Chapter 901 Cloud Pattern Ghost Leopard The edge of the vein at the Invercargill Forest Copper Mine, which is considered the northern part of the vein. The leader of the horse team was a local aboriginal guide. He did not ride a horse and walk barefoot on the dead branches and leaves in the forest. He has a very strong physique, surrounded by animal skins, and the exposed skin has a bronze color. There are five magic cores tied to the fine braids on his head. The hard skin of these magic cores has not been completely worn away. It just opened a window somewhere, revealing the magic crystal containing magic power inside. He carries an alloy hunting bow on his back, a wooden spear in his hand, and a short knife hanging on his waist. These weapons all flowed out from the Doden Town garrison camp and have basically spread to all the indigenous tribes in the Invercargill Forest. These indigenous tribes are considered residents of the Viscounty of Serdak. So they have all the rights and interests of formal citizens of the Green Empire. Having said that, these indigenous tribes will not be notified when Wilk City holds a magic awakening ceremony. This indigenous guide is a warrior of the Moniti tribe. He can understand the imperial language and can also speak some simple words. Following him is an adventure group from Wilk City. This adventure group has a total of 12 members. The leader is a level 1 to 18 warrior who possesses a valuable magic pattern structure. However, this set of magic patterns is very old. And many of the magic patterns have been worn to varying degrees. I am afraid that the repair cost will be astronomical. A group of team members under his command also have the strength of level 1 or above. Some members have a single piece of magic pattern structure. And all of them have magic weapons. They can be regarded as a team with good combat capabilities in the adventure group. A few days ago, they had hunted three low-level monsters in succession, according to the locations marked on the map. But as adventure groups continued to enter the Invercargill Forest, the monsters marked on the map were hunted down one after another. In the next few days, they continued to miss, and they had not gained anything for several days in a row. I heard from other adventure groups that monsters are often seen outside the Mineral Vein Mountain, and occasionally traces of some high-level monsters are seen. Many adventure groups try their luck near the Mineral Veins. The leader of this adventure group solicited the opinions of the members. Finally, I decided to take an adventure here. Aboriginal guides are experienced hunters in the Invercargill Warcraft Forest. He knew that there was only such a small river in the valley nearby. And it was the water source for many nearby herds. Recently, the hunters in the tribe have been hunting around this mountain range. The mountain range is like an invisible wall that blocks all the monsters from outside. So this place has become an excellent hunting ground in the eyes of the hunters. But in the eyes of the monsters in the Invercargill Forest, these tribesmen and adventure group members are not prey. This cloud pattern ghost leopard has been promoted to a fourth level monster after possessing the fourth magic pattern. The middle section of the copper mine vein is its territory for hundreds of miles. It usually hides in the mountains and forests, hunting low-level monsters for food. When the beast tide broke out, they fled into the Anya swamp where even the ghost marked red ants were unwilling to set foot. This time it returned to Invercargill Forest and was suddenly surprised to find that there was the smell of a dragon in its territory. The suspicious cloud pattern ghost leopard did not break in to explore the truth, but wandered around the periphery of the territory, waiting for opportunities. It had just eaten a white-horned deer recently, and now it was just thirsty. So it ran to a water source to drink water. It is an experienced hunter and very patient. It will never act rashly until it understands the true strength of this horse team. The adventure group searched for the beast's footprints by the river. It was lying in the grass on the other side. And even its breath was completely hidden. In the evening, a group of main beast families came to the river. For warriors rushed out from the grass by the river and began to hunt the main beast, which had two large, five small and seven heads. Several spears slashed through the main beast. In the sky, the main beasts were bulky. And one of them accurately pierced the back of the strongest main beast. An indigenous guide stood on the horizontal branch of a big tree. Looking around warily, the male main beast roared and charged towards the adventure group alone. Rock-like armor appeared on its skin. It approached a big tree and rubbed out the spear inserted in its back. But it didn't even bleed. A drop of blood. The female main beast's bristles stood on end. And she fled behind her with the five little beasts. The curved fangs in the mouth of the main beast are like two sharp blades. Facing the charge of the main beast, the leader of the adventure group raised a heavy tower shield and supported the shield with his body. At the same time, two members stood with him, intending to resist this charge. An adventure group member behind held a spear in his hand. At the moment it rushed up, its fangs overturned the heavy tower shield. The three adventure group members behind the tower shield fell backwards. 
and of the member of the adventure group holding a spear. The spear in his hand was like a poisonous snake spitting a message, right in the middle of the two front legs of the main beast, breaking through the solid rock armor, and the sharp spear tip sank into the body of the main beast. The spear penetrated from here, just enough to penetrate into the heart of the main beast. The main beast made a grunting sound, held the spear in front of its chest, and rushed forward dozens of meters before falling into the riverside with lush water and grass. The magic patterns on his body gradually dimmed, and the layer of rock armor slowly disappeared. The members of these adventure groups are a group of experienced hunters, and they are very experienced in dealing with these junior monsters. In the direction in which the female main beast escaped, eight members of the adventure group lurked in the grass. No one will pay attention to the cubs at this time. Only the adult main beasts can have magic cores in their skulls. So they will let these young main beasts leave on their own. But the adult main beasts cannot escape this ambush hunting. The female main beast never charged and escaped because the little beast was following her. In the end, she was covered in blood and was killed by several swordsmen using gorgeous sword styles. The leader of the adventure group came over and saw seven holes on the back of the main beast. He was so angry that he said loudly, there are just two main beasts with holes all over their bodies. This kind of rotten leather is not good at all. It's not worth much money. The cloud pattern ghost leopard crawls towards the cavalry. Just when the leader stood by the river and cursed his men, the cloud pattern ghost leopard rushed out like a bolt of lightning. Its aura was so well hidden that even the most experienced hunter did not notice its existence. It was like a phantom. A pair of sharp claws resting on the shoulders of one of its members. Just as the member turned around in horror, its bloody mouth tore open the main artery in his neck. The blood splashed on the ghost leopard's fur. And since it bounced away, the cloud pattern ghost leopard suddenly accelerated in the next second. And its body was like a line of blue smoke in the dusk. Disappearing in a swish. No. It's an adult ghost leopard. Run away. The leader of the adventure group roared. After being stunned for a moment, all the members dived into the grass by the river. Of course, the cloud pattern ghost leopard would not let them go so easily and pursued them closely. Its speed far exceeds the imagination of the members of the adventure group, and its body is as light as a wisp of smoke. Every time it condenses and appears, it will harvest the life of a member. The indigenous guide from the Moniti tribe stood on a tree and immediately jumped into the river and disappeared. A moment later, the twelve fragmented corpses of the adventure group members were found in the valley. Their internal organs had been basically eviscerated, and most of the leather armor on their bodies had been torn into pieces. Only some magic weapons were left scattered in the grass. The horses were also killed by wild beasts, and some supplies were randomly thrown on the ground. Some wild animals that came to drink water took the opportunity to eat these corpses. The natives of the Moniti tribe rushed to the mine in one breath. When Andrew led the cavalry battalion to the water source, except for some torn supplies, not even bones were left on the ground. The cavalrymen picked up some broken magic weapons from the grass and gathered around Andrew. Andrew picked up a completely scrapped magic pattern constructed shoulder armor, handed it to the two-headed ogre behind him, and said, It seems that the monsters lurking around here have at least level 3 peak strength. The two-headed ogre magician looked at the broken wounds and suggested to Andrew, You can try to find a sharp dagger. Andrew used his butcher's sharp axe to scratch the magic pattern shoulder armor, and the shoulder armor was only lightly scratched. It seems that this shoulder armor is stronger than imagined, Andrew said with a gloomy expression. Recently, members of three adventure groups have been ambushed by this one in a row nearby. And this adventure group was the most disastrous one. The entire 12-member adventure group was wiped out. If this continues, maybe no adventure group will dare to hunt in Invercargill Forest, Andrew said with some worry. The two-headed ogre said happily, Wouldn't that be just right? Andrew shook his head and said, but the boss hopes that the safety index in this forest can be higher. After saying that, he mounted the ancient bolai horse and rushed forward along the river valley. A squadron leader came up from behind and whispered to Andrew. I heard that Captain Samira will pass by the mine tomorrow with a batch of goods. Andrew's eyes lit up, and he said with a hint of joy. Then wait for her. On the day Samira led 18 Thunder Rhinos to the temporary camp at the copper mine, she saw Serdak leading 300 tribal natives into the mine camp. Eighteen thunder rhinoceros gathered at the foot of the mountain, and Samira stood on the platform on the back of the thunder rhinoceros and waved to Serdak. Serdak rode up to the armed thunder rhinoceros. Samira slid down from the eight-meter-high platform along the fur of the thunder rhinoceros' neck. This time, Samira brought back ironwood with thick trunks, but before putting them on the shelves, 
They were all wrapped in linen. Now you can only see great packages piled on both sides of the platform shelves. Is the journey going smoothly? Serdek asked Samira. Not seeing him for many days, the life of the half-elf archer in the forest gave her a little more wildness between her eyebrows. It's okay. I just met a lot of adventure groups on the way, Samira said with a slight frown. And then she smiled proudly and said, But there seem to be more monsters returning to Invercargo Forest along the way. The sun shines down through the gaps in the tree canopy and becomes speckled on the forest glade. Soldek said, I sent the Invercargo Forest Warcraft distribution map to the Adventurers Guild and the Mercenary Union, just hoping that they can come to Invercargo Forest to hunt and keep the number of Warcraft as low as possible. Serdak was riding on horseback and said to Samira, We'll talk when I settle down these young people from the indigenous tribes. However, Samira spread her long legs and followed Soldak. Serdak pointed at these indigenous young people and introduced to Samira. I recruited them from the indigenous tribes in the hills and mountains. Then, as if he had found a bargain, he whispered, I promised them that I would pay them 20 pounds of wheat flour every day. I didn't expect that recruiting miners would be easier than recruiting soldiers. Serdak really did not expect that local indigenous people could be hired so cheaply. I thought they were used to the traditional lifestyle and were unwilling to be miners. Unexpectedly, they only visited two tribes and recruited 300 people. The number of people greatly exceeded their budget. On the way, he asked a young native who knew a little imperial language why he wanted to work as a miner. The young native was very upright. He directly said that he could get 20 pounds of wheat flour every day by digging stones which was much better than hunting. For the natives, this job is easier than hunting, and 20 pounds of wheat flour is far more valuable than a small animal. These wheat flour can make a native live happily for 20 days, but a grouse cannot, and there are not only grouse in the forest. More than 300 young natives were arranged by Suldak to live in five large, empty work sheds. These work sheds are still very crudely built. They can only stop some stupid beasts from intruding, but cannot stop mosquitoes and mosquitoes. Live Warcraft, there was not even a wooden bed built in the work shed. The workers who originally lived here just laid a thick layer of moss on the ground. The wooden beds built by the young indigenous people themselves are also very simple. They just use arm-thick wooden sticks to lay them secretly on the ground to form a floor bed. They like to cover the ground with thick moss and pine needles. The pine branches have a strong smell of pine oil, which many mosquitoes don't like. When the young aborigines arrived at the simple copper mine camp, someone immediately cooked some grain porridge for them. The first batch of workers in the mine were aborigines from Duoda in town. They knew some aboriginal languages and the imperial language. There will be no discrimination against these indigenous tribes. Now Serdak will hand over these young indigenous people to their management. Communication between the two parties should be much easier. At least there will be no imagination of abuse. Deduction. Discrimination. Etc. Suddenly so many natives came to the camp. It suddenly became lively. And the food reserves here immediately became tense. This time, the armed thunder rhino transported the iron wood back to Duodan town, and also transported a batch of grain from there. Andrew and the cavalry battalion did not emerge from the mountains until evening. When they returned to the mining camp, they learned that Suldak was coming, and immediately rushed to the camp. The surveyor and two clerks from the Wilk City Territorial Administration also followed the team. Living in the mountains for more than half a month made them look like jungle savages in gorgeous clothes. I don't know how long it's been since I shaved my beard. Maybe I haven't shaved since I left Duo in town. The surveyor did not rush to see Suldak. Instead, he got into his tent and asked a young clerk to shave him. Chapter 902 Join Forces Andrew's latest task is to take the surveying and mapping officer of the territorial administration to measure the land near the copper mine every day. The surveying and mapping officer will use a large amount of data to check whether the map of Invercargill Forest is accurate. However, the cavalry battalion will also perform some emergency tasks such as rescuing an adventure group in distress nearby. But there is a prerequisite. That is, someone must arrive at the mining camp alive. Usually these people are indigenous tribal guides. Serdak stood in the forest clearing, pointed to the clearing in front of him, and said to Samira, This time, I need your armed thunder rhino to help me transport a few large iron cans. These iron cans are still being made in the blacksmith workshop in Duodan town. I want them to make them as big as possible. It is estimated that only these thunder rhinoceros can be made. A rhinoceros can carry a heavy load. Samira listened quietly on the side, looking indifferent. Her archer camp was set up at the foot of the mountain, surrounded by 18 thunder rhinoceros. 
This time, she brought nearly 300 archers to the canyon slopes on the edge of the Darkworm Valley. Perhaps the team was too large. But there were many people along the way. There were no monster attacks. Andrew and Gulitam ran up from the foot of the mountain. Boss, why are you here? Andrew shouted at the top of his lungs. His voice was so loud that it could echo in the valley. When Andrew came close on horseback, Soldek said, I went to Aranza City this time and found a way to process copper ore. So I hired some young people from the tribes in the hilly areas to start extracting copper sand. Andrew had no interest in copper mines. He jumped off the horse and said to Soldak excitedly, You are here just in time. A ghost leopard has appeared in this area recently and has attacked four adventure groups in succession. I have been looking for it for several days and haven't found it. I was thinking about asking Samira for help when she passed by. I didn't expect you to come too. Serdek asked. Can you determine the general direction? Andrew said with certainty. It is active on the edge of the mountainous area in the middle of the vein and has never left that area. That piece of land shouldn't be that big. Let's go there tomorrow and have a look. Soldek nodded and said. Samira squatted on the crown of a cloud-topped tree. The crown of this towering tree is like clouds. As long as you can climb to the top of the tree, you can easily overlook the surrounding mountains and forests. She held the sky strike bow in her hand and stared at the movement near the valley. At the exit on the east side of the valley in the distance. Eighteen thunder rhinoceros were blocking it like a wall. Serdak led five hundred heavy cavalry. Lined up in the west valley. And began to search this not so large valley. I am sure that the cloud pattern ghost leopard is hiding in this valley. But also thanks to the group of armed thunder rhinoceros. When this group of behemoths passed through the valley. There was too much movement. The cloud pattern ghost leopard was originally hiding on the top of the tree. He was sleeping, but was awakened by a huge rumble. And it jumped down from the tall tree vigorously. Although his body was as fast as lightning, he was still caught by Samira's keen eyes standing on the thunder rhinoceros platform. So Andrew directly led 500 heavy cavalry to block the west exit of the valley. And 18 armed thunder rhinoceros blocked the east exit. The cloud pattern ghost leopard could not be seen. So the knights lined up in a horizontal row and followed the path. Valley Carpet Hunt. In fact, the place where the ghost leopard was hiding was very secret. The cavalrymen of the cavalry battalion circled back and forth in the valley three times. But they could not find the cloud pattern ghost leopard. Unfortunately, at the last moment, the two-headed ogre relied on his excellent sense of smell to smell the cloud pattern ghost leopard. Of course, according to Gerlitm himself, it is the smell of meat. The cloud pattern ghost leopard's body lit up with magic patterns and it jumped down from the top of the tree. Its body stagnated in midair for a second, and immediately turned into a puff of gray smoke, floating in the air. Just a second before its body disappeared, an arrow wrapped in lightning streaked across the sky and passed through the gray smoke. Although the arrows did not hit the cloud pattern ghost leopard, the arcs of electricity followed the gray smoke and hit the cloud pattern thunder rhinoceros. Then with a burst of crackling sounds, the cloud pattern ghost leopard finally landed on a huge rock. His whole body was covered with electric arcs. And he roared violently. The body of the cloud pattern ghost leopard curled up. And then suddenly jumped up like a taut spring. And pounced directly on Samira on the back of the thunder rhinoceros. The ghost leopard thinks that only Samira can hurt it. The next moment, Serdak ran forward a few steps. Raised the dwarf chain shield in his hand. And threw it out without hesitation. Gilladam's good brother Nailwer also threw the fireball in his hand at this moment. The dwarf chain shield only caught the ghost leopard's afterimage. The ghost leopard turned into a line of smoke and disappeared again, while the small fireball exploded in midair. At the same time as the fireball exploded, the ghost leopard's lightning-like figure ejected again. The fourth-level monster didn't care much about this powerful fireball, but the fireball just happened to make the ghost leopard show up again. It was through this appearance that Samira on the platform shot another arrow. The magic crystal on the back of the bow instantly turned into countless crystal powders and the arrow was like a white lightning piercing the night sky. Striking hard. On the ghost leopard, he forcibly pinned the fast-moving ghost leopard in place, and the fur of the ghost leopard stood on end. Gilladam chased after him from below, picked up the bone-crushing stick in his hand, and swung it at the ghost leopard that fell from midair. The body of the cloud-patterned ghost leopard was in a state of paralysis, unable to dodge at all. It received a full blow from the ogre. Serdak heard the cracking sound of bones on the spot. But the cloud pattern ghost leopard counterattacked and struck a blow. The sharp claw just happened to hit the bone crushing stick and immediately made three clearly visible claw marks on the bone crushing stick. 
Gulitum was pushed back several steps by a huge force. At this moment, the ghost leopard didn't take any advantage. Its body hit a loud tree hard. And its strong body immediately caused the tree debris to fly. And the whole tree shook violently. From the moment, the ghost leopard was discovered. He was beaten to the point where he was unable to fight back. It was already scared out of its wits, and dared not stay in the fight anymore. It struggled to get up from under the tree. And its body immediately became translucent. Preparing to use its own natural ability to hide, and avoid the pursuit of this group of strong men. But he didn't notice Aphrodite behind Serdek. And the magic spells and magic symbols turned into a huge magic circle. A huge eyeball rose from the center of the magic circle. And then appeared above Aphrodite's head. The moment the eyeball opened, a ray hit the cloud pattern ghost leopard. The ghost leopard's body was crumbling, and he lay down under the big tree. The moment he closed his eyes, he still couldn't help but roar. The cloud pattern ghost leopard lay on the ground. Andrew rode up to catch up with him, carrying an axe from above. The flaming butcher's axe was raised high and struck hard on the ghost leopard's neck. Chapter 903 Second Level Magic Pattern A shadowy figure with an angry face gazing at the war appeared behind him and the butcher's axe in Andrew's hand emitted blazing flames. But at the moment when it was chopped down, the ghost leopard lying under the tree suddenly opened its eyes, opened its bloody mouth, and bit Andrew's wrist. Andrew lowered his wrist, and wiped the edge of the butcher's axe towards the ghost leopard's big mouth. The ghost leopard's head was very flexible. With a slight swing, it bit the handle full of spiral patterns. And then cloud patterns burst out from the ghost leopard's body. Pattern. His claws sank into the soil and he suddenly shook his head. Andrew was actually thrown away by the ghost leopard. After all, it is a level 4 monster, and its speed and strength are not weaker than those of level 2 monsters. The ghost leopard felt that the people who rounded it up this time were very powerful, and had no intention of continuing the fight. It was also frightened by those arrows with lightning, and it didn't dare to mess with Samira anymore. When he turned around and looked again, he saw the ogre with a fireball in one hand, and a big stick in the other feeling inexplicable fear in his heart. It instantly determined the direction of the breakout, and chose Serdek, whose dwarf chain shield had turned into a crumpled piece of scrap metal. His body turned into a black mist, and disappeared suddenly. Insect wings appeared behind Aphrodite, chasing after the cloud pattern ghost leopard. She was almost floating on the ground, holding an unnamed thorn rotan in her hand, and waved an overwhelming whip with one hand. Film. The whip hit the ghost leopard that had escaped into the void until it revealed its figure, causing the ghost leopard to let out an irrepressible roar. The pain came from the soul level, with a strange and soul-stirring aura, facing the cloud-patterned ghost leopard that rushed towards him. Serdak could only face it bravely. He couldn't get out of the way, because once he got out of the way, the ghost leopard would definitely speed up suddenly and open a hole to jump out from him. Serdak was originally a shield warrior who was good at defense. Facing the frontal attack of the ghost leopard, he threw away the dwarf chain shield in his hand and turned it into scrap metal. Holding the blood red crescent moon in his left hand and the holy light torch in his right hand, he then recited a series of rune spells. Relwart tell. What emerged under his feet was a magic circle composed of countless runes and magic lines. In the magic circle, countless earth fires gush out from the rocks. Lightning falls from the sky and the poisonous mist that fills the air forms a shield of red, white and green elements. This is the oldest rune language, ancient oath. However, it was not attached to the shield, but was summoned by Serdak in the form of a holy seal. Then, the shadow of a double-faced demon appeared silently from behind him, and four large golden translucent hands alternately covered Serdak's body. At the same moment, the ghost leopard felt the resistance in front, and it suddenly accelerated, dodging a series of arrows shot by Samira from behind. After these arrows were shot in the air, they shot through the rocks on the ground, causing bursts of explosive force. The air and dust left only a row of arrow holes on the stone floor. The ghost leopard's body disappeared again. The moment it disappeared, a fireball exploded where it appeared. The ghost leopard jumped out of the flames, and the flames ignited on its body were blown out by the wind around its body. As expected, the ogre's flames had no power over it and could only accurately predict where it would appear. The cloud pattern erupted with light like an explosion. The source of power in the body exploded one after another, and a series of air explosions sounded in the air. The ghost panther smashed the elemental shield with its head. It then used its sharp teeth to bite into pieces the four big golden hands protecting Serdak. Its body stagnated as a result. It stood in front of Serdak 
and raised its sharp claws to grab at Serdak's chest, ready to tear Serdak in half. Serdak instinctively put on a defensive posture at this moment, which had almost become an instinctive reaction of his body. The sword in his left hand and the torch in his right hand were accurately placed on the sharp claws of the ghost leopard. But the huge power was transmitted through the sword blade and the fire channel. And he was immediately forced to half kneel on the ground. The other sharp claw of the ghost leopard left four light blades in the air, which actually broke Serdak's blood red crescent moon into five pieces. The sharp light blade even cut through the entire body of Serdak. The black iron armor was cut open almost effortlessly from the left shoulder to the right ribs. And the salamander skin armor worn inside was also deeply scratched. A dark ball of light fell from the sky and hit the ghost leopard in front of Serdak. The ball of light was like a flower bud exploding instantly when it hit the ground. The eight petals wrapped the cloud pattern ghost leopard from all sides, forming a shadow prison. Then an arrow of light shot from the direction of Samira. It accurately passed through the shadow prison and hit the ghost leopard's neck. At the same time, a lightning pillar fell from the sky, penetrated the shadow cage, and hit the ghost leopard. The arcs of electricity that overflowed from the shadow cage spread out overwhelmingly. Some of the arcs penetrated into Serdak's body, making him feel numb all over, and his body trembled involuntarily. The feeling of being burned by the arc seemed familiar. Serdak faced the spreading arc and approached the shadow cage step by step. The ghost leopard was wailing in the electric column. He injected the power of holy light into the blood-red crescent, and a dazzling sacred energy suddenly emerged from this broken blade. Light flame. Cut it down with one sword. The sacred power turned into a sword light and struck the forehead of the cloud-patterned ghost leopard. The cloud pattern ghost leopard was restrained in the electric pillar and could not escape. Suddenly, the cloud pattern ghost leopard's head was split open with the sword light of the sacred aura. The sacred aura spread around, instantly dispersing the shadow cage. At the same time, the electric pillar also turned into countless arcs and dissipated in the air. Serdak walked out of countless electric arcs carrying the broken blade and the holy light torch. And his body was burned to a crisp by countless electric arcs. Serdak endured the burning and numbness all over his body, and used the holy light technique repeatedly to treat himself. Andrew, Samira, Guaidam and Afro gathered from all around. Andrew and Guaidam went to check on the more ghost leopard. Samira was relieved when she saw that Serdak was fine. Serdak just took a short rest. As a skinner who is proficient in skinning, he had to peel off the leather of the cloud pattern ghost leopard as soon as possible, and put it into the magic sealing box before the blood dried. He walked up and leaned next to Andrew to examine the cloud pattern ghost leopard, which was more than three meters long. After all, it is a level four monster, and the entire high-grade monster leather is filled with elemental power, with natural magic cloud patterns on it. As if it contains mysterious power, this kind of magic beast leather is the most challenging inscription master's understanding of magic patterns. When the inscription master is carving magic patterns, he may need to integrate the magic pattern array into these cloud patterns. Andrew split the ghost leopard's skull open, and a magic core larger than an adult's fist was embedded in the skull. Such a large magic core is destined to produce a high-level magic crystal. The head was split in half and could not be preserved as a sacrifice. Andrew casually broke off four crystal-clear leopard teeth and threw them to Samira, who was holding the sky strike bow and reinstalling the magic crystal. Andrew then used a butcher's axe to chop off four sharp claw blades. Seeing the elemental aura from the cloud pattern ghost leopard's body quickly dissipating, Serdak did not hesitate at all, opening the sacrificial altar to bless himself with the blessed body and eye of truth, immediately discovering that a very complete life magic pattern had been formed on one of the ribs on the left side of the ghost leopard. Serdak quickly dismembered the ghost leopard's limbs, the high grade leather, spirit patterned ribs, teeth, and claws were all put into the magic sealing box. As for the fresh meat of this ghost leopard, Half of the box was also packed, and the rest will become everyone's dinner. Under darkness, the cavalry battalion formed a long line back to the copper camp. The copper mining camp suddenly became noisy. The next morning, Andrew took 500 cavalry to accompany the surveyor to conduct field surveys of the copper veins. Eighteen armed thunder rhinos were still gnawing on the dewy grass at the foot of the mountain, and were driven halfway up the mountain by the driver. Serdak decided to start digging for copper mines from here. There were several giant rocks weighing dozens of tons. They need to be moved down the mountain. And now they have been dug out by the young indigenous people. They need to be dragged away by these thunder rhinos. Three hundred young natives started digging stones on the mountain side of the camp early in the morning. These copper ores are sandwiched in the stone layers exposed on the surface. 
They need to dig out these dark brown ores and smash them with sledgehammers. Then a stone mill is used for preliminary grinding. And then the copper or powder ground into powder can be immersed in the pool. An activator is added to precipitate a solution containing copper elements. And finally a catalyst is used to replace the copper. This involves a lot of alchemists' knowledge of metal replacement. This process is not destined to be the simplest and most efficient. But it is definitely the cheapest. And it does not have nearly stringent ratio requirements for operation. Since the metal pool has not yet been transported. Soldat can only ask the indigenous young people to select the ore first. And then conduct preliminary crushing. When all the stone mills and large iron cans are transported. The copper can be further precipitated. After arranging these matters. Serdak selected an aboriginal from Doden Town to be the mine director of the copper mine and arranged for six aboriginals to become foremen, each of whom would supervise 50 aboriginals. The copper mine frame was pulled up. Serdak brought an iron bucket from Doden Town, filled it with some copper or powder and clean water, and added some active agents into it. After a day, some copper sand really precipitated, and the copper sand showed a dark purple color. These copper ores in the copper mine are not the most valuable. The magical red copper accompanying these copper veins has good magic conductivity and is usually used to make cheap magic products. This is another major factor in the copper mine. Income. Half of these magical red coppers were born in this interlayer of mineral veins. This mine is still very crude. And it doesn't even have walls. It just has a few sheds built on the mountainside. This is the Invercargill Forest, which is rich in timber resources. If Soldak wants to improve the livability of the mine, he must continue to build some wooden houses. These wooden houses will gradually replace the few work sheds. Serdak also hired five women from the indigenous tribe to prepare three meals a day in the mine's canteen. In addition to wheat cakes and oatmeal porridge, the food these indigenous people eat is basically in this forest. They like to collect some tree leaves, smash them into a green slurry with stones, and then mix them into wheat flour and stir. It turns into a light green paste, spreads it on the iron plate, and fry it into a palm-sized cake, and then eats it with salt. Sometimes I dig wild vegetables in the surrounding woods, and cooked them into soup with a bitter taste. What Serdak didn't expect was that several aboriginal foremen could actually eat the food. There are always some adventure groups seen nearby recently, and they have regarded it as a temporary stronghold. They came to the mine, and some adventure groups would also make some supplies here, probably exchanging fresh meat for some food. They would carry the small beasts they hunted in the forest. Often the adventure group would hunt down a group of small beasts and kill more than 20 small beasts in one go. In addition to getting some leather, the freshly hunted animals the members of the adventure group couldn't finish the meat no matter what. And they couldn't take it back to Duodan Town. He could only bring it to the camp. He can use the fresh meat to exchange for some food. The only thing stocked in the camp is food. They will not take all the food away. They will just make some on their food bags. The mark is stored in the grain depot of the mine. And you can pick it up whenever you need it. Occasionally, some crafts such as animal bones and teeth can be obtained from the indigenous people. Of course, there is no such thing as exchanging bread for magic crystals. And the natives are not that stupid. Nowadays, most of the magic herb resources in Invercargill Forest are in the hands of the indigenous tribe chiefs. They also know the value of these magic herbs from Serdak. And have reached a medicinal herb deal with Serdak. The agreement will not be easily sold to others. Relying on these adventure groups, the natives in the mines gradually had more opportunities to drink broth. During this period, Serdak hunted and killed a level 4 monster the salamander basilisk, in the iron or vein stone forest. It was a monster that could spit out plasma balls. Samira's sky strike bow was against it. It had no effect at all. So Serdak simply took four second level experts and spent four days to kill the salamander basilisk in the stone forest. In addition to getting a piece of leather with the electric life magic pattern. The teeth of this python are as transparent as crystal. And the bend is exactly the shape of a dagger. As long as a handle is installed at the root of the tooth, you can get a very sharp one. Beast Fawn Dagger. These are the sharpest teeth that Serdak has ever seen. In addition, the leather of the Salamander Basilisk is also a rare high-end product. And on the slope where the ironwood is hidden, there is actually a cave hidden there, where a level 4 dark bat lurks. This bat is also a level 4 monster. There are hundreds of this old beast in the cave. Descendants of bats. To deal with this kind of monster trapped in the cave, Serdak's method was much simpler. He directly piled countless dry firewood at the entrance of the cave, poured a dozen barrels of kerosene on it, and then covered it with countless thunderbolts, rhinoceros feces and moss, 
And finally the cave entrance was sealed with soil, leaving only a half meter high fire vent below the cave entrance. Serdak asked people to ignite the dry firewood inside. After seeing the fire burning, he completely sealed the entrance of the cave with mud. After the fire burned for most of the day, some thick smoke drifted out from some stone crevices on the slopes of the forest. The ogre Gulidum simply slept next to the cave entrance, guarding his bacon every step of the way, according to Serdak's request. The entrance to the cave remained stuffy until the third day before it was dug out by a group of cavalry. After digging, they found that the firewood and thunder rhinoceros excrement piled at the entrance of the cave had been burned to ashes, and the entire cave wall was stained. There was a layer of black smoke oil hanging on it. After waiting for the smoke in the cave to dissipate, the ogre led a group of indigenous archers carrying sacks and happily ran into the dark cave to pick up the smoke meat. In this situation, the fourth-level dark bat emerged from a rock crevice and rushed towards Gulitum almost desperately, but was shot through the body by an arrow from Samira, who was guarding the entrance of the cave. This dark bat is the third-level four monster that Suldak hunted in the Invercargal forest. It was an ice monster. When it bit the ogre brother, it not only sucked his blood, but also froze his whole body with a layer of frist. If Samira hadn't taken action in time, the ogre brothers would have been no match for this giant bat. Serdak obtained a life magic pattern with blood-sucking properties from this dark bat. Unfortunately, the life magic pattern containing ice was shot through by Samira with an arrow, and the entire magic pattern was completely destroyed. Chapter 904 Second Level Magic Pattern Breeding Equipment The first wooden house built in the mining camp was naturally Suldak's residence. Serdak, Andrew, Samira, and the ogre Gulitum were sitting on a platform built outside the wooden house. This platform had a very wide view and could overlook the entire mine. Suldak placed the life magic patterns of three level four monsters, namely the cloud pattern ghost leopard, the python basilisk, and the dark bat, on the wooden table, and said to Andrew and Samira, I have said before that you will be promoted. After the second turn, you have more carrying capacity and can colonize a piece of this kind of magic pattern. Now these three magic skins of level four monsters are very good. You can choose one each. The ogre brothers looked at each other, and Gulitum said, Why should I choose the magic skin? I don't need it. Gulitum is right. We brothers participate in hunting just for a bite to eat. The cannibal magician Nailware smiled, and then said in a relaxed tone, Of course. If you want to compensate, it's not impossible for us to do so. Duck, can you find me a wand? You see, as a magician, I don't even have a wand that I can use. When we kill an evil mage in the future, we can snatch one back. Gulitum muttered. Serdak said quickly. Actually, it doesn't have to be that troublesome. I can ask the businessman Malakom to help me keep an eye on it. What you need is a battle staff. Hee <laughs> hee. You still understand me best. The ogre magician now Hor smiled and patted Serdak on the shoulder. Hey, brother, I don't really like your behavior. Gulitum turned to his good brother Nelhor and said, Okay, okay, I won't do it again. I know, I know. The cannibal magician Nalhuar repeatedly apologized. Serdak said quickly at this time, Nalhuar should indeed have a combat staff. Helping you is also helping me. After all, we are in the same group. Right. Gulitum sat there in a daze and said bluntly, We agreed at the beginning that we would eat delicious food from all over the world. I am not coveting anything else. Just like I like to reason with others and don't like to fight. Everyone knows that you are an ogre who loves food and likes to talk sense. Serdak stood up so that he could pat Gulidum's thick shoulder. Then he said to Samira and Andrew, Then it's your turn to choose. The magic patterns of these level 4 monsters are very suitable for you. Of course, you can also wait for better ones. Samira and Andrew looked at each other. And Andrew said to Samira, Lady first. Samira was not polite. Her eyes turned back and forth between the cloud pattern ghost leopard and the anaconda basilisk. A little hesitant. She was a cheerful half-elf, and quickly made a decision for herself. Choosing the spirit bone of the cloud pattern ghost leopard. This is a magic pattern that mainly increases speed, slightly increases strength, and also camouflages skills. It is almost tailor-made for half-elf archers. Soldek nodded and said, This magic pattern is indeed suitable for you. With two magic patterns left, Andrew chose the electric magic pattern of the salamander basilisk, and gave up the blood-sucking magic pattern of the dark bat. In fact, Serdak felt that the blood-sucking magic pattern was more suitable for Andrew. And he was simply desperate for his life when fighting. Next is the process of colonizing the magic pattern. 
This time the magic pattern implantation was completed in the copper mine wooden house. Soldek asked Samira to stay first. The ogre and Andrew had to guard outside the wooden house to prevent anyone from disturbing her. The process of colonizing the magic pattern required absolute silence, and no one could disturb her. Opening the altar. This time he hung four lanterns in the four corners of the wooden house. When the statue of the two-faced demon god appeared in the wooden house, Serdak directly sacrificed the head of the dark bat, and then used the altar to peel off the life magic pattern from the ghost leopard's spirit bone. He asked Samira to choose the location where the magic pattern would be implanted. The magic pattern was not big, and the pattern was long and narrow. Samira decisively chose her left shoulder. In this way, her right shoulder is the life magic pattern of the powerful demon ape, and her left shoulder is the life magic pattern of the cloud pattern ghost leopard, which perfectly forms a flower arm. Samira's beautiful face with light red eyes makes her look a bit seductive. The magic pattern had just been implanted into her body, and Samira was still a little uncomfortable. She held her left arm with one hand and sat alone on the wooden railing outside the wooden house slowly feeling the integration of the magic pattern of life with her body. Gilladam stood guard outside the wooden house, with a row of cavalry standing beside him. Everyone stared at the dense forest around him without saying a word. In fact, there are some sentry posts in the dense forest. Andrew walked into the wooden house, and Soldak sacrificed the head of the python and the basilisk. The shape of the basilisk's magic pattern was a bit weird. Soldak implanted the magic pattern into his shoulders, chest, and front collarbone. The position merged with his previous magic pattern, and the breath of fire and lightning surged and roared in his body. Andrew's physical condition is far superior to that of Samira, and he can inject power into the magic pattern without taking time to adapt. The soul of the berserker burst out behind him, strode out of the cabin, grabbed a logging axe from the firewood pile in the camp, and shouted to the ogre, Ghoul item! Do you dare to fight? The two-headed ogre immediately ran out from the wooden house, dropped the bone-crushing stick in his hand, pulled out a small tree from the forest, and used both hands to remove the excess branches, turning it into a large tree full of branches. Stick! Ghoul item swung the big wooden stick in his hand and threw it at Andrew. Andrew laughed, ha-ha, raised his logging axe, and faced Gilladam's big wooden stick. Flames and arcs of electricity flew around his body, and the arcs turned into electric snakes and burrowed towards Gilladam's arms. The ogre let out a war cry. A wave of air visible to the naked eye spread from the ogre's feet. The ogre's momentum increased greatly. The ogre magician Nalfa had already raised a fireball and threw it towards Andrew's big face. Andrew's whole body ignited with a ball of flames, and the fireball fell on Andrew's body, completely submerged in the flames. The magic patterns on his body lit up one by one during the fierce battle, and flames and arcs continued to appear, filling the surrounding air, actually forcing the two-headed ogre to retreat. After more than a dozen axe blows, only a short section of the big wooden stick in the two-headed ogre's hand remained. The handle of the logging axe in his hand was also shattered in the fierce battle. Andrew and Gulladam went into battle shirtless in front of a group of natives. They punched each other hard. Although the two-headed ogre was more than one meter taller than the Nanai indigenous warriors and weighed as much as the indigenous warriors. Three times. But this hand-to-hand -hand battle did not take any advantage. In the end, the two of them fell down exhausted on a messy grass almost at the same time. The surrounding indigenous people applauded and cheered, and their worship of the strong came completely from the bottom of their hearts. The cavalry and the cavalry battalion discovered that Captain Andrew's strength had grown by leaps and bounds again. The pressure of a second-level powerhouse emanated from his body, and the mine immediately became silent. The surveying and mapping officer of the Wilkes Territorial Administration also walked out of his cabin and looked at the open space of the mining camp with a shocked expression. After thinking for a moment, he decisively took out the map in his arms. Many actual measured dimensions have been densely marked. Now, without any hesitation, he took out the seal directly from his arms, breathed towards the seal, and then stamped it heavily on the parchment map. He turned to the two clerks behind him and said, Nothing unexpected happened. We will return to Wilk City tomorrow. The two scribes quickly waved their fists excitedly. The surveying and mapping officer who turned to leave muttered in a low voice as he walked. There are so many powerful second-level men under his command who are still nesting in the Belan Plain. This one is really low-key. Chapter 905 The Good Life of the Indigenous People The surveying and mapping officer lived in Invercargill Forest for nearly more than a month and finally handed over a map stamped with the seal of the Territorial Administration to Soldek. 
which meant that the Wilk City Territorial Administration recognized this land matches the map, and the land circled on the map belongs to Viscount Serdek. The remaining 60% of the land in Invercargill Forest will be classified as public territory. These territorial plans will be awarded to magicians with noble titles in the next few years, and will also be sold to nobles who are willing to pay to purchase the territory. Them. In the Green Empire, it is not easy to become a noble. First, the title can be inherited hereditary. But if the heir has no military merit, the title will automatically be downgraded every time he inherits the title. Second, participate in the magic awakening ceremony and awaken as a magician through the ceremony. Each magician will be canonized by the empire and will also receive a territory. Although it may be barren or remote or a land that a magician will never set foot on, this wealth will accompany the magician throughout his life. Third, knights are promoted out of the norm, which requires outstanding knights who have made great contributions to the Green Empire and have outstanding leadership. In fact, the biggest reason why Serdak was canonized was because he mastered the Holy Light technique. Currently, the paladin is indeed more important than the magician. In addition, there are also some special circumstances for canonizing nobles. But that depends on the mood of His Majesty Charles. The territory owned by Serdak is at least 10 times larger than what he can control with his current title. According to the laws of the Green Empire, these territories will be sold or turned over within a time limit. It's just that this law was almost forgotten by all the nobles. And the houses of representatives of each province also had a memorandum of understanding on this law. Of course, this is done to encourage young nobles to be willing to go to other plains to open up territory for the empire. Otherwise, many small nobles would explore unknown areas and be forced to sell off large tracts of territory they owned. Such a thing would not be in line with the current interests of the nobles. In the empire, the lives of nobles become very depressed every year. They have noble rights in the city, but live a civilian life. Of course, there are also some outstanding nobles who are rising, becoming new stars in the city, and emerging in the upper class. The land that Serdak owns in the Belan Plain is much larger than the territory of Halanza City. But after all, this is the frontier of a plain with vast land and sparsely populated areas. The only thing worth any money in the eyes of the nobles was a copper mine. The monsters in Invercargill Forest are raging, and the tide of beasts in the Darkworm Valley once every ten years will reduce Invercargill Forest to ruins. Except for those trees that can escape. All the rest can breathe. It's all about death and escape. In this way, those noble lords who have the strength to occupy this place do not want to trap all their troops here just for the sake of this land. Those noble lords who have no strength, not to mention their inability to occupy this place, cannot hold it even if they occupy it. They spend huge sums of money to occupy it. But in the end they are all in vain. There are only some speculative nobles who want to take advantage of the lull in the beast tide that occurs every ten years to seek some benefits in this mountain forest. So many nobles look down upon this land. What the H? L. It won't be long before the beast tide comes. And this place will be in ruins. That's what some of the Wilkes nobles always say. The indigenous tribes are not used to going to the town of Doden to trade. Because there are too many imperial immigrants there. The noisy market is always filled with too many merchants with small calculations. The natives are not very good at arithmetic. So they don't like small calculations. It doesn't matter if they are taken advantage of in one transaction. But two or three times will make people feel bored. This is the trading area for merchants and adventure groups. The large amounts of food stored in the copper mines were originally prepared for indigenous miners. The remuneration paid to them by Suldak was not settled with silver coins. The main reason was that the indigenous people did not want to go to the market in Doden town for consumption. Silver coins were not usually used. The indigenous people preferred to receive wheat flour. So the wages at the mine were paid with all our wheat flour. Later, an adventure group came to the mine to provide supplies. They took out fresh meat and traded food with the people in the mine. The indigenous people saw that they could still do this. Some indigenous people would carry special products from the forest and run to the mines to trade. The reason why they are willing to come here is also very practical. It is because the miners in the mine are all indigenous people, which not only makes them feel friendly, but also feels safer here. The trade here supports barter, but the standard of value is wheat flour. As long as the food is taken out and placed in front of the indigenous people, piled up like a hill, the visual impact can kill everything in an instant. In fact, if you pay gold coins, you will get so much food. But the natives don't know how to do it. Based on the principle of you'll know it when you see it. The indigenous people trade a lot of grain here. The mining camp has become a trading market. 
the Aboriginal mine manager at the mine reported to Suldek. Everything the Aborigines, who came to the mine to trade saw were good. The pots and pans, and even the sacks containing grain had become Aborigines. Seeing the goods in their eyes, a few waves of natives plundered the place like a primitive tribe. After hearing the mine director's report, Serdak immediately had some daily necessities transported from Doden Town, including iron pots, ceramics, salt, spices, hatchets, logging axes, and fine steel arrow clusters. However, how to trade has become a big problem. The natives are unwilling to accept the imperial coins. Unexpectedly, the mine manager is also very capable. In order to avoid repeatedly explaining the prices to these mountain natives, he placed large and small wooden boxes in front of these goods. The value of all commodities was measured in wheat flour. For example, the wooden box in front of the iron pot is relatively large. To fill such a box, it takes almost 60 pounds of wheat flour, which is two silver coins when converted into silver coins. Buying an iron pot with two silver coins has little concept in the minds of the natives. But if they exchange a box of wheat flour for an iron pot, they know how much they will pay. These indigenous people more or less have some magic materials in their hands. If they exchange them for food, the indigenous mine managers will also actively ask the adventure group. The price and the purchase price given are very fair. So the natives of Invercargill Forest suddenly discovered that the past life of hungry and full meals had quietly gone away. There was always half a bag of wheat flour hidden in the dry hole at home. And they would be branded with it when they were willing to go hunting. Order wheat cakes and drink some gruel while lying at home pretending to be dead. This is much better than drying dried meat. It was under such a situation that a group of indigenous people walked into the copper mine. When they first came to the mine carrying warcraft materials, they didn't understand why Lord Serdak hired so many tribesmen to dig stones here. They felt that these young people were simply wasting their youth if they didn't go hunting. Couldn't they grow old? Are you going to hunt honestly? But when they returned to the tribe with food bags on their backs, they went out hunting several times and found that there were not many beasts left in the forest after the beast hide. Now a large number of adventure groups have arrived from Duoda in town. Hunting for a living. The days are becoming more and more difficult. Now I can still take out some of the Warcraft materials I saved in the past and go to the mine in exchange for some food. But this is not a long-term solution. And these savings will eventually be exhausted. The more indigenous people come to the mine, some of them will chat casually with the tribesmen who dig stones here. When they find out about the remuneration for work here, they will immediately feel, what? Digging rocks for one day in exchange for food is enough for me to eat for 20 days. This is just robbing food. Why go hunting when you have such a good thing? The natives who learned about the wages in the mines always thought so. As a result, this group of indigenous people formed a large reserve force. They began to look forward to one day becoming miners digging stones here. It was under such circumstances that the copper mine in Serdak expanded to 2,000 miners in just one month. He suddenly discovered that the tin can he made in Duodan town was simply too small. Then so much copper or his mine from the veins every day, ground into or powder one after another, soaked in iron cans and slowly deposited into copper sand. Just after September, copper sand began to be produced from copper mines. Although the amount of copper sand produced every day is not even enough to pay the salaries of the natives. This copper mine is starting to generate profits after all. Serdak has already started preparing to build a larger pool near the mine near the mountain stream, so that all the ore powder can be loaded into the pool. The first batch of copper sand was born in this way of construction and mining at the same time. Duodan Town now has three blacksmith workshops, and there is only one that is good at making copperware. Serdak does not even need to sell the copper sand to the business group, as the copperware shops here can eat it directly. The first batch of 10 tons of copper sand sold for 40 gold coins. 10 tons of copper sand sounds like a large amount. In fact, only 20 small bags were packed into the linen bags containing grain, packed into two large wooden boxes, and transported to Doden Town. Soldak then exchanged wheat flour and some daily necessities from Doden Town and transported them back to the mining camp. The wheat flour was enough to fill the shelves of 18 thunder rhinos. When they arrived at the mining camp, the indigenous miners stood on the ridge, watching the loaded thunder rhinoceros stop in front of the warehouse to unload, and then went to the stream to drink water and eat beans. They let out deafening cheers on the mountain ridge. No matter what, the hard work they put in these days finally paid off. In September, Serdak spent nearly 600 gold coins on paying salaries to these indigenous miners, but his income was only 40 gold coins. The only visible wealth is the mountains of copper or in the mines. 
the magicians in Wilk City have always been paying attention to the upstart Suldak of the Luther Legion in the Northern District. When they heard that the first batch of copper sand from Viscount Suldak's copper mine only had 10 tons, a reception was actually held in Wilk City for this purpose. It is said that the organizer of the reception just spent 40 gold coins to hold the meeting. There was even a magician who laughed at Viscount Suldak on the spot at the reception. After working hard for nearly two months, the copper sand found out from the iron kim was only enough for the reception. This is really ridiculous. But this time, the noble lords of Wilkes collectively lost their voices. They did not take the opportunity to join in the fun. And no one came over to attend the magician's drinking party to build relationships with them. In the final analysis, this cocktail party was just a mockery of Soldak by the wizarding community in Wilkes City. This summer has passed at the magic awakening ceremony hosted by the Wilkes Magic Guild. A total of 59 young people awakened from the magic pool and became magic nobles. These young people who have just turned 12 are about to enter the Wilkes Junior Academy of Magic. Accordingly, these 59 young magic apprentices will receive baronies uniformly distributed by the Bina province. The Belan Plain is vast and sparsely populated, and its public territory reserves are very sufficient. This time, the top management of the magic union deliberately arranged to move these young baronies to Invercargill Forest which made the officials of the territorial administration want to give these magicians a few whips for not causing trouble, but feeling uncomfortable. However, according to the work procedures, these 59 baronies still need to be surveyed by surveyors and mapping officers to prevent the territorial area of the reward from being seriously reduced. Once there is a serious discrepancy between the territorial area and the actual land area, some officials of the territorial administration will be punished, or may even be dismissed. Although the surveying and mapping officer of the territorial administration was very angry, he still had to take these young magic apprentices to see their barony within the specified time limit. Two-thirds of these young magic apprentices are from noble families, and they basically look down on this border forest. There are also one-third of magic apprentices who come from civilian families. These magic apprentices from civilian families have average family backgrounds. They are still very concerned about owning a baron. They even want to move their families to their own territory. When the time comes, no matter what you do, at least you don't have to pay taxes. A series of dark magic caravans passed through the south gate of Duodan town and drove into this lively border town. A group of young magic apprentices pushed open the glass window of the carriage, revealing their young and immature faces. These magic apprentices, generally 12 years old, are this year's awakened ones. They came to Doden town to receive the barony assigned to them by the Bina province. On this trip, these magic apprentices were accompanied by their families. Most of this group of people came from the area around Wilk City, and many of them had never even heard of Doden before. Looking at the bustling town of Doden, they showed joy and curiosity. One by one, they jumped off the magic caravan, followed by their parents or other guardians. Under the arrangement of the surveying and mapping officer of the territory administration, these magic apprentices stayed in the hotel in Doden town. Each person had a separate room. It would not be a big problem to live as a family. But if the family members had special needs, then they would have to communicate with the hotel yourself. Everyone will rest one night in the town of Doden. After having breakfast at the hotel tomorrow morning, we will enter the Invercargill Forest through the Doden Gorge. The surveying and mapping officer said expressionlessly while standing in the lobby of the hotel. A group of people dispersed in the hotel lobby. While it was still early, many parents prepared to go shopping with their pride. Nowadays, the most popular items on the shopping streets of the town are bronze wares, followed by some magic materials of ghost pattern red ants. However, the sales channels for these magic materials have been fixed, and there is no demand here in Duodan town. So it is very difficult. Few vendors display red ant materials. Of course, there are also a wide range of other products. Duodan town has now become the largest market within a hundred miles. These parents took their children to stroll around the town. What surprised them most was how cheap bread was in the town. Bread sticks bought for two copper coins were so big that they could kill someone with one stick. I came back with a scone bigger than my face. Although it is a little remote here, the prices are really good. I guess the salary here must be very low. If we can make money in Wilk City, it would be comfortable to come here to spend money. A pair of young civilians, the parents pulled their daughter and said with emotion on their faces. Although their daughter is average looking. She stood out among more than 70,000 children who participated in the Magic Awakening Ceremony test this year and officially became a magic apprentice. The father of another magic apprentice, who was traveling with them triumphantly said loudly, What's so difficult about that? 
In the future, our children will have a barony near Doden Town. If the land is fertile, I plan to move your family to the barony, raise some horses, and let them graze freely in the territory. At the end of the year, if you sell them for money, you can live a good life comfortably. Please keep your voice down. I heard that the territory allocated to us is a forest. The woman pulled her husband to stop him from whispering. The father was obviously an optimist and immediately said, The forest is not bad. You can also open a lumber mill. The group of people walked out of the bakery and saw rows of neat and brand new townhouses across the long street. Look over there. Those houses are so beautiful. I'm sure they were just built. Chapter 906 Copper Mine Soldak and An San were standing on the roof of the townhouse. The housing reconstruction project in the slum area has been completely completed. And all the indigenous people in the town have moved into these small townhouses. In the past few days, the imperial immigrants in the town, who had been watching this matter finally came forward and kept looking for Mrs. Luna. Since the town can demolish the aboriginal shacks and rebuild townhouses, then ask her to renovate their houses, preferably into beautiful townhouses. Serdak brought on San here this time just to discuss this matter. The two of them stood on the second floor terrace of the townhouse, discussing the feasibility of this matter. Mrs. Luna wanted to get some benefits for these imperial immigrants, rebuild the townhouse for free, and the land squeezed out would be returned to them, all in town. However, Ong San was not very interested in this matter. The main reason was that he had to deal with imperial immigrants when building small townhouses this time. Ong San is very prestigious among the aboriginal people. When he builds these small townhouses, no aboriginal people will jump out and find fault. But if he builds small townhouses for the imperial immigrants, Ong San is not sure that they will not find fault. If something goes wrong, it would be better not to pick it up now if it causes trouble. Now the twin goddess temple is about to be completely completed. Ong San is planning to follow Serdak's plan. There is still a large area of land south of the Doden River to be planned for some higher-end residential areas. Although it will not be built immediately, it will be dug in advance. Drainage culverts, paving roads, planting homesteads, etc. These things are much simpler than renovating imperial immigration residential areas. Moreover, Ong San is also preparing to allocate some manpower to participate in the construction of the Invercargill Forest Copper Mine. There are only so many aboriginal workers on hand, and there is no way to spare any extra manpower. Serdak learned of these situations, and didn't say much. Seeing several young magic apprentices standing on the street in the distance, Ong San smiled, and then said to Soldak, Mr. Mayor, I heard that some new neighbors have arrived near your territory. His eyes fell on the magic apprentices, and he said, It seems that it is these newly awakened magic nobles. When the Wilkes Magic Guild allocates the baronies this time, they will all be sent to Invercargill Forest. Do you want me to privately inform the indigenous chiefs and send them to Invercargill Forest? Are they all going to be squeezed away? Serdak turned and asked Ong San, Why do you want to squeeze them away? I think it would be good to have some magician neighbors near the territory. Looking at those young faces, Serdak smiled and said to Ong San, There is so much useless land in Invercargill Forest. Rather than letting it lie idle, it would be better if someone developed it. After saying this, he was about to leave. But he stopped after taking a step, patted Ong San on the shoulder and said, Oh, by the way, the sedimentation pond your people built at the mine this time is very good. That's what we should do. Lead the people in the town to create value together and then improve everyone's living standards. After saying that, Soldak slowly walked down the townhouse and walked along the noisy street towards the town hall. He soon disappeared into the crowd of people coming and going. Entering the end of September, a large refining tank has been built next to the creek. This pool is built a bit like a swimming pool. The bottom and side walls of the pool are riveted with iron plates. In order to prevent the spliced iron plates from leaking, the pool has been repeatedly tested for leaks. Subsequently, a large amount of copper or powder was pushed into the pool one by one by the indigenous miners. Recently, five or six tons of copper sand can be fished out from the pond almost every day, and the mine has finally managed to maintain a balance of payments. However, due to the increase in the production of copper sand, so much copper sand cannot be eaten by the small copper workshop in Duodan Town. In fact, the blacksmith workshops are also aware of this problem. Their workaround is very simple. They smelt the copper sand essence in time to make copper ingots that are more convenient for transportation. The businessman Malacom then led the Thunder Rhino Caravan to transport these copper ingots to Wilk City. Serdak knew that this was not a long-term solution. 
when the refining furnace customized from Alenza arrived in Doden Town. Standard copper ingots could be extracted directly at the mine without the need for a blacksmith. The workshop smelts copper ingots. At that time, the blacksmith workshop will still have to return to its original path of making copper utensils. As the Invercargill copper mine began to continuously deliver copper ingots to Wilk City, the nobles of Wilk City discovered that this copper mine had caused the price of copper utensils in the city to drop in one day. 30%. Many people who originally planned to stand aside and watch Cernak's show now shut their mouths. They don't want to have any grudges with a noble lord, especially a lord who holds military power and keeps getting richer. Everyone did not expect that Serdak would move so quickly. In just two months, the copper mine had already produced a large amount of copper sand. Among them is the Zax, the largest slave owner in Wilk City. He has been feeling a little anxious recently because the dwarf slaves that were supposed to be sold to Viscount Soldak are currently on the road. And the Invercargill copper mine everything seems to be on track over there. If these dwarf slaves are shipped over and the auction price is too high, it is very likely that Serdak will not participate in the bidding. The magicians in Wilk City did not hold any ironic celebration party this time. They were very unhappy with Viscount Soldak. And the most they could do was call on people around them to boycott copperware. However, even among the magician nobles, there were not many families in Wilk City that could afford gold and silverware. Copperware is still an indispensable part of everyone's life. Compared with cheaper sub tin kettles, many middle-class families prefer to buy copperware that maintains its value. This time, the magic apprentices took over their baronies in the Invercargill forest area. This Count Soldak did not deliberately make things difficult for them because of his grudges with the magic union. At the same time, the deviations between these territories and the notes on the map were not large. The location and boundaries are extremely clear. In particular, certain rivers in the forest were important water sources. Serdak did not use the advantage of territorial priority to include all rivers into his territory. Many rivers existed as boundaries for territorial division. The benefits of this are also obvious. The small lords, who will be allocated territories later will at least be able to find water sources in their territories. This kind of generous aristocratic behavior also won the favor of some neutral-minded magicians for a while. By October, the refining furnaces shipped from Helena via normal channels passed through the portal smoothly and were piled in the warehouse in Wilk City. Along with these three furnaces, which cost a total of 4,500 gold coins, arrived in Wilk City, along with Scholar Ferdinand's magical assistant Victor. Serdak hurried from Doden Town to Wilk City to join the businessman Malakom and the magician Victor there. All the horses in Serdak's cavalry battalion were marching in a hurry. All the horses in Serdak's cavalry battalion had been strengthened by magic patterns. The physique of each ancient Bolai war horse was at least twice as strong as before. They could even march in a hurry all day long. Soldak galloped to the foot of Wilk City with a cavalry squadron of 60 men. Only four days had passed since he received the news that Victor had arrived in Wilk City. Chapter 907 This large-scale refining furnace enters the Belan Plain from Benna City. Cross-plane transportation not only requires paying a large amount of fees for crossing the portal, but Serdak personally rushed to Wilk City this time mainly to serve in the military headquarters. Get a combat readiness pass and avoid paying huge taxes in Wilk City. The Green Empire's taxes on this kind of cross-dimensional commercial trade have always been very high. The huge taxes alone are almost worth a set of magic patterns. For this reason, businessman Malakom specially wrote a letter to Soldak, saying that if these materials become military supplies, they can reasonably avoid taxes. Soldak arrived at the military headquarters with a list of supplies. He walked around a lot upstairs and downstairs before getting a stamped combat readiness pass. Then he went to the great swords Manchester's office and sat for a while before leaving the military headquarters. Businessman Malakom's warehouse was built outside the city. In a small pasture, there are dozens of thunder rhinoceros in the pasture. They gather together and leisurely eat staghorn grass on the ground along the grass slope. When Soldak arrived at the ranch with heavy cavalry, the magician Victor and the businessman Malakom led a group of people waiting at the gate of the ranch. When the magician Victor saw Serdak's cavalry for the first time, he was indescribably surprised. He found that these ancient bolai horses exuded some kind of magical aura. It was hard to say what it was. But these Gubalai's horse was carrying a group of heavy cavalry, which itself revealed a strangeness. Victor's understanding of the ancient horse was entirely due to a noble lord who approached Scholar Ferdinand last spring, because he could not buy a better quality blue-scaled horse. He asked the scholar to find a horse that could improve the ancient horse. For the Lima Physique Program, 
Ferdinand scholars maintained a special research group. And Victor was the deputy leader of this research group. In fact, based on the direction pointed out by the Ferdinand scholar, they quickly developed a strengthening scroll that could improve the physique of the ancient Boli horse. Unfortunately, the cost of such a strengthening scroll was three magic crystals, which was much higher than the price of a green-scaled horse. Even the black-scaled horses on the market were more expensive. So the research team was quickly disbanded. But Victor is very familiar with various physical data of the ancient Bolai horse. Kubwa Lima is famous for its endurance. But due to its weak physique and lack of explosive power, it cannot be equipped in the heavy cavalry battalion. But the scene in front of him completely overturned Victor's cognition. This heavy cavalry squadron was actually ridden entirely by ancient Bolai horses. And it seemed that they were coming from a long distance. Arriving at the gate of the ranch, all the horses were wet. The cavalrymen jumped off their horses, took off their armor one after another, used with chips to scrape their horses sweat, and then led their horses slowly in circles on the grass to soothe their emotions. No wonder I was able to make friends with Scholar Ferdinand. It turned out that this man was actually a noble lord. Victor thought in his heart. Serdak got off his horse cleanly, strode up to the magician Victor, stretched out his hand and said, Magic Victor! Thank you very much for making a special trip to Bylin's plane. His voice was steady and powerful. Victor immediately walked out of the crowd and said, Your Excellency, Viscount Soldak, it is an honor to serve you. Holding both hands together, Victor said, What I studied at the Alchemy Guild is metal transformation. Usually those metal transformation experiments are conducted in the magic laboratory. It is rare to have such a good opportunity to go deep into the mining area. I also I hope to accumulate some valuable experience through this practice. Soldak raised his head and glanced at the warehouse behind Victor. The warehouse door was designed to be very tall, so that even Thunder Rhinoceros could enter and exit freely. Is our furnace in the warehouse? Serdak asked. Victor nodded and said, Yes, all three sets of furnaces have been shipped this time. As long as they are shipped to the mine one after another, they can be assembled and debugged. I was originally worried that the furnaces were too large to be transported. Since you have prepared the Thunder Rhino transport group here, that would be great. Businessman Malakom stood next to Victor and stepped forward to hug Serdek. Businessman Malakom narrowed his eyes and smiled. I also asked you how to get a refining furnace that only alchemists can master. It turns out that you have such a close relationship with the Helensa Magic Guild and the Alchemy Guild. Serdak laughed and confessed. I came out of Halansa City. When I encounter trouble, the first thing I think of is to go back to Halansa to solve the problem. And I don't think the Alchemy Guild here can design such a plan. Excellent refining furnace. Victor looked at Serdak in surprise and asked with concern. Do you have any conflict with the Alchemy Guild here? Do you need me to write a letter to the teacher to explain this matter? He has many connections in the Alchemy Guild. Maybe this can be resolved. It's not necessary for the time being. Now we can still ensure each other's dignity. Serdak replied. Actually, I only had a feud with the alchemist from the Wilk City Alchemy Guild over territory. But that alchemist has now been exiled to the big battlefield. Victor lost his voice and asked. The battlefield is the training ground for the second level experts? Soldak nodded casually and agreed. Um, Victor was a little unbelievable and couldn't figure out what kind of background Viscount Serdak had behind him and what kind of methods he used to send the magicians from the alchemy guild there. That's a big battlefield a place of purgatory for all magicians. Thinking of the big battlefield, Victor felt his back getting cold, and when he looked at Soldak, he was a little more careful. The surveying and mapping officer from the Territorial Administration accompanied this group of magic apprentices in Invercargill Forest for more than a month before demarcating the territories of all the magic apprentices. The survey officer had no idea that he would be busy in Invercargill Forest from summer to late autumn. I originally thought that after stamping the map of Viscount Soldak, I would have completed the journey to Invercargill Forest. I didn't expect that there would be these young magic apprentices behind me, all of whom came here to divide the territory. He followed. This group of magic apprentices returned to Invercargill. If he had known this, he would not have returned to Wilk City. The autumn wind was bleak, and the surveying and mapping officer stood on a big rock in the forest. He took out his handkerchief and wiped his nose, and mentally greeted the relatives of the senior leaders of the magic union. Hearing the chaotic footsteps, the surveying and mapping officer turned to the head of the magic union and said, Your Excellency, Berkeley magician, now that the division of territory here has come to an end, we can return to Wilk City. The surveying and mapping officer secretly rejoiced. Fortunately, 
the entire territory allocation process went smoothly. Otherwise, he would have been busy for a long time. When the first snow fell in the forest, it would be more difficult to get out here. The head of the magic union smiled slightly, walked up to the surveyor and said, Tomorrow, Mr. Horsley, the vice president of the magic union, will visit Invercargill Forest in person to inspect the territorial settlement of magic apprentices. I will rush there tonight. Go to Doden Town to pick up Lord Horsley. Master Horsley is actually here. Is there anything I need to prepare here? The surveying and mapping officer asked with a relaxed look. In the past, the top management of the Magic Union did not have such routine inspections, and they did not know what the Magic Union was going to do. However, the great magician Horsley has an outstanding reputation. He is a very famous great magician in Wilk City. He also holds the title of Earl, although it is not hereditary. He is also well known in the aristocratic circle of Wilk City. The surveying and mapping officer was an official of the territorial administration. He couldn't afford to offend the great magician, and he didn't dare to return to Wilk City early, so he could only hold his nose and wait in Invercargill Forest. A group of magic caravans stopped at the north exit of Doden Canyon and then parked on the grassy slope below the hilly mountains. There are rolling hills and mountains ahead. From here further north, the road is not suitable for the magic caravan. Along the way, you can also see some horse teams carrying heavy goods into the Doden Canyon. Although there is already a lust road here, this road winds along the hills and mountains and the turf has long been trampled bare by the horses. Dozens of magicians descended from six gorgeous magic caravans. These magicians were from the Wilkes Magic Guild and the Alchemy Guild. This time, they rushed to Inver in the name of inspecting the territorial settlement of magic apprentices. Cargill Forest. A young magician jumped off the magic caravan, opened the carriage door, and hung the hanging ladder at the carriage door. Archmage Horsley, the vice president of the magic guild, walked out of the carriage. When he reached middle age, Archmage Horsley's hair had turned gray. He wore a dark green magic robe with two rows of golden medals hanging on his chest. He pursed his lips and looked at the vast area north of the Thorny Mountains. The last time he came here was when he just became the vice president of the Magic Union. In the blink of an eye, he had already wasted five years in this position. He stood up straight, looked at the rolling hills around him, turned to a group of magicians behind him, and said, Let the magic caravan stay here. The road ahead is not easy to walk. I think we might as well fly at low altitude on the magic harpoon handle. Two directors of the Alchemy Guild came behind. They came to Invercargill Forest this time, also in the name of inspection, to see what happened to the copper vein that was lost from Christopher. At present, in Wilkes City, news about the Invercargill Forest veins is spreading. Some people say that this vein cannot produce many copper ingots at all. And this Count Soldak has to pay huge salaries to the indigenous miners out of his own pocket every month. Some people say that this mine is now able to break even, but it has never been profitable. The report from Christopher that the Alchemy Guild received clearly stated that this was a rich copper mine with very rich copper reserves. For the Alchemy Guild, many agreements have been signed with Christopher. This copper mine will bring huge benefits to the Alchemy Guild. Unfortunately, all of them fell through in the end. This time the two directors of the Alchemy Guild came to Invercargill Forest to investigate whether the copper mine was really as bad as the rumors. Or maybe Viscount Serdak has some business problems. If that's the case, the Alchemy Guild is going to propose to Viscount Serdak a purchase plan for this mineral vein. He won't be able to make any money anyway. Wizard Kit, the director of the Alchemy Guild, said with a smile, That's a good idea. It should be fun to fly at low altitude in the hills and mountains. It would be great if we can regain the air superiority of the Belan plane sometime. Archmage Horsley narrowed his eyes and said casually, This kind of thing is not something we can decide. If we want to communicate with the higher-ups, we probably have to wait until Duke Newman returns to the Bena province from the Warsaw plane. While talking, magic potions were pulled out from the magic pockets of each magician. With the development of magic civilization to this day, the magic handle that allows magicians to fly freely in the air no longer has any characteristics of the handle. This kind of magic handle is composed of three parts, control part, seat part, and driving part. The most primitive magic handle has a simple single-handled wooden handle in front. The seat and the handle are connected together. It is just a cotton cushion wrapped around the wooden pole. There is no power part at all, relying entirely on the magician's own magic output. After so many years of changes, the grip of the magic handle has become very comfortable and easier to control the flight direction. The grip is divided into two parts the left and right, which look a bit like bull horns. 
The seat part is already a slightly sunken leather saddle. And there is a cross brace under the saddle for stepping on. In the power part, a small floating magic circle is designed. In addition to the magic crystals and laid on the magic pot, the magician only needs to continuously transfer magic power to the magic pot to drive the magic circle in the sky. Flight. However, the price of this kind of magic pot is not too cheap. Even magicians who can get a large amount of academic research allowance every month. Not everyone can afford it. Dozens of magicians gorgeously rode at the north exit of Duodan Canyon, riding magic harpoons and flying along the hills and mountains. The scene was also very spectacular. There was an infestation here in May, with ghosts striped red and eating everything available. But by October, the bushes and grasslands in the hilly and mountainous areas had returned to their original state, except for the small animals that rarely appeared. At this time in the past, the mountains and fields were full of mountain rabbits scurrying around with their but squirming, and groups of wild boars dragging their families with them. Basic Warcraft could also be seen everywhere, but now you might not encounter one even if you walk a few kilometers away. A hare. The same goes for Invercargill Forest, which has become lush and lush in just a few months. As the weather gets colder, the leaves begin to turn yellow. The surveying and mapping officer and the head of the Magic Union had been waiting at the edge of the Invercargill Monster Forest. When these new magic apprentices saw a group of magicians riding magic harpoons, flying around the mountain in a row close to the ground, they immediately stood on the top of the mountain and cheered warmly. Being admired always makes these magic union officials feel happy. They all jumped off the magic pot handle. Archmage Horsley, who was walking at the front, looked at these newly awakened magic apprentices. He held up a ruby wand in his hand and nodded slightly to the magic apprentices. The surveying and mapping officer and the head of the magic union rushed to greet him. Chapter 908 The Furnace on the Top of the Mountain The surveying and mapping officer looked a little cautious standing in front of Archmage Horsley. Have the territories of these children been divided? Archmage Horsley asked the territorial administration surveying and mapping officer with a straight face. The surveying and mapping officer quickly replied. Master Horsley, everything has been allocated. Archmage Horsley asked the magic apprentices again. Are you satisfied with your territory? The magic apprentices were excited. They didn't care that this place was located in a remote border area. They all shouted in unison, satisfied. The surveying and mapping officer let out a sigh of relief, and his anxious heart suddenly relaxed. A group of magic apprentices gathered around Archmage Horsley to say H, low, and the atmosphere became lively. Archmage Horsley stood on a big stone, raised his hands, and the surroundings became quiet. Very good! I feel very honored to be able to witness that these energetic children, like you can become magic apprentices. You are welcome to join us and become a member of our community of magicians. You are the future of the magic world and are responsible for creation. The magic apprentices around listened with great interest. Only Archmage Horsley's young assistant kept wiping his cold sweat on the side. He took out a speech from the information bag in his magic waistband. And it clearly read magic awakening ceremony speech. His heart skipped a few beats. I got the wrong speech script. He hammered his head. He had been a little out of shape for the past two days. He somehow took out the old speech. This speech had already been used on the day when the magic awakening ceremony was held. But no one cares what the content of this long and smelly speech is. Anyway, just clap when you stop. The atmosphere was very lively. And Archmage Horsley even answered questions from several magic apprentices on the spot. Then he followed the owner of this territory around the territory. The surveying and mapping officer followed the team, thinking that this would be the end of the formality. He even asked his men to prepare horses and prepare to return directly to Doden Town later. Master Horsley, prepare for a field trip. Be prepared, the head of the magic union whispered to the surveying officer. How many places do we have to go? The surveying and mapping officer was a little dumbfounded. Why is it not over yet? The head of the magic guild blinked and said expressionlessly. Please listen to the notice in detail. After speaking, the person in charge turned around and left. The officials of the Magic Union happily climbed to the top of the highest mountain in the territory and looked around. The scenery at the edge of Invercargill Forest was still very beautiful. Everyone walked around the territory and still had something to enjoy. So he clamored to go take a look at other territories. The only drawback was that there was almost no game in the forest. The surveying and mapping officer took everyone to visit three territories in a row. There were no wild animals in the forest but the soil full of leaf mold was very fertile. Everyone deliberately avoids talking about this being the Invercargill Warcraft Forest. At least there are no Warcraft in it now. The two officials of the Alchemy Guild wanted to go to the Copper Mine. 
the director of the Alchemy Guild, Wizard Kit, came out from behind and asked the magic assistant next to Vice President Horsley about the next trip. This was what they had learned before coming. It's already been said. The magic assistant turned around and asked the person in charge of the magic union in a low voice. How far is it from the copper mine? The union leader immediately took out a map, pointed out the location of the copper mine to the magic assistant, and pointed out everyone's location. The copper mine is over here, and now we are here. It would take half a day to walk on horseback. But there are always thunder rhino caravans heading there recently. So the journey is not difficult, said the person in charge of the magic guild. The magic assistant quickly came to Horsley's side and whispered a few words. Archmage Horsley raised his head and glanced at Wizard Kit, and then said to everyone, I heard that there is a free market near the mine. Our final destination is there today. When you build your territory in the future, you will inevitably go to this place. Come to the market and let us see what is available in this market. I heard that their market is very backward, and they still maintain the habit of bartering and transactions. I would like to say that this problem needs to be corrected. Otherwise, if they buy a set of magic pattern structures, they don't know how much they need to transport. Truck food. Everyone laughed when they heard Archmage Horsley's humorous words. The surveying and mapping officer led a group of magicians from the Magic Guild and the Alchemy Guild to the mining camp. They made various guesses on the way. When everyone climbed over the last hill in front of them, the scenery in front of them suddenly became clear. On the southern slope of the mine, the wooden houses built are neatly arranged on the mountainside. The wooden houses are scattered all over the mountain, so many that it is impossible to count how many there are. Surrounded by these wooden houses is a very lively market. From a distance, you can see a large number of indigenous people doing transactions in this market. But their trading method is very special. Behind many stall owners are bags of wheat piled up. The indigenous people were crowded in the narrow aisle. Everyone was carrying grain bags behind them grabbing some goods in their hands and bargaining with the stall owners here. However, the group of magicians standing on the opposite mountain ridge, including Archmage Horsley, did not set their sights on this bustling market. Archmage Horsley pointed to the huge smoky emitting thing on the top of the opposite hillside and asked seriously, Kit, what is that? The director of the Alchemy Guild, Wizard Kit, and another director of the guild looked at each other, hiding the horror in their eyes, and said calmly, Well, that looks like a refining furnace. Archmage Horsley frowned, stopped and turned to ask Wizard Kit. The Alchemy Guild has received such a big order recently. Why is there no movement at all? Wizard Kit wiped the cold sweat from his forehead and said with a wry smile, Lord Horsley, how could the Alchemy Guild accept the order from Viscount Soldak? Archmage Horsley had calmed down at this time and said to Wizard Kit, It seems that they have bypassed Wilk City. They should have customized the refining furnace from Bina Province. Two of the three chimneys on the top of the mountain opposite were spitting out thick smoke. Apparently there were two refining furnaces operating normally. Archmage Horsley asked with a sullen face. Kit, you are the director of the Alchemy Guild. Can you calculate the daily output of these three refining furnaces? Wizard Kit shook his head and said, I'm afraid it's difficult to estimate without going to the scene and taking a closer look. Archmage Hollis looked a little ugly and said, Forget it. I just asked casually. Your Territory Management Bureau has done a good job in the Territorial Settlement of Invercargill Forest. The latter sentence was addressed to the surveying and mapping officer. After saying this, he seemed to have forgotten his previous decision to stop at the mine. He turned around and asked the magic assistant beside him, What's your next itinerary? The magic assistant still didn't understand that Archmage Horsley didn't want to go to the mine anymore. He quickly took out a parchment notebook from his pocket and replied seriously, Teacher Horsley, you still want to go to the gold mine in Three Rivers Plains. Mine. Archmage Horsley nodded slightly. He reached out and patted Wizard Kit. And said, The schedule is quite full this time. I don't think we will stop at the copper mine. After saying that, he boarded the magic cauldron with a sullen expression. And flew away with a group of magicians from the magic guild without looking back. Only the two directors of the alchemy guild and the surveying and mapping officer were left on the top of the mountain. The magic apprentices were still following behind and had not yet caught up. Magician Kit told his magic assistant, Go and see which brother's union received the order. They are making money across districts like this. And why don't they even say H, low to us? Yes, teacher Kit. The magic assistant agreed, then rode the magic harpoon and flew towards the mining camp. Chapter 909 Territory Recruitment Malakom's Thunder Rhino Merchant Group successively transported the refining furnaces to Invercargill Forest. 
It took more than a month just to transport the components of these furnaces. After the magician Victor entered the mine with the first batch of main structural components, he took up residence in the mine. Ong San's Aboriginal Labor Group is specifically responsible for the infrastructure construction work of these refining furnaces. As early as four weeks ago, the foundation construction drawings of this large metallurgical furnace had already been handed over to Ong San, and some preliminary preparations had been completed. After these furnace components arrived at the mining camp, Ong San led more than 300 Aboriginal workers to use the huge gantry shelves of Thunder Rhinoceros, and under the guidance of Victor Magician, they quickly assembled the main structural frame. Then various accessories were shipped to the mine one after another, and Victor was always on site to guide the installation. Waiting until the weather gradually started to get colder, the leaves of the trees in the forest began to turn yellow, and pieces were swirling and falling to the ground. Three huge furnaces finally stood on the top of the southernmost mountain of the Copper Vein, like three giant steel beasts, crouch over the camp. Because it is an open pit mine, and there is no large-scale earth-moving equipment, Soldak does not plan to excavate the entire mountain at the foot of the mountain, but to conduct preliminary mining directly from the southernmost mountaintop. The three furnaces were built on platforms built on top of the hillside. Now the indigenous miners only need to push a cart of or into the feeding port of the furnace, with the help of the sliding rail cable car owned by the furnace itself. The ore is continuously transported downwards under the action of gravity, so that the ore can be manually selected at the same time, and then enter the furnace. The stone powder is ground into stone powder in the grinding machine that stops rotating, and then enters the three-stage release tank, where it is stirred and precipitated respectively. Finally, the catalyst is filled into precipitate copper sand. The copper sand flows out from the outlet at the bottom of the tank and is transferred to the furnace for processing. Smelting. Although many places still rely on manpower, many places have designed ingenious magic devices. For example, the main power axis for grinding is a magic wheel. The blast for smelting is also a magic rune board. And the furnace is the core device. It is said that a third level lava surge magic rune board is installed inside, which consumes at least five pieces every day. Magic crystal. Copper sand flows into the furnace, turns into copper water, and then flows into the cast iron mold under the furnace. Watching the molds being filled with copper water one after another, the miners pull them out from the furnace outlet and throw them piece by piece into the cooling pool. Finally, the indigenous workers fish them out from the bottom of the pond and place them neatly on wooden pallets. A refining furnace can condense about four pallets of copper ingots every day. Each pallet can hold almost five tons of copper ingots, which is a refining furnace. The furnace refines 20 tons of copper ingots every day. Copper mining and smelting are finally on the right track. It can bring about 240 gold coins to Serdak every day. Although the ore does not cost Serdak a penny, it does have to exclude labor expenses the magic crystal loss of the refining furnace, and the equipment loss. Labor costs account for almost only one-tenth of total revenue and account for a small proportion in cost accounting. The magic crystal stone consumed every day is relatively expensive. The magic crystal stone burnt every day by the magic rune board is about 100 gold. The depreciation of the refining furnace equipment is also 20 gold coins per day. Based on this calculation, this copper mine can bring about 100 gold coins to Serdak every day. Recently, Victor is thinking of ways to transform this furnace. The main purpose is to change the power source of the furnace from magic crystals to cheaper sunglass fragments. Once this transformation is successful, it will save Serdak money every day. Magic crystal worth 50 gold coins. However, this requires a dedicated person to guard the gym base, and a magic crystal fragment must be replaced every half hour. The refining furnace is built on the top of the mountain. The biggest advantage is that the entire assembly line composed of suspended cable cars can automatically move down the mountain through gravity. The merchants wait at the foot of the mountain every day. The orbital cable car continuously transports copper ingots down. And the empty cable car is pulled up to the top of the mountain again by the traction rope. It can be said that the pulley mechanism and transmission belt of this refining furnace were used to the extreme by Victor. The copper mine soon entered the profit stage and many businessmen went to the copper mine to find Soldek, hoping to become a dealer of the Invercargill copper mine. However, the largest dealer in the copper mine is the Thunder Rhinoceros Merchant Group. Only when their business group's transportation capacity is insufficient will they sell copper ingots to other merchants. Malakom fully supported Serdak's construction of the copper mine during this period, so he deserves this big contract. More than 2,000 indigenous miners bore the mine every morning, 
They rest in the mining area at noon. Lunch is prepared by more than 40 indigenous women in the camp, and each of them carries a large wooden basin on his head, carrying a wicker basket. Sent to the mining area. The cheapest meat product in Doden Town is the dried meat of red ants with ghost stripes. Now these dried meats have become a delicacy in the soup pots of indigenous miners. Miners are heavy manual laborers. And Soldak requires meat in every meal in the mine to supplement the large amount of physical energy consumed by the miners every day. In addition, Soldak advocated that miners have rest days. There is one day off for every five days of work. Of course, indigenous miners who live far away from home can also work for 10 days and have two days off. This way, the indigenous workers in the mines can often return to the tribe to take a look after work. Although it has caused certain difficulties for mine management, it has made more local indigenous people want to join the mine. After the magic assistant walked into the mining camp, he found that he was so incompatible with the place. Squeezing in the crowd, he found that there were indigenous people everywhere, and only some adventure groups gathered in the corner of the market to form an independent transaction. District. The prices of items here are relatively expensive and the natives will not come here. The magic assistant squeezed in, and sure enough, you could see some bloody monster leather, many of which had not even been cooked. There were also some Warcraft fangs, horns, claws, and other goods. He squatted in front of a stall, and reached out to flip through a piece of magic core of a junior Warcraft. Only the magic core of this kind of primary magic beast is worth gambling. The magic core of the second level magic beast must have magic crystals in it. What to buy the fur of the main beast? The stall owner sitting behind the stall asked enthusiastically. He looked at the bookish look on the magic assistant's face, then looked at his hands and the magic belt around his waist, and said with a smile, Now there are less and less Warcraft materials here. If you want to hunt these low-level Warcraft, you have to go to the Three Rivers Plain to find traces of these Warcraft. The magic assistant did not speak, but reached out and touched the animal teeth on the stall. The stall owner continued to ask, Are you a magician? Do you want to join our adventure group? The magic assistant raised his head and asked calmly. Are you going to the Three Rivers Plain? The stall owner thought for a moment and then said. No, our adventure group probably won't go there in the near future. The magic assistant asked doubtfully. Didn't you say that you can only hunt monsters there? Of course. The stall owner nodded affirmatively. The magic assistant asked casually. Then where are you going? The stall owner smiled proudly and said. Hey, it doesn't matter if I tell you. We are preparing for the near future. Have you seen those cavalry? They have been defending activities in the northern part of Invercargill Forest recently. Many adventure groups are going there now. Looking for opportunities. I heard that you can also find Ghostmark Red ants over there. Ghostmark soldier ants are simple-minded. And we have rich hunting experience here. Although the hard armor is not very valuable. The magic core is hard currency. The magic assistant said in surprise. Do you want to hunt ghost pattern soldier ants at the edge of the dark worm valley? The stall owner enthusiastically invited me and said, Yes. Are you interested in joining us? Forget it. I don't like taking risks. The magic assistant shook his head, put the animal tooth in his hand back on the stall, and refused. Actually, there isn't much danger. We have a lot of people. The stall owner saw that he was a magician and was unwilling to give up just like that. I really don't have those thoughts. The magic assistant refused again. He was a little impatient and planned to stand up and leave the stall. However, seeing that the stall owner was so talkative, he stopped after thinking about it and turned around and asked, By the way, do you know when the three refining furnaces here were built? You're not here just to get information. Are you? The stall owner saw his ruthless appearance, and the anger in his heart could no longer be suppressed. And he screamed, Do I know about your magic guild in Serta? Lord could doesn't get along. But since you're not going to join us, we're not companions. Even if I know all these things, I'm sorry, but I can't tell you. Seeing the shield warrior turn around and leave, the magic assistant rolled his eyes angrily. When he saw nearby stall owners and passers-by looking towards him with alert eyes, he knew he had been noticed and hurriedly got into the crowd. Quickly leave the market. At this time, a group of armed thunder rhinoceros loaded with goods came down from the foot of the mountain. These thunder rhinoceros were covered with thick armor pieces. Each one looked majestic and extremely large. They always emitted low sound waves. That strange sound easily resonates with the wood. In order to prevent these wooden houses from collapsing, they usually can only stay at the foot of the mountain. The thunder rhino stopped at the foot of the mountain, and immediately someone dragged cartloads of hay mixed with bean feed into the open space. 
the drivers quickly patted the shells and took away the thunder rhinoceros under the shells. They first let them drink water from the river, and then went to the open space to eat fodder. They have a very big appetite, and it takes a long time to eat each time. At this time, the drivers have to fetch water from the river and use extra long brushes to wash the bodies of these armed thunder rhinoceros. They are covered with a thick layer of hard armor. The gaps between the hard armor are moist and warm. And some dirt will always settle. This is also a paradise for parasites. Every time the driver takes advantage of the thunder rhinoceros to rest, he must use this long brush to remove dirt from their bodies and sprinkle some white lime powder to kill these parasites. A huge thunder rhinoceros needs to be busy for most of the day. Sardak jumped down from Thunder Rhino's platform. He came back from the northern border of Invercargill Forest because there were many young natives in the copper mines who wanted to join his private army. The army currently stationed in Doden Town is nominally a cavalry battalion of 500 warriors, but in fact it currently has 18 armed Thunder Rhinoceros and 1,000 archers, as well as 500 indigenous reserve infantry. This group the reserve infantry is not even issued armor, but the total number of troops he currently has is 2,000. However, according to the laws of the Green Empire, all citizens of the Empire over the age of 16 are obliged to perform military service. These indigenous tribes are currently considered subjects of Serdak and are naturally citizens of the Empire, so they also need to perform military service. Because of this, many natives have recently wanted to join Serdak's army. This time, he hurried back from the northern border of the forest and was also preparing to discuss this matter with the chiefs of the 37 tribes in the territory. Thing. Andrew and Malakom strode over together. Samira followed closely behind Soldak. Sernak asked Andrew. The chiefs of each tribe are here. Andrew said. We have been arriving here since yesterday. And the last one arrived at the mine at noon today. These clan leaders cannot leave the tribe for a long time. Gather them together in the vacant work sheds in the camp. Soldak said to Andrew. Okay. Boss. Andrew agreed, and took several squadron leaders behind him to summon these indigenous clan leaders from all over the camp. Recently, a large number of young indigenous people have joined the copper mines, bringing the number of miners in the copper mines to close to 3,000. This has formed a trend in various indigenous tribes. And young indigenous people now generally have a consciousness that they can only live a good life by joining Lord Serdek's army or the mines. A large number of young natives have left the tribes and many tribes have experienced a serious emptiness phenomenon, which Soldak does not want to see. That's why he hurried back from the northern border. Going up the street, the natives along the way all knew Lord Serdak and retreated to both sides of the stone street. Viscount Soldak, the crossbows and catapults you asked me to purchase last time have arrived in Doden Town. These ordinances are all shipped from San Carlos City. Businessman Malakom and Suradak walked with him and said as he walked, When I passed by the imperial capital this time, I also got a batch of magic crossbow arrows. Soldak asked the businessman Malakom. Last time, I asked you to go to the Imperial Capital Auction House to buy the magic pattern structure. Is there any new news? Malakom replied. The primary magic pattern structure is still available at the Imperial City Auction House. This time, I brought back a set of magic pattern structures with attributes that focus on agility according to your request. However, the second level magic pattern structure is basically it is not circulated in the market. I heard that only the second level experts who have been to the big battlefield can have the opportunity to obtain the second level magic pattern structure in the big battlefield. The great battlefield, Serdak repeated, then turned to Samira, who was following behind and said, It seems that you and Andrew really need to go there once. With that said, the group of people walked into the working shed of the mine. At this time, one after another indigenous tribe chiefs came in from outside and greeted Serdak one after another. Chapter 910 Tribal Meeting this work shed was originally used to house indigenous miners, but as a large number of wooden houses were built in the camp, these work sheds gradually became idle at first. Currently, three work sheds have been converted into warehouses. The work shed was actually intended to be a warehouse, but the last batch of miners moved here just a few days ago, and it is close to the canteen of the mine. The aboriginal mine manager wanted to transform this place into a canteen so that the workers could eat without being affected by wind and rain. There are already many long wooden chairs placed in the work shed. These wooden chairs are made from logs in the forest area that are directly broken with saws, divided into two halves, with a flat surface facing upward, and the base is slightly fixed. The wider one becomes a table, and the narrower one becomes a long stool. There may be little else in Invercargill, 
except for the fact that timber is everywhere in the mountains and plains. Sitting on a long stool, businessman Malakom introduced to Soldak that the managers of the business group brought back bulk commodities from San Carlos City this time, mainly hoping that this big customer could select a few goods. In addition to the set of magic pattern structures, Serdak only left some bed crossbows and catapults. These weapons are also very expensive in the Green Empire, especially the magic bed crossbows, which are no cheaper than the magic pattern structures. How many? Although he made some money during this beast wave, as a self-made lord, he needed to use every gold coin where it was most needed. Malakom sat next to Serdak, and even after a lot of effort, he could not persuade Serdak to buy the items he highly recommended, such as trays with heating functions that could be nailed to any wall, a faucet that automatically flows out of water, a magic mattress that automatically shakes slowly. He even suspected that the Green Empire's magic pattern structure was in such short supply because these magicians were not doing their jobs all day long. Lord Sardak, except for women, old people and children, there are almost no people in our tribe. All the strong laborers either ran to the mine or joined your army. Fortunately, there are no monsters in the hilly areas now. Otherwise a small group of main beasts can flatten my tribe. The leader of the Dakuni tribe walked in from outside the work shed and complained to Serdek. At first, he strongly opposed the clan members in the tribe joining the Lord's private army. Unfortunately, the situation in the Invercargill forest suddenly changed and all the lords accepted the rule of Lord Serdek. He could only adapt to the situation. Otherwise Daku the Anai tribe also needs to migrate to Anya's swamp. I know. Don't worry. I will take care of it. Serdak sat on a bench at the front and comforted the old patriarch. The indigenous women outside the workshed brought in some warm water soaked in mint leaves. And a little lemon was added to the water, which tasted pretty good. Other indigenous chiefs entered the workshed one after another. Everyone whispered to each other and discussed the incident in aboriginal language. There were a large number of young indigenous people surrounding the workshed. Almost all the aboriginal chiefs in Invercargill Forest gathered here. The young aborigines at the mine could not remain indifferent. Everyone was crowded outside the work shed. The aboriginal mine manager stood outside the work shed and organized the young aborigines to sit on the ground. He came forward tell everyone to be quiet. The open space outside the work shed was almost full of young indigenous people. After the 37 indigenous chiefs gathered, Serdak stood up from the bench, supported the table with both hands, knocked on the table gently, and said, Dear clan leaders, I know it is not easy for you to come to the mining camp despite your busy schedule. At the same time, I would like to thank you for your continued support of the Invercargill territory. Now the mine is basically able to operate normally. And the miners here are basically able to operate normally. They are all young people from various tribes. Every one of them is very outstanding. They work almost hard in the mine without complaining. They have never complained to me. The place to live is poor. The food is poor. And the salary is low less time to rest. When I came to the mine, I have been working hard and without complaint. Here, I want to make it clear to all the tribal young people that they have overturned my superficial understanding of tribal people. These words made the work shed become silent, and all the indigenous chiefs were listening carefully to Suldek's speech. The eyes of the natives who had mastered the imperial language suddenly brightened when they heard Lord Suldek's affirmation of the young people in the tribe. Serdek knocked on the table hard and said loudly, However, Due to the limited scale of the mine itself, you should have seen that I only customize three sets of refining furnaces. The copper or that these furnaces can consume every day is fixed. That is, even if I have more miners, the actual amount there is no way to smelt the mine copper or into copper ingots. The upper limit for recruiting miners in this copper mine is 2,500. Once these numbers are exceeded, the copper mine will actually have no need for them. So please ask the tribe leaders to restrain the young people in the tribe a little. In fact, I hope that each tribe can develop a rotation list. Of course, I hope that the young people of the tribe can come to work in the mine. But now the scale of the mine is limited. So it is necessary clan leaders come to impose restrictions. I think the number of young people from each tribe who come to work in the mine should not exceed 60. If any tribe is willing to have too many young people come to the mine, then we can also implement a shift system. After hearing what Serdek said, the tribal chiefs, who had originally planned to complain to Serdak immediately expressed their hope that Serdak could relax the number of miners. Serdak waved his hand to signal everyone to quiet down, and then continued, As for the army and the territory, I actually hope to have a complete recruitment system. Neither can we swarm in like now, and everyone wants to serve in the army. 
nor do we want this enthusiasm to be extinguished. If there is no people are willing to join the army, my army now has almost more than 2,000 people. It can be more, even 3,000 people. If it is more, I am afraid it will not work. The weapons and equipment cannot keep up. A series of other benefits and benefits may not be able to keep up. Not on. Then when divided among each tribe, there are actually only about 60 people. I hope that each tribe leader can control this number. I hope that the number of young people from each tribe joining the army every year will be less than half of the number. I understand that if all the young people in the tribe leave, it will hinder the development of the tribe itself. So I hope that the recruitment of soldiers should be orderly and planned. Hearing that Serdak did not intend to keep all the young people in the tribe in the army, the indigenous chiefs, who were originally a little worried, felt relieved at this moment. Later, they wanted to complain to Soldak. But Serdak said directly, I know that there has just been a beast tied here, and this forest needs to recuperate. Now that there are fewer beasts, hunting may not be enough. Life in each tribe may be a little difficult, but you have everything in this forest. A large area of land is a wealth in itself, and each tribe can try to engage in animal husbandry. Malakom is a big businessman in Wilk City. I invited him here this time to discuss with everyone that he can buy a batch of yellow sheep on my behalf. Sardak turned to look at the merchant Malakom. Malakom, who was sitting aside, immediately understood and coughed, and then said to the chiefs of these indigenous tribes, each tribe will raise a few for the time being, about a thousand at a time. The birth rate of yellow sheep is very high. A ewe basically gives birth to two babies every three years. If more than half of the sheep flock is ewes, three the quantity can double every year. These indigenous chiefs almost clasped their fingers below before they realized that it was really. He immediately agreed with Serdak's proposal, thinking that he would soon have a large group of yellow sheep, and couldn't help but want to laugh out loud. Some tribal leaders even lamented in aboriginal language, who would have hunted if I had known that raising sheep was so profitable. In fact, Serdak wanted to remind them that it was actually more profitable to hunt warcraft. But after thinking about it, I swallowed these words back in my stomach. Chapter 9-11 Curiosity and Cats After receiving satisfactory answers, the tribal leaders left one after another with the food purchased from the mine market. But this craze has not completely cooled down, and many young indigenous people are unwilling to leave. The existing indigenous miners at the mine will continue to work, and the mine will no longer recruit new miners for a period of time. Serdak promised the clan leaders of each tribe that he would allocate the quotas for recruiting miners to each tribe at the turn of autumn and winter every year so that the young indigenous people left the mine with great expectations. Currently, Serdak's army temporarily maintains a strength of 3,000 troops, 1,500 heavy infantry, 1,000 mounted archers, and 500 heavy cavalry. When young indigenous people join the army, they are required to perform military service and do not receive monthly military pay. But these young natives can receive a small allowance. And every time they go out to perform a mission or fight, they can gain merit. If you accumulate 100 points of merit, you can exchange it for a gold coin. Therefore, in addition to actively participating in high-intensity training every day, the only thing these young indigenous people who have recently joined the army hope for is to be able to participate in field operations. However, the heavy armor and weapons worn by the 1,500 heavy infantry are still being customized, and all infantry are undergoing intensive training in the garrison camp. Only the cavalry and archers were out on duty. Samira has been leading 18 Thunder Rhinoceros frequently between the copper mines and the canyons in the northern part of the forest recently. She is obviously more interested in making money than participating in battles. In order to prevent the few old iron trees buried under moss and dead leaves in the forest from being stolen, she not only left 800 archers in the northern canyon forest, but also borrowed 200 cavalry from the Andrew Cavalry Battalion. It was also deployed on the northern border of Invercargill Forest and patrolled around the valley all day long. Samira's idea was simple, just to transport the ironwood out as soon as possible. But there were a lot more ironwood buried under the leaf mold in the forest than she expected. When Serdak and his party passed through this forest area before, they only saw some ironwood exposed on the surface and covered with a layer of moss. When Samira transported the old ironwood exposed on the surface of the forest to Doden Town in sections, she discovered that a lot of ironwood was hidden deep in the soil of the forest. Some of the ironwood was even related to the roots of the trees in the forest, entangled together, due to its non-perishable nature. The ironwood has been buried in the soil for countless years. Now only the surface has rotted away, but the ironwood inside is quite well preserved. 
These ironwoods have been buried in the forest for so many years under moss and leaf mold. And now they are finally exposed to the light of day. Samira was worried that once Thunder Rhino transported a large amount of iron wood, it would definitely attract the attention of some interested people. She doesn't want the iron wood to be stolen. Saldak also returned to the northern border of Invercargill Forest. He came here not to transport back the iron wood buried in the forest, but to wander around the south bank of the mountain stream with a group of cavalry every day. He is currently paying attention to his neighbor in the north of his territory. The once-a-decade beast tide fills him with a sense of urgency. If this dark insect valley cannot be conquered within ten years, then his territory will be trampled by an army of thousands of red ants. The ground was raised to the ground. If that is the case, long-term investment will not be possible here. He has been wondering for the past few days whether he can use this mountain stream to build a new line of defense. This forest with dense foliage is located in the northern part of Invercargill Forest. It is only separated from the Dark Worm Valley by a deep mountain stream. Occasionally, one or two ghost striped red ants will appear. Perhaps it was because of the level 4 Warcraft Dark Bat. The local natives only knew that this forest area was dangerous, and they were usually reluctant to come here. The mountain stream in the northern part of the forest almost completely separates the Invercargill Forest and the Dark Worm Valley. Although the ghost striped red ants are good at climbing cliffs, they are very afraid of water. There is an endless river below the mountain stream. It is this river that separates the red ants from heading south. It is said that when an animal tide breaks out, the ant colony wants to cross this mountain stream. Countless soldier ants hug together and build a bridge that connects to the other side of the river. When Samira followed Serdak to the south bank of the mountain stream, she also saw some dried corpses of ghost striped worker ants on the cliff at the bottom of the valley. Many worker ants were tightly packed together and hung on the stone wall, but the bridges composed of their bodies were completely broken. Occasionally, some corpses of ghost striped red ants fall into the valley below the mountain stream, and the only sound of the river flowing can be heard. The last time Serdak came here, the indigenous warriors of the Dakuni tribe took him across this mountain stream, but they did not venture into the Dark Worm Valley at that time. Ever since the three level four monsters entrenched in the Invercargill Forest were hunted down by Soldek's army. There were no monsters in the forest that could threaten the adventure group. Everyone knows that Invercargill Forest is full of treasures. After the beast tide ended, there were very few low-level monsters left in the forest, and many of them had migrated back from Anya's swamp. But during this period, a large number of adventure groups rushed into the forest before winter, and almost all the monsters in the forest were hunted by the adventure groups. There is no room for the monsters to survive in this forest. And because of this, the adventure group's footsteps are heading towards the north of the forest little by little. A large number of adventure groups came to the south bank of the mountain stream in Invercargill Forest near the edge of the Dark Worm Valley, and finally stopped. The members of the adventure group discovered that what stood in front of them was not only a deep stream, but also a poisonous mist that could hardly be dispersed in the valley opposite, as well as those ghost-striped red ants that were infested in the poisonous mist. Across the mountain stream, we can see ghost-striped red ants moving in the dense forest. They would hardly leave the woodlands filled with poisonous fog, let alone cross the rapid river valleys at the bottom of the mountain streams. Across the bank, I saw that there were many ghost-striped red ants infesting the woodland opposite, and many adventure groups did not want to return empty-handed. At this time, some members of the adventure group showed their wild imagination. They began to secretly build several iron ropes leading to the north bank on the south bank of the mountain stream in the northern part of the Invercargill Forest. Then these adventure groups embarked on a unique hunting trip on the bank of the mountain stream. That is to say, various baits are used to introduce the ghost-marked red ants in the poisonous fog into the forest. And then, they are killed one by one. They peeled off the hard skin of the red ants and hung them on a tree to dry. They took out the magic core from the skull and put it in their pockets. Originally, many adventure groups had begun to think of leaving because there were no more monsters to hunt in the Warcraft forest. However, an adventure group discovered the business opportunities here. So many adventure groups began to gather towards the northern part of the forest. In Belan in October, and magic materials appeared again in the markets of the Copper Mine and Duod in town. The night sky in Invercargill Forest is full of stars, and several members of the adventure group are sitting in the camp chatting. They set up several tents under a rock cliff and have been hunting ghost-striped red ants on the other side of the mountain stream for the past few days. Outside the tents, the rock walls and branches are covered with the hard carapace of red ants. Don't dare to camp too close to the red ants. This rock cliff requires climbing over a mountain ridge to reach the mountain stream further north. 
Such harvest days always make people feel happy. The weather has started to get colder. And you can feel the biting wind blowing in through the gaps in the tent at night. Even if you get into your sleeping bag, the cold wind can still hit your face. The leader of the adventure group has already begun to calculate the departure date. He does not want to wait until the first snow falls before leaving. Otherwise the road in the mountain forest may become more difficult. The adventure group has gained quite a lot in recent days. And the members are feeling a little relaxed. The weather here is a bit cold. In addition to fatty food and spicy food, fruit wine is also something that can ward off the cold. After dinner, several members gathered around the campfire and took turns drinking a glass of fruit wine from a shared wine glass. When chatting, there are always people who like to brag, so as to liven up the atmosphere of the chat. Tonight's topic is, what is on the other side of the mountain? From the boundary marker, everyone knows that the mountain is the northernmost boundary of Viscount Saldak's territory in Invercargo Forest. What makes everyone curious is that in this mountain forest, wooden boards are nailed at every intersection into the mountain, and two lines of words are written on them in imperial and aboriginal languages. Private property. No one allowed to enter. In fact, if I didn't write these words, the slopes in this barren mountain would be the most difficult to walk on. There are thickets of thorns. Thorns, vines and shrubs everywhere among the tall trees. Maybe the members of the adventure group would not easily go there to solve their personal problems. Lin Z. They will worry about those thorns accidentally pricking their buttocks. But there are always those wooden boards near the boundary markers. Although the words on the wooden boards were clearly written and their meanings were straightforward. In the eyes of adventurers, the words were more like, Come in quickly. It's very mysterious here. Now the members of this adventure group are discussing this issue after drinking some fruit wine. Every time I pass by that creek, I always see that board. And I wonder, what's hidden inside? You know, the copper mines don't even have such warning signs. A young ranger tore his hands apart. He whispered while eating the roasted red ant meat. What exactly did you say they transported back to Doden Town? A shield warrior sitting opposite put down the whetstone in his hand, inserted the polished one-handed sword back into the leather scabbard, and began to check the belt buckle behind the shield. In the adventure group, he was mainly responsible for blocking attacks. When the red ants came up, he wanted to ensure that there would be no problems with the weapons and armor. Sneak in and take a look and you'll find out. A skinny ranger with a shiny beard on his lips said frivolously. The skinny ranger has the most outstanding appearance in this adventure group. The leather armor he usually wears is also very elegant. He also has two long legs that allow him to run extremely fast. His archery skills are not outstanding. But his mind is flexible. He is always responsible for the most important exploration tasks in the adventure group. And every night... I can always get an appointment with the only female swordsman in the group. This makes everyone a little dissatisfied with him privately. Isn't it just that his face is a little paler? The female swordsman picked out a steaming red ant leg from the bonfire, used the long sword in her hand to pry open the hard sh. L. Picked out the snow white and tender red ant meat inside, and handed it to the skinny ranger intimately. Although she is not very beautiful, this adventure group has not returned to Duodan Town for more than two months. In everyone's eyes, all her shortcomings are automatically ignored. In this wilderness, some people may not care about gender even if they have breasts and butts. The group members sitting under the bonfire couldn't help but feel their Adam's apple twitching. And then the glasses of fruit wine they passed around became less fragrant. Just take a look and take a look! The shield warrior muttered something in his mouth, then raised his head and looked at the night sky. There seems to be no moon tonight. If we sneak in, take a look and come back. No one will know, the shield warrior said again. However, the young ranger looked at the group leader, who was sitting silently by the campfire, and whispered, It's better not to go. The mountain road is not easy to walk at night. And it's so late now. Isn't there going to be hunting for reds tomorrow? And the leader looked up at the young ranger. But everyone's curiosity has been aroused. It was the young ranger who said these words. Who cares what he thinks? Let's go and have a look. Maybe if there is a gold mine in there, we can even pick up gold. Maybe there is an entrance to an ancient ruin hidden. As long as we can pick up a rune tablet, we won't have to take risks again in this life. Several members encouraged each other and stood up from the campfire. Although the skinny ranger didn't want to go, he was now interested and put the long leather boots that were roasting by the fire back on his feet. The group of people crossed the boundary marker and sneaked into the territory of Viscount Soldek. This feeling of sneakiness would make your heart beat faster, and your whole body could not help but tremble. During the day, 
several members of the adventure group always passed by this boundary monument, although they did not enter the depths of the dense forest. The situation near the entrance of the forest road was still relatively familiar. Enter the woodland and walk along the hillside. Under the darkness of night, you can see some huge thunder rhinoceros footprints in the forest road. When thunder rhinoceros steps on the soft leaf soil, it will always leave relatively deep footprints. These footprints can be made into traps. Just insert a sharp thorn needle underneath. Cover it with dead leaves and soil. And step in, and the sole of the foot will be pierced. Several people walked along the forest road. One step deep and one shallow. Until they reached the top of the slope. But they didn't find anything special. However, the skinny ranger soon discovered something different. He stood in the darkness and quickly called to his other companions. Come here quickly. Over here. The adventure group ran over quickly. Followed the slender ranger. Climbed over the top of the slope. And arrived at the southern slope of the forest. The scene in front of me suddenly changed. Many places on the slope had been dug up. When I got closer, I realized that there was nothing inside. A group of adventure group members. You look at me. I look at you. Go further inside, the shield warrior said in a low voice. There was silence all around, which made the young ranger feel uneasy. He put his hand on the thin ranger's shoulder and whispered, I think it's better to forget it. Be careful there may be traps in the woods. The shield warrior pushed the young ranger away with his strong chest and said in a very disgusting tone, I wonder why you are so cowardly. You are still not a ranger. I just don't have that strong curiosity. I only want to hunt ghostmarked red ants here, and I don't want to get into trouble. The young ranger said truthfully. The shield warrior ignored him and whispered to the slender ranger. Randy, what do you say? Can you help us avoid those traps? Perhaps the drunkenness had not dissipated, or perhaps the pits dug in the forest had irritated him. The skinny ranger immediately puffed up his chest and promised. Follow me and you'll be fine. Okay, okay, let's go. The shield warrior urged. Chapter 9 12 Arrows in the Night Sky An indigenous archer hiding in a tree took advantage of the darkness to see these adventure group members sneaking into the territory passing through the forest. He stood on the horizontal branch at the top of the tree, held the hunting bow behind him in his hand, drew the bow and knocked the arrow, and aimed at the person walking at the front in the dark. He hesitated slightly and moved the arrow tip forward. Whoosh! An arrow flew past the skinny ranger and stabbed firmly into a tree in front of skinny ranger Randy. The tip of the arrow penetrated deeply into the tree trunk, and the tail feathers of the arrow trembled gently in the night wind. Randy gasped in fright, and his heart almost popped out of his throat. The other members of the adventure group quickly hid behind the tree. Randy also lay on the ground and waited for a few seconds. He did not dare to move at this time, hoping that the black coat on his body would give him enough protection. The shield warrior stared at the direction in which the arrow was flying, and subconsciously touched it with his big round shield. There were five of them in total and they had already cooperated very well with each other. The other members could only follow them and cover both sides of the shield warrior. Slender Ranger chased after him, trying to pull his teammates back. The native archer on the tree shouted in the imperial language that he was not very proficient in. Who is it? Seeing the dark shadows in the woods moving vaguely towards him, the native archers immediately shouted nervously. You have broken into Viscount Soldak's private territory. If you go further, we will shoot you. I ask you to stop immediately. After saying that, he shot another arrow at the shield warrior's feet. The arrow stuck into the soil. The shield warrior pursed his lips, spit out a mouthful of smear, and wanted to continue rushing forward with the shield on his back. Slender Ranger Randy caught up from behind, held his shoulders, and shouted in a low voice, Let's go. The shield warrior wanted to rush forward, but was forcefully pulled back by the Slender Ranger, and they quickly ran towards the way they came. Stop. If anyone tries to run away, we will shoot him immediately. The native archer shouted as he drew the bow string again. This time he aimed at a black figure in the forest. After hesitating, he shot the arrow at the tree trunk. The shield warrior felt the cool breeze on his neck. The arrow just flew past his neck, almost scaring him to the point of peeing. With red eyes, he wanted to turn around and fight back. Slender Ranger Randy held his arm tightly and said quickly, Don't worry about them. Let's go quickly. If they catch up, I'll let them have a taste of the trap. The swordsman behind also quickly grabbed the shield warrior, and the five of them quickly dived into the dense forest. Several archers emerged from the forest behind the indigenous archers. They were also secret sentries on duty in the forest. When they heard there was movement here, they immediately ran over to support. 
The archers who came over were walking quickly through the forest. They were very familiar with this forest, and they quickly surrounded it from the left and right sides. When the shield warrior saw a group of people chasing after him, he gritted his teeth and asked Ranger Randy. They really caught up with him. What should we do? Ranger Randy rushed to the front. At this time, he could only stop and take the hardwood bow in his hand. His archery skills were not outstanding. So he fired back with one or two arrows just to prevent the pursuers from following him. Whoosh. There was a muffled groan and the sound of branches snapping in the distance. Someone fell in the forest. The swordsman following behind exclaimed, Hurry up. I think I'm hit. Ranger Randy wanted to slap himself. He wanted to stop and see what the unlucky guy shot by his arrow looked like. The next moment, he felt like a ferocious beast emerging from the forest behind him. The cold killing intent even made him tremble while running. A sharp sound of breaking through the air came from behind Ranger Randy. The swordsman beside him looked back and saw an arc of electricity flying over from the forest and then passed over everyone's heads. The moment the electric arc flew by, the entire forest was illuminated brightly and Ranger Randy and the members of the adventure group were all exposed to the strong light of the electric arc. What is that? The swordsman running behind, panting, asked Ranger Randy, Lightning. Ranger Randy said casually. As soon as he finished saying this, he felt a sharp pain in his back. The pain was so painful that he couldn't breathe. His feet fell softly, and he fell into the woods, feeling numb all over his body. Ranger Randy's eyes widened. He wanted to shout to his companions. Don't worry about me. Run away. He couldn't do it. He fell to the ground, unable to get up. He wanted to see the other members behind him. But the moment he turned his head, Two swordsmen running out from behind were hit by arrows and fell to the ground. When the young ranger saw his companion fall, he stopped quickly and wanted to carry one of his companions away. However, he saw Randy, the ranger behind him, staring at him and shouting hoarsely to him, Hurry up! Unfortunately, it was too late. The fifth arrow with electric arc flew out and was accurately inserted into the back of his neck. The sharp arrow tipped past through the back of the neck and turned out from the throat in front. The young ranger put his hands on his throat and his eyes widened. He struggled to turn over and lie on his back, but failed to do so. His whole body froze completely in the forest, and his body lost all vitality. All five people from this adventure group who came to explore the forest at night fell down in the forest. Not long after, Samira caught up from behind with a sky strike bow. After briefly checking the identities of the five people who sneaked into the forest, she realized that they should be members of a nearby adventure group. She said to her subordinates, who were following behind her, Carry them all over. Dig a bigger hole and bury them. Serdak only got the news, and came over when he started filling soil on the body. It's not a big mistake to break into the territory. They don't have to die. Serdak stood next to the pit, looked at the corpse, patted his forehead helplessly, and said to Samira, Half-elf archer Samira looked up at Serdak, and said in a hoarse voice, They killed my people. Then she jumped slightly in front of Soldak and asked him, If one day I am killed by the enemy on the battlefield, will you avenge me? Serdak admitted, Probably so. I also want to give an explanation to my archers. It doesn't seem like too much to shoot them all. Samira narrowed her eyes and said to Serdak, The two stopped talking about the matter and trespassed into the Lord's private property and were shot dead by guards, which echoed imperial law. Serdak returned to the woodland here from the northern border of the forest at night. Samira knew that he was going to the other side of the canyon to study the ghost strike red ants in the forest on the other side of the valley. So she asked him, Have you gained anything this time? Serdak shook his head first, and then said, I heard that the indigenous elders of the tribe said that every winter the poisonous mist outside the dark warm valley in the north becomes extremely thin, but the activities of ghost strike red ants will be correspondingly frequent, and there will be other monsters. Even so, it is still exploring the best season in the Dark Worm Valley. We're going to maybe go to the Underworld Worm Valley this winter. After speaking, Serdak walked forward. Chapter 913 Plastic Sisters The camp established by Serdak on the canyon slope in the northern part of the territory is right next to the cave where the fourth-level gloom bats are hunted. The indigenous archer who was accidentally shot by Ranger Randy was lying on a stretcher. An arrow shot through his chest. Blood frothed at the corner of the indigenous archer's mouth and his face was as pale as paper. Serdak squatted next to the stretcher. Holy light burst out from his palms. And a ball of golden holy light fell on the chest of the indigenous archer. The arrow came out from his back 
and had been cut off by Serdak with his dagger. With this ray of holy light falling, Serdak reached out and decisively pulled out the arrow. The double-faced, four-armed demon statue emerged, and the blessed body fell on the indigenous archer, and his breath gradually calmed down. Samira next to Soldak glanced at her and reached out to ruffle her scattered hair, wearing tight-fitting salamander leather armor. Samira was like a quiet cat, squatting next to Serdak. Although she has been promoted to a second-level powerhouse, she is also a young half-elf. She just came out of Wazimra City in the Maka Plain not long ago. Before that, she was still a young half-elf in Wazimra City. A local guide who is also a thief always likes to steal tourists' wallets in order to feed the children in the shelter. She was even willing to climb the city wall and shoot the hateful H, L dogs below. She never lacked courage to face life. But her disregard for life gradually formed after she became a strong person. He waved his hand and asked the onlooking archers to carry the wounded back to the camp. Everyone has a strong curiosity, especially when his skills give him strong self-confidence and he will ignore the law. It is understandable that they are curious about this place. This sentence seems to be talking about those people. The dead members of the adventure group seemed to be talking about Samira. The half-elf archer blinked his red eyes and said nothing. Soldak stretched out his hand to pull Samira up, pushed open the wooden house and walked in, poured a glass of wine and handed it to her, and said, They may have thought of stealing, but if they just understand the simple idea, they will not if action is taken. We can only warn of expulsion. You can't just assume someone is a rapist just because he looks at you, he added, biting the rim of the wine glass with her soft lips tasting the spicy and slightly sour fruit wine. Samira sat on a wooden stool near the window. Now that Invercargill Forest has become my territory, many things must be judged by standards. Now that you are in charge of an archer battalion, you have more responsibilities. You must establish correct codes of conduct for those archers. We have no the method is to kill all those who are hostile to us. At least the laws of the Green Empire do not allow it. And that will also plunge us into endless wars. And sometimes deterrence is also a means of retreating the enemy. Serdak put the golden cider back on the wooden shelf, turned around and said, He has built several large wooden houses in this forest area. The walls of these wooden houses are very thick, and there are earthen stoves built in the rooms that can be used for heating and cooking. At least this can allow the soldiers to resist the cold in the harsh winter. Serdak planned to build a military camp here. So the wooden houses built here were built according to barrack standards. Malakam has sent the crossbows and catapults to Doden Town. This time, I want to go back and find a way to transport those ordnance here. You stay here and stare at the group of ghost-marked red ants opposite. And at the same time, try to give those adventure groups some conveniences. Serdak lit a lantern in the room. He hung the lantern on the hook on the ceiling. And the room suddenly lit up. Looking back, he said earnestly to the half-elf beauty under the light. They are hunting ghost-striped red ants on the south bank of the mountain stream which is definitely a good thing for us. If the mines and the army had not continued to invest a lot of money recently, I would even want to provide a financial subsidy to these adventurous groups. It's better to create a reward list and set the adventure group that hunts the most ghost-marked red ants each month to receive a reward. We will only award it to the top three. It shouldn't cost much. Sammy Law helped Serdak come up with ideas. Serdak nodded repeatedly and said with a smile, This is a good idea. The reward can also be a magic pattern. Anyway, there are rumors that there is a great alchemist behind me who is secretly supporting me. I'm afraid this is no secret. Samira narrowed her light red eyes and whispered. I'm a little looking forward to what kind of actions those adventure groups will take after they hear about this reward. Samira, you must remember that our enemies are not the adventurous groups who are hunting red ants for a living on the south bank of the mountain stream, but the ants on the opposite side who want to compete with us for land and all resources. Serdaka sat opposite Samira and said to him again, I know. I know it's long-winded. Samira was like an agile leopard, swooping out of the window. Eighteen thunder rhinoceros loaded with a batch of iron would walk south along the forest road in a mighty manner. In the early morning, a light mist surged in the forest. In the mist, the trees in this forest where the leaves were gradually withering and turning yellow were looming. There is no need to worry about these thunder rhinoceros getting lost in the forest. The leading thunder rhinoceros only needs to keep walking along the 10 meter wide forest road. And the exit is not too far from the north exit of Duodan Canyon. Serdak stood on the platform on the back of thunder rhinoceros and waved goodbye to Samira, who climbed to the top of the tree. Are you going to build a military camp here? Aphrodite pushed open the door of the wooden house on the platform, walked out of it, 
and asked Soldak looking at the hillside in the morning mist. Well, I'm going to move the northern defense line of the occupied area of Belan Plain here. The report has been sent to the Great Swords Manchester. He smiled at Aphrodite and said, I always have to take a look inside the warm valley to the north. Aphrodite took off the mithril mask on her face, reached out and stroked the crossbow on the platform, and reminded Soldak, As long as you don't think that the Ant Queen in the Insect Valley will meet the Bee's Tide, as long as the young Ant Queens, who have not lost their wings, have the same strength and means, there will not even be any comparison between them. The one in the Worm Valley is just the strongest one among the millions of Ant Queens and the queens we met in the tide have not even reached maturity yet. After hearing Aphrodite's warning, Serdak suddenly felt that he had taken this northern expedition a little lightly. He thought that black gunpowder was being prepared in the village of Wall, and asked Aphrodite, How are the black powder preparations over at Wall Village? Aphrodite said, The first batch of gunpowder has arrived at the sulfur mine camp. That's why I came here. It's too dry there. If there is a slight open flame, the batch of black gunpowder might be detonated. We still need to transport it here from the sulfur mining camp in advance. When Serdak heard what Aphrodite said, he felt that this succubus had already regarded Pussy Mountain as its home. Then he promised, Okay, I will transfer as soon as possible. Aphrodite asked, Why are we in such a hurry? Isn't it going to take ten years? If we were allowed to wait a year, the situation here would be much better. Serdak shook his head, and then said, I inquired about the whereabouts of Viru. I heard that he led an indigenous tribe northward to trace the footprints of the indigenous ancestors into the far north, to find the ancestors of the indigenous people and build a foundation for them. A shelter to rise up. Now the dark worm valley is lying here, blocking our exploration to the north. We must try to eradicate it. I think that after the ant tide ends, the dark worm valley will also be in a period of decline. Only by taking this opportunity can we go deep into the depths of the worm valley, Serdek said. Then he added, In addition, the army has now expanded to 3,000 people, which is much larger than ever before. To maintain the army's fighting will, the ghost marked red and here are a good choice. Serdak looked to the north, but his sight was blocked by a high mountain ridge. He continued, The soldiers in the army need the ghost pattern soldier ant inscriptions, even for those strength and resilience magic patterns. I will continue to fight against these ghost pattern red ants. Do they think the retreat of the insect grain beast tide is over? It's not that simple. It's up to them to decide when this battle starts. But it's up to us to decide when it ends. As long as I can continue to gain benefits from this war, I will continue to fight until I completely overthrow this worm valley. Aphrodite suddenly felt that the light in Serdak's eyes was as sharp as a sword. In preparation for this war, Serdak not only prepared a large amount of black powder in Wall Village, but also bought a batch of crossbows and catapults from Merchant Malacom. Unfortunately, he could not buy more powerful magic cannons. A ray of sunlight penetrated the fog and shone on Serdak's body. The thunder rhinos slowly crossed the mountains. There is already a patch of white frost on the grass outside the town of Doden, which indicates that winter is coming soon. Selina opened the window and let the cold morning breeze blow in. She hugged the quilt and leaned against the window, and her exposed round shoulders instantly became cold. She quickly retracted her body, put on a knitted sweater and a long black skirt, rearranged her long hair, and put on warm deerskin boots. She had to go to the market in the town early. She didn't even have a window. Water splashed under the river, and her blue scales showed dark red. The weather was so cold that the river was reluctant to flow. Fortunately, the river surface had not frozen yet. Winter is coming soon. Jana, the mermaid, was shivering with cold in the river. She quickly got into the temporary nest under the wooden house, quickly got out of the river, picked up a bath towel from the clothes hanger on the wooden wall, and wrapped it in it. On the body, the huge fishtail swung twice and dived into the warm bathtub that was slightly steaming. In order to accommodate this good friend, Zigna and Nika have spent a lot of time recently. The girls even asked Ong San to build a brand new underwater room under the wooden house in the name of Serdek. Half of this room is deep into the river, and the other part is exposed above the river, and is connected with Selena's room. The riverside wooden houses are connected together. It looks and feels like a basement with a gently sloping floor that extends down to the river. There is a heater and a large bathtub in this basement. This is a small nest specially built for Jana Mermaid. There is also a stove under the big bathtub that can be used for heating. Jana, the mermaid lay in the warm fish tank and closed her eyes under the steam. There was a knock on the door. Sia raised her ears and listened carefully. 
Then she raised her hand and shot out a stream of water. The stream of water was like a flexible ribbon, curling in the air and shooting at the door bolt. The door bolt was hit by the water stream, pushed open. The wooden door was pushed open from the outside. The two young faces of Zygna and Nika were revealed at the door, seeing the mermaid Sia soaking in the bathtub. The two girls breathed a sigh of relief and walked hand in hand into the dark and damp wooden house. When I passed the river bend this morning, there was a thin layer of ice near the shore, Nika said, carrying a bag of wheat cakes and placing it on the shelf next to it. She glanced at Shia with some worry and said, I'm afraid it will become more and more mountainous in the future, and the entire river will freeze. Don't worry. You can stay here forever, Zygna said nonchalantly. Nika said with a somewhat tangled expression. We are going to the temple too. I'm afraid I won't be able to stay with you here during the day. I will add a lock outside this room to prevent anyone from breaking in. We don't know who can help you. I asked some rich people in the town. When faced with a homeless Janissee tribe, their first thought is always to take you as their own or sell it to a slave owner. Probably no one will be willing to put you back into the sea. After all, the sea is simply too far away for the people here, Mika said. She did ask some people in town recently, and she didn't even say, both of which sounded more reliable. Some people simply said bluntly that there is almost no seafood here in Duoden town. If you can meet a Jana mermaid, you can grill it and try it, or you can make a specimen while you are young and beautiful and hang it on the ceiling of the living room. However, Signa did not have so many worries and said directly to Thea, If we want to rescue you, first we have to save some money, and then we have to have an excuse to escape. The most important thing is that we have to find a place with the sea. The girls were a little worried, and the room suddenly became quiet. How about we discuss it with Dak? Signa suggested. He is the sheriff of the desolate land and the lord of the Invercargill Forest. I think this matter is not difficult for him. Nika thought of Suldak's serious face and asked Zygna in embarrassment. What should we do if he doesn't want to help us? Zygna blinked and said quickly. We can ask him first. If he has such thoughts, we should not talk about Thea. I heard that he will be back soon. Because of the Twin Goddess Temple, there will be a celebration ceremony soon. He is the mayor of Duodan Town. And he must come back for this kind of thing. Nika whispered softly. You know, he is my master. And I don't want to deceive him in anything. I know. I'll go find him and tell him. Zygna's dark eyes were like the silent night. Chapter 914 Junior Warrior Academy The Two Goddess Temple in the town has been built. Recently, the focus of conversations among the residents of the town has always been around the Two Goddess Temple. This is a rare major event since the establishment of Doden Town, and it is destined to be recorded in the annals of the town. To this end, Doden Town is preparing to hold a grand celebration ceremony. However, until now, the town hall has not come up with a feasible plan, nor has it announced the specific day on which the celebration ceremony will be held. The residents of the town have not seen Mayor Soldak for at least more than a month since the beast tide subsided, in addition to seeing him on the construction site of the small townhouse a few times. It is said that he also personally inspected twice during the construction process of the Twin Goddess Temple. The back garden of the temple is his decided to expand. Regarding the mayor, the residents of the town hold two extreme views on him. Those who love him can't wait to talk about his achievements every day. Of course, there are also many people who make no secret of their disgust for him. This the group of people are almost all imperial immigrants. Nobles, merchants, etc. Mrs. Luna has been a little anxious recently. As the mayor, Soldak has been away from the town recently. And many things are waiting for his signature to take effect. Now Duodan Town has undergone almost earth-shaking changes compared to half a year ago. In the past, nothing happened in the town for a month. But now the daily chores in the town are almost overwhelming. No news yet? Tax Officer Butra opened the door and asked Mrs. Luna sitting in the office. Mrs. Luna put down the quill in her hand and could only say, I heard from the merchant who came back from Invercargill Forest that he is on his way back. Tax Collector Butra also has many things that Serdek needs to make decisions about. Taxes in Doden Town have continued to rise recently, and the taxes in the Treasury have been increasing. According to Seldak, only a certain amount of tax money needs to be stored in the Treasury. This amount only needs to be able to pay the salaries of all public officials in the town for six months. And a part of the reserve fund for emergency plans needs to be stored. The rest of the money needs to be only by investing in the urban construction of Doden Town can the town achieve long-term development. Now there are more and more gold coins piled up in the vault. 
during the time when Serdak was no longer in the town. Almost no one came to him for money. Looking at the gold coins that were about to be piled up in the warehouse, Tax Officer Butra couldn't help but feel a little worried. The mayor is back. A young clerk ran in from the corridor and reported to Butra Tax Officer. Where is it? Tax Officer Butra suddenly stood up and was about to walk out. His eyes filled with excitement and joy. The secretary touched his nose and whispered awkwardly. The mayor just arrived at the military camp in a thunder rhinoceros. Go and prepare the magic caravan. I'll go find him at the military camp. Tax officer Butra didn't stop at all and ran out of the corridor quickly. Butra's tax collector's assistant quickly followed him and ran outside together. When he arrived at the military camp, he saw that Serdak was directing a group of people to carry some heavy goods wrapped in linen into the warehouse. The tax officer Butra didn't care what they were carrying and walked quickly to Serdak. Before. Mayor Soldak, how long has it been since you went to the town hall? Tax officer Butra complained and then said, there are many documents in the town that require your signature. And those decrees signed by Mrs. Luna will not be effective at all. Serdak stopped and turned around, staring at Tax Officer Butra, and asked strangely, But shouldn't Mrs. Luna come to me personally for this kind of thing? Or do you two have overlapping government affairs? Hey, I just said it casually. Tax Officer Butra immediately tightened his belly and straightened his chest, and said with a serious face, Mayor, now the tax office in the town receives a lot of tax money every day. I always want to, as you have explained before. This money needs to be spent. And it is best spent on the urban construction of the town. So? Serdak waved his hand to the Thunder Rhinoceros to leave directly after unloading the cargo. Tax officer Butra immediately said, Waiting for you to establish the project. Serdak patted his head, held the tax officer's shoulders, and said to the tax officer in front of Thunder Rhinoceros, I'm looking for you. I plan to build a junior warrior academy in Doden Town. You go find someone. Do a budget and see how much it's going to cost the town. Tax collector Butra asked in surprise. Are you planning to build a warrior academy? Serdak nodded and said, Junior college. Whether it is imperial immigrants or aboriginals, it has always been a troublesome thing for children to go to school in this town. I plan to build a junior college in Doden Town, which can at least teach them something. Basic fighting skills. The address was chosen next to the river bank opposite the twin goddess temple. Serdak added later. Tax officer Butra immediately saluted Serdak in high spirits and replied cheerfully. I will take care of this matter right away. He left these words and hurriedly left the military camp. In fact, Serdak wanted to discuss some other things with tax officer Butra. But before he could finish speaking, tax officer Butra had already run out of sight. Soldak stayed at the military camp for a while listening to the captain of the City Defense Brigade reporting on the recent defense situation of the North City Wall, and then hearing about the recent situation of the Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment, and then ran to the supplies outside the military camp, warehouse, to inspect the crossbows and catapults that Merchant Malacom brought from San Carlos City. When the warehouse manager heard Serdak ask about the batch of bed crossbows that had recently arrived in Doden Town, he immediately found a bunch of keys and led Serdak to the door of another warehouse. Open the iron lock and push open the warehouse door. The warehouse was filled with a strong smell of engine oil. Serdak saw that all the bed crossbows were wrapped in a thick layer of oil paper. He walked to a bed crossbow and used a dagger to cut it, trapped in thick hemp rope. Opening up the oil paper, there was a brand new crossbow inside. The bowstring was not installed on it, but there was no scratch on the crossbow arm. All the places with the worm gear and the anti-return ratchet were coated with a thick layer of white grease. The grooves of the crossbow arrows are also polished very smoothly. And three magic rune plates are nailed side by side to the crossbow body. This is the most distinctive feature of these magic bed crossbows. Businessman Malakom did not lie. These bed crossbows are all brand new. Then he opened the oil paper of a catapult. The catapult wrapped inside was also very exquisitely made and seemed to be really worth the money. Select a few randomly tomorrow. Roll them out and install them casually. I want to see the design effect and accuracy. Serdak ordered the warehouse manager who was following him. Yes. Commander. The warehouse manager quickly agreed. Chapter 915 Mermaid Misthea. After a busy day in the town, Serdak just ended a meeting at the town hall in the evening. Since he holds an important military and political position in a small town, he has endless things to deal with every day. Walking tiredly onto the wooden platform of the Riverside Wooden House. Soldak felt that the Riverside wooden house seemed a little different from before. He stopped and turned around the cabin. 
Only then did I realize that the pillars that were originally erected in the river under the platform of the wooden house were now covered with a thick layer of wooden boards. There was also a wooden step that was not too wide in the corner of the platform. And there was a building below. Wooden house in the water. It looks like a small dock. But on the Doden River, which can almost freeze in winter, it is not a wise move to build such a dock. However, Soldek also thought that in early summer, he could buy a small wooden boat and go rafting on the river. It felt very romantic when he thought about it. He leaned on the wooden railing of the platform with one hand and stretched his head to look down the wooden stairs. The stairs seemed very narrow, and there was actually a lock on the bottom door. Soldak held onto the fence of the platform, wanting to see if there were any small wooden boats below. Dak, what are you doing? Zigna's sweet voice sounded from behind Soldak. Soldak turned around and saw Cygna standing quietly at the top of the stairs, staring at him with dark eyes. The shipyard below was renovated by Selina and you together? Is there a ship there? Serdak asked curiously. Do you want to go in and take a look? Zigna asked with a sullen face, staring at Soldak. Of course. If you invite me? Serdak was a little curious. The stairs are a bit narrow. You have to be careful. Zigna moved the stairs out of the way and gestured to invite him in. Serdak was wearing hard leather armor. When he reached the top of the stairs, he stretched one foot inside and realized that the stairs were too narrow. If he wanted to walk in, he probably had to turn sideways. He stopped and said to Zigna, I shouldn't go yet. I'm worried that I will get stuck in the stairway. Serdak turned around and walked into the wooden house. As he walked, he asked Zigna behind him, What's in it? I guess it's a wooden boat. Zigna followed Serdak nimbly. She tilted her head and asked him, Duck, why did you leave Doden Town for so long? Soldak changed into a pair of soft shoes at the door of the wooden house, walked into the wooden house and sat in the living room, and said to Zigna, I am planning to build a copper mine in the Invercargill Forest. If I have the opportunity, I can take you there. Have a look. Zigna walked in, walked to the open restaurant, poured a glass of water for Soldak, and brought it in front of him. Soldak took the water glass and thought it was great to have such a well-behaved daughter. Dak, what do you think of the aliens? H.I.G. knelt on the chair opposite, holding the back of the chair with both hands, resting his pointed chin on it, with a trace of curiosity on his face. Serdak was slightly startled and said, I'm not sure what you are referring to. Meeting on the battlefield or meeting in peacetime? There may be two completely different results. He then added, If we meet on the battlefield, there is a high probability that we will be enemies, and I will kill them without hesitation. If we meet in the city, they will be either slaves or envoys. As long as they do not hinder me, I probably won't do anything. He felt a little hungry, touched his growling stomach, and said to Zygna, By the way, there will be a celebration ceremony organized by the Twin Goddess Temple tomorrow. Selina and Nika are both there. I'm so busy making the final arrangements. I'm afraid no one will prepare dinner for us. What should we have for dinner? Dak, do you like fish? Zygna asked with a serious expression. Serdak thought for a while and then said, It would be okay if there were no fish bones. You know I don't like to pick bones from those fish meat. Zygna paused for a moment, looking a little nervous, and then asked, Do you like big or small food? The big one. Serdak replied cheerfully. He felt that such questions and answers between the two parties could enhance mutual feelings. Zygna looked a little nervous and asked Soldak, Do you have any other requirements? For example, Color. Place of origin etc. Serdak patted his forehead and said, It is best to live in the sea. I don't like those in rivers. As for the color, it is best to be golden or red, such as large yellow croaker or red grouper. There will be more in the future. The opportunity will definitely take you to the beach. Maybe we can see the Janna Sea tribe there. Zygna lowered her head and asked after a while, Dak, how far are we from the sea? Soldak drank the last bit of water in the cup and then said, we must return to Wilk City from Doden Town. Return to Benna City through the portal. And then take the magic airship over there all the way east. I heard that there is a magic airship bound for Hayinsi City at the Benna City Airport Terminal. And it takes about half a month to fly to Hayinsi City. Is it so far? Zygna exclaimed with a disappointed look on her face. Serdak nodded and said, If you don't take the teleportation gate, it may be very far away. Benna Province is an inland city of the Empire. Why do you suddenly think of asking these questions? Nothing. I just want to see the sea. Zygna said hesitantly. Soldak thought for a while and said to Zygna, It may not be possible now. 
but there will always be a chance in the future. Then he stood up, took Zygna's little hand, and said, Let's go. I'll take you to the town to see if there is anyone selling sea fish here. One of my best dishes is pan-fried sea fish. Zygna immediately followed Suldak's footsteps. She simply didn't dare to ask any more questions. Serdak did not buy the kind of fish buried in ice and salt that Serdak expected. He took Zygna to have dinner at a newly opened restaurant in the town. Then the two of them went to the temple of the two goddess and waited for Selina and Nika to finish their work there before slowly returning to the riverside cabin together. The moonlight was like water, shining on the stone road in front of them. Zygna and Nika walked in front hand in hand. In just a few months, the two girls had become so close. You must know that Zygna is a very introverted girl and very defensive. She is not so easy to get along with. Back at the riverside cabin, he and Selina hadn't seen each other for a long time. So naturally they had a conversation and laid down on the soft big bed again. Soldak held a piece of soft fur in his hand, caressing Selina's smooth back, and couldn't help but express his doubts. When was a dock built down there? Selina curled up on the bed like a lazy Persian cat. She opened her eyes slightly and asked, What? You discovered our new neighbor too? New neighbor? Do you know that room? Soldak didn't quite understand why Selina said that. Selina sat up from the bed hugging the thick blanket. She was barefoot, and her two long legs were exposed from under the blanket. She quickly walked to the window and opened the curtains. From here, she could just see the platform. At the stairs leading to the wooden house below, she whispered. Well, Zygna and Nika asked Aung San to build a cabin under the wooden house. How could I not know? But I guess you would never have thought that we would have a cabin. New neighbors. Before Serdak could guess, Selina gave the answer. It's a mermaid with a fish tail and a human body. I have never seen such a beautiful body in scales. You mean the Janna mermaid lives in it? Serdak said with his eyes widened in surprise. Didn't you even go take a look? Selina asked strangely. Soldak scratched his head and said, Zygna told me that she owned a wooden house downstairs. They made the stairs of the wooden house so narrow that you could only squeeze in sideways. So I didn't go down to take a look. As he said that, he sat by the window and picked up the soft leather armor from the floor and quickly put it on. Selina was wrapped in a blanket and standing by the window. The moonlight poured into the room from her back, leaving clear shadows on the floor. Where are you going? Serdak replied, I plan to go see the Janna mermaid. It's so late. Selina reminded him angrily. Soldak immediately stopped and stood there awkwardly and said, Ha, huh, that's right. I'm just a little curious. Why is there a Janna Sea clan in the Belan Plain? If we go further east in the Three Rivers Plain, can we see the sea? How about we go together? In fact, I also really want to know. Selina moved closer to Serdak and encouraged. After getting dressed carefully and thoughtfully, they quietly walked out of the wooden house and walked to the stairs of the platform. Before they both walked down the stairs, they heard a childish voice from behind asking, Mom, Duck, where are you going? Serdak was startled. But Selina obviously had a better psychological quality. She turned to Zygna and said, Of course we want to visit your new friend. But it's so late. Zygna protested softly, Zygna, aren't you going to introduce your new friend to us? Selina asked standing at the top of the stairs. At this time, the wooden house under the stairs was pushed open by a pair of white and delicate hands. The mermaid Sia poked her head out of the wooden house and said apologetically to Selina and Soldak on the platform, I'm really sorry. I have been staying at your house and haven't taken the initiative to say H, low to you. It's really rude. Sia always seemed to be singing when she spoke, and the delicate face revealed from the door was so soft and beautiful. Before Selina could speak, Soldak looked at Sia in surprise and said, why is it you? Do you know each other? Selina asked doubtfully. Soldak touched his nose and explained to Selina. Well, I saw her twice in Wilk City. Oh no. It should be three times. The first time was at a private auction. I originally wanted to buy a group of dwarf slaves. And the last lot was this mermaid lady. The second time was on the arch bridge of the inland river in the northern part of Wilk City. I obtained the right to develop the Invercargill Monster Forest and was about to return to Doden Town. At that time, I saw this mermaid lady in the inland river. He was being chased by a group of guards. The third time was at the gate beside the moat at the north city gate. I was waiting to leave Wilk City at the city gate. There was a carriage blocked on the moat drawbridge. She was right next to the fence at the water outlet. I felt she shouldn't be locked up in that city and a magic dagger was thrown at her. 
I thought she might be able to swim into the sea if she wasn't caught back. But I didn't expect that she actually swam from the Wilkes River to the Doden River. Serdak recounted how they met. The mermaid Sia was also very surprised. She didn't expect to see the noble who saved her here. It turned out that he was still a lord. Thea blinked her beautiful blue eyes and wrapped the sacred bath towel a little tighter. She sat in the warm bathtub with a fire-gathering magic rune board spread under the bathtub. It is estimated that Zigna and Nika must have put a lot of thought into buying this metal rune plate. Thank you, Lord Soldak. If it weren't for you, I'm afraid I would have been captured by them that same day in Wilk City. Hey, Miss Sia, don't make any mistake. I just accidentally dropped a dagger into the moat. It has nothing to do with saving you. Of course, you don't need to thank me. But if you picked up that dagger, as for the dagger, can you return it to me if it's convenient? Of course. Although Sia was a little reluctant, she still returned the exquisite magic dagger to Soldak. Serdak took the dagger and put it back into the magic belt bag. Then he asked Miss Mermaid, I also want to know, if you went down the Wilkes River, shouldn't you have gone to the sea or a big lake? How did you end up here? Sia had an inexplicable liking for Serdak and answered truthfully. The end of the Wilkes River is a bottomless abyss. It's not a lake or ocean at all. I swam from that side and got lost in a dense canyon. I didn't expect that the river I chose would kill me. Bring it here. It turns out that the end of the Wilkes River is the bottomless abyss. Soldak did not expect such an answer. However, he is also very interested in the lower reaches of the Doden River. After all, one third of this large woodland north of the Thorny Mountains belongs to his territory. In addition to the Dark Worm Valley in the north, there is Anya in the west. Swamp. Of course, he also wanted to know what was downstream of the river. But he only knew that there was a large three river plain to the east of the Thorny Mountains. Listening to see his story about his adventure, Serdak couldn't help but exclaim, You mean there are a lot of monsters in these rivers? There are many monsters in the river downstream. So I hid here. Thea said truthfully. Miss Sia, thank you for bringing us so much precious information, Soldek said. Soldek and Selina looked at each other, and finally said, You have become friends with Zigna and Nika, so you can stay here temporarily, but you should try not to be discovered by other people in the town. Once your information is published, I'm afraid it will be difficult for me to protect you. Thank you, Lord Sardak. Chapter 916 Light and Darkness Celebrations are rarely held in the town of Doden. It's not as historic as Paina City or as populous as Wilk City. In fact, it is just an unknown border town in the occupied area in the northern part of the Belan Plain. The people here are immigrants from the Empire who are forced to live, as well as some assimilated local aborigines. These two groups of people are in two different life circles, and they all dislike each other. The aboriginal people in the town have always been the lowest class of people who have been infinitely exploited. Today, Duodan Town has become a gathering place for adventure groups and merchants during this beast tide. At the same time, they have also brought prosperity to Duodan Town. Their continuous transactions have brought a large amount of tax revenue. And their basic necessities, food, housing and transportation have also been supported. Many residents of Duodan Town were killed. A temple to the two goddesses was built in the town. And the celebration ceremony was held on the first day after winter. This celebration was even more lively than the harvest festival in the town. The residents of the town, whether they were imperial immigrants or local aborigines, all put on their most respectable clothes and walked to the streets. Everyone happily talked about their yearning for the twin goddess temple. At this time, you will find two distinct factions, the imperial immigrants and the local aborigines, waiting outside the two gates. A large group of imperial immigrants gathered at the gate of the Temple of Dawn. The street was filled with all kinds of gorgeous magic caravans. Many nobles in the town, who were rarely seen, came out of the manor to participate in this celebration ceremony. A group of the sheriff was sweating profusely in the early winter to direct traffic, so that these magic caravans could line up on the roadside. The aborigines in the town gathered around the Temple of Night. There were a large number of them. But there were no magic caravans on the street. So it was not that crowded here. Everyone stood at the door, marveling at the beauty of this temple and waiting for the temple door to open. Neither of these two gods is familiar to the residents of the town. In fact, the Green Empire has believers of the Statue of Liberty all over the country. These believers have been suppressing believers of other gods. It is rare to see other types of temples in the Green Empire. Later, all the priests and priests of the Statue of Liberty left. But the residents of the Empire still remain believers of the Statue of Liberty, do not know much about the other gods in the Kingdom of God. Therefore, 
the immigrants from the empire came to the Temple of Dawn mainly for a casual stroll and a visit to this magnificent temple. As people walked into the temple, Nika stood on the steps of the temple wearing a pure white linen dress. Her skin color and face were all aboriginal features. Even though she looked more delicate, she did not look stunning. The point. So the imperial people who came to visit the Temple of Dawn stared at Nika in astonishment. And some even said bluntly, Why is the saint in the temple an aborigine? Some people did not recognize her as a saint at all. And discussed with their friends. Who is she and why is she standing here? Some imperial people who had been to the southern region of Belan Plain saw at a glance that the other girls were also indigenous girls from the southern region. And they asked the people next to them. These clergy seem to be natives of the southern region. What's going on? Just when everyone felt a little incredible, Nika, who was standing on the steps, took a step forward. Welcome to the Dawn Temple. Nika stood on the high steps and said to the imperial immigrants who walked into the Temple of Dawn. When everyone heard the voice, they immediately stopped talking and looked at Nika. After all, Nika is just a girl who is just 12 years old. She was still a little flustered when she stood in front of the stage. But after she whispered a series of prayers, the imperial immigrants at the front steps of the temple fell silent. She held a ball of light in her hands, and the beam of light shot out from between her fingers. She raised her head, and a crack appeared in the cloudy sky. A beam of light enveloped Nika's whole body, and the shadow of a goddess statue appeared behind her. The phantom of the goddess came out of the light. It looked down at the people in the temple with a solemn face. The temple was filled with light. Nika stood under the shadow of the goddess. With her eyes closed, her hands clasped together, her body overlapping the shadow of the goddess. And she murmured, God said at the end of time, when the world comes to an end, wisdom will disappear. Justice will also come to earth. Courage turns to anger. All hope will be swallowed up by despair. Death will eventually spread its wings and cover the sky. Destiny is ruined and irreversible. All living beings will wait for the light in the morning light. Although her voice was not loud, it allowed every corner of the temple to hear her clearly. After saying these words, a group of small town residents looked at Nika in shock. At this time, no one would talk about her identity. Everyone followed Nika into the hall of the temple. Nika's body was constantly radiating light. She stood on the altar in the hall and opened the curtain covering the statue on the altar of the temple, walking straight up and overlapping the statue. It suddenly looked radiant. Nika and the indigenous maids from the southern part of Belan stood on the altar of the temple and a group of imperial immigrants behind them had begun to walk up impatiently. At this time, Nika was no longer needed to maintain order. The first imperial immigrant walked up to Nika, who stood under the statue of the god, and accepted Nika's blessing. Then the next town citizen came up, and Nika shone a light into his body. People kept coming up, and Nika held a beam of light in her hand. Although this pure light has no healing power, it has the power to dispel some negative effects. The imperial immigrants in front of Nika suddenly felt relaxed. Bathed in the sun, it seemed that even their breathing became much easier. Before Selina came to Doden Town, the local aborigines in the Belan Plain only worshipped their ancestors. Usually they have never come into contact with any gods. This time the indigenous people in the town came into contact with the dark goddess Selene. And many people changed their lives because of their belief in the goddess Selene. First, wheat cakes suddenly became cheaper than multigrain cakes. Secondly, Every aboriginal who was willing to work could find a job with a good salary. Finally, the town decided to transform the slums and the slums into brand new buildings. Townhouse. The indigenous people believe that all this is given by the dark goddess Selene. Before the twin goddess temple was built, these aboriginal believers had regular gatherings. But now they just have a more gorgeous temple. These aborigines didn't even have much communication. They lined up in a long line outside the big iron gate of the twin goddess temple. Some of the aborigines were wearing very thin clothes. So they crowded together so that they could keep each other warm. Selena and Zygna carried out a bucket of hot lemon black tea from the temple and distributed it to the aborigines waiting at the door. Zygna and Selena were wearing black robes and standing at the door of the dark temple. The difference between this place and the Temple of Dawn is that there are only Zygna and Selena here. A group of aboriginal believers lined up at the door and walked in one after another in an orderly manner. Everyone passed by Selena every time. They will salute. This kind of worship has been performed many times. But this time it was in a new place. All the natives were very convinced of Selena. While everyone was paying homage to the temple, Zygna, who was standing at the foot of the statue, with the help of Selena, opened the curtain covering it. 
and the statue of the Dark Goddess appeared in front of everyone. The Dark Goddess seemed to be imprisoned in an underground well. She stood barefoot in the muddy water, and countless hands stretched out from the muddy water below, trying to pull the Dark Goddess down below as she kept struggling upwards. The Dark Goddess only had a few pieces of cloth around her body, and a thick chain was tied around her body. She raised her head and stretched one hand to the patio above with all her strength, but her eyes were closed. At this time, all the aborigines sat on benches and prayed. There were no windows in the hall, and there was silence in the darkness. Everyone seemed to be in a dream. In just a few minutes, it seemed like I had a beautiful dream, and my body was getting rid of all fatigue. Chapter 917 Josh Golding's Plan The celebration ceremony at the Temple of the Twin Goddess lasted until dark. All the small town residents who participated in the celebration saw the miracle. It is said that the Goddess of Dawn is a very beautiful goddess even more beautiful than the Statue of Liberty. Selene, the goddess of the night, is wrapped in shackles. People who have seen her statue always have a lingering haze in their hearts. But as long as they close their eyes, they can feel the tranquility in the soul. By sensing the light element, Nika received the blessing of the goddess of dawn and became an envoy in the Temple of Dawn. The beam of light she released had the effect of removing and purifying. Although it was not a cure, it could remove some diseases. Signa also successfully became the saint of the night temple. She has a rare dark physique and likes to hide in places where the sun does not shine. She is the purest carrier of the descendants of the goddess. But recently the goddess of darkness prefers to descend on Selene, Na's body, to understand the world. As the door of the twin goddess temple slowly closed, the busy day came to an end. In fact, the temple of the two goddesses is not open to the public every day, in order not to affect the normal life of the town residents. The temple is only open to the town residents for one day every five days. As a saint in the temple, Zygna was supposed to live in the temple. But the living room of this temple still needed to be properly decorated. So Nika and Zygna continue to live in the riverside cabin these days. Serdak walked through the busy commercial street of Doden Town. And dim street lamps were lit on both sides of the street. Baron Josh Golding stood by the window on the second floor of the trading house. He was holding a glass of wine and leaning on the windowsill with his other hand to look out. Although trading firms have recently been subject to fierce competition from outside firms and have to pay a tax to the Duodan Town Tax Office, there has been a steady influx of World of Warcraft materials in the town these days, and the income from each order has been less. But as the number of orders has increased, and the trading firm's income has been growing steadily since autumn. However, he will not be grateful to the mayor of Duodan Town for this. He is a timid and cautious person who likes to hold grudges. Not to mention that the trading company can earn so much in the first place. Seeing Serdak and his woman passing side by side on the street, he turned around and didn't even want to take a second look. The second floor of the trading house. This is a living room. There is a dining table in the room. And a group of waiters are standing aside carrying plates of dishes. Although the barbecue, pastries, and fruits on the plate may not be very delicious. As a noble, this is the kind of pomp and circumstance you want. Baron Josh Golding sat back on the main seat and saw an adventure group leader walking in with a female swordsman under his command. Then he stood up, holding a wine glass in one hand and inviting them to sit on both sides of the dining table with the other. Sit sideways. The leader of the adventure group was the one who explored the canyon forest at night and killed five members of the group in one night. In addition to him, he was also accompanied by the female swordsman in the group. The others were there that day. We all went our separate ways in the morning. The two ran out of Invercargill Forest overnight. They were frightened almost every night and looked a little haggard. Any street girl in Duodan Town would have bigger breasts and rounder hips than this female swordsman. Of course, one cannot say who is cleaner than the other. He even took the female swordsman with him when he fled back to Doden Town. It was not because they had a brief romantic relationship for a few nights, or because she was a member of the adventure group, but because her distant cousin was married to Gore. Baron Golding and Baron Golding is the nobleman in the town of Doden. Distant relatives are also relatives. You mean you were chased by Lord Soldak's men in Invercargill Forest? And in the end only the two of you ran back? Halfway through the dinner, Baron Josh Golding dropped the knife in his hand and took a sip of sweet wine, his eyes shining with interest. Then he added, Let me tell you carefully, even a noble lord cannot harm the citizens of the Empire casually. This cannot be done by paying a small fine. The leader of the adventure group told the story in detail. Although he did not enter Serdak's private territory, 
he understood everything based on investigation and speculation afterwards. But he did not know the specific details of the fight in the forest. But you broke into his territory. With this reason, even if the lawsuit goes to the House of Representatives, do you think those lords and members will stand on your side? Baron Josh Golding looked like a lawyer at this point. He rubbed his chin and thought carefully, trying to find out the factors that could be detrimental to Viscount Serdek. In addition, didn't any of your team members escape alive? Baron Josh Golding said with a frown. Are those members of the adventure group just ordinary warriors? Those members have followed me for many years and have extremely rich combat experience. There were also two experienced rangers and shield warriors who sneaked into the territory at that time. The leader of the adventure group said with red eyes and some helplessness. But what's the use? Lord Serdak has at least two rank two powerhouses under his command and there was a rank 2 powerhouse guarding the forest that night. Two times strong man? Baron Josh Golding narrowed his eyes, and touched his chin and said, I have an idea. After you return to Wilkes City, you will file a lawsuit with the Wilkes House of Representatives, accusing Viscount Soldak of killing members of the adventure group for no reason. Of course, the specific circumstances must be described truthfully. I think you will eventually lose this lawsuit. The leader of the adventure group looked at Baron Josh Golding with a puzzled look. Baron Josh Golding said proudly. As long as you can tell the details more clearly, I believe someone will help you get justice. Such as how your men fought bravely and skillfully. Your adventure group is an Invercargill forest. How many ghosts marked red ants have been killed in the northern region? The most important thing is that you must clearly describe the characteristics of the second level powerhouse. Someone in the House of Representatives must have noticed the second level expert under his command. It is estimated that as soon as this matter spreads, the magic union will also help. At that time, these second-level experts under him will receive the teleportation pass from the big battlefield. Every second-level expert in the Green Empire is obliged to enter the big battlefield to experience. It is full of opportunities. But there are also hidden dangers. It's a huge danger. If you can perform several dangerous tasks inside, it may not be easy to survive. Baron Josie Golding had a sinister look on his face. The leader of the adventure group was so frightened that the wine glass in his hand dropped on the dining table, immediately staining a large area of the white tablecloth red, counting against a noble viscount, who was also a lord who held an army and a large piece of land and had a strong military background. The leader of the adventure group felt that there was a cold wind on his neck and a trace of cold sweat on his forehead. If I had known it would be a dinner like this, I might as well have eaten in the hotel. Chapter 918 Warrior Academy Tax collector Butra is very efficient in his work. In other words, Martino's family originally had a model of the Junior Warrior Academy. On the third day after Soldak returned to Doden Town, he dragged Martino and ran to Soldak, placed a plan for the construction of the Warrior Academy in front of his desk, and also brought the model of that Warrior Academy. When Baron Marin Martino designed this War Academy, he even fully considered the environmental factors of Doden Town. He also selected a building land for this Warrior Academy just outside Doden Town, on a small hill. The only problem is that this land belongs to Baron Lancaster of Doden, who owns large woods and pastures around Doden. But when Baron Lancaster heard that a warrior academy was going to be built in the town, and the chosen address happened to be in a corner of his territory, he felt that the matter was completely negotiable. In just one afternoon, Soldak signed a land swap agreement with Baron Lancaster. The agreement stated that the mountain southwest of Doden Town and the surrounding 10 hectares of land will be provided to the town to build a warrior academy. But this land can only be used to build a warrior academy. In addition, Doden Town will divide a piece of land of no less than 20 hectares in the Doden Canyon for Baron Lancaster. In fact, Baron Lancaster is also gambling. If Serdak can firmly occupy the Invercargill Forest and Hills, then the land he replaced in the Doden Gorge will have great room for appreciation. But if Serdak cannot hold Invercargill in the territory of the forest, the beast tide will arrive as scheduled in 10 years, and then the land in the canyon will have no value. The negotiation went smoothly, and Baron Cranster was very cheerful and signed the agreement neatly. Serdak also signed the Warrior Academy plan and asked Mrs. Luna to come over and ask her to take the plan to Ansan in the town and ask him to follow Baron Martino's requirements. Build this Warrior Academy. The college designed by Baron Martino is a building made of huge stones, which is larger than the temple of the two goddess. To build such a warrior academy, Serdak needed the coordination of Madame Luna, which was mainly funded and supervised by the Butra tax collector. The designer belonged to Baron Marin Martino, and the construction party was on. 
the Aboriginal Labor Corps in Doden Town. M.T. Soldak even directly placed the model of the Warrior Academy made by Baron Martino at the entrance to the lobby on the first floor of the town hall, so that everyone who walked into the town hall could see this architectural model. By then, if Aung San has been reduced during the construction process, it will be clearly reflected on the model. On the day when the plan for the Warrior Academy came out, Serdak also ordered Mrs. Luna to put the property rights of the land between Doden Town and Warrior Academy into the name of the Doden Town property. In the future, in addition to paving in addition to a wide stone road, a row of commercial shops facing the street will be built on both sides. He plans to develop this place into the second commercial street in Duodan Town. Samira, the captain of the Archer Brigade of the Independent Cavalry Battalion of the Doden Town Garrison, killed five members of the adventure group in the Canyon Forest and was quickly sued to the House of Representatives in Wilk City. The House of Representatives and the military department sent investigators to the Canyon Forest site almost simultaneously to investigate. However, the entire process of this matter was very clear, and the investigators basically only spent two days collecting evidence at the scene. After investigation, we learned that the place where the incident occurred was the private territory of Viscount Serdek, and that there was a very clear, no entry, sign on the outside of the territory. These members of the adventure group sneaked into Serdak secretly, knowing that there was this prohibition, the territory of Viscount Dark. At that time, the archers guarding the territory fired arrows to send a warning. The members of the adventure group not only resisted arrest, but also shot and wounded an archer under Viscount Soldak during their escape. This led Samira, the captain of the archer brigade, to personally shoot and kill several members of the adventure group. Their bodies were buried in this woodland. The laws of the Green Empire were very comprehensive in protecting noble lords from such battles that occurred on private territory. Soon the House of Representatives passed a resolution acquitting Serdek, without even requiring him to pay any compensation. And Serdek actually had a more solid reason. After so much preparation in this canyon forest, a large barracks had been built around the Bat Cave. This adventurous group is even suspected of stealing military secrets from the forest. However, in Wilk City, Many citizens participated in the discussion about the fact that an adventurous group secretly sneaked into the newly built military camp and was almost instantly wiped out by the local garrison. It is said that the troops directly affiliated to the Luther Legion are powerful, and they performed very dazzlingly during this outbreak of the Beast Tide. But no one expected that this cavalry battalion would be so powerful. Several second-level powerhouses from Soldek also came into everyone's sight, and there were even some sketches circulated among the nobles of Wilk City. Berserker Andrew wearing the earth shield, riding a horse. Samira standing on the platform bed crossbow on the back of the armed thunder rhinoceros. Wearing a hood, the two-headed ogre Gulatum was sitting next to the campfire, holding up a cow leg and gnawing at it. The good brothers kept arguing while eating. It is said that there is also a portrait of Viscount Soldak himself. But this Viscount has clearly stamped the mark of the Luther family. No one among the nobles in Wilk City would introduce their daughter to him at this time. No. It is said that there is a great alchemist secretly supporting Viscount Soldek. When fighting against the Beast Tide, the entire town of Doden saw the magic items provided by the great alchemist. Some of these advanced magic items were even research topics of the Wilk City Alchemy Guild and could be popularized in the army. For example, strengthening scrolls, such as explosives more powerful than fire scale bombs, etc. After the exposure of these second-level powerhouses under Serdek, Someone immediately proposed to the military that Samira and Andrew, the second-level powerhouses with human ancestry, should enter the battlefield for training within a time limit. The military department quickly responded with, Okay. The reason given by the military department was very simple. Because the Luther Legion was performing garrison missions in the Belan Plain, they would not accept the two people's teleportation passes to the battlefield. Of course, it is okay to accept the two big battlefield teleportation passes from the relevant departments but how to solve the defense issues in the northern area of the Belan Plain and the Invercargill Warcraft Forest requires everyone to sit down and talk. In fact, it can be seen from this incident that Marquis Luther has a very strong influence on the Wilk City Military Department. This is probably the reason why Marquis Luther did not let Serdak go with him to the south of Terrapagan to quell the rebellion. Chapter 919 Northern Expedition In addition to purchasing a batch of crossbows and catapults from San Carlos City, Businessman Malakom also bought a set of agility-oriented magic pattern structures from the Imperial Capital Auction House. In addition, the 1,500 infantry soldiers in the military camp also wore heavy armor. They had bright heavy swords hanging on their waists. 
and carried dwarf heavy shields and Paglio spears behind their backs. On the last day of October, 1,500 infantry soldiers, fully armed, left the town of Doden and headed north through the Doden Gorge. The infantry lined up in a long line, following the armed thunder rhinoceros, and marched into Invercargill Forest. All the infantry soldiers seemed very excited. Most of these new troops are young indigenous tribesmen. They have an obsession in their hearts. That is, they can only get money when they perform tasks. This time they left Duoda in town. Everyone everyone wants to make a fortune on the battlefield. Eighteen armed thunder rhinoceros carry thirty-six bed crossbows on their backs. And the shells also carry forty dismantled bed crossbow parts and twenty catapults. All these ordnance will be transported to the northern part of the Invercargill Forest. In the military camp in Canyon Woodland. Serdak's northern expedition to the Dark Worm Valley also officially started on the last day of October. He understands better than anyone else that the military is actually fighting for money. But victory in the war can bring huge rewards for previous efforts. But once the war failed, not all lords could bear the losses. Serdak had never thought that the scale of this northern expedition to the Dark Worm Valley would be so large. He just invested all the wealth accumulated from the beast tide throughout the summer into this expedition. In addition, he also wants the proceeds from the continuous sales of copper ingots at the copper mine to be directly exchanged for a large amount of strategic war preparation materials to fully support this expedition. When these supplies were continuously transported from Doden Town to the military camp in the Canyon Forest, the entire supply line was almost crowded with horse teams carrying goods. Such abundant supplies had a huge impact on the indigenous tribes in the hills and mountains and Invercargill Forest. These indigenous tribes had also fought with the Green Empire's army but they were not behind the war zone. They watched such a battle from the perspective of bystanders. They saw these ordnance supplies, and so many young warriors rushing to the battlefield well-equipped. These indigenous tribes also couldn't sit still. Logically speaking, their tribe is currently affiliated with Lord Serdek. Lord Serdek wants to start a war, and they are obliged to send their own armed forces to join it. The first time Serdak organized a war of this scale, he mobilized a group of young indigenous warriors so he forgot to issue recruitment orders to various indigenous tribes. However, various indigenous tribes heard that Serdak began to mobilize troops frequently, and the heads of each tribe communicated privately. If they don't respond at this time, they will easily be caught in the future. So they should respond positively. So on the day when 1,500 heavy armored infantry entered the Invercargill Forest, each tribe also sent a hundred or so indigenous warriors to the military camp in the Canyon Forest. They even brought their own dry food and weapons. The warriors sent by each tribe are not many. But the number of these tribes is large. 37 indigenous tribes actually gathered nearly 3,000 warriors. They were a group of real hunters within the tribe. In terms of personal strength, they were much stronger than the young indigenous people and had rich combat experience. When these tribal warriors arrived at the canyon camp one after another, Serdak realized that the scale of the camp he had built was a bit small. And he quickly cut down trees and built some more barracks. I saw that although these tribal warriors had alloyed bows in their hands and craftsmen heavy swords hanging on their waists, they were still only wearing animal skin armor, and their feet were also wrapped in tattered animal skins, even a pair of decent no shoes. For this reason, Serdak quickly ordered another 3,000 sets of imperial infantry armor from the businessman Malakom. Even if these indigenous warriors volunteered to send troops to help this time, it would be a little benefit. Even Malakom was a little surprised that Serdak was so generous. He also didn't expect that all the magic crystals Serdak took out were earned during the Beast Wave this summer. Now, for this battle in winter, his pockets are almost cleaner than his face. Taking advantage of the fact that it had not yet snowed in the Invercargill Forest, Serdak arranged for people to pull up 50 arm-thick iron ropes on the mountain gorge and use these iron ropes to pave an iron chain bridge for the armed thunder rhinoceros to pass. In addition to such a massive iron cable bridge, Saldek also built more than a dozen zip lines on this mountain stream. These zip lines, which are low on one side and high on the other, can allow soldiers to quickly slide across this natural chasm. It has only been half a year since the epidemic, and many areas have not yet recovered from the damage caused by red ants. Many people did not expect that Viscount Saldek and the Lutheran army actually led an army across the mountain stream in the northern part of the Invercargill Forest in the name of the Northern Lord of the White Forest Plain. Preparing to lead the army, when the first heavy snow fell, the army attacks the Dark Worm Valley. Saldak's army has just arrived at the Canyon Woodland Camp in the northern Invercargill Forest. A large number of adventure groups in Wilk City are like dry leeches smelling blood in the tropical rainforest. 
pouring into Invercargill from all directions. Gil Forest. Some large mercenary groups even have more than a hundred people. They were not hired by Lord Serdak, but instead took a fancy to the magic cores in the skulls of the ghostly patterned soldier ants. This summer, they have already tasted the sweetness of following Serdak's cavalry battalion. This time Serdak is preparing to march north. And these adventure groups and mercenary groups actually got wind of it. Just after the first week of November, the number of adventure groups and mercenary groups gathered on the south bank of the mountain stream surged to more than 5,000. They had almost hunted down all the ghost-striped red and wandering in the forest area opposite. So much so that no trace of the ghost-striped red and can be seen across the mountain stream. Dark clouds were pressing down in the sky layer by layer. And the north wind carried a damp and cold atmosphere. At this time, the rocks in the northern sky have already hid in their nests. This is the call before the wind and snow. The light green mist surrounding the dark warm valley is constantly blown into the sky by the north wind. In such a cold weather, the woodland shrouded in poisonous fog gradually appeared in Serdak's sight. As snow grids fell from the sky, which would sting a bit when hit on the face, the fog in the forest opposite became lighter. 500 cavalrymen from the cavalry battalion were already guarding the chain bridge on the north bank. Following Soldak's order, 18 armed thunder rhinoceros took the lead and stepped onto the chain bridge one by one, carrying heavy beds. The crossbow crossed the bridge deck and set up a second line of defense to the north of the chain bridge. A thousand archers followed these thunder rhinos across the chain bridge, followed by 1,500 heavy armored infantry. By the time 1,500 heavy armored infantry built fortifications on the iron chain bridge, Andrew led the cavalry battalion to quickly insert into the edge of the poison swamp. Although the snow has dispersed the poisonous fog, the entire swamp is still very difficult to navigate, and countless puddles, traps, and methane are hidden under the thick moss and grass. Usually this place is almost a forbidden area for cavalry, but now Andrew is preparing to lead 500 cavalry through here. Chapter 920 Battle of Poison Swamp A. Eh? Even when it rains heavily in summer, the poison swamp is still filled with a faint poisonous mist. Only after snowfall in winter will the poisonous mist here gradually dissipate. Only from mid-November to early February in a year, the poisonous swamp lasts only 70 days. In many days, the naturally formed gate of the Dark Worm Valley will be open to the world. Fine snow grits continue to cover the poisonous swamp. Although these fine snow completely suppress the poisonous swamp fog, they also completely cover the entire poisonous swamp. His vision had turned into a vast expanse of white. Winter has just begun, and a thin layer of frozen soil has just formed in the poison swamp. This place is covered with thick moss and grass. If you step on it in ordinary places, the soft and wet grass can almost swallow the calf of a pedestrian. The poisonous swamp grassland here is full of pits for bastards. If you don't pay attention, even people and horses will be trapped. Everyone will fall into it. Andrew's cavalry opened the way in front. And the first thing they did was to find a passage with hard soil under the turf in this poisonous swamp. If it were other legions, even the eagle eye with the world vision might not be able to do this. The safest way would be to use infantry to try to move forward. However, this kind of exploration, like mine clearing, would keep the army from moving forward. Trapped outside the poison swamp, Serdak started the sacrificial ceremony directly in the temporary marching tent and moved the sacrifices he stored in the lava cave into boxes. In addition to giving the 500 cavalrymen who opened the way the blessed body, they also used the Eye of Truth on Andrew, Samira and himself. Although the effect of the Eye of Truth can only last for less than half an hour, Serdak basically used the heads of these soldier ants as sacrifices. He, Andrew and Samira walked at the end of the line. Ahead, through the eyes of truth, you can see beneath the turf. In their eyes, the water and soil under the turf show two completely different colors. Someone planted a flag at every turf puddle, and small flags were planted along the three roads that were opened. 3,000 indigenous warriors, 500 cavalry, and 18 thunder rhinoceros were divided into three columns, slowly approaching behind Serdak, Andrew, and Samira. At the end is the leak picking coalition composed of the adventure group and the mercenary group. 1,500 heavy armored infantrymen guarded the north of the chain bridge, guarding the only retreat. There are also a small number of ghost striped red ants in the swamp. They hide in the grass and form ambush teams. However, under the survey of the true eyes of the three Serdex, they were unable to hide for a while. The Thunder Rhinoceros team followed Samira. These archers carried a large number of arrows this time and shot at the red ants hiding in the distant grassland to lure them out of the grassland. Along the way, 
Only by constantly hunting ghost pattern soldier, ants can the loss of sacrifices be slightly replenished. In the cold weather, the actions of these ghosts mark red, ants also become somewhat stiff. They rely on the magic patterns on their bodies, to continuously inject energy into their bodies, to maintain sufficient vitality. They have stiff and thick hard armor on their bodies. This layer of hard armor also has a certain thermal insulation effect. However, in this cold weather, they should be hiding in burrows under the soil. But now they have to lurk in a poisonous swamp filled with wind and snow. The team walked less than 20 kilometers forward, and the outline of the dark insect valley in the wind and snow gradually became clear. At this moment, Soldak and Samira stopped almost at the same time. Andrew also noticed something unusual in front of him and raised his fist to stop the cavalry. Without saying a word, Samira boarded the armed thunder rhino behind her, raised her long legs and jumped onto the console of the bed crossbow. The bed crossbow operator beside her quickly lifted out a giant crossbow arrow and installed it in the groove. The sound of the reel turning, the bow string slowly being pulled in, and the magic patterns on the entire bed crossbow also lit up one by one. A giant crossbow arrow streaked through the air, making bursts of air explosions. The next moment, a steady shot hit the forehead of the giant ghost pattern soldier and 800 meters away. The huge spearhead was deeply embedded in the hard armor. Half of the giant ghost pattern soldier ant was originally lurking in the swamp, and the other half the body was covered by the grass. At this moment, the body suddenly jumped out of the grass. The pair of one meter long tentacles on the head suddenly opened forward, but they could not catch the giant crossbow arrow. When it emerged from the grass like this, the other giant ghost striped red and thought it was launching a charge, and shook off the cold and sticky mud on their bodies. They emerged from the swamp, and a large black mass appeared in front of the army. At the front were 40 or 50 giant ghost patterned red ants covered in dark red, followed by a dense and overwhelming mass of red ants. Too numerous to count. In sharp arrow formation. Line up. Prepare to use explosive crossbow arrows. And use armor piercing arrows in the second round. Samira ordered without hesitation. A messenger quickly climbed to the roof of the wooden house behind her and waved a few simple movements at the row of armed thunder rhinoceros behind her. The thunder rhinoceros following behind quickly adjusted its position and turned sideways to aim at the battlefield ahead. The controls on the platform, the hands began to adjust the shooting angle of the bed crossbow. Samira had no intention of saving money for Serdak. The first two waves of arrangements were giant crossbow arrows bundled with black powder and a magic giant crossbow arrow with an armor-breaking effect that had just been shipped from the imperial capital. The crossbow arrows cost 35 silver coins. A single shot from the 18 Thunder Rhinoceros would throw out 12 gold coins. Andrew immediately asked the cavalry to move closer to the armed Thunder Rhinoceros. He had no intention of charging at these giant soldier ants, which were 6 to 7 meters long. The warhorses did not dare to run around in this poisonous swamp. They were looking for traps everywhere. Charges and wolf pack tactics were purely seeking death. The 3,000 indigenous warriors behind Serdak saw a large group of ghost patterned soldier and suddenly emerged from the poisonous swamp in front of them and immediately howled and screamed to convey the message. Serdak shouted to retreat behind the armed thunder rhino, but they couldn't understand it at all. A group of indigenous warriors took out their paglio spears and rushed forward, trying to throw the spears in their hands before the giant ghost striped soldier ants entered the throwing range. Serdak almost screamed, grabbing several excited indigenous leaders in the crowd and yelling at them to calm down. These indigenous leaders could still understand some imperial language. After listening to Soldak's instructions, they realized that they did not need to use flesh and blood to stop these giant bugs. They were in a daze for a while. And then, they were ecstatic. The indigenous leaders shouted quickly, and quickly hid behind the armed thunder rhino, with these tribal warriors wearing standard armor. They were really not slow at all. Leaving Soldak at the end, each native could take a step forward four or five meters in the poisonous swamp. At the same time, the first wave of explosive crossbow arrows had been shot out and hit the giant ghost pattern soldier and 600 meters away. With a series of explosions, the sky and the earth collapsed, and the soil and soldier ant stumps flew up in the fine snow. High altitude. In this violent explosion, a row of giant ghost pattern soldier ants rushed out. They start running faster. Samira stood with one foot on the crossbow control platform looked at the armed thunder rhinoceros formation behind her in the shape of wild goose wings, and shouted to the herald on the roof again, Another wave of armor-piercing crossbow arrows! While the herald was waving the flag in his hand, the second wave of armor-piercing giant crossbows had already been fired. 
These giant crossbows were obviously much lighter than the first wave of explosive crossbow arrows. 36 giant crossbow arrows formed narrow snow lines in the air. With precise accuracy. Hit these giant ghost pattern soldier ants that are charging forward. The armor piercing giant crossbow arrows shot these giant ghost pattern soldier ants instantly. Knocking people off their feet. And the sharp arrow tips cut into the hard armor. As if there was no obstacle at all. The ordinary ghost striped soldier ants at the back were like a red sea tide. Stepping on the bodies of the giant soldier ants in front. And swarming towards the armed thunder rhinoceros. The third wave of armor piercing crossbow arrows was fired and there was no longer a single giant ghost pattern soldier, ant among the charging ants. Ordinary ghost striped soldier, ants have rushed 200 meters away from the armed thunder rhino. Half of the thousand archers are standing on the shelves of the armed thunder rhino, and the remaining half are forming a long queue at the feet of the thunder rhino. The flag bearer standing on the roof changed to a large flag and waved it vigorously in the air. The archers did not hesitate to draw the bowstring and threw it at an angle of 45 degrees into the sky. A shower of arrows flew towards the sky. After reaching the highest point in the sky, it falls smoothly by gravity. This rain of arrows has very limited lethality even against ordinary soldier ants. But these rain of arrows are dense enough that if they happen to hit weak joints, they can be nailed into the joints of ghostly patterned soldier ants. In the past six months, she and Andrew had been cleaning up red ants in the hills and mountains and Invercargill forest. No one knew how to hunt these big guys better than them. Suddenly, Swarms of soldier ants fell on the poisonous swamp. The indigenous warriors, who crowded behind the armed thunder rhinos saw the ghost-striped red ants in front of them falling down one after another. They could not stand honestly behind. So they squeezed out from behind the armed thunder rhino. Three thousand indigenous warriors instantly overwhelmed the archers. They first took a few steps and threw the paglio spears in their hands with all their strength. These natives are so explosive that the spears they throw can fly more than 150 meters. This kind of war spear is not the kind of smooth and edgeless javelin that flies smoothly. It pierced the body of the ghost mark soldier ant. And another large piece fell down. Zerdak has been conducting trade with the indigenous tribes in the past two months. The weapons in the hands of the indigenous warriors have long been replaced by guns. They took off their alloy bows and stood side by side with the archers. The number of 1,000 archers tripled instantly and became 4,000 archers. All the archers lined up in three rows amidst the chaotic shouting. When each row was ready, they walked to the front, shot the arrows on the bow strings, and then quickly returned. The alloy bow is not a longbow, and the power of the projectile is limited, but the flat shot is only lethal within a range of 60 yards. For a moment, arrows rained out overwhelmingly, but I saw those ghost patterned soldier ants whose bodies were nailed by arrows like hedgehogs, but they still rushed forward. Chapter 921 Battle of Poison Swamp B. The cavalrymen pulled on the reins of their horses, raised the knight's spears high in their hands, and stood in front of the archers in a dense formation. Under Andrew's command, they did not charge forward in a single line, but separately, following Andrew, Gulitum, and Serdak, they pierced into the ant colony like a trident. This greatly avoids falling into a dark pit in the swamp. The indigenous warriors surrounding the armed thunder rhinoceros were holding alloy bows in their hands. They also followed the cavalry and rushed forward. Not only are they proficient in archery, but they can also carry swords and shields and follow the cavalry in close combat with ghost pattern soldier ants. At this time, Andrew unleashed his strongest fighting spirit, with flames and arcs all over his body, and he rushed into the ant colony, immediately splitting the heads of two soldier ants in succession, and was only stopped by the third ghost striped soldier ant. But there was a steady stream of cavalry behind him, and the cavalry at the front were all those who had obtained magic patterns in one turn. They rushed up from the front of the battlefield, and their strength was no less than those of these ghost patterned soldier ants. Using the knight's spears to charge, the cavalrymen flew away dozens of soldier ants as soon as the two sides came into contact. Of course, there were also cavalrymen who were less lucky. They rushed to the front and were picked off by the ghost striped red ants with their fork like tentacles. The two headed ogre following behind saw the scene. Gulitum waved his bone crushing stick and roared. With a war cry, the ogre magician threw a fireball at the same time. He rushed over in a few steps, rounded the stick in his hand, and hit it hard on the head of the ghost-striped soldier ant. Suddenly, the head of the ghost-striped soldier ant was like a sand flesh watermelon hanging on the ground, and it shattered in an instant. Zerdak held the holy light torch in one hand and a shield in the other. A halo of power lit up under his feet, and the holy seal on his chest flashed frequently. After rushing into the battlefield, 
Serdek discovered that these ghost-striped soldier ants were much more powerful than those in the hilly highlands. The hard armor of these ghost-striped red ants was very dark in color. In Serdek's hands, when the holy light torch hits it, it can only leave some dents and cracks. Every ghost-striped red ant is very ferocious. And they are not afraid of death. They don't even try to avoid the cavalry's charge. Before dying, he had to take a bite of meat from the cavalry. Of course, the tribal warriors had never fought against ghost pattern soldier ants like this before. They are now wearing standard armor, with sharp weapons and strong shields in their hands. When they see the cavalry charging forward, they follow them in a swarm. This group of tribal warriors are usually a group of experienced hunters. When they first held hardwood bows and wooden spears, they all worked together to hunt these ghost pattern soldier ants. Now they hold sharp and tough heavy swords. Even more so. No longer afraid of these ghostly pattern soldier ants. The battlefield fell into melee for a while. Ghost pattern soldier ants are constantly coming from the north. The native warriors gradually found a simple way of fighting. They stole it from the cavalry who jumped off their horses to fight on foot. Several warriors who were very familiar with each other gathered together. And everyone had a clear division of labor. From the shield warrior to the main attacker. And then to the last ditch shooter at the back. The three indigenous warriors formed a combat team which not only withstood the attack of the ghost-marked soldier ants, and also succeeded frequently in battles. The archers at the back lined up in a neat row, shooting their arrows wherever the red ants were suppressed on the battlefield. Occasionally, these tribal warriors are reminded on the battlefield that the ghost-striped soldier ants they kill must be marked, and these will become achievements after the battle. The tribal warriors didn't understand this, and didn't care about the ghost-marked soldier ants they killed. After the battle broke out, the combined forces of the adventure group and mercenary group that followed found that Lord Serdak's army had stabilized the situation and immediately moved forward, looking for those fish that had slipped through the net in the swamp behind. There were so many of them that they were like a large net spread out, surrounding a group of ghostly patterned soldier ants in the swamp that wanted to get around them. Although they fought independently, they were able to effectively block a group of ghost patterned soldier ants at this time. The battle lasted until the afternoon before the group of ghost-striped soldier ants withdrew from the battlefield with heavy casualties, leaving corpses on the ground. Cleaning the battlefield is the most important task in the battle. This is not only to clean up the corpses of the ghostly patterned soldier ants, but also to pick up all the precious magic arrows shot by the archer brigade. The biggest harvest of this battle was the 41 giant ghost patterned soldier ants hunted by the bed crossbow. The legs of these soldier ants were removed and moved to Serdak as soon as the ant colony retreated. Serdak needed to select some complete life magic patterns from these outriggers. There were a total of 173 outriggers with life magic patterns that were very intact. Looking at the life magic pattern legs piled up like a hill in front of him, Soldak felt that almost one third of the goal of the Northern Expedition Plan had been completed. There was no dry place to camp in this swamp. After the battle, everyone stood in the mud and ate some marching rations, drank some water, and continued on their way forward. The snow was still falling and there was a vast expanse of white everywhere above the poison swamp, only where the army had passed. A dirty trace was left on the swamp. Serdak and his army finally found a place with trees when it was just getting dark. At least, they wouldn't be soaked in ice water if they stepped on it. Seeing that the night was about to fall, there was still nothing in sight. At the end of the swamp, Serdak decided to stay here. Although the heavy snow covered up the poisonous fog, there was still a faint poisonous fog in the places where people stepped along the way and the water in the swamp was not drinkable. Many soldiers inhaled some faint poisonous mist during this day, and those with weaker constitutions began to suffer from some poisoning symptoms of dizziness and vomiting. Soldak had also been prepared for this, and Justin took it in Doden Town. After arriving at the herbal medicine, this period of time mainly involves preparing two magic potions. The first is the secondary life potion, and the second is the detoxification potion. Although there are many ways to detoxify, the most effective ones are the magic potions prepared by magicians. When Serdak sets out to conquer the Dark Worm Valley, the first thing he has to face is the poisonous mist in the swamp. Of course, he will not fail to prepare the antidote. Serdak quickly poured several portions of the antidote into the drinking water and asked all the soldiers to drink some. The poisoning symptoms were finally effectively contained. In order to prevent poisoning, Serdak asked the indigenous warriors not to eat food from the swamp or drink water from the swamp. To this end, he could only use part of the supplies he had prepared. At night, bonfires were lit in the forest. The combined forces of the adventure group and the mercenary group also camped in the woods. Some of them were discussing today's harvest. However, 
some of them encountered such and such situations. The symptoms were at most mild poisoning. Not everyone could afford antidote. Serdak would not be too stingy at this time. Anyway, the symptoms of poisoning were mild. A bottle of antidote could dilute a barrel of water. Enough for a hundred or ten people to drink. In the evening, Serdak began to use the holy light technique to treat the wounded. After a series of treatments, the more seriously injured soldiers would be moved to the forest camp overnight. The indigenous warriors of the tribe had never experienced this before. When they saw that even if they were injured, they would most likely not die. Their morale immediately soared. For dinner, the indigenous warriors of these tribes ate something special. It was a poisonous insect similar to a millipede dug out from the mud in the poisonous swamp. This poisonous insect will hibernate underground after entering the winter. Even if it is dug out, it will be too lazy. Yang Yang let himself be slaughtered. The indigenous warrior said that this is a kind of poisonous insect that likes to hibernate in the swamp, hiding under the grass. Many adult poisonous insects have a physique close to that of a monster. Some skulls can even have magic cores dug into them. But their living habits cannot be changed. It becomes extremely easy to catch in winter. However, digging out these poisonous insects is also a physical job. You need to find the entrance of the hole. Then test whether there are poisonous insects inside. And finally start digging. Sure enough, Serdak found some poisonous insects that were stiff and asleep. And he was able to find the magic core even after cutting open their skulls. The two-headed ogre believed that the meat of this poisonous insect was very tender. So he had long joined the indigenous warriors to exchange cooking methods with them. Serdak didn't want the soldiers' physical strength to be wasted digging for these poisonous insects. So the army did not carry out extensive digging. Instead, they started taking turns to rest early after nightfall. This northern expedition cannot be completed in a day or two. The end is still far away. However, the news about the swamp millipedes was not deliberately concealed from the adventure group and the mercenary group. When Serdak walked out of the tent early the next morning, he found that the swamp outside the forest was almost completely dug up by these people. Some people were lucky enough to find it, while many others just searched blindly in the muddy water. It was in such a chaotic scene that Serdak had breakfast with the soldiers, and then hurriedly pulled down the tents in the camp, and the large army continued to move forward. The northern expeditionary army opened a passage through the poisonous swamp and walked for another whole morning before they finally walked out of the poisonous swamp and saw the high mountains like Tianju Peak in the north. It is said that the Dark Worm Valley is under this mountain peak. Chapter 922 The Dead World Tree After the army walked out of the poisonous swamp, Suldak let the large army rest in place and prepare to march towards the Dark Worm Valley. This has already entered the sphere of influence of the ghost-marked red ants. At this time, every time he took a step forward, Serdak asked the scouts to explore the way ahead. The scouts who had just been sent out brought some bad news to Suldak not long after they left. The scout led Suldak over the slope at the edge of the poisoned swamp. What came into view was a large lake with no edge visible at a glance. Soldak got on his horse and rode to the lake. At this time, the lake was filled with water. There is only a thin layer of ice. And it will take at least a month before the lake is completely frozen. There are several giant arched stone bridges above the lake. These stone bridges are very exaggerated in shape. It looks like the dead roots of a giant tree are exposed from the ground. But the bridge deck is actually round. The thickness of these stone bridges is also very uneven. Some stone bridges are tens of meters wide in places, and only two or three meters narrow in places. What troubles Suldak the most is that the decks of these stone bridges are arc-shaped. It is high in the middle, and low on both sides. The slope becomes steeper towards the edge. Only by standing in the middle of the stone bridge can you pass safely. Once you stand too close to the edge, you will easily lose your balance and fall into the lake. At this time, the lake has a layer of ice, and the water temperature should be close to zero. Ordinary soldiers will lose their temperature quickly if they fall into the lake. It may not be easy to swim out of the lake. I don't know if there are any in this big lake. What kind of underwater monster? Although this steep bridge deck is a big challenge for humans. War horses and armed thunder rhinoceros. It is not difficult for these ghost striped red ants. They have six powerful legs and can climb 300 meters on the stone bridge. 60 degree climb. Moreover, this kind of stone bridge across the lake actually stretches out from the north. It is not yet clear how many meters the span of these stone bridges is. Ghost marked red ants can be seen everywhere on the stone bridge. Serdak did not expect that these ghost marked red ants actually knew how to retreat to the stone bridge. Serdak just walked around the lake and then rode back. This is the territory of ghost striped red ants, and it is blocked by poisonous fog all year round. 
so it is usually inaccessible. Among the grassland and shrubs by the lake, some elementary magic herbs such as silverleaf grass, kazoo root, and pool grass can be seen everywhere. Soldak immediately realized the value of this grassland and quickly waved to the cavalry following behind him. Call for some help. The cavalry quickly turned their horses and left. And soon a large group of people came. Serdak selected those with collecting experience from among these cavalry and asked them to take advantage of the gap between the ghost marked red ants to retreat to the stone bridge and quickly collect all the magic herbs here and wait for the adventure group and mercenary group later. Everyone walks out of the swamp and follows. I'm afraid this is where all parties will compete. The cavalry came on horseback, much faster than Samira and the archers. When Samira arrived at the lake, she saw the magic herbs everywhere on the grass in front of her and quickly called her archers to seize the shrubs with the most herbs. Forest, the magic herbs in the Green Empire are now more valuable than gold. At this time, no matter what kind of magic herbs are in the market, they are hard currency. It's just that magic herbs are very hungry for land resources. They probably need to constantly absorb the surrounding elements during their growth. They cannot grow in large patches. There are only one or two trees in an area. The cavalry immediately searched further along the river to get closer. Give these resources to the archers. This kind of muffled fortune making only lasted until before dark. When Andrew's cavalry outpost encountered a large group of ghost pattern soldier ants in the distance. And then quickly retreated. At this moment, the adventure group and the mercenary group that followed had also come out of the poisonous swamp. They almost walked in the mud and dug up poisonous millipedes along the way. This group of people ventured here just to make a fortune. Come on. These poisonous millipedes are a big fortune to them. When they walked out of the poison swamp and came to the large lake covered with thin ice, they immediately discovered traces of collection on the grass. These adventure groups went completely crazy. They were like a group of gadflies smelling blood. They rushed into the grass with a bang. They didn't even care about it getting dark and searched for magic herbs further along the river grass. He didn't even pay attention to the kind reminder of the cavalry set by Soldak. It may also be that they don't have the same panic about these ghost striped red ants as before, which is why they are so unscrupulous. Who caused all the magic herbs in the nearby grassland to be harvested by Lord Soldak's warriors? What else could they do except go to the grassland farther away by the lake to look for magic herbs? The temporary camp has been set up. The marching tents are closely connected together, and groups of soldiers are walking around the camp. These patrolling soldiers stared at the arched stone bridge not far away, fearing that a group of ghost marked soldier ants would suddenly rush out from the stone bridge and attack the camp. They had experienced the beast tide and naturally knew the power of these swarms of red ants. In the past, when fighting against ghost-striped red ants, everyone relied on the northern city wall to block them and occupy this strategic location. Now Andrew and his cavalry can deal with these ghostly red ants in the wilderness. But ordinary warriors still couldn't resist the impact when faced with ghost-marked red ants. The armed thunder rhino also transported the ordered bed crossbows and catapults this time. Aung San's younger brother Tula is now the captain of the ordnance maintenance team. After these bed crossbows and catapults were transported through the poisonous swamp, Latu had nothing he didn't do anything and just started assembling the bed crossbow with his men. Underneath this bed crossbow is the chassis of a four-wheel carriage. This four-wheel base with a magic wheel axle has an extra reinforced structure and looks very bulky. If there were no horses to pull it, it would take at least six people to push it, and the road should not be too bad. The bed crossbows that had just been assembled were now pushed onto the slope pointing at the stone bridge by the lake a few hundred meters away. Serdak's dinner was very rich. In addition to baked wheat cakes and broth, there was also half a roasted millipede. The meat of this barbecue was indeed very tender, but the poor appearance made Serdak lose his appetite. A magic circle light lit up inside the marching tent, and Aphrodite walked out of the void gate. You came just in time. I just have something to show you. Serdak sat on a chair and wiped his mouth, then left the camp with Aphrodite. The two of them walked directly onto the slope, where a group of bed crossbow repairmen, led by Latu, were assembling these bed crossbows overnight. Serdak pointed to the stone bridge hidden in the night in the distance and asked Aphrodite, Do you know what those are? They can't really be some naturally formed stone arch bridges. Right. Aphrodite turned to look at Soldak with a speechless expression. But then she still observed it carefully. The big lake under the starry sky is like a bright mirror or a huge gym. The glimmer of light reflected from the lake surface just makes these stone arch bridges completely exposed. A shadow of transparent insect wings appeared behind Aphrodite, and her body also floated into the air. Serdak thought she would fly over to investigate, 
but he didn't expect that after a while. She landed on the spot, thought for a moment, and then said to Serdek, I have read similar records in the Goblin City Library of the Maka Plain. The goblins believe that these stone bridges are probably the roots left after the death of the world tree, which were exposed on the surface, and then turned into stone after countless years of weathering. Duck, do you think the mountain in front of you was originally a world tree? Look at the fractures on the top of this mountain. She pointed to the mountain peaks that looked like pillars in the northern night sky. But in the night, they were just dark shadows. If you imagine it as the stump left behind after a big tree dies, these stone bridges are most likely its roots exposed on the surface, and its body and roots gradually petrified over countless years. You said that Mountain Peak is the stump of the world tree after it dies? The Dark Worm Valley is on the root of the world tree. If that's the case, these ghosts strike red and really occupy a geomantic treasure. Even if it's a dead world tree, I'm afraid it's full of treasures. But after so many years, there may not be much left. If we can build a city inside the stump of this world tree, at least we won't have to dig a moat. I guess this mountain must be hollow. Such a high mountain wall can be used as a city wall. The disadvantage is that if the city is built inside, the lighting must be very poor. I heard that the elves like to build cities on the top of the world tree. Aphrodite squinted her eyes, not afraid of the cold wind blowing from the north, and actually sat on the slope, looking at the distant mountain peaks and starting a series of reverie. Serdak then expressed his troubles. Now our army has to pass through the stone bridge, but it is covered with ghost-marked red ants. If you want to cross this stone bridge, you will probably have to fight through it. Fighting on the stone bridge, the ghost-patterned red ants have too great an advantage. Then what are you going to do? Aphrodite asked. Serdak pointed to the bed crossbows and catapults being assembled not far away, and said to Aphrodite, I'm going to use the catapults and bed crossbows to blast all the way over. Chapter 923 the exploding arrow that breaks the situation. I heard Aphrodite say that the mountain peak is probably a dead world tree. Serdak wanted to cross these arch bridges and go to the other side of the lake to have a look. The original plan was to set up crossbows and catapults on the stone bridge and then blast it all the way across. After a night's rest, Serdak's army gathered under the stone bridge. Thousands of ghosts marked red ants also gathered on the stone bridge. These red ants crowded on the stone bridge and kept hissing at the army under the bridge. Countless red ants opened their tentacles to demonstrate against the army. Serdak waved his hand and pushed the thirty bed crossbows that had been assembled overnight to the front. Eighteen armed thunder rhinoceros were also lined up at this moment, and all the bed crossbows were aimed at the ghost marked red ants on the bridge. When these ghost striped red ants saw the army setting up crossbows, they stepped back one after another. Although they were crowded on the bridge, their retreat speed was very fast and they were thousands of meters away in the blink of an eye. Such a long distance has exceeded the maximum range of the bed crossbow. Even if the giant crossbow arrow can fly there, it will not be able to break through the hard armor of the ghost-marked red ants. Suldak ordered the cavalry to advance. The ghost-patterned soldier ants stood outside the range of the bed crossbow. When they saw the cavalry stepping onto the stone bridge, they immediately rushed towards the entrance of the stone bridge and strangled together with Andrew and hundreds of dismounted cavalry. The bridge here is not wide, and almost all the cavalrymen dismounted, wearing heavy armor and fighting on foot with the ghost-patterned soldiers. Although Andrew and Gulitum were in front, these ghost-striped red ants could crawl freely under the stone bridge and attack the cavalry from the left and right sides of the stone bridge, causing the cavalry on the flanks to panic. The cavalry who lost their horses completely gave up their speed advantage. They were actually forced to retreat steadily under the acidic venom frequently sprayed by the soldier ants. Cavalry caught in an infantry battle will perform no better than heavily armored infantry. Fortunately, their armors were strong and their bodies were strengthened by magic patterns. Their strength was no less than that of ghost-patterned soldier ants. Each of the cavalrymen had a handy magic weapon in their hands, and they did not look embarrassed even if they retreated. The cavalry continued to retreat, luring the ghost-patterned soldier ants into the range of the bed crossbow. The bed crossbow surrounding the bridge head fired at the same time and a large number of ghost-patterned soldier ants were hit by arrows. Many red ants fell directly from the bridge into the lake. What followed was a tug-of-war that began on the stone arch bridge. This was all because the ghost-striped red ants were restricted by the terrain, and could not use their numerical advantage to suppress the cavalry. The cavalry abandoned their horses to fight on foot, which also gave up their greatest advantage. They pulled back and forth, basically allowing the crossbowmen to take advantage. The archers also gathered near the lake, 
and shot a shower of arrows at the ghostly patterned soldier ants. Even Serdak did not expect that just in the battle at the bridgehead. A steady stream of ghost-marked soldier ants rushed out, causing the army to fight hard here for more than half a month. With the cavalry and indigenous warriors taking turns to fight, materials and supplies were continuously delivered from behind. Serdak's marching tent was set up on the top of the bridge slope. He even built several rafts by the lake specifically to fish out the ghost patterns that fell into the lake. Soldier ants. However, as the weather gradually gets colder, the ice on the lake becomes thicker and thicker. And the ice must be broken before these rafts can be rowed to the lake. But it wouldn't work without these rafts. The three centimeter thick ice layer couldn't support people at all. Since the stone bridge was blocked by the ghost marked soldier ants, Serdak could only slowly consume the vitality of the ghost marked red ants. During this period, the joint forces of the adventure group and the mercenary group harvested a batch of magic herbs near the lake. There were also some adventure groups that specialized in digging for poisonous millipedes in the poisonous swamp. The first ones who followed Serdak's army to the north were both the adventure group and the mercenary group made money. As this batch of magic herbs entered the trading market in Duoda in town, the entire Belan plain became aware of the northern expedition. As soon as the beast tide subsided, Soldak, the new lord of the Belan plain, summoned 10,000 troops to attack the Dark Worm Valley. This simply shocked the jaws of many Wilkes people. The beasts haven't fought enough yet. And they actually attack people's lairs. What's even more annoying is that after breaking through the poisonous swamp, the natural barrier of the Dark Worm Valley, a large amount of magic herbs were harvested. And almost all the adventure groups and mercenary groups that followed benefited. At this time, the rest of the adventure group and mercenary group in Wilk City couldn't sit still. Of course, they also wanted to pick up precious magic herbs by walking around the lake. And they also wanted to dig up casually in the swamp. A poisonous insect that can obtain a zombie state. Even many small lords in Wilk City have gone to the military headquarters in recent days to inquire about this information. They want to know if Lord Soldak has any plans to recruit troops in the near future. They have some well-trained soldiers. Army. The response given by the military department was that the northern expedition was entirely the personal behavior of Viscount Soldak. All military supplies and troops were personally borne by him. The military department did not give any explanation for this, nor did it assume any responsibility to know whether Viscount Soldak had any plans to recruit troops. He had to go to the northern front line of Invercargill Forest and ask Viscount Soldak personally. Both the adventure group and the mercenary group were relatively flexible. They could leave at will. Many adventure groups left Wilk City that day. There are also some businessmen from Wilk City who are preparing to collect some supplies and go to Doden Town to reap benefits. However, the smart businessman did not go to Doden Town at this time, but ran to Malakom and proposed to do business with him. Everyone who was well informed knew that Malakom was Viscount Serdak's only material. Supplier. The battle at the southern end of the stone bridge lasted for more than half a month. Although a lot of supplies were consumed, a large number of ghosts marked red ants were also hunted. The daily expenses are not small, but the harvest is enough, at least for Serdak. The balance of payments can still be maintained. But he has also realized that with this stalemate at the bridge, once this winter passes, he may not be able to withdraw his troops even if he doesn't want to. Originally, I wanted to use bed crossbows and catapults to blast it all the way. Later, the cavalry and tribal warriors took turns to fight. Obviously, this stone bridge could not be captured. So in the third week, Samira, who was already extremely irritated by the boring tug of war at the top of the city every day, pushed three crossbow carts onto the stone bridge. And the crossbow arrows she brought to the stone bridge this time were all explosive crossbow bolts strapped with explosives. Behind the bed crossbow is a group of infantry preparing for battle. And behind the infantry are two catapults. Just when the ghost patterned soldier ants on the opposite side launched a charge, Samira shot three exploding giant crossbow arrows at the opposite side without any sense of martial ethics. The giant crossbow exploded on the arched bridge. And at the same time, the desire for victory of the ghostly patterned soldier ants was shattered, as the catapults behind them threw explosives that exploded on the stone bridge one after another. The ghostly patterned soldier ants fell from the bridge into the icy lake one after another. The stalemate in the battle was broken by these exploding arrows. Chapter 920 for the ants counterattack. The explosive arrows of the bed crossbows and the flints of the catapults made these ghost marked soldier ants miserable and retreated steadily. They were forced to give up the stone bridge. Andrew and Samira quickly completely occupied the stone bridge with a span of three kilometers. As expected, 
the farther you get to Tianju Mountain, the wider the stone bridge deck becomes. The diameter of the part of the stone bridge that goes deep into the soil is almost 200 meters. There are actually other stone bridges next to it. But none of the other stone bridges are as big as this one. Serdak led the army quickly through the stone arch bridge and finally came to the other side of the lake. At the foot of Shirju Peak, I discovered that this place is simply a dynasty of red ants with ghost stripes. The entire mountain wall has been riddled with holes dug by red ants with ghost stripes. Looking around, there are ant nests dug by red ants with ghost stripes everywhere. There is no way of knowing which hole is the real entrance to the ant nest. There are some busy ghost striped worker ants everywhere. These ghost striped soldier ants, which are about the size of a calf, line up neatly with all kinds of food on their tentacles. They gather from all directions and get into the cave. The lines arranged by these worker ants look like exquisite runes from a distance. Tens of thousands of ghost patterned soldier ants are blocked under the stone bridge. These ant colonies are mixed with a large number of giant soldier ants. At this moment, the tribal warriors at the front are holding shields to block the attack of the ghost patterned soldier ants. Catapults and beds. The flints and exploding arrows shot by the crossbow continued to explode in the ant colony. And more soldier ants rushed up almost crazily. There are a large number of giant soldier ants in the middle of the ant colony. Samira must deal with these giant soldier ants first. Otherwise, once they rush over, they will put huge pressure on the military formation. Following several rounds of counterattacks by the ghost striped soldier ants, most of the northern bridgeheads that had been occupied were reoccupied by the ghost striped red ants. Moreover, the army has been fighting on the bridge, and it is difficult to recover many giant crossbow arrows after they are shot out. Up to this moment, the giant crossbow arrows worth 10,000 gold coins purchased by Serdek from the businessman Malakom have been almost used up. The supply from the rear has shown to be insufficient. Serdek can only give up the stone bridge again retreated to the southern exit of the stone bridge, waiting for the giant crossbow mobilized by Merchant Malakom from Wilk City. A large number of ghost pattern soldier ants rush out every day, and the battle on the stone bridge becomes more intense. The soldier ant camp is also mixed with some giant soldier ants with black heart armor. These giant soldier ants are not afraid of ordinary crossbows at all. Every time they emerge from the ant colony, Samira will entertain them with magic giant crossbows. Entering November there were two consecutive heavy snowfalls during this period. The ice lake under the stone bridge can already support pedestrians, and horse racing in the edge area is no problem. But the thunder rhinoceros cannot walk on it yet. The combat effectiveness of the ghost-striped soldier, Ants, was greatly reduced in the wind and snow. When Andrew led the cavalry back from the stone bridge, a howling sound erupted from the lake in the distance, and a huge monster was on the withered grass beside the lake. On the road, chasing the adventure groups and mercenary groups, who collected magic herbs overnight. A group of ghost patterned soldier ants emerged from the cave behind it. They raised their tall tentacles and caught up with those who were left behind. Blood and limbs suddenly exploded in the crowd. Although the adventure group by the lake organized several counterattacks, they were quickly dispersed by the rampaging behemoth. The members of the adventure group and the mercenary group quickly approached the Serdak military formation, and the ghost striped soldier ants chased after them. Andrew led the cavalry battalion and rushed towards the behemoth along the lake at this moment. That behemoth was twice as thick as the 10-meter-long ghost-striped male ant. Its armor was almost dyed black. Its huge head was raised high, as if there were three pairs of tentacles growing out of its head, and six huge ones. The outriggers support the body. Maybe the sand near the lake is too soft for it. The six outriggers are stuck in it and have to be pulled out of the sand each time to take a step forward. It's huge. That belly dragged a deep ravine out of the sand by the lake. It had a pair of extremely long tentacles, like two spears, with the corpses of six or seven members of the adventure group hanging on them. It was waving when the tentacles were raised. The completely fragmented corpses were hanging on it and swinging back and forth. Not only were the two tentacles stained red by blood, but even its upper body was dyed red by the sticky blood. Samira stood on a platform high above the armed thunder rhinoceros. She asked her assistant to load a huge armor-breaking crossbow arrow on the bed crossbow. Unfortunately, this place is a bit far away from the battlefield. So I can only watch the members of the adventure group desperately trying to escape this way. At this moment, Andrew's 500 cavalrymen had already rushed forward quickly. But when he saw a swordsman who summoned the shadow of the sword master being pierced through the chest by the behemoth, he knew that all the cavalry behind him could not be the opponent of the behemoth. All the cavalrymen tried to keep as far away from the behemoth as possible. There were also several powerful swordsmen in the adventure group. 
desperately trying to hold down the behemoth and create time for their teammates to escape. They all know how sharp and powerful the two tentacles of this behemoth are and can easily penetrate even the excellent level tower shield. Fortunately, it was stuck in the sand and it was extremely difficult to move. It was like a huge farming machine. Every time it took a step forward, sand flew up on both sides of its body. Andrew didn't even think about the consequences of rushing forward. So he rode up on his horse and charged forward single-handedly. The 500 cavalry behind them dispersed to intercept and kill other ghost pattern soldier, ants, who were chasing the adventure group. The two-headed ogre had just walked out of the military camp and happened to see the behemoth by the lake. He shouted to Soldak. Dak, a male ant has emerged over there. Andrew may not be able to defeat it. Let's go help. This was the first time that Serdak heard that the ogre wanted to gather his companions to fight the opponent. Usually the ogre rarely talked like this. But since Gulitam said this, he quickly got out of the tent, mounted his horse, and chased after Gulitam. Samira saw Serdak and Gulitam chasing behind Andrew, and also let the armed Thunder Rhino approach the behemoth along the grassland by the lake, before Serdak could get close to the behemoth. He felt a rumbling roar from the ground beneath his feet, followed by a series of huge earthquakes that made it almost impossible to stand on the ground. A large lump suddenly bulged out from the ground near the lake. A huge creature popped out of the permafrost and stretched out two three-meter-long tentacles to block Gulitam and Serdak. Countless ghost pattern soldier ants poured out of the cave dug behind it. Samira stood on the armed thunder rhino, less than 200 meters away from this behemoth. Her bed crossbow happened to be equipped with a giant armor-breaking crossbow arrow. Facing such a behemoth, she didn't even need to aim. Can hit. The arrow flew out with a hint of wind element. It instantly hit the behemoth in front of him. But the armor-breaking crossbow arrow actually pierced the thick armor on its chest and failed to penetrate the hard armor at all. The behemoth looked down at his chest in astonishment and then let out an angry roar. The shockwave rippling under his feet blew the ghostly patterned soldier ants that had just crawled out of the wormhole into rolling motions. Gulitam was even pushed back more than 10 meters by the circular shock wave. Chapter 925 Stones the giant male ant raised the sharp tentacles in its hands high. Countless magic lines lit up on both sides of its body. And a series of roars came from its mouth. The sharp tentacles pointed at Andrew from a distance. Just as Andrew continued to rush forward, the giant male ant also made a move. He looked very clumsy and turned into an afterimage. He rushed in front of Andrew in an instant. And the tentacles in his hands suddenly moved forward. Pierce out. Andrew thought that this behemoth would be as clumsy as an ordinary ghost-striped male ant. And he didn't even pay much attention during the charge. It was this oversight that gave the giant male ant an opportunity to take advantage of it. The sharp tentacles almost stretched out in front of Andrew. Only then did he react and quickly hit the tentacles with the butcher's axe in his hand. The butcher's axe struck at the tentacles. When it was hit by the pincer, it made a harsh sound of gold and iron. The tentacles just hit Andrew's axe blade and Andrew felt a huge force coming from the tentacles. And the giant axe suddenly swung backwards. In terms of strength, there is a huge gap between Andrew and this behemoth. The moment the butcher's axe was repelled by the pincers, it hit Andrew's magic pattern breastplate heavily. Andre felt a thunderous force hit his chest, which almost caused his internal organs to shift, and his body flew backwards for ten seconds. Domi, the earth shield magic pattern structure on Andrew's body suddenly lit up and the three shields hit the contact pincers in succession, shattering to pieces. Even Andrew couldn't block the behemoth's full blow. The suppression of power caused Andrew to fall out. He spit out a mouthful of blood in midair, and then fell heavily on the beach by the lake. He couldn't get up from the sand for a long time. Look at the Gubo Lai war horse under his crotch that has been strengthened by magic patterns. At this time, all its limbs have been severed, and blood is flowing from its eyes, nose and ears. It fell to the sandy ground, and the horse's blood left a trail of blood on the hard sandy ground. The internal organs exploded from the inside of his belly, and his death was a bit horrific. The behemoth in front of him actually knocked the berserker to the ground, and ghost patterned soldier ants surrounded Andrew from all sides. A rain of arrows fell one after another, and the ghost marked soldier ants actually rushed forward despite the rain of arrows. Andrew lay on the sand, with flames and arcs of electricity rushing around his body. He gasped for breath and failed to get up after several attempts. The two-headed ogre and Serdak rushed towards the behemoth in unison. At this time, it resumed its slow pace, raised its sharp spear-like forelimbs, and dug a deep ditch in the sand. The hard soil layer showed huge frozen blocks, but they were covered by the six thick ones. The giant legs crushed it to pieces. 
the surrounding cavalry also tried to get closer to Andrew. And they flew away the ghost-patterned soldier ants that rushed up from the front, taking advantage of the speed of charging. The cavalry must quickly leave the battlefield to pick off a ghost-patterned soldier ant, and only then can they resume the charge. Otherwise, once they are caught in a melee and unable to escape, and lose their speed advantage, the cavalry will have nothing to lose. The fighting power is remarkable. They gritted their teeth, turned their horses' heads, and charged towards the grass. After picking off the ghost-patterned soldier ants, he continued to rush towards Andrew. Andrew, who was lying on the sand with his mouth full of blood, let out a sigh of relief. The cavalryman rationally implemented the tactics he had formulated and did not rush to die, which made him feel more relaxed. He watched the blue sky constantly rotating and constantly felt the huge earthquakes on the earth. The last time he was so close to death was during the siege of Wazamala. He clearly knew that the giant male and was only a few meters away from him and he no longer had the energy to make any evasive movements. Pursued by ghost-patterned soldier ants, the dispersed crowd of adventure group and mercenary group saw a giant male ants emerging in front of them, and they were already running towards the deserted grassland. Samira squatted on the control platform, and the bed crossbow fired another armor-piercing crossbow arrow. This time she became much more cautious when aiming and shooting. She no longer aimed at the chest of the giant male ant, but aimed at its most vulnerable compound eyes. However, this kind of male ant actually had a circle of terrifying eyeballs on its head. Samira, you can only choose the eyeball with the most correct shooting angle. Boom. The armor-breaking crossbow arrow sounded an explosion in the air and flew towards the giant male ant. Samira didn't stop at all. She stood directly on the bed crossbow, stepped on the wooden frame of the bed crossbow, and struggled to pull the sky strike bow into a full circle. As the magic crystal on the sky strike bow moved violently, it turned into countless fine particles when burned, and a large amount of magic power poured into the magic pattern of the sky strike bow from the grooves of the gems, turning into beams of lightning and injecting it into the arrows. A bolt of lightning-like arrows streaked across the sky, flying in front of the giant male, and almost at the same time as the armor-breaking crossbow arrows. The arrows fired from the sky strike bow came first, and were inserted into the head of the giant male ant first. The arrows wrapped in lightning released countless electric snakes. At the same time, a bolt of lightning fell from the sky and hit the giant male ant's head. The blazing white light illuminated the giant male ant's body. The next moment, the armor-piercing giant crossbow arrow also penetrated deeply into the mouth of the giant male ant. Just under the baptism of the lightning beam, the giant male ant actually rushed out of the light network formed by the arc. Its hard armor had become scorched under the arc, and it was emitting wisps of green smoke. A three-meter-long armor-piercing crossbow arrow was inserted into its huge mouth but it still did not stop its attack. It only became more violent. The ogre took the opportunity to rush to Andrew. He picked Andrew up from the ground with only one hand and held it under his arm. The fireball in his other hand knocked over a ghost-patterned soldier ant that had surrounded him and turned around to fight. Run back for your life. Along the way, ghost-patterned soldier ants kept popping up to block him, and the two-headed ogre refused to let go. He attacked the body several times with the ghost-patterned soldier ants, and ran back howling. Andrew was about to be crushed into a pulp by his kick. Of course, the giant male, and did not want to let Andrew go. It followed the two-headed ogre, and the magic patterns on both sides of its abdomen once again appeared. His body once again it turned into an afterimage, and hit behind the two-headed ogre. Gulitam was running at full speed at this moment, and his good brother Nahua kept looking back, staring at the giant male ant. When he saw the body of the giant male ant turned into an afterimage, and rushed towards him. He screamed in fright and cursed Gulitam, a big idiot, who was just looking for death. The dwarf chain shield in Seldak's hand had been damaged while hunting the cloud pattern ghost leopard. What he was holding now was a commemorative shield that had been strengthened and enchanted. This shield is the strongest looking square tower shield he picked out from the magic arsenal. Seeing the giant male and light up the magic pattern again, obviously wanting to charge again, Serdak knew that Gulitam would not be able to escape like this. He gritted his teeth, jumped off the horse with a tower shield in hand, and slapped the old man hard on the butt, causing him to run away on his own. He held up his shield to face the giant male ant and recited a series of magic spells quickly. At this moment, a golden magic pattern appeared on his neck. Shilampulam. Then, there was a series of short spells on the sand in front of him. A clay stone demon quickly condensed. The four meter tall clay stone demon actually looked very thin in front of the giant male ant. The clay stone mill just stood in the way of the giant male ant's charge. 
The moment he appeared, various halos lit up under his feet. The moment he saw the giant male and its body turned into an afterimage, a pair of iron fists were already crossed on his chest. Swinging. Take a defensive stance. Serdak stood behind the clay stone demon and raised his shield in the same posture. The moment the giant male and collided with the clay stone demon, a two-faced and four-armed demon god appeared behind Serdak. There was a loud bang. The clay stone demon that looked like a tough guy was scattered again into yellow sand in the sky under the collision of giant male ants. The giant male ants' momentum only slowed down slightly before it crashed into Serdak's body. At this critical moment, the shadow of the two-faced and four-armed demon became extremely solid, and four big golden hands instantly stood in front of him, protecting him in their palms. As the golden shadow shattered, the giant male ants' sharp tentacles finally hit Serdak's shield. The magic shield worth five magic crystals was easily pierced by the giant male ant, and Serdak was also knocked away by the giant male ant at this time. Although most of the power was borne by the clay stone and four big hands, the last bit of power still made him lie on the ground. Somewhat out of breath, the six legs of the giant male ant took turns pulling out of the sand and approaching Serdak step by step. Chapter 926 Defeat The battlefield near the lake was in chaos. A large number of members of the adventure group and mercenary group were being chased by a group of ghost pattern soldier ants. Behind them was a giant male ant, rampaging through the crowd. The joint forces of the adventure group and mercenary group were at the lake. A large number of people were killed or injured. Serdak fell in front of another giant male ant that emerged from the burrow. During the pause in the charge, the giant male ant slowly approached Serdak, who was lying on the sand step by step. Seeing that Serdak was about to be poked out a hole by the giant male ant's sharp forelimbs. On the sand beneath Serdak, black magic lines spread like vines, and countless phantoms condensed into a come to the door. Aphrodite jumped out of the void wearing a mithril mask, her magic robes flying in the air, and a pair of nearly transparent insect wings appeared behind her. With a gentle buzzing sound, Aphrodite's hand Soldak hugged the body lying on the ground. His body dropped slightly, and then immediately rushed into the air. The body almost flew out against the sharp forelimbs of the giant male ant, and the giant male ant roared towards Aphrodite. Aphrodite rushed towards Samira's thunder rhinoceros without looking back. Lying on the Thunder Rhinoceros platform, Serdak turned his head and glanced at the giant male ant. His first words were to tell the herald next to Samira, Send my order, and the entire army will evacuate the camp immediately and give up. All military supplies quickly pass through the poisonous swamp and retreat to the mountain stream iron cable bridge. Armed Thunder Rhinoceros cuts off the rear. When the herald heard Soldak say this, his legs softened and he almost knelt on the ground. After being kicked by Samira on the side, he climbed onto the roof and faced the other armed thunder rhinoceros who were rushing towards them. He waved the flag in his hand repeatedly and the sound of the withdrawal horn resounded across the lakeside. The combined forces of the adventure group and the mercenary group, which had become a mess on the shore, let out a wailing sound pursued by the soldier ants that kept pouring out of the wormholes. Without any hesitation, they turned around and rushed into the poisonous swamp, desperately escaping southward. The armed thunder rhino standing on the slope had already begun to change direction and began to move closer to the camp. The cavalrymen left the battlefield one after another, but the ghost pattern soldier ants were chasing after them, and the scene became extremely chaotic for a while. There are also a row of catapults and a row of catapults parked on the hillside. The catapults have already pulled out all the bow strings, and the catapults have also prepared explosive packets. They just need to adjust the throwing angle and ignite the projectile. The tribal warriors, who ran out of the camp heard the sound of retreat horns before they entered the battlefield. Even the leader of the tribe was a little confused. Only when he ran up the slope did he see that the battlefield by the lake had been occupied by two behemoths. Rivers of blood flowed, and bodies lying in pools of blood were everywhere. Some of the stumps were still being eaten by ghost-striped soldier ants. The two-headed ogre holding Andrew was also in the retreating team. Serdak and Samira stood on the platform of Thunder Rhinoceros. A group of cavalry gradually withdrew from the battlefield, surrounding them and heading towards the slope. Running wildly, there are more and more ghost pattern soldier ants behind, and even a large number of ghost pattern soldier ants are pouring out from the stone bridge. Eighteen armed thunder rhinos formed a flesh and blood city wall on the slope. A row of crossbows were parked at their feet. Almost all the crossbows were aimed at the bulky giant male and chasing behind. More than seventy giant crossbow arrows at the same time. They flew towards the behemoth and then heard the bang-bang sound of an ordinary giant crossbow arrow hitting the giant male ant. 
ordinary crossbow arrows all bounced away from the giant male ant. Only those precious armor-breaking giant crossbow arrows pierced into its hard armor. However, the penetration was not deep, and it did not seem to cause much damage to it. There was only a giant crossbow arrow inserted into the huge mouth, which looked like it was causing it to feel abnormal pain. As for those exploding giant crossbows, they also exploded on the giant male ants. In the smoke, the giant male ant rushed out almost intact, standing on the back of the armed thunder rhinoceros. Sernak finally gave up his last illusion of luck. Faced with such two giant male ants that were completely unkillable, Sernak signaled the army to quickly evacuate from the stone bridge camp, retreat into the poison swamp, and follow the original path back to the mountain stream iron cable bridge, hoping to use the natural barrier to block these two behemoths. Fortunately, the two behemoths moved very slowly in the soft soil. Even climbing this not-so-high slope was quite difficult. These giant male ants are far less mobile than the armed thunder rhinoceros, and they are constantly throwing crossbows and catapults, which greatly hinders their pursuit. The soldier ants that emerged from the bridge and the burrow were more agile. They chased behind the cavalry and began to climb the slope quickly. However, these soldier ants also suffered a large number of casualties under the rain of arrows and explosive arrows. 3,000 indigenous warriors took the lead in withdrawing into the poison swamp. All the catapults and catapults were abandoned on the hillside, in addition to the necessary supplies needed for the march. The Shirtyal camp also abandoned the tents. Then came the 500 archers who went into battle lightly, but they could still maintain a neat formation at this moment, and they seemed to still maintain a strong will to fight. 18 thunder rhinoceros and 500 cavalrymen stood guard at the end. They were least afraid of being entangled by ordinary ghost pattern soldier ants. There are 500 archers squatting on the thunder rhinoceros. No matter which direction the soldier ants come from, they will face more archers squatting on the shells. The cavalry fought with the ghost pattern soldier ants and retreated all the way. Because Serdak abandoned a large amount of supplies, the team retreated very quickly. The giant male ants chased to the poisonous swamp and roared at the edge of the poisonous swamp. They did not rush into the poisonous swamp recklessly. It seemed that they also knew that they could easily sink into those bottomless mud pits. Although they live in burrows, that doesn't mean they won't drown if they fall into a mud puddle. Seeing that the giant male ants did not enter the poisonous swamp, Serdak organized the cavalry to clear out a wave of ghost pattern soldier ants in the poisonous swamp, and launched a rescue operation for the adventure group and mercenary group coalition forces. In this battle, Serdak lost nearly half of his supplies, and 41 first turn cavalrymen failed to enter the poisonous swamp. Andrew was seriously injured, and even if he was treated with Serdak's holy light technique, he would probably need at least half a month to recover. Many people from the joint forces of the adventure group and the mercenary group also died. Many adventure groups were looking for surviving members after escaping from danger. Serdak rode the armed thunder rhino out of the poisonous swamp and returned to the temporary camp on the north bank of the mountain stream chain bridge. He began to accept the wounded from the adventure group and the mercenary group and provide them with basic treatment. Hearing that this Count Serdak accepted all the wounded from the adventure group and the mercenary group, the adventure groups gathered around the temporary camp on the north bank of the chain bridge. Looking around, I saw a field of gray tents set up here. Too many to count. This time Serdak also became ruthless and took out all the boxes of primary sacrifices saved from killing the ghost marked soldier ants, almost filling his treatment room. As long as there were some injuries that were difficult to heal, he would directly just sacrifice a primary sacrifice and pray to the face of God for the blessing of the blessed body. Soldek was busy all day and night in that treatment room. Chapter 927 Second Turn Paladin Serdak never thought that he still underestimated the true strength of the ghost-marked red ants. He had to pay for his wrong judgment this time. He thought that no matter what kind of trouble he encountered, he would be able to find a way to resolve it in time with the power he had now. Unexpectedly, just two giant male ants interrupted this northern expedition. He built a treatment room in the temporary camp on the north bank of the mountain stream chain bridge and used holy light to treat the injured warriors. Adventure groups and mercenary groups could also be treated. The priority was determined based on the severity of the injuries. He spent all day and night. I didn't sleep much at all. When I was tired, I would lean against the wall and drink water. When I was sleepy, I would close my eyes and squint for a while, until he felt that the treatment room was filled with a strong smell of blood. He stretched his body and saw that the two assistants had fallen asleep leaning on the edge of the tent. Serdak opened the tent and looked at the wooden boxes containing primary sacrifices piled at the door. Some of the boxes still had a slight smell of decay. 
seeing that there were people standing guard outside the tent. They asked people to move the empty boxes away from the door. There were still ghost striped red ants rushing out from the direction of the poisonous swamp. The military camp sent a team of indigenous warriors to block the edge of the poisonous swamp. The fighting was fierce on the battlefield. But there was no trace of the two giant male ants. They were probably its blocked by the poisonous swamp on that side. But it's hard to say whether it will dig a burrow under the swamp and get through. The scene in front of him made Serdak a little confused. Even though he had worked hard to treat people all day and night, there were still many wounded waiting outside who needed his treatment. They didn't even line up. They just sat on the ground outside the camp and looked at this side with expectant eyes. Unfortunately, Nika and the treatment team were still in Doden Town. And he regretted not bringing Nika over. But then I thought again. How could I let Nika go to the battlefield under such circumstances? She is still so young. He lowered his head and walked back to the tent. The injured who had been treated were carried out. But the new wounded had not yet been carried in. He was sitting on the sacrificial box. The sacrificial ceremony was not over yet. Four lanterns were hung in the tent, emitting a dim light. The statue of the two-faced and four-armed demon was leaning against the wall of the tent. It did look a bit strange here. Shabby. Samira didn't touch a bite of the dinner that Samira brought him last night. Now he simply couldn't eat a bite. He sat down a little slumped, thinking that the northern expedition ended in such an embarrassing situation. It was a bit frustrating to say the least. Even when Serdak was full of irritation. He saw the two-faced and four-armed demon statue filled with a dark aura. At this time, the statue became very solid inside the tent. And the demon's face was in Sir Dak looked at him in surprise and slowly turned to him. The empty eyes on the statue seemed to have energy. But the dazzling light prevented him from looking directly. He could only squint his eyes, cover his face with his hands, and look at the statue in front of him through his fingers. Sacrifice the sacrifice to me, and you will have the power to kill these ants. A gentle voice came from the statue. And he knew that the voice came from the face of the devil. He glanced at the face with eyes. But that face said nothing. Shouldn't both parties be bidding at this time? He even looked forward to what kind of conditions the face of God could give him. But after waiting for a while, there was still no reaction from the face of God. Serdak shook his head helplessly, lowered his head, and looked at the wooden boxes filled with sacrifices around him. After thinking seriously for a while, he said to the demon statue, Compared to the power of chaos in the darkness, I yearn for the sacred power in the light more. The demon's face stared at Serdak with a distorted expression. And there was a kind of, You will regret it, in his eyes. But he did not bother too much. The light in his eyes slowly dissipated. And the statue returned to its original appearance. Just when Serdak was about to call the wounded to come in and continue treatment, a little bit of sacred elements in the air continued to condense and gather. Then, there was a charm in the eyes of the face of God and the face of the statue slowly turned around. He looked at Soldek with soft eyes and asked, Human, do you want to have a stronger power of holy light? Soldek nodded seriously and said, Yes, I want that. A kind of Sanskrit sound seemed to resound in the sky. The sound was not loud, but it penetrated the eardrums. The eyes of the face of God became brighter and brighter. A ray of holy light penetrated the tent and covered Soldek. Emerald green leaves continued to fall in the holy light. Those leaves were not real leaves, but strong and pure waves. The breath of life. Every leaf falling on Serdak injects powerful vitality into his body. The vitality made the holy light in his body like a surging ocean tide. The huge waves washed over Serdak's body and continued to surge towards the place where the lower body was shrouded in darkness. Pieces of green leaves fall in the golden light. Are you willing to keep a humble heart, respect others, and be modest and prudent at all times? The Sanskrit sounded again which caused Serdak to hear the eight virtues of knights that he had learned at the Knight Academy, and that he had sworn in front of the stone tablet on the day he became a knight. I want to stay humble at all times, he said. Are you willing to fight for honor, even at the cost of your life? Sanskrit sounded. I am willing to fight for honor, he said loudly. Powerful aura continued to pour into Serdak's body, and he felt that his whole body was dyed golden by the holy light. Do you have the courage? When you need to pay the price to fulfill the interests of the majority of people, do you dare to sacrifice? The Sanskrit sound sounded again. I dare to sacrifice, he said seriously. Are you brave enough to fearlessly declare war on evil? I'm brave enough. Are you willing to show mercy to the weak and tolerate others? I pity the people. Are you willing to be an honest and trustworthy person? I will always be honest and trustworthy. Are you willing to be impartial and selfless and strictly abide by the rules? 
I will be fair and impartial. Will you uphold my spirit? I am willing to uphold these spirits at all times. After he took the oath, as if he had made some kind of choice, the powerful holy aura was like a huge light group, completely wrapping Serdak's body, and the dark star in his body was very fast at this time dimmed down. He could feel the dark power being slowly stripped away from his body. The strange feeling was like stirring marshmallows. And the aura full of evil and darkness was being pulled out of his body, like a cocoon being peeled off. Serdak stood in front of the statue. And the dark stars in his body separated from his body layer by layer, turning into countless tiny particles and floating in the tent. The power of holy light continued to pour downwards. And his body actually turned into a golden holy body at the last moment. The skin all over his body seemed to be able to breathe freely in the air, absorbing the sacred breath existing in the surrounding air. His body is like a huge container capable of the power of holy light. Countless holy lights are surging in his body. This feeling is far purer and more majestic than the power of holy light stored in countless nodes in the body. The beam of light shone on Serdak's body, and his body became transparent and golden, and his whole body was glowing with golden light. At this time, the statue behind him was no longer the statue of the double-faced devil. The statue shattered into countless golden fragments at this moment. An angel with a pair of golden wings reappeared behind him, holding a big sword in both hands. Suspended in midair, lowered his head and meditated. Serdak only felt that at this moment. Something in his body seemed to be broken. The overwhelming power filled his body. At this moment, he even had a strong urge to look up to the sky and shout. He felt that countless sacred powers turned into trickles and converged into his body. That pure sacred aura was already a part of his body. At this moment, he looked at his hands that were glowing with golden light, and finally realized that he was already a rank 2 powerhouse. Chapter 928 Vision When Serdak walked out of the tent, a flash of fish belly white lit up on the horizon. On the winter dawn morning, with a cold wind blowing across my face, the two-headed ogres Gulitam and Samira were standing guard outside. Seeing Serdak coming out, they all smiled knowingly. Serdak didn't know how much movement he made during his second turn. But at this moment, all the soldiers, knights, tribal warriors, adventure group members, and mercenaries in the army looked at the marching tent, and everyone was waiting for him to come out of the tent. When he saw him walking out of the tent, there were cheers from all around. Soldak raised his hands towards everyone, signaling for everyone to be quiet, and said to the wounded waiting outside the tent, Next, to continue treating the wounded, I need everyone to obey the order and stay quiet. A wounded man was lying on a stretcher with an excited expression. When he was carried in by his companions, blood was still oozing from the bandaged wound. It seemed that their team's losses were not too big, and they knew the rules here in Serdak very well. So they took the initiative to leave two heads of ghost pattern soldier ants. When treating these adventure groups and mercenary groups this time, Serdak felt that there was something wrong with his command and did not restrain the coalition forces of the adventure groups and mercenary groups which caused huge casualties to the coalition forces. He treated these wounded soldiers. At that time, the need for Warcraft heads as sacrifices was not mentioned at all. It seems that this adventure group should be a team registered in Duo Dan Town. Serdak knelt down in front of the wounded soldier, untied the wound, and sewed up the torn wound. A ball formed in his palm. The powerful healing power of the Holy Light spell made the wound visible to the naked eye. Speed is healing. He clearly felt that some of the holy light was consumed in his body, and his mind naturally thought of the rune language he had learned in the secret room of the red dragon treasure. Draw a magic pattern in front of him. The core of this magic pattern only has four runes, but it makes Serdak feel extremely mysterious. It was the same as the call of war before. Although he understands its painting method and structure, it is I have never succeeded in painting. This time he had a strange feeling in his heart, and the rune language naturally appeared in his mind. Sight. He recited something silently in his heart, and then began to recite the pronunciation of the runes. His fingers gathered the power of holy light and drew runes one after another in front of him. Raltir Talsol. A matrix of magic patterns appeared under his feet. Standing in the matrix, he felt that the power of holy light was constantly gathering from all directions. The surroundings were instantly filled with a large amount of holy light power. This holy light power quickly replenished his body. In vivo, but this is only one of the effects. And his speed of casting holy light seems to have become faster. It seems that he can control the holy light accurately. He tried to condense a small amount of holy light. Unexpectedly, the speed of condensation increased three times. There was almost no pause. And the light appeared after a flash. Although the healing effect is a little worse. 
the power of the holy light consumed is very small, and the casting speed is very fast. The wounded man lying on the stretcher was a little confused, thinking, didn't he just perform a healing spell? Why do it again? Could it be that I'm too seriously injured? Serdak sacrificed a head. Since someone had brought a sacrifice, it would be unkind to not use it. So he blessed the wounded soldier with the blessing of blessed body, and then walked to the entrance of the tent to tease him. He raised the curtain and shouted, Take him out and bandage the wound with a clean bandage. Next one. In order to save time, the preliminary wound treatment and subsequent bandaging were performed outside the tent. After treating a dozen wounded people in this way, Serdek discovered that the healing power of the Holy Light after the second turn was much stronger than before, and the wounds had a sanctifying effect. When Serdak uses the Holy Light technique on the wounded, the wounded person's wound will be stained with a little bit of divine light, although it is only for a very short period of time. During this period, when he uses the Holy Light technique on the wound again, this the healing effect of wounds will be greatly enhanced. It has been three days since the rescue work at the Tyaswokyo camp was completed. The fighting here is still going on, and ghostmark soldier ants are constantly crossing the poisonous swamp to attack the camp here. These ghostmark soldier ants originally wanted to continue to hunt the members of the adventure group. They were not very smart. They could see some camps in the distance and even smell the smell of blood there. So they wanted to rush over at one go and crush the army in front of them, like the stone bridge camp. These soldier ants didn't seem to understand that the defeat of Serdak's army was not due to them, but to the two male ants that were almost like steel fortresses. Some adventure groups left one after another, but those that did not suffer attrition stayed, guarding the north entrance of the Iron Chain Bridge, opening up a battlefield to continue hunting ghost-striped soldier ants. The victory in the past few days made these soldier ants very bold. Soldier ants kept rushing to the battlefield here, and then quickly turned into trophies. During this period, another batch of supplies arrived at the Iron Chain Bridge Camp from the Canyon Woodland Military Camp. Andrew. Gulitum and Samira spent the whole day studying how to kill the two giant male ants. With Soldak's treatment twice a day, morning and evening, Andrew's injury improved quickly. For Andrew, he was defeated in front of the giant male ant this time, and lost an ancient bow lie horse that had been with him for a long time. He was a little depressed. Being depressed may cause the berserker's strength to decline. So Andrew has been slowly adjusting his condition in the past few days. There is also an irreparable wound on the chest of the earth shield magic pattern structure even if it can be repaired. It may greatly reduce the service life of this magic pattern structure. This makes him feel very distressed. I originally planned to wear it for the rest of my life. But it would be best to wait until Serdak dies before he dies. So that this magic pattern structure can be legitimately left to his son. During Serdak's battle at the Quoto camp, the army did not lose much strength. But almost all the military supplies were thrown away. This part of the material loss was worth nearly 15,000 magic crystals. The most valuable supplies are the 40 brand new crossbows and 20 catapults. The camp also stocks some giant crossbow arrows, gunpowder, etc. Although he retreated to the Iron Chain Bridge Camp, Sue did not take it lightly. He was still worried that these two giant male ants would dig holes to cross the poisonous swamp and suddenly come to this battlefield. He had not yet found a way to deal with them. So Soldak also made some preparations at the Iron Chain Bridge Camp. Half of the troops in the military camp and the wounded soldiers were transferred to the south bank of the mountain stream and restationed a camp to prevent a sudden outbreak of war. Can't go back. In addition, Serdak also prepared several large packs of black powder explosive barrels for the two giant male ants. These explosive barrels were buried in the crevices of the rocks. As long as they were pressed tightly enough, they could cause large areas of the mountain to collapse. In the past, when Serdak was in Wall Village, he used this kind of black powder barrel to blast limestone in the mountains. Bury it in. Ignite it. And the entire mountain wall can collapse. He used this method to bury two ghost strike ant queens in the Doden Canyon. However, Serdak was worried that even if he caused a landslide, he might not be able to completely bury the two giant male ants. He thought of burying Aphrodite from pulled over from the lava mine in Pudu Mountain. Everyone got together to think of a solution. Chapter 929 War Call Serdak was sitting outside the marching tent, looking at the battlefield of constant fighting more than 500 meters away. He thought that the giant male ants might dig holes and come out. And he couldn't sit still. He thought that Aphrodite might know how to deal with such a behemoth. So he thought about calling Aphrodite from the Pussy Mountain. At this time, he jumped up from the stool and thought of the rune language call to war that he had never been able to complete. 
In the past, I always felt that my own strength was not enough. Now that I have become a second-level powerhouse, although I have not yet fully mastered this tyrannical power, I can still try to draw the language of runes. He was right in front of the marching tent. The wounded were crowded here in the past few days. Now, after receiving treatment, the wounded were gradually moved to the rear. The empty space in front of his marching tent became very spacious. After he stood up, he did not try rashly. Instead, he closed his eyes and recalled the extremely complicated rune language pattern, imagining how to draw each stroke. Then he felt the pure power of holy light in his body, almost overflowing from his body. He began to stretch out a finger and began to draw the rune language in front of him. At this time, the power of the holy light he possessed was extremely abundant. He no longer needed to control the power of the holy light. He only needed to release it steadily from his fingers. Allowing these the holy light forms a rune in the air, and combined with the spell, the complex rune language can probably be completed. The first time the runes and spells didn't fit well, so it failed. The second rune was not completely drawn at all. The third time, Serdak tried eleven times, but all ended in failure, which made him a little discouraged. While sitting down and waiting for the power of the holy light to recover, he thought that his vision was not used very well. And then he carefully thought about what the problem was and even re-examined himself line by line. He got stuck. It has been almost a few months on this rune language. Now it's finally time to try drawing Call of War. And of course, you can't be discouraged by a dozen small failures. After the power of the Holy Light was restored, Serdak began to recite incantations and draw runes again. It turned out that war summoning was really difficult. He knew that the power of this rune language to summon partners. But he underestimated it. Difficulty. Three of the five runes were high-level runes. And Serdak seemed to have tried them twenty times in front of the marching tent. Finally, bunches of pure white sacred light that seemed to span time and space lit up under his feet. Countless runes in the light were constantly changing. He discovered that the war call could indeed summon partners. Besides Aphrodite, eyes of the red dragon can be felt. The magic pattern array under his feet lit up. And a golden gate woven with holy light seemed to stand in the clouds. Looking like the gate of an angel palace. He tried to contact Aphrodite, but the succubus seemed to be resistant to this summons and decisively cut off the contact between the two. He was unable to communicate with the red dragon Izer in advance. So he tried to perform a war call on it. The next moment, Serdak felt that most of the power of holy light in his body was consumed by this golden gate, and the golden door suddenly became five or six meters high, with complicated patterns on the huge door panel. As golden rays of light came out from the door, this door was actually open right in front of Serdek. The inside was pushed open. Then a huge red dragon head covered with red scales poked out from the crack in the door. Peering out, it found itself standing in the center of the magic pattern array, with unconcealable surprise on its face. Then it saw Serdak standing in front of the array. So the dragon suddenly spit out an imperial language. Dak, why are you here? Yissel emerged from the light door with a swish and the smooth dragon scales reflected the gorgeous light like glass under the reflection of the holy light. The red dragon was summoned for the first time. It was very curious about this new world, and kept looking around. Serdak finally saw Iser's complete body. He was really a big guy. His whole body was even bigger than Thunder Rhinoceros, especially the pair of dragon wings folded behind his back. He leaned over to face Serdak. When he was walking, the pressure that was equivalent to the above made Soldak's legs feel a little weak. Even though they were so familiar with each other, it was a kind of suppression at the level of power. It approached Serdak, put a big face in front of Serdak, and asked with some surprise, You learned the call of war. It took you so long to learn this, and you still haven't come for so long. Look at me. The latter sentence was full of resentment, but then it noticed the battlefield not far away. Seeing the mountain chain bridge and a camp here, it asked Soldak with some doubts. Dak, are you in any trouble? Already? Soldak nodded and said, It's a little troublesome. In fact, he just wanted to summon Aphrodite. But he never thought of summoning Israel. Only now did Serdak realize that Aphrodite didn't want to come over. Probably because she built the summoning gate with holy light. For the succubus, receiving a baptism of holy light would be no less than disfigurement. Thinking of this, Serdak reacted, hoping that Aphrodite wouldn't be too angry. The red dragon scales on the chest of the red dragon Izer suddenly lit up as if his chest was filled with fire. Iser said to Soldak somewhat seriously, Let's go! Take me over and take a look! What can I do for you? Serdak did not try to climb on the dragon's back, 
but took Isser directly out of the military camp. Everyone they met along the way stared wide-eyed and fell to the ground with weak legs. They stared stupidly at the red dragon Iser, swinging his huge dragon tail and walking out of the camp side by side with Serdak. There has not been a red dragon in the Green Empire for many years, and there are no dragons in the White Forest Plain at all. At this time, Serdak appeared from the camp with a red dragon, which made everyone look surprised. The red dragon Iser shook his huge head and followed Serdak in an inconspicuous manner. After leaving the camp, it stretched its huge wings once and wanted to fly into the sky, but it still held back. Just seeing the battlefield ahead, a trace of fire came out of his nose, the smell of sulfur that was familiar to Serdak. At this time, the red dragon Yisil realized that those ghosts striped red and did not pose much of a threat to the warriors here. So it stopped and asked Serdak in confusion. Isn't it here? Serdak nodded and said. On the other side of this poisonous swamp. But it has been several days. I am not sure whether the two male ants are there. Then let's go take a look and I can catch you. After saying that, Israel stretched out its two strong front paws. Serdak wanted to hide, but he didn't. Then he felt the world spin for a while, and the clouds flew from the sparse forest into the sky. He saw a ring of poisonous swamps in the sky, and there were also distant places. A large lake surrounded by a vast white swamp and surrounded by poisonous swamps. Israel felt a little excited, spread out her dragon wings, and flew into the sky with just a slight leap forward. Chapter 930 Red Dragon Izer A. Eh? It is a young red dragon, only over 800 years old. He has been living on the plain of Istander since he was born. He has no parents or partners and survives alone in a dangerous plain. In the memory of the young dragon, it had been nesting in a rock crevice in the woods behind a small fishing village near a big lake. It was not a dragon cliff at all, nor was it a dragon cave full of lava. It was just a shelter for a young dragon cub. Place. Every day it would find the right opportunity to rush to the fishing village by the lake, where there were some stupid fishmen. A kind of demi-human race with two big fish bodies and two thin arms. They had some intelligence. Can communicate in simple dialect. Live by the lake and make a living by fishing every day. This kind of fish people is not a large group. And they live in very simple shacks. Years later, when Iser left the small fishing village, he vowed never to eat fish again in his life. But it turns out that it has a good appetite. When it grows up, Israel will eat almost anything, as long as it is a monster. By chance, it discovered that its appetite was so good that it could eat a red crystal. After eating this red crystal, something in its body began to fission. And it found that it quickly became stronger. Now it can fly in the sky near its territory. And the pleasure is something it has never enjoyed before. Then it found a partner who was like a teacher and a friend. It originally planned to find a way to help him cross that magical rock wall and take him to the magical Istanbul to enjoy the blue sky there, the sea, the tops of mountains, and then shuttle through the clouds. However, they didn't expect that their first flight would be in the small plain of Belan. And it seemed to be very cold here, with white snow and pine needle forests everywhere. It did not invite him to ride on its back. After all, this was related to the dignity of a dragon. He flew over a swamp that was not too wide. This swamp has been covered with snow, except for some circular depressions at the waterholes, which are also frozen. Then it saw a lake and a big mountain. It only flapped its wings a few times and flew to the lake. Some red ants were running quickly on the ground, probably going through the swamp to fight Dark's army, which made it a little bit nervous. Irritable. It feels that this inferior creature does not deserve to have red, which is the lucky color of the dragon family just like its scales and duck's leather armor. That's the reason. After thinking about the reason for the fight, it spread its wings and flew over, right next to the sandy area near the lake where the red ants were densest, letting these red ants feel the heat of the dragon clan. It hovered in midair, with countless runes lighting up throughout its abdomen. Its belly continued to bulge, and blazing flames condensed in its throat. A red dragon's breath left a river of flames on the sand beside the lake. Countless ghost-striped soldier ants turned into black and roasted ants. They didn't even have a chance to dance in the flames, and directly turned into charred forms and stood in the flames. In the middle of the day, when the north wind blows over, their charred hard armor will bloom with a luster of burning charcoal, and then the whole body will become bright, and finally turn into ashes and dissipate in the cold wind. It flew over the Shirtyal camp, which had become a ruin. A row of dismantled ballistas were lined up on the hillside. A giant male ant was digging for the black powder next to the gunpowder barrel in the camp. 
dark magic lines appeared on its body. And its huge body looked extremely bloated. Apparently it also discovered Izer in the air at this moment. It opened the six tentacles next to its head to the sky and made a low hum. As if in demonstration. Israel's idea was relatively simple. He swooped down and faced the ghost-marked male and warlord with a breath of dragon's breath. Which immediately turned the giant male and into a ball of burning flames. And the ground was covered with a sea of fire. Serdak was in a daze at this moment. He happened to see the giant male and surrounded by powder barrels. Without thinking too much, he took out the square tower shield from his back with his backhand and released his shirt in the next second. A golden archangel spread its wings and hovered behind him and Israel. Just as dozens of gunpowder barrels exploded, the golden archangel's wings surrounded Izer and Serdak, forming a golden light shield in front of Serdak. All the black gunpowder exploded. The landslide and the ground cracked and Israel and Soldak were pushed into the air by the huge impact. The angel holding Serdak turned into a golden stream of light and disappeared instantly. The remaining shock wave hit the shield in his hand, hitting his chest hard, and the pain made Serdak almost want to vomit blood. Izer in the sky was also frightened, but it was unharmed in the big explosion, except that its red scales were stained with some ashes. It was a little worried about Serdak on its talons, flapped its wings, and tried to maintain balance in the air. It looked down at Serdak and found that he was holding a shield with both hands. He seemed to be in good condition. So he stabilized his body. The huge dragon wings flapped in midair, making a fierce sound of breaking wind. Serdak looked down and saw a big crater in the camp where the black gunpowder was placed. The giant male ant survived the explosion, but two of its legs on one side were blown off. And its abdomen there are also two cracks oozing blood outwards. The dragon's breath on the body has not been extinguished and the hard armor has exploded at the burning location. Its body was still covered in fire, and it was desperately digging into the soil beneath it, trying to sink its huge body. Of course, Israel would not let go of the giant male ant so easily. He dived again and poured a mouthful of dragon breath into the giant male ant. Half of its body had sunk into the soil, and the giant male ant completely turned into a ball of flame. Israel circled in the sky, dived for the third time, and firmly grabbed the back of the giant male ant that had almost completely sunk into the soil, and used the momentum of gliding to pull the giant male ant out of the huge pit. Coming out, Israel couldn't lift the big guy. The red dragon's huge claws left several deep scars on the back of the giant male ant, and the thick hard armor was obviously scratched by it. Taking advantage of this momentum, the giant male ant rolled down the slope towards the lake. Serdak felt that even though he was caught in midair by Yissel, the flames on the ground were still making his mouth dry. He felt that if he were any lower, he might be almost cooked. Regardless of the pain all over his body, the giant male ant found that he could not escape. So he fled along the lake towards the nearest burrow. The nearby ghost-striped soldier ants avoided to avoid being stepped on by the giant male ants. It had two broken legs, so it crawled very slowly, limping and drawing wavy lines on the sand. There is a smell of meat in the air, just at the entrance of the crypt. The ghostly patterned warlord collapsed heavily on the ground. And the dragon's breath on his body has not been extinguished to this day. A group of ghost-striped soldier ants were timid and did not dare to approach. The cave entrance was crowded with ghost-striped soldier ants. And they did not dare to get out. He doesn't seem to be able to do it anymore. Israel circled in the air. And when he slid to the bottom of the sky, he dropped Soldak. And then landed next to the giant male ant. Chapter 931 Red Dragon Izer B. Serdak felt so comfortable with a red dragon by his side. He stood next to the wormhole, holding a skinning knife and facing the corpse of the giant male ant. He didn't even know how to start. It was so big that the dagger in his hand couldn't penetrate such thick hard skin. The giant male ant was still burning fiercely, and Serdak did not dare to get too close. But he found that this giant male ant had a lot of good things. At least it had six eyeballs and six tentacles. The head of the limb is very good, and the magic patterns on it are clearly visible. Unfortunately, most of the body was burned to the point of carbonization by the dragon's breath, making it of little value. There were densely packed ghost patterned soldier ants surrounding it, but they only formed a huge circle. The soldier ants crowded together, but did not dare to rush forward. The red dragon Izer had four feet on the ground. A pair of dragon wings slightly spread out, and roared at the surrounding soldier ants. The powerful pressure brought by the high-level monsters forced the ghost-marked soldier ants. They kept retreating. Serdak began to concentrate on collecting the loot. But the behemoth in front of him was simply too big. And he didn't know where to start. In the end, 
It was Israel who helped. Tearing off the huge head of the giant male ant with his claws, Serdak found a sharp single-edged mountain axe from the magic waste bag. And after a lot of effort, he tore off the tentacles. The head and limbs were untied. The sacrifices and useful parts were kept. And the rest were discarded on the beach by the lake. During this period, the red dragon Izer waited quietly aside, patiently watching Serdak handle the corpse of the giant male ant. Its eyes were full of novelty. And Serdak kept talking about his journey of studying the call of war these days. In his words, this rune language is simply too difficult. Israel was lying on the beach by the lake, looking at the white snow on the lake, and paying attention to the growing number of soldier ants around her. As soon as everything was settled here, the second giant male ant emerged from a new hole in the ground. Seeing the way he came out, with his butt facing the direction of the poisonous swamp, Serdak's heart beat violently twice. Sure enough, he was digging a tunnel through the poisonous swamp. It seemed that this giant male ant was. I want to go to the chain bridge camp battlefield. Facing such a powerful giant male ant, the red dragon Izer still did not dare to take it lightly. He immediately grabbed Soldak and flew into the sky. The giant male ant seemed to be angered by the red dragon's behavior. It turned into an afterimage and rushed over. Just more than 20 meters away from the red dragon, its abdomen suddenly bulged and then contracted violently. A thick green sour water arrow passed through a distance of more than 20 meters and stuck to the red dragon. Serdak's boots flew past his feet. It was not a mouthful of thick phlegm, but like a fire truck's water gun, spraying endlessly. But at this moment, the red dragon Izer has risen into the air, and the giant male ants that can only fight on land cannot reach it at all. The red dragon Israel was also angered by the sour water arrows of this giant male ant. He kept hovering in the sky. Every time he circled twice, he swooped down and spat out a mouthful of dragon's breath, its breath covered an extremely wide area. The vastness simply turned the lakeside into a sea of fire. The second giant male ant was completely ignited in the sea of fire. It slammed into the sea of fire. Even if it stood in the icy lake, the fire on its body could not be extinguished. The giant male ant warlord was struggling in the sea of fire. His thick hard armor could not even be penetrated by black powder. But it was quickly melted by Israel's dragon breath. The second giant male ant died in the lake. Israel saw that Serdak seemed to have a special liking for its head. So he grabbed the giant male ant's head with his claws and hung it under his body. Took Serdak back to the chain bridge camp. Israel appeared again. And the entire military camp was shocked. The adventure group and mercenary group were also gathered outside the camp. Everyone was looking at this big guy curiously. In recent years, even the knights riding dragons and flying dragons have become rare. The Angelical royal family does have a royal griffin knights. But its intimidation power is greater than its own strength. What was carrying Serdak back was indeed a crimson red dragon. The armed thunder rhinoceros in the camp were already lying on the ground collectively. As for the ancient Bolai horses, they kept pawing at the ground and kept retreating. Even if the cavalry around him kept comforting him, it would not help. However, the two-headed ogre suppressed the trembling of its legs, took the initiative to come over here, greeted Soldak and said, Hey, Dak, where did you find this big guy? It looks really good. Leave far away. The red dragon Izer was full of hostility towards Gurlidum. It shook its head and roared at Gurlidum. The sound almost deafened the two-headed ogre's ears. Gulidum waited for Israel to stop and sat down on the spot. He was an ogre who liked to reason. And he was definitely willing to have a good discussion with the red dragon on this matter. Especially when he found out that the red dragon also can speak imperial language. Hey, why are you so angry? There was indeed a dragon slayer among our ancestors. But it was a long time ago. Now the ogres even eat kelp from the seaside. Besides, I am still the third once you see a dragon. You can't use old ideas to label a new age ogre, said Gulidum. Sure enough, when Samira and Andrew came over, Israel didn't react that much. However, Yisel is definitely not a good-tempered dragon. It raised its front paws and pressed hard on the stone in front of Gulidum. The boulder as big as a millstone was smashed into pieces, scaring the ogre into retreating quickly. Two steps. Hey. We are all friends of Dak. You are my friend. And friends of friends are also friends. So we should be considered friends. Okay. Ghoul item. We have to prepare to take back the stone bridge camp. Serdak came over at this time and said to Andrew. Samira. And Ghoul item. At this time. Andrew finally saw the blood-stained giant male ant's head. The tear marks on the neck were still clearly visible. The black eyeballs. Which were as big as coconuts. 
had not lost their spirituality. It looked like they had just died. Andrew asked Serdek in shock. Did you get rid of those two giant male ants? Yes. Just now. Israel helped me solve this problem. Now we are going to clean up the battlefield and pick up the loot. Soldak did not hide it at all. He had just relied entirely on the red dragon Izer to turn the ghost mark red and upside down. Andrew whistled quickly, called a close aide over, and gave him some instructions. Samira also asked her assistants to prepare the armed thunder rhinoceros. But soon the two subordinates walked back awkwardly and whispered a few words to Samira and Andrew. The armed thunder rhinoceros and Gubwa Lai war horse were so frightened that their legs were weak and they were unable to fight at all. The red dragon Israel really hated this ogre that was chattering in his ears. He pushed the ogre away with his huge swinging tail. And then a huge light door appeared in front of it. Israel turned to Sue Erdek said softly. Okay. Dark. It's time to summon. Don't forget to come to me often in the future. You'd better prepare some red cookies next time. With that said, Israel stepped into the light door and disappeared in the dazzling holy light. Chapter 932 Chuko Camp Israel disappeared in the sacred gate, and the Iron Chain Bridge military camp completely returned to calm. Everyone looked at Serdak with respect in their eyes. Some people in the joint venture group and mercenary group had been whispering. They were discussing the background behind Serdak, the young red dragon, and the star. The bloody giant male and head hung on a high wooden stake at the entrance of the camp. Many people gathered around the gate of the camp to pay homage to this ferocious-looking giant male ant. They were also recalling the gains and losses of the battle not long ago. Even though the two giant male ants were extremely brave, they moved slowly. Even if they had charging skills, their lethality was extremely limited. But in that battle, more than 700 members of the adventure group died on the battlefield alone. And even more members of the adventure group were injured. Most of these casualties were caused while fighting ghost pattern soldier ants. Of the ghost pattern soldier, ants only have the strength of the second level early level monsters. Although they have strong execution capabilities, they are the stupidest second level monsters. During the battle, they only knew how to charge blindly and spray acidic liquid. They could easily be lured into a trap by the members of the adventure group. After about half a year of long-term fighting, these adventure groups who hunted ghost pattern soldier ants in the Invercargo forest all had some unique hunting techniques. Unfortunately, when the giant male ants emerged from the burrow, everyone was completely panicked and everyone wanted to escape as fast as they could. It is precisely this idea that gives those ghost-striped soldier ants an opportunity to take advantage of. If they resist and retreat in an orderly manner, the casualties of the adventure group and the mercenary group can be reduced by at least half. Now that the two giant male ants are dead, the worries that have been hanging in everyone's minds are suddenly eliminated. Watching the cavalry in the military camp leaving the Iron Chain Bridge military camp on Gubwa Lai horses. The combined forces of the adventure group and the mercenary group knew that Viscount Soldak had already started taking action. The cavalry came to the front of the battlefield and charged against the ghost pattern soldier ants. Then I saw 18 armed thunder rhinoceros loaded with archers, entering the poisonous swamp again, followed by 3,000 indigenous warriors. This time, the advance on the poison swamp encountered a tenacious resistance from the ghost pattern soldier ants. These soldier ants were actually extremely tenacious in the ice and snow. Andrew and Gulitam have been standing at the front of the team. This time, they did not consider the issue of keeping the sacrifices. The butcher's axe and the bone-crushing stick were all hit hard on the head. Two people with the strength of the second-rank warrior. A full blow can smash the head of a ghost-marked soldier ant like a smashed watermelon. Andrew seemed to be redeeming himself. His whole body was burning with flames. And the electric snakes kept scurrying about his body. He tried his best to kill these ghostly patterned soldier ants. There was no emotion or joy on his face. As if he was completely immersed in the killing. The knight's spears in the hands of the cavalrymen were also stabbed in the head. This is simply killing the ghost patterned soldier ants in the poisonous swamp. The cavalry with the magic pattern have extremely strong mobility. They can gallop on the frozen poisonous swamp. And their strong armor can block almost all kinds of attacks from the ghost patterned soldier ants. The knight's spear is a bulky weapon that can reach 5 meters in length. The entire spear is cut from hardwood. The tip of the spear is a genuine fine steel spearhead. This spearhead is made using a stack forging process and has a gorgeous Damascus pattern. The tip of the gun itself is also very sharp. When the cavalry charged, they increased the speed of their horses to the limit, rushed in front of the ghost pattern soldier ants, and instantly thrust out their spears. Using the momentum, they wedged the spears into the heads of the ghost pattern soldier ants, and knocked them over violently. On the ground, 
These ancient Bolai horses are blessed with magic patterns of strength, and their explosive power is comparable to that of green-scaled horses. Facing this kind of cavalry, the ghost-patterned soldier ants could only spit out some acidic liquid. However, the connection between the knight's boots and trouser armor has now adopted a tile-style overlapping structure. Unless the acidic liquid can flow back, or spray directly into the cavalry's face to hurt them. Although these cavalry are still some distance away from the constructed knights, they have already broken away from the strength category of heavy cavalry. However, they relied on their horses to possess strong combat power, and they could fight those ghost-striped soldier ants from the front. As long as they were not trapped in a swarm of red ants like a sea tide, the cavalry would have killed the sea wolves chasing fish in the ocean currents. The armed thunder rhino ignored the ghost-striped red ants on the poisonous swamp. Although the surface of the poisonous swamp was frozen, the ice layer was only half a foot deep. It still could not withstand the trampling of the heavy thunder rhinoceros. They still had to follow the path open more than a month ago. The road out leads towards the stone bridge camp. The indigenous warriors have somewhat adapted to this kind of war life. Drinking that salty wheat porridge every day is probably their greatest luxury. For them, the days of hunting in the tribe are no safer than fighting. There are endless magical beasts in the Invercargill forest. They are not afraid of the magical beasts that appear in their field of vision. What they are afraid of are those lurking in the dark, which will cause harm when they appear. A forest predator that kills in one shot. Hunting ghost-striped soldier ants. For these indigenous tribal warriors, they will have some new insights into this battle every day. They have excellent physiques and are extremely familiar with this land. What they are unfamiliar with are the sharper weapons in their hands, the sturdy standard armor on their bodies, and the endlessly advanced techniques and tactics. A group of indigenous tribal warriors were walking on the poisonous swamp with swords and shields in hand. Their steps were neat and their movements were consistent. They had an indescribable momentum. After that defeat, the remaining members of the adventure group and mercenary group hunted ghost pattern soldier ants on the edge of the poison swamp every day. In order to appease the coalition forces of these adventure group and mercenary group, Serdak deliberately gave up a battlefield. In the past few days, I have been hunting ghost-striped red ants on this battlefield to make money. Now the army began to attack again. And the cavalry crossed the poisonous swamp. The members of the adventure group packed their luggage again and followed the army to take advantage. This time they did not disperse to the entire shore of the lake, but formed a temporary army and inserted themselves into the poisonous swamp. It was almost sunset when the armed thunder rhino crossed the poison swamp and arrived at the ruins of Stone Bridge Camp. It only took most of a day to cross this poisonous swamp. The main reason was that there was no need to delay on the road this time. Because the road that could be used by Thunder Rhinoceros had been explored before. This time, we only needed to follow the original path. Can. Samira led the bed crossbowmen to defuse the ghostly patterned soldier ants on the slope. When the sky completely darkened, the archers took back the ruins of the Shirchiao camp. The red dragon eyes are detonated those gunpowder barrels. And the camp almost ceased to exist. Instead, there were rows of bed crossbows and catapults abandoned on the top of the slope, although some were scattered, some were overturned on the slope, and some the burned city was ashes, but there were always some bed crossbows that still had repair value. They only needed to tear down the east wall and repair the west wall, and then they could reassemble the bed crossbows and catapults that could be used. The only trouble is that there is a shortage of gunpowder and giant crossbow arrows, and all the marching tents here are damaged. Now Serdak's biggest enemy is not only these ghost-striped soldier ants, but also the cold winter of the Belan Plain. The cold wind blowing on the armor quickly takes away the heat from the knight's bodies. Chapter 933 The Horn of Counterattack The day after Serdak recaptured the stone bridge camp, he led the cavalry battalion to the battlefield on the sand beside the lake. In addition to the remains of two giant male ants, there were thousands of ghost-marked soldiers among the ashes. The magic core left by the ants. The ghost-striped red ants were completely defeated. The soldier ants completely left the church up camp and the lakeside, leaving behind a large number of burned remains of the soldier ants. In the early morning, the cold north wind was raging on the lake, and the remaining snow was picked up by the wind and floated farther away. Against the north wind, the cavalry used hammers to hammer the carbonized soldier ant skeletons on the battlefield by the lake. Some of the skeletons were burned white and shattered with the slightest touch and even some fragments floated away in the wind. Some bones are soaked in tar and become hard and brittle. If you want to break these bones open, hit them with all your strength. Some bones are not completely burned and even retain the nature of hard armor. Use a long sword to chop them. It will be much easier. These magic cores 
which are like briquettes, are very inconspicuous in the pile of bones. It is not easy to find them all. The cavalry need to first identify the number of bones from their initial state, which is also the approximate number of magic cores. And then, they have to clean up bit by bit and search bit by bit. There is no need to break all the bones. But this battlefield is indeed huge and there are many wreckage. The cavalry were the first to enter this battlefield. By the time the archers joined, they had already made themselves look like coal diggers in the mines and could only see color when they smiled and blinked. But what surprised everyone was the number of dead soldier ants. Thousands of ghostly patterned soldier ants burned to ashes on the battlefield just after the red dragon breathed out its breath several times. This cross-level dimensionality reduction attack allows everyone to clearly understand the terrifying power of high-level Warcraft. The income brought to Serdak from the magic cores recovered from these ghostly patterned soldier ants alone could almost make up for nearly one-fifth of the losses after the defeat in the stone bridge camp. It's a pity that a lot of hard armor was lost. The remains of the giant male ants were not well preserved. The corpses of the male ants were covered with acid rot. And the entire hard armor was mottled with burns. None of the magic patterns were preserved. And the flesh and blood were also eaten clean by other ghost-marked soldier ants. From a distance, they looked like the remains of two huge magic mechas. When you walked in, you realized that they actually had no use value at all. Probably the soldiers in the army were frightened by Israel. Seeing him riding into the battlefield, his expression was not as relaxed and casual as before. And everyone's eyes were filled with awe. It took the army a whole day to clean up more than half of the battlefield. The main reason was that the value of the magic core was too high. The soldiers would rather be careful and slow than miss anything. Moreover, the entire battlefield was burned by fire. The remaining snow and ice in some places melted as a result, and then condensed into ice with the bones after the fire was extinguished, making this part more difficult to deal with. These days, it gets dark relatively early at Churchill Camp. In the evening, Serdek stood by the lake and looked up at the sky. The sky was covered with gray clouds, and heavy snow was about to fall. Once these wrecks are buried in the snow, it will be even more difficult to dig them out watching the soldiers dragging their tired bodies back to the camp in darkness. They had been freezing in the wind and snow all day, and their energy had been exhausted. Serdak still thinks that he will continue to collect these magic cores tomorrow morning. The heavy snow started to fall in the middle of the night. The goose feather-like snowflakes floated down silently, and soon piled up a thick layer on the ground. The soldiers lying in the tents in the military camp crawled out of the tents one after another. They didn't have time to clean up the snow covering the tents. They picked up the hammers, and ran towards the battlefield near the lake despite the wind and snow. In the heavy snow, they rushed to smash the wreckage that had not been searched, and took advantage of the snow not being too deep to snatch out the magic core overnight. After daybreak, the entire Churchill camp was covered with two feet of snow, and the dark battlefield was completely buried in the snow, seeing the head of the last charred ghost pattern soldier and being smashed into pieces. The soldiers covered in a thick layer of ice armor cheered in the dawn light and everyone returned to the camp happily. In this cold weather, you must eat more high-calorie foods to keep out the cold. The oil of ghost-striped soldier ants is not rich enough. But it is also a good delicacy when stewed with canned lunch and meat transported from the rear. It snowed heavily all night, and almost half of the marching tents in Churchill camp collapsed. The soldiers rebuilt their tents in the biting cold wind, and then got into sleeping bags and slept soundly. After the lake's surface froze, it was covered with a thick layer of snow, and the most common thing on the snow were the pointed footprints of ghost-striped soldier ants. In order to prevent a large number of ghost-striped soldier ants from crossing the ice lake to attack the Churchill camp, Soldak placed a large number of explosives on the ice lake. These explosives were buried in the ice by the cavalry. And fuses soaked in beeswax were crisscrossed, hidden beneath the snow. He did not take advantage of the Red Dragon Izer to severely damage the army of ghost-marked red ants and cross the ice lake to attack the Dark Worm Valley at the foot of Shershu Mountain. In fact, although the caves of Ghost Mark Red ants are everywhere at the foot of the mountain, it is only the outermost entrance to the Dark Worm Valley. In the cold winter, the Ghost Mark Red ants also have to sneak into the deep caves of the Insect Valley to rely on their storage, food to survive the harsh winter. So no war broke out for several days. The combined forces of the Adventure Group and the Mercenary Group also camped by the lake again. Almost all the magic herbs in this area had been plundered by this group before the heavy snowfall. Now there is no trace of the ghost-striped red ants. Many people are on the battlefield. Look for usable materials in the wreckage. Of course, the remains of two giant male ants are also the focus of their search. 
By the time Andrew led the cavalry battalion across the lake again, it was already the fourth day after the heavy snowfall. This time the cavalry arrived at the entrance of the dark worm valley at the foot of the mountain. The place was no longer as prosperous as it was three weeks ago and was even covered with snow. Numerous had nest entrances. The ghost-striped worker and seemed to disappear without a trace after the heavy snow. But some dark red ghost-striped soldier ants occasionally appeared at the entrance of the ant nest. They seemed to be afraid of the cold and did not emerge from the anthill. And Andrew did not attack rashly. Latta led the crossbow maintenance team to repair six catapults in a few days. This time he followed the cavalry battalion across the ice lake and stopped on the lake. As Samira personally ignited the oak barrel of explosives for throwing the basketball. Six barrels of explosives were thrown out while rolling. And finally exploded at the entrance of the ant nest. The catapult bombing only lasted for half a day. Just as Serdak expected. The ghost-striped soldier ants once again emerged from the ant nests in all directions. They gathered an army by the lake to confront the army on the surface of Serdak's lake. Probably because they didn't see the red dragon in the sky. The ghost-striped soldier ants began to charge towards the lake. Chapter 9, 34 Persuasion At the exit of the dark worm valley. A huge earthquake shook the ground. After the ice, snow and permafrost shattered. Six giant male ants emerged from the soil underground in no particular order. Behind them were a group of purple-red ghost-striped soldier ants. These soldier ants were only slightly smaller than the giant soldier ants. A large number of red ants crowded together and swarmed towards the lakeside battlefield in the cold wind. Explosive barrels kept falling from the sky. And explosions were heard one after another. A wave of ants poured into the battlefield rushed onto the ice lake, and rushed towards the location of the catapults. These six catapults obviously could not suppress them. These soldier ants came overwhelmingly. At the same time, the group of archers standing behind the catapults began to throw arrows into the sky. Although the hard armor of these soldier ants was stronger, some arrows could always penetrate the gaps between the eyes of the ghostly patterned soldier ants and the hard armor, slowing down their charging pace. Six giant male ants rushed at the front. But as soon as they stepped onto the ice, there was the sound of the ice breaking. The thick outriggers broke through the ice and stepped directly into the unfrozen mud underground. The giant male ants did not dare to go any further. Only the dark red ghost-striped soldier ants rushed up in large numbers. Andrew led the cavalry to penetrate from the right side of the battlefield, hoping to attack the soldier ant charging camp from the right side. After firing the first round of arrows, more than a thousand archers quickly stepped onto the sledges that had been prepared behind the team. Hundreds of Gubois horses pulled the sledges and quickly retreated north. Armed thunder rhinoceros form a wall on the north shore of Ice Lake. Gubwa Lima pulled these snow sledges through the gaps between the thunder rhinoceros and quickly retreated behind the Ice Lake. Andrew's cavalry did not rush into the army of soldier ants. They were just on the periphery of the army of soldier ants. Taking advantage of the speed of the cavalry to eat away at the outermost ghost pattern soldier ants. It wasn't until these soldier ants were about to rush across the lake that they were intercepted by 18 armed thunder rhinoceros on the lake. 56 bed crossbows fired giant crossbow arrows almost at the same time. These giant crossbow arrows crashed into the ant colony and failed to stop their charging steps. However, at the feet of the armed thunder rhinoceros, 3,000 indigenous warriors formed an infantry square and were already ready. Seeing the ghostly patterned soldier and swarming towards them, the indigenous warriors raised their shields in unison at the command of the commander. Serdak and Gulitam stood at the front of this square military formation. A halo of power immediately lit up under Serdak's feet. However, this halo could not cover the entire army. At best, it covered less than three areas around Serdak. Ten yards range. However, he held the commemorative shield and faced the charge of the ghost-patterned soldier ants. But he always stood at the front and never retreated. The two-headed silk mannequin Gulitam was also beside Serdak. And let out a low war cry. The low and passionate voice immediately shook the morale of the entire infantry formation and the natives struck with their heavy swords, touching the edge of the shield. The uniform knocking sound sounded deafening in the ears of the ghost-marked soldier ants. These huge ghost-striped soldier ants looked more like a herd of bison. The moment the front ghost-striped soldier ants hit the shield of the military formation, the front row of indigenous warriors were knocked flying with their shields. But behind the shield was a group of tribal warriors holding the shield firmly with their bodies. The charge of these ghost-patterned soldier ants was blocked and they immediately sprayed a large amount of acidic liquid towards the infantry camp. They used their four back legs to prop up their bodies, used the sharp claws to twist the tribal warrior behind the shield. However, they were desperately stopped by a group of tribal warriors holding heavy swords behind them. 
after the heavy swords and the tentacles collided. They made a harsh sound of gold and iron. Just when the soldier ants used their size and strength to suppress the tribal warriors, countless Paglio spears stretched out from the gaps between the tribal warriors and pierced the huge mouths of the soldier ants. Serdak held the holy light torch, and the torch erupted with brilliant holy light in the crowd. The memorial shield in his hand blocked a ghost-patterned soldier ant from being strangled with giant pincers. He waved the holy light torch and lit up a series of complicated magic patterns. A dazzling holy light burst out from the torch. And at the moment, it hit the soldier ant's head. A huge light ball rushed into the ghost-patterned soldier ant's body. The body of the ghost-patterned soldier ant lights up with countless runes. And the light inside the body rushes out through the runes. The next moment, the ghostly-patterned soldier ants turned into a line of smoke under the burning of the holy light. And was blown away by the biting north wind. The powerful sacred aura spread outward from Serdak's body. Forcing the ghost-marked red ants near him to retreat leaving a huge space of 10 meters in diameter. The two-headed ogre was not too far away from Serdak's position. Gulitam used all his strength to smash the bone-crushing stick in his hand onto the head of a ghost-patterned soldier ant. The broken skull was the turbid slurry bloomed, and he stepped on the corpse of the ghost-marked soldier ant with one foot, and stuffed the fireball in his other hand into the mouth of the soldier ant that rushed up from behind. The exploding fireball scared away the ghost-patterned soldier ants that rushed up from behind. The two-headed ogre strode forward to pursue him. A group of indigenous warriors followed his killing footsteps and rushed towards the lake. However, they were stopped by Serta not far away. Cook calls to live. At this time, Samira, who was standing at the feet of the armed thunder rhino, held a torch and bent down to light the fuse at her feet. The next second, several sparks shot out into the lake with a faint smoke. Then a series of explosions came from the lake. These explosions were not earth-shattering but they caused ice and snow to fly. The ghost-patterned soldier ants were scurrying around in the explosion, but not many ghost-patterned soldier ants were injured. The explosions on the ice continued to spread outward, forming a dense line of explosive sounds. If someone looks down from the sky at this time, they will find that the explosion on the ice lake spreads outward in a spiral shape along the center of the lake. Although the damage caused to the ghost-striped soldier ants is not great, the cracks on the lake are spreading outward rapidly. These ice cracks are constantly expanding. The two-foot-thick ice exploded, and the ghost-striped soldier ants on the ice tumbled into the ice lake along with the exploded ice. The soldier ants were stained with lake water and kept climbing on the floating ice. Unfortunately, they were so big that no ice block could bear the weight of a ghost-striped soldier ant. They were floating up and down in the ice lake. I don't know how many ghost-patterned soldier ants fell into the ice lake. The ghost-striped soldier ants who were isolated on the south bank relying on the constantly exploding ice lake, could only bite the bullet and charge towards the army on the north bank of the ice lake. Giant crossbow arrows harvested the lives of the soldier ants in the chaotic scene. It has to be said that these dark red ghost-patterned soldier ants are much more powerful than those when the bees tide broke out. Unfortunately, they were still pierced through the body in front of the bed crossbow. A large number of indigenous warriors crowded around the lake. They held shields in their hands and kept slashing with their heavy swords. Behind them were the indigenous warriors holding Paglio spears. They swarmed up and continued to squeeze these ghost-marked soldiers. The living space of ants. The entire ice surface was constantly exploding. The soldier ants wanted to escape from the ice surface. But they had to face the stubborn resistance of the tribal warriors. At this time, several large rock birds were hovering in the sky. And the continuous and low explosions could not cover up their clear calls. In fact, the indigenous warriors only pushed the ghost-striped soldier ants on the north shore into the lake and returned to Shirtyal camp one after another before dark, leaving only countless soldier ants struggling in the lake, with a howling cold wind blowing around them, taking away the little heat in their bodies. Extremely cold nights are obviously the most deadly for these soldier ants. Their joints will freeze after being exposed to water. These frozen areas continue to thicken, making it increasingly difficult for them to move. The cold wind blows on the lake surface. On the ice, a thick layer of ice quickly formed. Some ghost-striped soldier ants climbed ashore, covered with thick ice, crawling hard on the snow, and finally died in the pursuit of Andrew's cavalry. Some ghost-striped soldier ants simply drowned in the lake water and were frozen with the broken ice in the lake. Less than half of the ghost-striped soldier ants were able to escape back to the dark warm valley from the south bank of the lake. The six giant male ants could only stand on the north bank of the lake and roar angrily. One. The cold night wind refroze the shattered lake surface, and countless ghost-patterned soldier ants, like ice sculptures, were buried under the thin layer of ice. In the early morning, 
Serdak and his army reappeared on the south bank of the glacial lake and saw an unknown number of ghost-striped soldier ants frozen on the vast lake. Their bodies still maintained their original struggling appearance. These ice cubes reflected the dazzling sunlight, causing the warriors on the lake to squint their eyes slightly. Since the ice was not frozen solid, Soldak prohibited the soldiers from running to the lake to collect the loot. At this time, the combined forces of the adventure group and the mercenary group poured out from behind. They did not go to pick up the corpses of the soldier ants on the newly frozen lake. These were the trophies of Viscount Serdak and were sacred and inviolable private property. But those ghost-striped soldier ants that had fled to other parts of the lake to freeze their bodies, but not completely die, became the prey that the coalition forces competed for. Three days later, a group of indigenous warriors with spears in their hands began to walk onto the ice lake, began to cut through the ice, and gradually took out the frozen ghost-striped soldier ants from the ice. The corpses of countless ghost pattern soldier ants were transported to the Shirchiao camp. After the battle on the lake, the ghost pattern soldier ants completely retreated into the ant nest in the dark warm valley and refused to come out. The good news of victory has been sent back to Doden Town from the Stone Bridge camp. Serdak was not in a hurry to march to the dark warm valley. He just set up seven catapults on the north bank of the ice lake and continued to throw explosive barrels every day, targeting the enemy. The ant nests in the dark warm valley undergo continuous bombardment. During this period recently, there have always been countless birds circling in the sky. At the end of December, the chiefs of 25 tribes in the Invercargill Forest arrived at the Stone Bridge Camp on the south bank of Ice Lake. Seeing the chiefs of their tribes coming to the camp one after another, the indigenous warriors were in high spirits and contributed to the chiefs one after another. Rewards earned during these days. The clan leaders were sitting in Serdak's marching tent with faces of embarrassment and embarrassment. Everyone looked at each other, but no one was willing to speak. Serdak walked into the march tent covered in ice and snow. He kept sending gentle greetings to the indigenous tribe leaders. When he entered the tent, all the indigenous tribe leaders stood up one after another. Afterwards, everyone sat down one after another, and Serdak asked them why they came. Is it necessary for the indigenous warriors in the military camp to return to their respective tribes this severe winter? The clan leaders shook their heads indicating that this was not the case. The leader of the Dakuni tribe coughed unnaturally, then looked at Serdak cautiously and said to him, This year, the food reserves of each of our tribes are pretty good. They are enough to last until the spring flowers bloom, and the tribes have also begun to raise yellow sheep. Speaking of which, we must also thank Lord Serdak for his strong support, so that we can survive the beast tide. The first winter since then has been so easy. The chiefs of other tribes nodded in agreement. Is there a problem at the copper mine? Serdak asked strangely. The clan leaders shook their heads again to express no. Seeing the confusion on Serdak's face, the Dark Uni clan leader said, Lord Serdak, you have achieved brilliant results in the Dark Worm Valley, but please forgive us for making an unreasonable request. Are you really what's more? We can't kill these ghost patterned soldier ants anymore. Unexpectedly, the indigenous tribes who had just been massacred by the Beast Tide were actually the lobbyists of these ghost marked red ants. Serdak asked even more doubtfully. Why is this? Why don't you let me continue hunting these red ants? If we continue to kill, it will affect the lives of the birds living on the cliffs of the holy mountain to the north. These red ants are usually the food of the birds. The leader of the Dakuni tribe explained, his voice a little dry. Red ants are numerous in number and reproduce in large numbers every year. Once the number reaches a limit, a tide of beasts will break out. After hearing what he said, Serdak realized that these natives actually had a deeper understanding of this forest. And they usually just didn't talk about it. The leader of the Dakuni tribe continued. But if you clean up these ghost-striped red ants on such a large scale after the beast tide, they will quickly reduce their numbers. Once they can't catch enough red ants to fill their stomachs, they will plunder them, go through Invercargill Forest, and hunt the monsters in the forest as well as us. For us, the beast tide only occurs once every ten years. Once the rocks are recognized as food that can satisfy our hunger, I'm afraid we won't be able to live in the hills and mountains. We must know that they are the overlords who control the sky here. Soldak nodded slightly, indicating that he understood. Then he said, Although this northern expedition was not too successful, I originally planned to occupy the dark warm valley. But the strength of the ghost marked red and here exceeded my imagination. Now that I say this, I accept your persuasion. I will gradually withdraw our troops within a week and retreat to the mountain stream chain bridge camp in the future.
It is estimated that such large-scale siege operations will be carried out once every winter to control the number of these ghost-striped red ants. In addition, the Iron Chain Bridge Camp will not be removed. It will become the bridgehead of the northern border of the Imperial Army and the entrance to the hunting ground in the northern part of the Belan Plain. I will open this hunting ground to the adventure groups and mercenaries in the northern plain. The core is open. And of course tribal hunters can also come here to hunt ghost-marked red ants. He raised his head and said to Andrew and Samira, who were standing at the door, Get ready. The baggage troops will leave the Churchill camp first. And the cavalry battalion will be responsible for the rear. None of the indigenous chiefs expected that he would withdraw his troops so decisively. And they all stood up and saluted Serdak. Chapter 935 returned to Duodan Town. Samira stood on the platform on the back of the armed thunder rhinoceros, looking up at the flying birds in the sky. She even hoped that these birds could fly lower, so that the sky strike bow in her hand would have a chance to kill them. A big bird that always hovers in the sky. It is said that the indigenous tribes have a certain connection with these rock birds. At least no one from the indigenous tribes has ever thought of hunting rock birds. They even believe that the rocks between the rock walls of Tianju Mountain were their guardians. When the Imperial Army entered the Belan Plain, the indigenous troops and the rocks jointly resisted those armies. Unfortunately, the aboriginal troops were later defeated on the grassland. The Imperial Cavalry was defeated, and the Alliance Army was disbanded. Like drowned dogs, the indigenous tribes were driven north by the Imperial Cavalry from the fertile central grasslands. Originally, the indigenous tribes planned to build a natural barrier with the Thorny Mountains. Unfortunately, the Imperial Cavalry occupied the Thorny Mountains in one go and drove the indigenous tribes into the mountains. The Warcraft Forest of Fukarger competes with the Warcraft over there for living space. After the coalition of indigenous tribes was dispersed, the rocks also returned to the northern cliffs. However, they are the veritable air overlords of the White Forest Plain. They have been dominating the sky of the White Forest Plain and migrated from the Bena province. Because of these rocks, the immigrants were unable to open an airport terminal in the Belan Plain. Mainly because these rocks always attack those magic airships. And they can shoot lightning bolts from their mouths. This powerful lightning is just a powerful weapon to restrain the floating devices. So there have never been magic airships in the Belan Plain. Of course, Another reason why the airport terminal has not been opened is that the occupation area of Belan Plain is actually not large. Every indigenous warrior has respect for these birds. And this idea is slowly affecting the entire army. The army passed through the poisonous swamp. And 3,000 tribal warriors took the lead in crossing the chain bridge. Then Samira led the archer group and finally returned to the Viscounty of Serdak and moved into the military camp on the south slope of the canyon. Andrew's cavalry will remain at the chain bridge camp to continue garrisoning. The combined forces of the adventure group and the mercenary group followed Soldak's army back to Invercargill Forest. Of course, some members of the adventure group chose to stay at the chain bridge camp. The northern expedition officially ended on the day Soldak crossed the chain bridge. The first to be disbanded were the indigenous warriors from various tribes, who returned to their tribes with their own trophies. The indigenous warriors gained a lot from this battle. Almost each of them carried two magic crystals, wore a set of imperial standard armor, hung a craftsman's heavy sword on his waist, and left the military camp carrying a tower shield and a paleo spear. These armors and weapons will be the foundation for them to settle down in the Invercargill Forest, and will also be the reason for them to continue to fight for the tribe next time. The archer brigade and cavalry battalion under Serdak were much simpler. They only recorded their own merits in the account books. No one was stupid enough to receive the magic crystal at this time. Everyone was accumulating merits and exchanging them for better ones. Magic weapons. Exchanging merit for magical weapons in the military camp has almost become a trend in the camp. Although Serdak lost a large number of crossbows and catapults, he captured more than 30,000 magic cores. Based on past experience, it is estimated that half of the magic cores can produce complete magic crystals, which can just make up for the defeat in the last battle. Time loss. The harvested magic crystal fragments can also repay the soldiers' salaries. In addition, he also harvested the heads of two giant male ants. This high-level sacrifice is even more valuable. And the high-level magic core in the skull is also extraordinary. It was also after leaving the Iron Chain Bridge that Serdak learned that the giant beast was called the Ant Overseer by the magicians while chatting with the indigenous warriors. In this northern expedition, nearly a hundred giant ghost pattern soldier ants were also hunted. This was probably the real purpose of Serdak's trip. He harvested nearly 300 magic patterns of strength and resilience this time. 
and all of them have been put into his magic pocket. Serdak planned to continue to expand the cavalry battalion. But among the more than 200 soldiers who died in this battle, more than 40 were cavalry. The cavalry who died in the battle were all veterans. Which made Serdak a little bit annoyed. He also needs to pay a sizable pension. Serdak did not stay in the canyon camp for too long. The army only rested in the camp for three days before continuing to break out of camp and continue towards the copper mine. Serdak rushed to the copper mine. And the copper mine was still being mined in an orderly manner. However, due to the cold weather, labor efficiency was greatly reduced. Serdak feels that the free market here has become more lively than two months ago. It has even turned into a material transfer station. Many merchants flocked to the loot, warcraft materials, and magic herbs transported back from the Iron Chain Bridge Camp and arrived. Many caravans did not dare to risk entering the frontline war zone and could only wait here. They tried to purchase some materials transported from the frontline. Some were even sold in the trading market of the copper mine. And some were transported back to Wilk City. Go inside so that you can earn the price difference inside. There are a lot of supplies sold here. And the market is very lively. There are always some adventurous groups rushing to the copper mine to pan for gold. Businessman Malakom's Thunder Rhino fleet is now mainly responsible for transporting tons of copper ingots produced by copper mines. He has transferred five nearby Thunder Rhino caravans here to take turns transporting these materials to Weiwei, Urk City. In the prosperous copper mine, some members of the adventure group also returned to the copper mine one after another. Some indigenous warriors also followed the army back to the copper mines. They took two magic crystals and began to try to buy some food and supplies in the market. At this time, they discovered that two magic crystals could really buy a lot of supplies. The natives need to exchange magic crystals for some gold coins first, and then exchange the gold coins for some silver coins before they can go to the free market to buy things. When he returned to Doden Town, Serdak discovered that even though it was already winter, there were still some workers on some construction sites in many places. They were working enthusiastically against the north wind. A lot of things happened in Doden Town these days. A brand new wooden house has been built along the south bank of the river. And the area where the imperial immigrants gathered in the town is also being renovated. Baron Martino is in charge of these two things. In addition to these, the foundation of the Junior War College on the slope outside the town has been leveled. And some pillars and ropes have even been used to completely expand the boundaries of the college. Even the stone road between the college and the town has been its built. Some homesteads have appeared on both sides of this stone road. It seems that the pre-sale of Mrs. Luna's land is pretty good. At least many people in town know that the land on both sides of this road may increase in value. Chapter 936 Chain Bridge Hunting Ground Today, Duodan Town has entered the lane of rapid development. The prosperous commerce in the town has driven the rapid development of surrounding agriculture, animal husbandry, forestry, and mining. The town is not only building new residences in large areas, but also renovating old ones. Residential areas. Serdak brought back a large amount of Warcraft materials from the Invercargill Forest. And once again, became the goods that merchants in Doden Town were competing for. Businessman Malakom's Thunder Rhino Merchant Group is mainly responsible for transporting copper ingots from the copper mines. And is not very interested in the hard armor of the ghost pattern soldier ants. The large amount of hard armor hunted during this northern expedition was brought back to Doden Town by Soldak and piled in the square in front of the military camp. The businessmen who got the news ran to the town one after another and passed Mrs. Luna. Talked to tax officer Butra to get specific information about these Warcraft materials. Some businessmen also approached Ong San. This aboriginal man was also considered a popular figure in the eyes of Viscount Serdek. He controlled a labor team of more than a thousand people, mainly responsible for undertaking various tasks in Doden Town and the Copper Mine. Construction Projects The Junior Warrior Academy in Doden Town was also built by Ong San's Labor Corps, with Baron Marin Martino responsible for the design and production. The entire mound was filled with foundation stones of various sizes. The site looked very messy and even looked a little depressed after a few snowfalls. The construction of the Junior Warrior Academy requires a large amount of stone, which is mainly supplied by the quarry in Doden Town. But some exquisite marbles and statues are purchased in bulk from the art center in Wilk City. Unlike the Twin Goddess Temple, which was built quickly, the construction period of the War College took as long as two years. Most of the buildings were built with rocks. After the college is completed, it will be filled with a large number of artistic statues and reliefs. Now the foundation of the college has been completed, and dense wooden frames have been built around the mound. 
Rows of exquisite wooden houses have been built in the large open space between the Warrior Academy and Doden Town. These wooden houses have been built all the way to the south bank of the Doden River. These wooden houses have not even been painted, and the original yellowish wood grain is exposed. Many wooden houses are actually businessmen who came to Doden Town to do business lived in it. Serdak rode through this residential area and saw many four-wheeled carriages pulling bundles of firewood to sell to the residents here. Smoke drifts from the chimneys of wooden houses, and you can smell the aroma of bacon and grilled fish when you stand on the street. Children built some snowmen and castles on both sides of the street. A group of naughty children stood in the castle made of snow, throwing snowballs at pedestrians on the street. When they were discovered, they dispersed into the alley behind. Escape. The surface of the Doden River had completely frozen into ice, which reminded him of the Janna mermaid named Sia. In such a cold weather, even if she was hiding in a wooden house, her life would not be easy. Serdak stood in front of the gate of the Twin Goddess Temple on the north bank of the Doden River. Today happened to be the prayer day for the residents of the town. Many residents came to the temple to pray to the goddess. This was also the most popular time for Selena, Nika and Zygna. A busy day. The bell rang in the temple to end the prayer. A group of townspeople walked out of the temple side by side, wearing thick coats. Everyone was wearing heavy clothes and chatting while walking, making crunching sounds on the snow on the ground. Serdak did not wear salamander skin armor. He casually put on a woolen cloak and walked leisurely through the snow to the temple backyard just like an ordinary traveler, so that the townspeople did not notice. The man standing in the snow in the courtyard is the mayor. When it was completely dark, the residential areas in the town turned on lights one after another, and the street lights were turned on one by one by night watchmen. Selina slowly walked out of the temple with Zygna and Nika. They locked the door of the temple, turned around and walked along the riverside building towards the riverside wooden house. Serdak then stepped forward and appeared in front of the three of them seeing the hoarfrost on Serdak's beard. Selina looked at Serdak in surprise and asked him, How long have you been waiting here? Why don't you come in when it's so cold? Her voice was soft and a little sweet, which made Soldak feel warm in his heart. He walked closer and held Selina and Zygna in his arms. Zygna broke away from Soldak's arms, looked up at Soldak's majestic side face, and said with some confusion, Dak, I feel like you are a little different from before. Zygna's voice still sounded like a little milk cat. What's different? Serdak leaned over and asked Signa. I can't tell, Signa said, shaking her head hesitantly. The four of them walked side by side along the riverside path. Selina stayed close to Soldak, raised her chin slightly, and looked at him and asked. I heard that the northern expedition did not go well. It's okay, Soldak said with a slight smile. When we come back this time, will the northern expedition be over? Selina asked with concern. It's over. Serdak exhaled a breath of white breath and said looking at the river covered with thick snow. Signa cheered. Ah, that's great. Three magic caravans were parked at the gate of the riverside cabin. Serdak and his party came over. Mrs. Luna, tax officer Butra, and Ansan pushed their way out of their respective carriages, quickly stepped out of the carriage, and faced Serdak, their eyes full of eagerness to talk. Serdak looked around and then at the wooden house without any smoke and smoke. He hesitated before saying, Everyone hasn't had dinner yet. Let's go and find a warmer place to have something to eat together. By the way, I'll also hear about what you have gained during this period of time and what difficulties you can't solve. Mrs. Luna and tax collector Butra quickly asked Soldak and Selina to board the magic caravan. Ong San smiled and did not argue about it. He quickly returned to his magic caravan and let the magic caravan follow behind. Tax collector Butra was sitting in the magic caravan and suggested to Serdak. Then go to the newly opened barbecue restaurant in the town. The chef in that restaurant came from Benna City, and his cooking skills are very good. Serdak nodded and asked tax officer Butra. Are there any financial problems in the town? It's the end of the year, and some documents require your seal before they can be filed. Tax officer Butra said. With such a warrior academy, is the town under great financial pressure? Soldek asked again. Tax collector Butra leaned forward and said to Serdak. One third of the project fee for the Junior Warrior Academy is paid, and the quarry is basically paid on a monthly basis. So there is not much pressure. This newly opened barbecue restaurant in town is not far from the wooden house on the Soldak River. It is built on the west side of the central shopping street and south of the road. It is a one story wooden building facing the street. The glass windows at the door are very clean. From the outside through the glass window, you can see the chefs feeding skewers of barbecue into the huge oven. 
and there is a delicate aroma of fat floating outside. The open design structure of the kitchen allows guests to see what is going on inside the store at a glance. There were many customers eating in this restaurant in the evening, and there were even a dozen customers waiting in line at the door. Tax officer Butra got out of the carriage first, and then asked Soldek, Selena, and Mrs. Luna to get out of the carriage. The waiter at the door seemed to know tax officer Butra. He quickly ran to the lobby and asked the restaurant manager to come out. The well-dressed restaurant manager respectfully invited everyone to a well-decorated private room inside. This move inevitably caused protests from those waiting in line. But a waiter immediately came forward to appease him. When the lobby manager introduced the restaurant's special dishes to Soldak, Soldak learned that the so-called specialty here was to use silver oak nuts as charcoal to grill the limestone iguana, a specialty of the Bena province. No one was very interested in iguanas, so they just ordered some smoked fish and lamb shank. While waiting for the appetizers, Serdak asked the three of them. Now, what do you want to tell me? Mrs. Luna coughed lightly, and then reported to Soldak. President Buckley wants to apply for 50 hunting certificates for the mercenary union at the Chain Bridge Hunting Ground. Serdak snorted and said noncommittally. Tell him to come to me at the town hall tomorrow morning. Hearing what Soldak said, Mrs. Luna knew that this matter was probably not going to work and she couldn't help but feel a little resentful towards the president of the mercenary union. At this time, tax officer Butra hurriedly came over and whispered, Epson, the owner of the tailor's shop, heard that the miners in the mine wanted to order uniform clothing, and the styles of the clothes he said were not approved. I would like to ask you about it. Serdak rarely bothers with such trivial matters recently. These trivial matters can basically be decided by the mine manager of the copper mine. Serdak said, What's there to know about this? Ong San? What kind of clothes would you wear if you were a jungle hunter? Ong San was at the dining table, using a silver table knife to handle a piece of fried meat. At this time, he quickly raised his head and said without thinking, Of course it's leather armor. And some jungle camouflage is also required. Serdak asked again, Butra, you are a tax collector. What kind of clothes do you usually wear? Just wear it all. You can put a charcoal pen in the chest pocket. And you can also put the account book in the pocket. Tax Officer Butra replied. Serdak then explained to Tax Officer Butra. What the miners in the mine need is a kind of work clothes sewn from linen fabric that is tough and relatively cheap. The key point is that it is wear resistant and practical. And it is also relatively high quality and cheap. I don't want to see these miners wearing clothes that look like this. That kind of pullover skirt made from a linen bag. With neither sleeves nor trouser legs. And anti-smash leather shoes. By the way. Tomorrow you invite the shoe shop owner to come to my town hall. Tax officer Butra nodded quickly and said, I know. I'll bring him here in the morning. In addition to the tax collector Tabatra, the owner of the tailor's shop, who asked Serdak about the detailed requirements for the miners' uniforms. Several businessmen also asked the tax collector Butra to ask Serdak what to do with the Warcraft materials. Serdak thought for a while and then said, These Warcraft materials and frozen meat will be transported to Benna City. There is a leather goods company in Benna City that can process these hard armors. And the frozen meat will be sent to the free trade there. Market. But the amount of material shipped back this time is huge. And it is not impossible to do transactions with me. Businessmen who can produce 10 recent tax payment receipts can come to the town hall to find me. Lady Luna and tax collector Butra got the answers they wanted from Serdak and shut up. Ansa began to report to Serdak on the progress of the Junior Warrior Academy project as well as the renovation of houses in the Imperial Immigrant Residential Area and the construction of residential areas on the south bank of the Doden River. In the past year, Ong San has transformed from an ordinary hunter to a small town builder. Not only has he created countless wealth for the indigenous people, but his own life has also undergone earth-shaking changes. All this probably happened after he worked as a guide for Serdak. Not only Doden Town, but also copper mines and canyon camps are represented by the Ong San Labor Group. This Count Serdak, do you want to build a long wall on the southern cliff of the mountain stream? Ong San looked up at Serdak and said respectfully, This is a big project. If you have such a plan, I will lead people to cut down the trees in the winter and start construction next spring. Soldak put down the table knife in his hand, took a sip of sweet wine, and then said, There is no need for a defensive wall now. You have a general understanding of the terrain over there. In fact, I have also had some considerations in the past few days. We plan to establish a hunting ground in the area north of Chain Bridge Camp and south of Poison Swamp. Ong San did not expect that Serdak would adopt such a radical plan. 
He immediately thought that the northern expedition seemed to be a complete victory. Thinking that the cavalry battalion under Soldak was indeed capable of fighting against the ghost-striped red ants. He said, The hunting ground is a really good idea. Then I will build some wooden houses in the chain bridge camp. Serdak shook his head and said, The focus of your next task is to lead the labor team down to the tribes. He touched the clothes on his body, tapped the plates on the dining table with his fingers, looked up at the room in the restaurant, and said to Ong San, We are going to gradually change the living conditions of the indigenous tribes. The initial stage is nothing more than it means changing their food, clothing, housing and transportation. In the future, we will also allow children from the tribe to study in the warrior academy. Since they have become subjects in my territory, I have the responsibility to improve their lives. Signa and Nika sat at the dining table with some restraint, looking at Soldak with admiration. The candlelight reflected on their red faces, making their eyes shine brightly. It wasn't until the dinner was over and Soldak and Selina returned to the riverside cabin with Nika and Signa in a carriage that Selina asked Soldak in a low voice. Can I ask those indigenous people in the future? The tribe passes on the teachings of the dark goddess? Certainly. Serdak looked at the hint of gold in Selina's eyes and immediately answered without thinking. Samira received a letter from Wazimra City in the Maka Plain, which was sent to Samira by the old nun in the asylum. The general meaning is that they have received a large amount of money, so they are planning to renovate the house in the asylum and take in more children. This money will allow the asylum to maintain for a long time. So there is no need for Samira to continue to send money. The letter mainly said only this one thing, and the rest were various blessings from the children. Some wrote blessing words and their names on the letter paper. And some drew some pictures. There were also some small gifts mixed in the envelope. Broken pieces. Small doll with cloth head. Grasshopper woven with grass leaves. Samira sat in front of the bed in the attic of the garrison camp. Her eyes became very soft under the moonlight. Chapter 937 The Magic of Sia In the lower room of the riverside wooden house. The walls of the room extending into the river have been completely frozen by the river water. There is a very thick layer of ice there. However, the room is not too cold. But Thea cannot take a dip in the Doden River. She is a Janice tribe who cannot live without water. Recently, she has been lying in a large bathtub that is not very spacious. Even swinging the tail fin doesn't work. As long as she flaps her tail fin, half the bathtub's worth of water will fly out. The room was not too cold. Just a little damp. And there was a thick layer of white thrust on the surrounding walls. Mermaid Miss Thea was lying in the bathtub. There was a metal rune plate placed under the bathtub, and a very stable flame was burning on the bottom of the bathtub to maintain the temperature of the water in the bathtub. The water temperature was a little cold, and when she stretched her arms, she always took them out of the tub. She felt very cold when her arms covered with water were exposed outside, as long as she wasn't eating. She basically wouldn't float out of the bathtub. In the blink of an eye, it has been more than two months since I arrived in Duodan town. Sia has somewhat adapted to the life here and is familiar with her temporary shelter. Since her escape from Wilk City, the original magic seal forbidden magic on her body has become invalid. She regained her magic power half a month ago. Although she regained her magical power, she failed to gain any happiness from this power. The reason is that both Zygna and Nika are very disdainful of her magical power. And even when the three of them are together, they don't talk much about these things. Miss Mermaid really wanted to let her friends know about her magical power. But after the exchange, Sia found that the two girls didn't seem to respect magic that much. She had known for a long time that Nika had the power of light element. But obviously Nika could only be regarded as a beginner. She also fully hoped that Nika could ask her about magic. But unfortunately Nika never asked her. Recently, by chance, I learned that Zygna was born with a dark constitution. According to this statement, once Signa successfully reaches the peak of level 19, she will be promoted to a strong person at level 2 without any shackles. Sia understands this natural elemental constitution. Just like some people in the Janna Sea tribe are born with water elemental bodies. However, this kind of special physique is unique even among the Janna Sea clan. He will be absorbed into the Sea God Temple at birth and become a priest of the Sea Goddess. She was a little curious as to whether there were many people with such talents like Nika and Zygna in the human world. After having this idea, she was ready to try to live in the human world for a while. After her magic power recovered, she could recite the spell she occasionally recited on the rocks to turn her tail fin into legs. She sat on the edge of the bathtub tonight, wiped the water stains on her body with a towel, and then began to chant the magic spell like a ballad. Her body was surrounded by magic lines, 
and the three-color fish tail slowly turned into two big long legs. She suddenly felt uncomfortable with these two ivory-like meat pillars. She covered her round buttocks and jumped from the edge of the bathtub to the floor with some restraint. She walked around the floor twice with bare feet and found that her steps were light. And her swimming in the sea are completely different concepts. In the sea, she needs all her strength to swim quickly. But here, the wonderful feeling of being able to run so fast with only two legs is simply indescribable. Thinking that both Zygna and Nika had shoes, she found that there were no shoes in the wooden house. But this did not bother him at all. She wrapped her delicate and saw feet with a piece of linen cloth, which was actually very good. Beauty. She wanted to surprise Signa and Nika after dawn, and then borrow a beautiful skirt and boots from them. She was considering whether to sell a pearl to get some living expenses. This pearl was one of the few assets she had. Every night seemed to be difficult. In the past, she didn't feel that time passed very slowly while sleeping in the bathtub. But tonight she had two long legs, and the night was really long. She was in the room on the lower floor of the platform, wrapped around a cashmere blanket and waiting obediently for dawn. This Count Seldek seemed to have come back last night. The ceiling made a creaking sound all night. Miss Selina was crying faintly in the room upstairs. Miss Thea planned to tell the secretly. For Zygna, at least don't let those two silly girls blindly worship this bad guy. After dawn, Nika would check on Sia's condition as usual every morning. But this time she pushed the door open and walked in and was really startled by the mermaid lady. After pushing the door open and entering the room, Nika saw Sia standing straight at the door with a trace of pride on her face. You can actually stand up? Nika lowered her exclamation and shouted to Sia. Yes, my magic power has recovered. When Sia spoke, the smile on her face seemed a bit offensive. Nika didn't want to meet Sia in the same way. Seeing that she was fine, he was going to leave a breakfast and leave. Nika, wait a minute. Sia called to Nika and then said with some embarrassment, Do you know where to sell this bead? I'm going to change it for some money. Do you want to exchange this bead for money? No need at all. Nika stared at the round pearl and said loudly, Magicians can make money easily. Aren't you also a spellcaster of the Janna Sea tribe? Dot. Sia's eyes lit up and she asked Nika, Then what should I do? Nika just glanced at Sia and said casually, Of course I'm selling your magic. Thea widened her beautiful blue eyes and asked Nika, How can I sell my magic? Just draw your magic and draw it into a magic scroll and sell it. Water magic should be very popular. Nika introduced to the mermaid Miss Sia, and then said, I don't know much about this, but I hope Gina must know. I'll call her over. Nika came back soon after leaving. Not only did she wake up Signa from her bed, but he also brought her a pair of old leather boots and a skirt. But for Sia, Nika's new loose skirt is a bit tight no matter how she wears it. Signa sat sleepily in the lower room. After listening to Thea's question again, she explained to her, I heard the following from Celia Cooper. I haven't confirmed whether it will work or not. I heard that drawing a magic scroll requires some preparation, including magic ink, magic carving knife, and magic parchment. I can ask for these. Justin is going to order some. He is a magic pharmacist, and he is staying in Doden Town to help Duck refine magic potions. Is it really possible? Sia asked hesitantly. Signa clapped her hands, raised her face, and muttered, How will you know if it's okay if you don't try it? Chapter 938 A Day in a Small Town The sun shines brightly on a winter morning, and the air in Doden Town becomes extremely fresh under the snow. Serdak was wearing a thick leather coat. He stepped off the snow on his sauls at the door of the town hall and stepped into the lobby on the first floor of the Duoden Town Hall. Miss Ruili, the receptionist at the front desk, quickly stood up and greeted Serdak very respectfully. Kuz saluted. Good morning. Mr. Mayor. Good morning. Miss Ruili. Soldak accurately called out Miss Ruili's name, causing the young blonde lady's pretty face to blush slightly. Walking up the stairs, I opened the door and entered my office which I had not set foot in for almost two months. The room must have been cleaned frequently, so it was very clean and tidy. There were two pots of rose flowers on the windowsill, which looked very delicate and charming. Soldak looked up and saw the map hanging on the wall. This was the map he had hung before entering the Invercargill Forest. The mountains and rivers marked on the entire forest area were still very blurry. Now he held it in his hand. There is a more accurate map of the territory. He walked over, pulled the old map off the wall, and rehanged a map of Invercargill Forest with very clear boundaries. From this map, you can easily find copper mines, canyon camps, 
and mountain stream cable bridges. The location of the camp and the distribution of the 37 indigenous tribes can also be seen in the general area of the enclosed land. When he first arrived in Doden Town more than half a year ago, who would have thought that he would occupy the entire Invercargill Warcraft forest by the end of the year? Who would have thought that the army he brought would actually expand to 3,000 people? And the cavalry of the cavalry battalion would even set foot at the entrance of the Dark Worm Valley? If it were not for the fact that the birds in the north of the mountain did not have enough food, Serdak felt that he would continue cleaning up those ghost striped red ants this month. This winter in Doden Town, Serdak suddenly felt some emotion in his heart. The room was very warm. He hung his thick leather coat on the hanger at the door, then sat down on the chair in front of the desk and rubbed his hand on the table. Just when he was in a daze, Mrs. Luna stood at the door holding a tea tray and knocked gently. He walked into the office elegantly, placed the tea tray on the coffee table, poured a cup of milky black tea and placed it on the desk in front of Soldek. He said with a smile, You need an assistant by your side. The government office has selected several good candidates for you. Although there were crow's feet at the corners of his eyes, his generous manner and tone of voice made Soldak feel very comfortable. Well, that's fine. Then invite them over tomorrow morning. And I'll try to choose one of them. Soldak nodded in agreement. Mrs. Luna stood in front of the desk with her hands down and responded. Okay, Mr. Mayor. At this time, Mrs. Luna's assistant stood at the door and said, Madam, President Buckley is here. Mrs. Luna didn't speak for the first time. She looked at Soldak. Let him in. Soldak glanced out the window and saw the Mercenary Union's magic caravan parked in the yard. Mrs. Luna's assistant agreed. Okay. President Buckley walked into Soldak's office wearing a magic pattern structure. His hair was meticulously combed and he had an earnest smile on his face. Serdak asked him to sit down opposite him and asked, I heard that you want to increase the hunting certificate for the hunting ground. President Buckley looked at Mrs. Luna, who was standing aside, and quickly replied, Yes, Mayor Soldak. There are many mercenary groups in the Union who said they went to the hunting ground at the Chain Bridge Camp to hunt ghost striped red ants. Idea? Soldak nodded slightly and said to President Buckley, The issuance of hunting certificates may be suspended this winter. It is estimated that the hunting grounds will not be developed to the outside world until next spring. This time my army's northern expedition has been greatly reduced. The number of ghost striped soldier ants is so high that I don't want to see no trace of ghost striped red ants in this hunting ground in a few years. President Buckley said with some reluctance. But next spring, the poisonous mist on the poison swamp will seal the dark worm valley again. How can we hunt ghost striped red ants at that time? In previous years, when the poisonous fog cleared from the poisonous swamp, were those mercenary groups so urgent? Serdak retorted. Uh. President Buckley was speechless by Soldak's words. Soldak changed the subject and asked. President Buckley, how much do you know about the Anya wetland? Mr. Mayor, are you going to open up the Anya wetland next? President Buckley immediately began to think about the information about the Anya wetland and said casually, there are lakes and swamps everywhere, and there are many snake lizards living there. It is good at concealing its whereabouts and often hides in bushes and puddles to ambush explorers. Only explorers who are familiar with the swamp environment can survive there. Once winter arrives, Many monsters in the wetland enter a state of hibernation. Unless we can dig through the permafrost and dig them out of caves more than 10 meters deep, it will be difficult to hunt them. Serdak knew that it would be difficult for the Eye of Truth to see through such a thick layer of soil, and hunting in the Anya wetland in winter seemed unrealistic. At this time, President Buckley said, compared with Anya Swamp, I actually think the Three Rivers Plain is more suitable for cavalry hunting in winter. But there are many high-level magic beasts entrenched on the vast plain over there and the rock birds in the north are always guarding there. Although this area is richer in warcraft resources than Invercargill Forest, ordinary adventure groups and mercenary groups do not dare to set foot in that area easily. Serdak did not expect that the Three Rivers Plain was actually a place rich in warcraft resources. So he asked, Isn't there anyone among the local lords who is developing that area? President Buckley immediately replied, Of course there are still some. The famous nobles in Wilk City, including the Goss family, the Golding family, the Norton family, etc. all have cavalry regiments stationed there. It's just that in recent years without the support of Duke Newman, the Lord's private army was very slow to develop in the Three Rivers Plain. Although he felt that there was something in President Buckley's words, Soldak just nodded and did not continue the conversation. President Buckley failed to obtain a hunting certificate for chain bridge hunting ground 
and had no choice but to say goodbye and leave. As soon as President Buckley left the office, tax collector Butcher took Epperson, the owner of the tailor's shop, and Barney, the town shoemaker, waiting outside the door of Soldak's office. Serdak asked them to come inside. Epson, the owner of the tailor's shop, crouched behind the butcher tax collector, looking groveling and cautious, with a somewhat stiff smile on his face. Soldak had dealt with this tailor shop owner several times before, and had a pretty good impression of him. But this was the first time I met Bonnie Soldak, the shoemaker in the town. He was a shy, Renault's, strong man. He wore a leather apron when he came to the town hall. You could tell at a glance that he was a craftsman. Soldak invited them to sit down on the sofa in the rest area, and then said directly to the tailor shop owner, The clothes that the miners in the copper mine need are very simple, very strong, wear resistant, and extremely cheap. It's made from cut fabric. It doesn't matter if the fabric is rough. It doesn't need to be too soft. And it doesn't need to be comfortable. Is this kind of fabric okay? The owner of the tailor shop opened his clothes, revealing the money bag at his waist, and asked Soldak, the cloth bag looks very strong, but its texture is as rough as a linen bag. You decide which kind of fabric you want. I'm just telling you the general direction of the mine's demand. Soldak glanced at the tailor shop owner, and then said, These are just clothes for working in the mine. They must be design style should be based on cheapness and practicality. The tailor shop owner nodded repeatedly to show that he understood. Soldak looked at the shoemaker, took out a piece of the hard leather of a ghostly patterned worker and placed it in front of him and asked him, can you use the hard leather of this kind of worker and to sew leather shoes? It's okay. But the made leather shoes are very hard, which may scratch your feet when you walk. However, I thought of designing the uppers of the leather shoes into three sections. This problem can be solved by using the abdominal joints of worker ants. Leather shoemaker as I talked. I found the solution. Serdek waved his hand and said, The upper part of the shoe must be harder to prevent stones from falling and breaking the toes. But it should not affect walking. Shoemaker Buck's eyes brightened and he said confidently, I can give it a try and send you a sample in three days. Soldak pushed a piece of hard leather out of his hand and said to the shoemaker Little Buck, My requirements for these leather boots are the same. They should be as simple and practical as possible. The surface of the leather shoes does not require any treatment. These leather shoes will be taken to the copper mines for the miners to wear. Comfort, impact resistance and durability are the most basic requirements. And I there are only these three requirements. If you can do a good job, I will give you this order. The first batch of orders will make a thousand pairs of these leather shoes. The shoemaker didn't expect that the mayor would order a thousand pairs of leather boots as his first order. And exclaimed, Oh my god! I have to make one thousand pairs for three years even if I don't eat or drink. Soldek waved his hand and said, Once the sample is passed, I will pay you one third of the advance payment. And I can provide the raw materials of hard leather. I am not asking you to make these leather shoes by yourself. It is a long-term supply business. You can recruit some apprentices or hire some leather workers. You just need to teach them the methods to ensure the quality of the leather boots. Epperson, the owner of the tailor shop nearby, immediately whispered to the shoemaker. But, if you find it difficult to do it alone, we can cooperate. You just need to develop your skills, and I will recruit other leather workers and apprentices. Serdak went on to talk about the specific details about the miners' uniforms and anti-smash shoes. He also wanted to make some safety helmets. Thinking about it, it seemed easier. Just cut off the heads of the ghost pattern soldier ants. Then although the piece of hard armor is not very beautiful, it can be directly used as a safety helmet. The morning passed like this, and Soldak walked out of the town hall. Tax collector Butra was waiting next to a magic caravan in the courtyard of the town hall. When he saw Serdak coming out of the hall, he immediately opened the door from the carriage, stood next to the car door, and invited Serdak to join him. Lunch. Serdak waved his hand, pointed to the small single-family building diagonally opposite the town hall, and said to tax officer Butra, There will be many opportunities in the future. I want to go to Justin's place to see the preparation process of the magic potion. As he spoke, under the gaze of tax officer Butra, he walked out of the town hall compound, walked through the lively street in front of the town hall, and came to the small building he rented to Lance, pushing open the courtyard door. The snow in the courtyard has been cleared away. Serdak stepped in and knocked on the door of the small building. The person who came out and opened the door was a cook wearing an apron around her waist. After seeing Serdak, she quickly saluted and said, Mr. Mayor, good afternoon. 
Is Justin Magic here? Soldak knew the young cook in front of him. She not only had to clean the room here every day, but was also responsible for Justin's two meals a day. He's here. Come in quickly. The cook immediately opened the door and asked Soldak to come in. Soldak walked into the small building and walked through the foyer and saw Justin, Nika and Cigna sitting on the sofa in the living room chatting. Squeezed together with the two of them was a very delicate and beautiful girl. But her hair was light algae green and her ears were a little special. She was wearing a tight skirt, revealing a section of her white calves. Wearing so little in such a cold winter. And what she wore on her feet was clearly a pair of Selena's high-heeled leather shoes. These are Selena's favorite leather shoes. Soldak looked familiar to her face. At this time, Zigna and Nika stood up from the sofa when they saw Soldak walking in from the outside. Zigna looked surprised and asked, Dak, why are you here? Owner. Nika also stood up with a look of fear. The young girl wearing Selena leather shoes also stood up immediately and looked at Soldak in surprise. When Soldak saw her big blue eyes, he realized that she was the Janna mermaid Messia who lived downstairs in his house. Unexpectedly, her legs were quite beautiful. Why are you here? I'm here to visit Justin. Soldak asked Nika. Miss Signa, Sia and I came to visit magician Justin because we wanted to learn from him how to make magic scrolls. Nika answered truthfully. Hearing what Nika said, Soldak nodded apologetically and said, It's my fault. If it weren't for me, you should be studying this knowledge at Wilkes Academy of Magic now. Justin saw Serdak walking in and asked him to sit down. Master, I never thought about going to a magic academy to study, Nika whispered. Justin opened his mouth wide and looked at Soldak and Nika. His eyes filled with all kinds of stories. At this time, Zygna secretly pulled Ravnica's sleeve and then said to Soldak, Dak, since you have something to see Justin Magician, we won't bother you. With that said, he picked up Messia who didn't say a word and hurriedly walked outside. Chapter 939 A Day in a Small Town 2 Seeing Zigna holding Sia's hand and walking out of the small building quickly, Soldak asked in the living room, Hey, Signa, where are you going? Signa waved her hand to Soldak without looking back, looking like a rebellious girl. However, this rebellious phase seemed to come a bit early for Signa. Thea looked back at Soldak out of curiosity. The Lord looked a little helpless. Nika hurriedly followed the two girls, but still gave a hasty salute to Soldak, then ran out with her skirt in hand. Thea is almost as tall as an adult woman, with a slender and well-proportioned figure. She and Zygna stand together like an adult holding a child. Her eyes are so pure that there is no impurity. When she looks around, her eyes are full of novelty, like it was a deer that ran out of the forest. Soldak made a gesture to Nika to take good care of Zygna, and stood at the door of the small building watching them hurriedly run out of the yard, rushed into the crowded street, and disappeared into the chaotic street in the blink of an eye. Serdak was just a little surprised. In such a cold weather, Miss Janna Mermaid seemed to be wearing a little thin clothing. Justin, who was standing next to Soldak, pushed up the thick glasses on the bridge of his nose, pulled his arm, and said to him impatiently, Dak, come and see my recent achievements. The two walked back into the living room of the room. Justin touched his magic belt with his hand, and a magic sealing box suddenly appeared on the carpet in front of him. Justin pointed to Soldak and asked him to open the lid of the box, and he took out five more boxes one after another. Serdak opened the lid of the box, and the honeycomb-like grid inside was filled with test tube-shaped secondary healing potions. There were more than 70 bottles on one floor. There are about eight to nine hundred bottles of secondary healing potions in six boxes. The demand for these things in the magic market is almost in short supply. So much. Serdak also didn't expect that the magic herbs harvested during this northern expedition could actually be used to refine so many healing potions. Of course, with so many magic herbs and these secondary healing potions, the success rate is almost 100%. Justin shrugged indifferently. Then he approached Soldak again and said very sincerely, Dak, I think we should make some lion potions or spiritual potions. These two potions are hard currency in the magic market and are secondary treatments. Sooner or later the potion will become worthless. Okay, maybe you have a point. Serdak felt that since his holy light treatment was quite effective, he agreed to the proposal. At this moment, I heard a familiar voice shouting from the balcony upstairs. Good afternoon, Lord Soldak. Soldak raised his head and saw Victor the magician wearing a nightgown and a nightcap standing behind the railing. He said with a surprised look on his face, Victor, why are you here? 
Victor spread his hand, pointed at Justin and explained. Justin and I were very good friends when we were in Helensa City. I have been living with him in Doden Town. Serdak laughed and said. I thought you had returned to Aranza. Victor did not hide anything and said directly. Justin has some magic herbs that the alchemists urgently need. I am discussing with him. Magician Victor's voice was interrupted by Justin. Don't even think about it. These are to be refined into healing potions to save people. Not the catalysts and co-solvents of your alchemy guild. Justin immediately stated his position. Victor said without giving up. Actually, these reagents are also very useful magic items. And I don't want much. Justin's answer was even more decisive. If we don't talk about this, we are still good friends. Hey, I know there is a good bar in the town where you can meet a good girl. I will take you to go shopping in the evening. Don't think about my medicinal herbs anymore. Seeing the obvious smell of gunpowder in the conversation between the two friends, Soldak immediately patted Justin, who looked like a fried cock, and then said to Victor upstairs, Victor, if you need just a little bit, I can give it to you as a token of my gratitude for traveling all the way to Bylin's plane. Victor's eyes lit up, and he expressed his very appropriate gratitude for Soldak's gift. Lord Serdak, thank you very much. The two young magicians stood at the door, watching Serdak leave the small building, and they were filled with emotion for a moment. The streets of Doden Town are still very lively in winter, and there are many vehicles on the streets. Signa pulled Mistia and ran until she was out of breath. The three girls stopped at a chilled fish stall. Signa and Nika took a fancy to a fresh fish wrapped in thin ice and planned to treat Thea to a good meal. Of. Sia was staring at some dried kelp hanging next to the fish stall. She reached out to take it. But the stall owner stopped her. A bundle of dried kelp is 50 copper coins. Please pay first. The stall owner saw her fair skin and beauty and reminded her gently. Only then did Thea remember to spend money to buy it. She lowered her head and took out a sh. L from her arms. Zigna and Nika had already come over. When the stall owner saw Zigna, he quickly asked with great respect, Miss Zigna, why are you free to come to my shop today? Do you and your friends need fresh fish and dried seaweed? Please pick up the one you choose. Yes, don't be polite. Zigna asked with a puzzled look on her face. Do you know me? Looking at what you said, there are probably not many people in the entire Duodan town who don't know that you are Mrs. Selena's daughter. The stall owner said with a flattering smile, Thea pointed to the dried kelp hanging on the stall and whispered to Zigna. I want to eat that. Zigna touched her money bag in embarrassment, but was unwilling to reach out and take the package of dried kelp in vain. At this time, Nika had handed over the copper plate and put it in the hands of the stall owner, and then took Zigna and Sia away from the fish stall, carrying the things they bought on the street. The girls walked into a coffee shop and sat down. They ordered three times the sweetness of hot drinks and sat down next to the window. We were at Magician Justin's house just now. Why did we run away? Thea asked doubtfully. She was a little curious about this kind of dessert. So she licked it with her deaf pink tongue, and her eyes suddenly narrowed into slits. There was no girl who didn't like sweets, and Jana Mermaid was no exception. Zigna rolled her eyes and said in an adult tone, Otherwise, do you really want to sit with him? Didn't you see that Dak was staring at Sia's legs just now? That kind of the expression is the same as that of other men on the street. According to Celia Cooper, men are animals who like to think with their lower bodies. This sentence was a bit profound, and Sia didn't understand it at all. I don't think the master is that kind of person, Nika retorted quietly from the side. Cygna said very harshly, He didn't look at your legs because you're not pretty enough. The three girls remained silent for a while, and everyone was drinking hot drinks in silence. In the end, it was Nika who spoke first and asked, What should I do next? Cygna thought for a while, and pointed to a grocery store selling magic items across the street. Let's go to the grocery store opposite. Maybe we can buy a secondhand magic engraving pen there. And preferably a bottle. Magic ink is cheap enough. As for magic parchment, I don't think it's necessary to draw magic patterns on parchment. We can also try it on the hard armor of soldier ants. Those things are everywhere in the military camp. Whatever no one will care if you take a few pictures. Nika took off the money bag from his waist, placed it on the table and said, I still have a little money in my pocket. Signa had an idea and suggested. How about we go to the military camp first and have a look? While they were chatting, they didn't even notice that Serdak passed by the shop on horseback and headed towards the North City Wall. Chapter 940 Sia's Thoughts Walking on the long street of Duodan Town, she all looked at the roofs covered with thick snow in the distance, like a thick snow-white quilt. 
the shops on the street in the town are not very neatly built. But in just six months, the originally depressed town street has become very lively. Sial was holding a paper bag in her hand, which contained a pack of dried kelp. She put the paper bag, put it in front of you, and gently smelled the salty smell on it, which is the smell of the sea. Nika introduced this border town to Thea and met many townspeople along the way. When everyone saw Nika and Signa, they would take the initiative to say H, Lo. The two girls are the saints of the Dawn Temple and the Night Temple respectively. They have a special status in the town. No matter where they go, people know them. Duodan Town is built on the south side of the canyon. Standing in the town, you can see the towering cliffs on both sides hanging above your head, giving you a strong sense of oppression. The owner is the mayor of this town. He happened to go to Wilk City to solve the issue of territorial development rights at that time. You are so lucky to meet him at that time, Nika said to Thea. One side again. You've been gone for so long. Is it really okay? Thea knocked on her legs that were stiff from the cold, shook her head and said, It's okay. It's a little sore. But it doesn't matter. It turns out that this Count Serdak is the mayor of this town. She thought about how she was hiding under the bridge over the inner river in Wilk City, and how Soldak rode away without a care. And she felt her heart beat violently. Nika thought for a moment. And when passing by the tailor's shop, she pulled C in. Epson, the owner of the tailor's shop, had just met Mayor Soldak in the town hall. When he saw Zigna and Nika walking in from outside, he quickly greeted them warmly. When they first arrived in Doden Town, Nika and Zigna rented a single-story building owned by Epson the owner of a tailor's shop. They knew this tailor, who liked to make small calculations. Good afternoon, Miss Signa. Nika, how can I help you? The tailor shop owner asked the clerk to go inside and bring out a few cups of milk tea. Um, we want to buy a thick, well-fitting skirt for Miss Thea. She came from Wilk City and has not prepared any clothes suitable for winter, Nika said calmly. The owner of the tailor shop hurriedly took the three girls to the second floor. As he walked, he said, Three beautiful ladies, please go this way. There are finished dresses upstairs, from the petticoats and corsets inside to the outside. A thick woolen skirt, gloves, and a hat. I have everything here. Walking up to the second floor, it turned out that the walls on this floor were covered with all kinds of finished clothes, and the tailor shop owner arranged them very neatly. The clothes inside were all very exquisite. Zigna liked the princess dress hanging in the corner very much. She stared at the lace tutu skirt for a long time. But in the end, she looked away and accompanied Thea, looking for her. Clothes that fit her body size. Almost a complete set was selected from the inside out. Sia has a very well-proportioned figure, making it very easy to choose women's clothing in the right size. However, Nika thought that she would have to pay for herself later. And the silver coin she finally saved in her pocket might not belong to her anymore. So she picked through these dresses, trying to find the most cost-effective one. Maybe save some money. You have really good taste. The tailor shop owner praised from the side. Nika pointed to the clothes worn by the mermaid girl Sia and asked, So how much do these clothes cost? Whatever you want. The owner of the tailor shop didn't intend to charge money at first. But he was worried that he would make the three girls turn around and leave because he was too obvious. So he changed his words and said, Oh! The tailor shop is doing a discount promotion. These pieces together total five silver coins and three. Nineteen coppers. Oh, it's so cheap. Nika said in surprise. She remembered that the dress she was wearing cost four silver coins. And Thea bought a complete set including a petticoat and corset. Our store is on sale. And this is a discounted price. The tailor shop owner said seriously. Nika took out her purse. Picked out some copper coins and silver coins and paid it to the tailor shop owner. She was not that stupid. Then she whispered to the tailor shop owner. Thank you, Boss Epperson. Epperson bent down slightly and said enthusiastically to the three girls. It's the greatest honor for me that you can come to me to buy clothes. Before the three girls left, they stuffed three big red apples into Nika's pockets for them to eat on the way. Just after the three girls left the tailor shop, a customer standing nearby asked strangely. Boss, aren't you doing a promotion here? Why don't you give me a cheaper price? The tailor shop owner said without changing his face. Sorry, the discount event has just ended. The customer shouted. Your event is too short. Boss Epson walked downstairs without looking back and motioned to the clerk next to him to receive the customer. He said at the same time, These britches for 15 silver coins are already the cheapest on the street. If you think you still want to consider it, 
you can go to other stores to choose. When the customer heard what the Epson boss said, he quickly said, That's it. Are there really no promotional discounts? The clerk said to him with a smile, No more. Customer, there are similar markets in the cities of the Jana C clan. Although Sia is a Jana mermaid, the tailor shop owner made it so obvious that she could tell at a glance that the tailor shop owner was trying to please them. She knew that there was no need for the tailor shop owner to please her. He would definitely be trying to please Signa and Nika. It turns out that Viscount Soldak is the mayor of this town. And he seems to be very respected. Thea thought to herself. Signa and Nika took Thea to the military camp. The guard at the gate saw Signa and said familiarly, Signa, are you here to see Mrs. Selina? She goes to the city defense brigade. I went to the warehouse to check the supplies. Signa waved her hand politely and said in a sweet voice, I'll wait for her inside. The guards ignored them and allowed the three girls to walk into the military camp. This Count Serdak is the commander of this garrison. Nika whispered to Sia. Inside the military camp, 1,500 infantrymen were practicing in formation on the playground. The snow on the playground has been cleared around. And the infantrymen wear standard armor and look majestic. Zigna walked to a small building in a familiar manner, opened the door and walked in. As she walked, she said, Every time Dak brings back a monster, he puts it in the kitchen for skinning. I'll go and see what's there in the kitchen. There's no leather left. She passed through the corridor and went directly to the kitchen of the small building. She rarely went to that kitchen, mainly because the kitchen walls were covered in blood and looked a bit scary. When passing by the study, she glanced inside out of habit and saw Soldak signing orders at his desk. In the past two months, he has led the expedition north, and the military camp has accumulated a large number of documents that need to be signed. Dak, why are you here too? Zigna was shocked. Soldak raised the quill in his hand and said, I'm just about to review these backlog documents. Seeing Nika and Sia following Zigna, he asked, Have you had lunch? Do you want me to prepare something for you? Zigna felt that it was better to make things simpler. So she squeezed in through the crack in the door and said, Dak, can you help me with something? Sernak sat up straight, put the quill in his hand into the inkpot, and asked seriously, What do you need me to do for you? Zigna whispered, I need some magic parchment or something, which is the material for making magic scrolls. You want to learn how to make magic scrolls? Sernak asked in surprise. Zigna nodded and said, Nika, Sia and I all want to try it. That's all? Sernak asked. Zigna nodded quickly. Yes. Sernak took off the money bag from his waist and threw it directly to Nika without even looking at how much money was in it. When Nika caught it, it felt heavy inside. Nika, go to the grocery store in town and buy some magic parchment. A magic engraving pen and ink. I believe the owner of the grocery store will tell you what kind of ink is more suitable for you. Soldak said. Nika opened the money bag. And the yellow gold coins inside dazzled Nika. Okay. Master. Nika said cheerfully. Serdak's eyes fell on Jana Mermaid Sia standing at the door. And asked. Are you Miss Sia? Good afternoon. Lord Serdak Sia quickly bowed in greeting. Serdak nodded and said. So you can become a human. I hope you have a good time in Doden Town. When the three girls left the small building, Soldak warned Zigna. Zigna, don't play out too late. When passing by the empty field outside the military camp, I happened to see a row of armed thunder rhinos with their heads lowered and gnawing beans. A whole sack of beans was gently sucked by the thunder rhino's fleshy mouth. And its wet big tongue was flicked inside. Roll up and eat a bag of beans. Seeing the armed thunder rhinoceros, Sia couldn't help but think, so there are such huge war beasts on land. This reminded her of the killer whale knights of the sea tribe. Perhaps these armed thunder rhinos were the whale knights of the human empire. These armed thunder rhinoceros are also part of this Count Serdek's army. Nika explained on the sidelines. Zigna and Nika took Thea to the magic grocery store in the town. Thea was a little distracted. And she didn't even notice the dazzling array of shops on both sides of the street. She felt that she should seek the help of Lord Serdek. And perhaps ask him to take her back to the sea. But Sia also knows that it doesn't matter if it happens casually. But if this matter is going to be very troublesome, Lord Serdak cannot help him for nothing. Maybe he can exchange it for equal value. Thinking of this, a water ball appeared in Thea's hand. The capital she had now should be the water magic she was familiar with. She decided to have a good talk with Viscount Serdak that night. Of course, Serdak didn't know that Jana Mermaid had the idea of working for him at this time. Selina has already placed the report on the consumption of logistic supplies on his desk. 
he invested almost all the wealth earned by the bees tied into this northern expedition. Thunder Rhinoceros transported back a large amount of Warcraft materials, as well as more than a dozen boxes. Elementary magic herbs and dozens of boxes of magic cores seemed to be a rich harvest. In fact, Serdak did not earn anything. Ordnance damage, merit exchange, and pensions will be three huge expenses. The biggest loss is the ordnance damage. Each bed crossbow is almost as good as a set of magic pattern structures. The 40 bed crossbows purchased this time can fully sue Kwanwei brought back only 11 from the battlefield. And 7 more catapults. The remaining ones could only be dismantled for parts. The only thing he earned was more than 300 life magic patterns. But these magic patterns are not for sale. Although they are valuable. Serdak is not prepared to sell them. These magic patterns also need to strengthen his cavalry battalion. After more than 2 months of excavation. Almost all the iron wood buried in the leaf rot soil for many years has been dug out except for a part of the main trunk, Serdak, which was planned to stay. The rest were all transported back to Alanza city by land, and this part of the income was considered to have come to an end. Of course, there is an iron ore mine in the territory that has not yet been developed. The mine is located in the eastern part of Embercargill Forest, near the Three Rivers Plain. He planned to take it easy first, after the army had been training for a period of time. He wanted to explore the Anya Swamp before the ground thawed. If possible, he would push the safety line of the Anya Swamp 200 kilometers westward, waiting until spring. Once the spring flowers bloom and everything revives, it may not be easy to enter the Anya Swamp. A large number of monsters will gather in Anya Swamp. After the tide of monsters subsides, these monsters will gradually return to the Invercargill Monster Forest. Suldek also wants to build a barracks there, at least not to let those monsters roam freely. Entering Invercargill Forest, looking at the map on the wall, the Anya Swamp area is still blank. Serdak will go on another expedition and needs to restock a batch of war preparation supplies. Selina is currently counting the loot at the warehouse. A business group has already approached her to discuss the specific costs of transporting this batch of materials back to Benes City. Many business groups hope to buy these hard armors. However, Serdak has an agreement with the Goffaro family. The leather business must take care of the Goffaro family's leather business as much as possible. So all these hard armor skins must be transported back to Benes City. Serdak stepped through the void gate. Waved to Aphrodite, who was lying beside the lava pool. Chopped some red crystal stone clusters next to the stone pillar. Put them into a linen bag. And entered through the cracks in the rocks. Go to the red dragon's treasure chamber. And prepare to continue teaching the rune language to Izer. The huge head of the red dragon Izer lay on the stone platform. Looking at the exquisite dragon knight saddle in a daze. It wasn't until Serdak was holding a linen bag and standing next to its huge head that it raised its head and asked Serdak, Dak, is this armor for me to wear? Are you talking about this Dragon Knight saddle cover? Serdak walked over, patted the saddle cover made of pure gold, and said, he was a little afraid to look at the magic patterns carved on it. Every time he looked at it, it would cause a huge shock in the sea of spiritual consciousness. The last time you summoned me to that cold plain, when I held you and flew across the swamp, I thought of this armor. It belongs to the Dragon Knight. Right. Israel raised his head. A little irritated. Asked. Probably not needed now. Soldak sat next to Iser. Opened the bag. Took out red crystal pillars more than one meter long. And threw them into Iser's bag like biscuits. Mouth. And then said casually. Perhaps it will only be used when we form a Dragon Knight. Dak. I want to try. The Red Dragon Iser interrupted Serdak. Chapter 941 Chester's Recruitment Order You want to form a Dragon Knight with me? Serdak sat on the stone platform and looked at the Red Dragon with bright eyes. No, I just want to wear this golden armor. It looks very handsome. Israel shook his head, turned to look at the golden armor with exquisite runes with an obsessed look, and said, Look at the pattern on it. It should have some effect. If it can help me increase my strength, I'll go and compete with those old guys. Serdak said indifferently. Be safe. You are still young and there is still a lot of room for growth. When you learn all the rune languages, maybe you can defeat them. The red dragon Izer gave Suldak a fierce look and said angrily, Who says I can't defeat them? I just think we should learn the language of runes. Serdak quickly stood up and went to get the magic crystal from the dragon egg, L over there. He put his hand into the one meter high egg, L and said, By the way, you should have learned the war call. If you need my help, please don't be polite. The Red Dragon Izer said with some disdain. Although you have been promoted to a second turn knight, 
as you just said to me. You are still young and still have a lot of room for growth. It copied what Serdak had just said. And the words were full of ridicule. I checked some information. If you want to become a real dragon knight, you must not only practice with the dragon, but also communicate with the dragon's mind and communicate with the dragon as a companion. You must also learn powerful skills. It is said that you can use them when the time comes. Maybe this golden spear, Serdak said as he took out a magic crystal. He put these things aside for the time being and began to concentrate on studying the rune language. Dodin Town Tavern Since the garrison in the town ended their northern expedition, even the business in the tavern has been much better. And many soldiers on vacation have gathered in the tavern. They only sell a variety of fruit wine and ale here. Of course, there are also some dried fruits and fish that go well with wine. But no simple meals are provided. It had just arrived in the evening, and the tavern was already full of people. Even in winter, the wine sellers wear leather skirts that expose their breasts and legs. They don't mind the drunkards touching them casually. But they do mind the scoundrels who don't buy drinks after touching them. It seems that only places full of alcohol and perfume can make people excited. A red dragon. Absolutely fiery red all over. With each scale glowing beautifully like red crystal. It grabbed Commander Serdek. Flapped its wings slightly and crossed over the area where we were riding armed forces. The Thunder Rhino walked through the poison swamp for two days, said an aboriginal archer. He was sitting in front of the bar, wearing light leather armor. The alloy bow was standing at his feet, and tied to his waist with a short chain. Oh my god! Red Dragon! A drinker sitting next to him exclaimed, Although this is no longer a secret, and this matter is talked about countless times in the pub every day, there are still a large number of people who listen to it with interest. Shut up and listen to him continue. The drinkers around him protested. The drunkard who exclaimed quickly shut up. The archer took a sip of ale and then continued. I don't know what happened on the ice lake that day. When we crossed the poisonous swamp, we saw the corpses of red ants all over the lake. Has anyone experienced forest fires? Lake the scene next to it was like a forest fire. And then we took hammers and smashed the skeletons of the soldier ants, looking for those fist-sized magic crystals inside. The drinkers on the side were also sighing. It turns out that our lord is a real dragon knight. However, this topic was immediately stopped by the bartender, who reminded the drinkers. Don't talk nonsense about this kind of thing. But I think even if it isn't, it will be soon. In the corner of the first floor of the tavern, several indigenous warriors gathered at a table. They were all young people who came out of a tribe. They were all in the military camp. But some of them joined the military camp first and entered the cavalry camp and archer brigade. Some people later joined the military camp and entered the infantry brigade. Everyone was sitting together drinking ale at this time. And this time, the guest was a cavalryman who had made money. They drank and chatted in aboriginal language. How many achievements have you made this time? The archer on the side asked him. The cavalryman smiled proudly and said, How many can there be? I guess there won't be anything left after changing to a magic weapon. I changed this knife last time. This time I plan to change it to a better shield. Since I want it, if you eat this food, you should improve your weapons and armor. He, <laughs> So many. The young man who newly joined the infantry brigade exclaimed with envy. In our cavalry camp, my achievements are really not much. The native cavalry said to the archer. How are you? We are okay too. The indigenous archer seemed a little low-key. The indigenous infantryman interrupted at this time and said. Our infantrymen have been staying at the Taya Swokio camp. We have not experienced any war at all. But we can make some money. I am going to buy some food and daily necessities. Now the caravans in the town have a kind of proxy. Delivery service. We only need to buy goods from their caravan. And they will help us deliver them to the tribe without paying extra freight. The native archers and cavalry had obviously never heard of such a thing. And said with surprise. Is there such a thing? The infantryman said very proudly. You haven't heard yet? Many people in our infantry brigade have sent things home. Can you send some wine? The ale here is really good. I want to send a barrel back to the clan leader and my father. The cavalryman patted the large wine glass on the table and said. The infantryman thought for a moment and replied. That should be possible. The native cavalry patted the infantryman on the shoulder and said. Let's go. Finish this drink and come with me to see. On the second floor of the tavern. Swordsman Chester held his hand on the railing and frowned at the noisy scene on the first floor. He usually doesn't like drinking. Alcohol will affect a swordsman's accuracy and balance. He turned to Soldak and asked, You didn't earn much this time. Why is the merit exchange list set so high? Sardak usually likes to drink some ale. 
He thinks this is the best way to entertain friends. Hearing what the great swordsman Chester said, he smiled freely and said, B should be given to them. I can't blame them for the defeat. Besides, I just didn't make any profit. So it's not a loss. He paused before asking, You came to Duo Dan Town this time to watch my northern expedition. Right? Just to see how your northern expedition is going. Great swordsman Chester brought the wine glass in his hand to his mouth, took a sip, and praised, You did a good job this time. He turned his head and glanced at the adjutant beside him. The adjutant quickly stood at the entrance of the corridor and stopped letting any drinkers squeeze in. I have another thing to do here this time. Great swordsman Chester put down his wine glass and said, If your northern expedition has not ended yet and you can't withdraw, you probably won't say anything. But I think you just took a rest. I really need your help. What? What happened? Soldak also put down his wine glass and asked seriously. The great swordsman of Chester took a deep breath and said, There are some problems with Marquis Luther. Although most of the south of the tower is under our control. Now Lord Macdonald has led the entire army to retreat into Chin. The cloth plane also cuts off the portal from one side of the dry cloth plane. Didn't we already expect it at first? Cernak asked in shock. Swordsman Chester said with a wry smile. The problem is that before he left, the magician from our astrologer's guild followed his legion and sneaked into the Ganbu plane. The space magician also brought a set of temporary portals there and came back to contact him this time. Go to the top. And they plan to go to the Ganbu plane to arrest Lord MacDonald through the temporary portal. I have received the recruitment order from the Marquis. He added, Should I go too? Serdak asked. The great swordsman Chester coughed lightly and then said, This kind of temporary portal is very expensive to transfer. A single transfer requires dozens of magic crystals. So this time, only second-level experts and powerful magicians can do it. Master, I would like to borrow your Andrew and Samira. It would be best if the two-headed ogre is willing to go. You actually advanced? Only at the end did he react and asked Serdak. Serdak nodded. Swordsman Chester waved his fist excitedly. That's great. If you come with us, your actions will be more secure. Then he felt a little melancholy and sighed and said, Hey, the military department probably won't be able to protect you this time. When you come back from this operation, you will do your best to stabilize your territory. It won't take long for the big battlefield to recruit you. The order will be sent to the Marquis. Soldak nodded repeatedly and said, Andrew will sit at the chain bridge camp, staring at the swarm of ghost-striped red ants, unable to move for the time being. Can I take Samira and Gulitum with me? When can we leave? Great swordsman Chester said to Soldak, Tomorrow morning, First go back to Wilk City. And then go to Benis City. The teleportation gate is in the teleportation hall of Benis City. Soldak did not expect the recruitment order to come so suddenly. But since it was Marquis Luther who was in trouble, there was nothing to say. Just be prepared to rush forward. After notifying Gulitum and Samira, they packed their luggage at the Riverside Cabin at night. This time Serdak not only has to leave the Belen Plain, but also enters the Ganbu Plain through the portal. It can be said that he has to cross two planes. This is likely to be a long journey. Everything in Doden Town has just happened. On the right track, many things are waiting for him to decide. After I leave, you will keep an eye on this place for me. I will write to Andrew and ask him to fully cooperate with you. If there is any emergency, go to the Iron Chain Bridge Camp to find Andrew or send someone to call him back and solve the problem. If you can't do anything, evacuate Duodan Town completely. Don't take any risks. Everything will wait for me to come back from the Ganbu plain. Serdak warned Selina, who was arranging her clothes. Selina nodded, indicating that she understood, but her delicate eyebrows could not be stretched no matter what. Do you want me to go with you? Selina asked. You are needed here too. Soldak pinched her smooth cheek and said gently. After hearing what Soldak said, Selina nodded and continued to sit by the bed and sort out the clothes. Tuck, tuck, tuck. There was a knock on the door. Who could it be? The two of them raised their heads and looked at each other at the same time. Signa never knocked when she came in. And Nika never knocked on the door at this time. Soldak walked to the door. Opened the door and found Miss Thea standing at the door. Chapter 942 Please take me there. Sia, who was wearing a plain dress, had a hint of prayer on her pretty face. Every time I see her blue eyes, I think of the beautiful sea, sunshine, and beaches. I don't know what kind of magic she cast but the light green scales on her body have completely disappeared. Her skin is delicate, white and smooth, 
and her fishtail has completely disappeared. She is wearing a thin nightgown, and the outline of her legs can be clearly seen. Serdak asked with some confusion. Thea, what's the matter? Sia lowered her head slightly. Her long green algae-colored hair was still wet, with some small water droplets flowing down from the ends of her hair. Her long, wet hair clung to her forehead, making her face even more beautiful. This counts, Serdak. Can I go to Tarapa with you? Sia said with courage. Her imperial dialect must have been learned from Zygna, and it has the unique slang of Alensa City. When people from other places say, Talapagan, the ending sound will never rise. You want to go on a mission with us? Serdak asked. Yeah. Sia replied in a positive tone. Serdak found it a bit incredible that a Janna mermaid actually took the initiative to apply to go on a mission with him. When Soldak said goodbye to Zygna and Nika just now, Sia was sitting next to her. Soldak didn't avoid her. Now that he saw her knocking on the door and looking for her, he felt a little regretful. This is a matter of the Luther Legion and has nothing to do with you. Soldak stood at the door of the room and said to Thea, In addition, this mission is also dangerous. I can't take care of you during the mission. This is not a simple wilderness experience or adventure. Sia stared with big eyes and said very seriously, If necessary, I can join your cavalry battalion and that will have something to do with me. When she saw Soldak reaching out to close the door, she quickly squeezed half of her body to the door frame and said stubbornly, Do you think I am a burden? I am a weaver who graduated from the Seven Realm Sea Witch Academy. He has the ability to manipulate the water element. I think I can help. She raised her pointed chin, revealing her delicate neck and collarbone. Serdak scratched his head in distress. He did not want to discuss with a Janna mermaid whether she was valuable. Serdak said directly, if you just want to leave, I can take you to Benes City and give you an airship ticket to Ignace City. I heard that the Ignace City Airport Terminal is built on a 100-meter-high sea on the cliff. As long as you arrive at the airport terminal, you can jump into the endless sea with just one jump. Of course, you have to figure out how to return to the Seventh Sea, and you will probably have to swim thousands of kilometers. Thea was slightly startled, not expecting that Serdak would say this. Then Soldak added, Originally, I thought I would do this when I take Zygna and Nika to Halanza City when the weather gets warmer. Since you are a little homesick, I can take you to Igna City this time. Thea never thought that Soldak had already thought of sending her home. However, once the Janissi clan has an obsession in their hearts, they want to complete this matter. For them, this is considered an equal exchange. The Janissi clan does not need charity. I want to help you complete a mission and exchange for an airship ticket to Igna City. I feel that I need to show my value. Please believe that I can help you. Sia said a little stubbornly. I believe in your strength. But forget about this mission. You don't need to take risks there. Serdak patted the Janna girl's shoulder. But he didn't expect her shoulders to be so smooth. He was slightly startled. Then calmly retracted his hand. Thea was also blushing. And her eyes were a little blurry. The moment the fingertips of that hand touched her shoulder. Thea felt an electric shock. As if an electric arc was crawling through the tip of her heart and her whole heart was numb. Soldak felt that something was wrong with the atmosphere, and even Selina, who was packing her luggage, looked towards the door. He quickly said, I can take you back to Benes City. As promised, you can leave Doden Town with us tomorrow morning. However, this journey will take a week on horseback. During this time, you will be in Are You Sure You Can Do It By Land And Without Access To Water? I can. Sia puffed up her mouth, and three thin fish gills were exposed on the left and right sides of her chin. Soldak nodded and said, Okay, see you tomorrow morning. I want to use the little time left. Maybe you can say a simple goodbye to Zygna and Nika. It's obvious that he looks down on mermaids. Thea curtsied, turned and left with some depression. When Soldak returned to the room, Selina had already stepped into the steaming bathtub and sunk her body, resting on the pillow next to the bathtub. She picked up a glass of hot milk and drank it in one gulp. The winter in Doden Town is very cold, and being able to take a bath in the bathtub at home is definitely an addictive enjoyment. There was only a wall between the bathroom and the bedroom. Serdak watched the mermaid girl running back to her room through the window, then turned around and lay down on the soft and thick bed, with his head resting on his hands and his legs stretched out. The insteps are stacked together. When I first arrived in the White Forest Plain, I heard that Wilk City was like spring all year round, and I thought there was no spring in the White Forest Plain. Serdak said mockingly to himself. This is too far from Wilk City. Selina sighed. The bathroom door was open. 
so there was no obstruction to the conversation. By the way, Epperson and the shoemaker at the tailor shop will send over their modified miners' uniforms and anti-smash shoes tomorrow, Taldak said. He thought for a while and then said, the miners' uniform must be wear-resistant and strong. In addition, the price must be low. After all, the order is for thousands of sets. It will be made in winter and summer and distributed once a year. Last time, the sample belt does not have buckles for hanging mining picks, chisels, ropes, and water bottles. I asked him to take it back and change it. This time you should focus on improving these areas. The requirements for anti-smash shoes are a little more stringent. I require that a stone the size of a wash basin should hit the upper surface of the shoes without hurting the feet. And the shoes should not be too bulky. The last sample was flattened by me. Since we have such a good hard leather material. If the leather shoemaker still can't do it this time. I will take this order to Benna City. Also. I entrusted Malakon to purchase a batch of mining picks mixed with lapis lazuli. When they arrive. You have someone sharpen the pickaxe blade twice with a file. If you still file it twice. Iron filings will fall off. Just throw it back to him. They say I don't need to make uniform clothes for the miners. Let alone custom made leather shoes. In fact. These are needed sooner or later. This can help the mine create a certain centripetal force and a sense of superiority. The sound of watering came from the bathroom. After it calmed down, Selena said, I know. The tailor shop owner and the shoemaker are complaining everywhere because of your harsh demands. If the order volume hadn't been huge and every miner's uniform and pair of shoes were profitable, I think they would have gone far away. Selena couldn't help but want to laugh when she thought of the way Serdak threw the miner's uniform at the feet of the tailor shop owner yesterday, and how they remained silent. Serdak sighed and said, The requirements are a bit harsh, but it is also an improvement for them. They don't want to stay in duo in town all their lives, so they have to find a way to get out of here. So this one step is inevitable. Selena changed the subject. That mermaid lady wants to leave here with you. Will there be any trouble? Serdak snorted. The Luther Legion doesn't even have this privilege in the Belan Plain. So what's the point of garrisoning her? I will bring her to Benna City safely. Selena said casually. I'm just worried that you will be in trouble. The relationship between you and the aristocratic circle of Wilk City is a bit tense. According to the laws of the Green Empire, every citizen cannot help slaves who have escaped. If they are found slaves who have escaped must be reported to the local security group. When you take Thea through the portal in Wilk City, try to be careful so as not to be discovered by them. I know, Serdak said. Don't worry. In fact, it doesn't matter whether you care about this kind of thing. I just help you when you meet. You can also see that Thea, Zigna and Nika have become good friends. Just rely on she is Zigna's friend. And I can't just sit idly by. I just can't go to Igne's city. I can only send her to the magic airship. If I give the captain some money, I should be able to send her back to the sea safely. It's quite pitiful when I think about it. She lives in Duodan town. Just like us living alone on a desert island. Okay. Selena said. There was a sound of running water next door. It was probably Selena standing up from the bathtub. In the early morning, there was still a light mist surrounding Doden town. The withered yellow grass in the distance could not be seen. And even the construction site of the Warrior Academy, not far away, became blurry under the mist. A light layer of mist clung to the surface, becoming lighter as it went higher. Samira rode an ancient bolai horse and waited by the bridge at the entrance of the town with a two-headed ogre ghoul item. There were obviously two bodies, but there were three people chatting. Most of the time, Gulet brothers Temu and Naoware were arguing constantly, as if quarreling had become a part of their lives. Serdak was a little curious. If ghoul item found an ogre partner in the future, would the four of them get together and quarrel? Swordsman Chester was a little surprised when he saw two people following Serdak. This is Magician Victor from the Hellanza Magic Guild. He is traveling with us and is preparing to return to the Hellanza Magic Guild. This is Miss Sia from the Janna Sea Tribe. She will return to Benes City with us and will transfer to the Magic Airship to go to Ignis. Serdak introduced the Great Swordsman Chester. Great Swordsman Chester nodded politely to Victor. He glanced at Miss Mermaid and had some other thoughts in his mind. So he whispered to Suldak. Why is there Janna in Doden Town? Dake of the Sea Tribe. You really can always bring some surprises. Serdak smiled and made no excuse. This journey is basically spent riding horses during the day and resting at night. In order to be able to take care of Victor and the mermaid girl Thea, Swordsman Chester did not choose to camp in the wild, but stayed in hotels and towns along the way as much as possible. 
This large grassland in the winter wilderness of the white forest plain is actually nothing to describe. The further south you go, the less snow covers the grass. When the group arrived at the outskirts of Wilk City, the grass here was still slightly wet. It's green, not all yellow. Wilk City is also much warmer. So there is no need to wear thick cotton clothes. When entering the city, the great swordsman of Chester rode his horse directly past the suspension bridge of the moat of the North City Gate. The guards at the city gate stood up straight and saluted the great swordsman of Chester. Sia was wearing a magician's black robe at this time, with a thick hood on her head. Victor is also dressed in this way, but his hood is open. He wears a magic badge on his chest, and he has a serious face. A group of people including Samira, the two-headed ogre Gulitam, and the guards pass through the city gate without any inspection at all. The water in the moat here is not even frozen. There is no wind, and there is not a trace of waves. Swordsman Chester did not return to the military headquarters, but directly led Soldak and his party to the Civic Center Square. The streets of Wilk City are very lively, filled with the sounds of various hawkers, and the aroma of fried food wafts far along the streets. Fried chicken, fried fish, and French fries. The ogre stood in front of the fried chicken stall with his tall body of more than three meters. He was wearing heavy chain mail and iron plate armor. He inevitably made a clanking sound when he walked scaring those who were queuing up to buy. The fried chicken citizens dispersed. The stall owner had a mournful face, looking at the two-headed ogre with a ferocious look in front of him, and was completely speechless. The ogre's voice sounded like beating a drum. He asked the stall owner very patiently, How much does a fried chicken cost? One silver coin each. The stall owner said stammeringly. The ogre Gulitam calculated it, took out a golden gold coin from the slit of his belt under his belly, threw it to the stall owner and said loudly, then I will buy 40 coins. After saying that, he smiled at the brain flower beside him and said, You can eat 20, and I can eat 20. There shouldn't be any problem. Right. Only when talking about eating. The ogre brothers will not quarrel, and their opinions can easily be unified. Two. At this time, the stall owner suddenly said something again. What two? I want to buy 40. 20 for him and 20 for me. The ogre Gulitam yelled at the stall owner. Two silver coins for one. The frightened stall owner, who was sweating profusely, finally said the words completely, putting the fried whole chickens into cloth bags. Putting them in, the stall owner stopped with an embarrassed look on his face. The two-headed ogre looked at Soldak and his party, who had already entered the central square, and urged the stall owner, Hurry up! Hurry up! I'm in a hurry! There are only 32 fried chickens! The stall owner said fearfully, Gulitam looked at the fat chickens piled next to the oil pan and asked, Aren't there some more over there? Those have just been oiled once and are not yet cooked. The stall owner was not so panicked when he realized that the ogre was being reasonable. Gulitam waved his hands repeatedly and shouted, Hurry up and pretend. I don't have time to wait. The stall owner packed the fried chicken. He picked up the cloth bag and chased after Soldak, ignoring the stall owner. The stall owner shouted loudly from behind, Yes. I haven't given you any change yet. Gulitam rushed forward without looking back. Now Huar turned to the stall owner and said loudly, The rest is a tip. It was probably the first time for the stall owner to meet a wealthy man who tipped more than he paid for the chicken. He took out the gold coin that was tightly grasped in his palm, put it in his mouth and took a bite. Then he felt completely relieved and watched the two-headed cannibal. There were some mixed feelings when the demon left. Chapter 943 Walking on the Waves the central square was filled with supplies ready to be transported to Benna City. Crowded on the other side of the square was a group of fat ancient bull-eye horses and yellow sheep. The nobles are directing their attendants to drive the horses into the guardrail passage and then drive them into the portal in an orderly manner. It seems that this should be a big deal. Swordsman Chester rode up to the portal in the central square, his horse's hooves making a crisp sound on the flat stone slab. Riding directly to the portal guard, the great swordsman Chester took out a portal pass from his arms. The guard immediately stopped the passing horses with the spear in his hand, leaving the portal entrance free. The great swordsman Chester said to Soldak expressionlessly, Let's go back to Benna City. Serdak turned his head and glanced at the two-headed ogre coming over panting. The group of people rode through the two-way portal quickly. The scenery before my eyes changes. Soldak and his party returned to Benna City and looked at the snow-covered courtyard of Duke Newman's mansion. Groups of ancient bolai horses lined up along the rope-enclosed passage toward the outside of the courtyard. You can't stay in front of the exit of the portal because you don't know what will come out of the portal in the next second. 
a group of grooms gathered in the backyard of the duke's palace. They were coming out of the portal and rushed to the special passage. When they saw the great swordsman Chester and his group riding out from inside, they immediately got out of the way. Winters in Ciudad Pena are also very cold, but the weather looked pretty good, sunny and cloudless. This is the backyard of Duke Newman's Duke's mansion. Almost all of his private plane portals are located here. It is very lively here every day. Some materials are transported from here to various planes, but more materials are concentrated from the planes to Inbina City. All the planes occupied by the Empire are sending blood to the Green Empire. Merchants have teleportation passes. They transport trade supplies into Bina province. And taxes are payable on these supplies. The plane transfer tax is a small income from Duke Newman's operation of these small planes. The biggest income comes from territorial development. Selling these developed lands and letting the noble lords manage them. Because not all nobles have the ability to develop territories. Many wealthy nobles are more willing to use gold coins to purchase plane land. In addition, there are precious resources on the plane. Magic materials, herbs, magic metals, etc., which are very expensive as long as they are related to magic. As long as these materials are transported from the small plane to the rolling continent, the price will basically double. The great swordsman of Chester belongs to the plane garrison, so there is no need to pay any fees to pass through the portal. But this requires a special portal pass issued by the military department. A group of people walked out of the teleportation gate. The guard guarding the teleportation gate checked the teleportation pass of Chester Great Swordsman and quickly let them go. Gulitum passed by the passage. And many people looked at the tall figure of the two-headed ogre, including the guards of the Duke's palace, who looked surprised. Everyone did not stop in the backyard of the Duke's mansion. They rode out of the gate of the somewhat crowded backyard of the Duke's mansion. The Great Swordsman of Chester looked up at the sky. The sun was directly above his head and it was exactly noon in Bena City. Victor Magician first said goodbye to Serdak. He also has some classmates and teachers in Bena City, and he wants to visit them before returning to Helenza City. Swordsman Chester said to Soldak on the street, Report to the military headquarters in Bena City tomorrow morning and follow the arrangements above. You still have one night. Okay. See you tomorrow morning. Serdak said to Sia on horseback. See ya. Let's go to the airport terminal to buy airship tickets first. I don't know if there are any flights to Ignace City today. Tickets? Don't worry if you can't buy airship tickets today. I will arrange for someone to take you to the magic airship. Viscount Serdak, please let me complete this task with you. Thea said softly. The great swordsman Chester was about to leave. But when he heard Sia say this, he immediately turned to Soldak and asked, Dak, does she know all about this operation? His eyes looking at Sia were a little sharper. Serdak smiled and said casually, she knew that I was going to perform a mission. So she wanted to help. As for the rest, she didn't know anything. Great swordsman Chester didn't understand what charm Serdak had that allowed a Janna mermaid to follow him so persistently. Seeing the expression on the great swordsman Chester's face, Soldak knew that his idea might be a little biased. He quickly explained to the great swordsman of Chester. She said that she was a Janna spellweaver. She said she would carry out the mission with me and exchange the reward for this mission for an airship ticket. Are you really willing to join us and help Soldak complete this dangerous mission? I mean, the mission we perform is very dangerous, and we may be killed by the opponent at any time. Great Swordsman Chester asked Sia. Yes, I am willing to join. Sia said seriously. Of course. Our mission this time is not something that just anyone can join. The people who will accompany me on the mission are all powerful warriors from the past. Great Swordsman Chester said to Thea. I want to see what abilities you have to determine whether you are suitable. Want to see my magic? Sia jumped off the horse cautiously. Next to the tall outermost wall of the Duke's palace is a bluestone road. Across the road is an inland river. Although the river is completely frozen now, the water element nearby is quite abundant. Sia recited a spell like a song, and the magic pattern array under her feet was like a spider whip, spreading outwards from the center of her feet and emerging from the ground. The sound of the spell stopped, and a huge wave instantly surged out of the magic pattern array, lifting Sia's whole body up and carrying her forward. Great Swordsman Chester was surprised to find that he could easily stand on the wave and be carried forward by the huge wave. He had never seen such magic before and asked in surprise, What is this? Magic? Ride the waves. Thea raised her hand, and the huge waves under her feet disappeared, and she and the Great Swordsman Chester landed firmly on the ground. Great Swordsman Chester looked at Sia and his eyes immediately became full of recognition. And he said cheerfully, 
Not bad. Duck. We are short of magicians this time. Sardak glanced at Sia who looked proud. And could only say. Okay. But I still suggest you take the airship directly to the nearest seaport city. And then return to the sea? Sia smiled and said nothing. Obviously not wanting to do this. Swordsman Chester stood aside. Mounted his horse again. And said to Thea. Don't worry. After this mission is completed. I will buy this airship ticket for you. Do you want to go to Ignace? You is it the Janna Sea clan of the Endless Sea? Sia corrected. My home is in the Seven Realm Sea. Great Swordsman Chester asked with a puzzled look on his face. Then how to get to Ignis? It is very far away from the Seven Realm Sea. If you want to swim back by your own power, it will take at least half a year. In fact, you can take the magic airship to Chien Port, which is much closer to the Seven Realm Sea. How did Serdak know the sea territory beyond the Green Empire? Hearing what the Great Swordsman Chester said, he immediately turned his face to the side. Chapter 944 Xander's Butcher Shop the most beautiful thing about Sia is not her eyes as blue as the sea, nor her face as delicate as a demon, nor her long hair like green algae, but her slender waist, especially when riding on horseback. The waist keeps swaying from side to side in accordance with the rhythm of the horse's forward stride, and the swaying posture makes pedestrians on the street forget to walk, even if it was placed in a glass jar, placed on the auction table, and watched by countless bidders. Sia had never been so nervous. She felt like her heart was about to be squeezed out of her throat, and her face felt a little hot with every heartbeat. Seeing Sia's embarrassment, Samira bent down and pulled out a veil from the bag hanging on the saddle hook and threw it to Sia. Thanks. Thea unexpectedly took over this black hollow veil with very delicate embroidery on it, and it also had the faint fragrance of a half-elf. She covered her face with a veil, which indeed blocked many people's eyes. Don't hold us back. Samira glanced at Sia and whispered in front of her. After saying that, he chased after Soldak, who was walking in front. Thea blinked her eyes, pulled the reins, and caught up. Samira glanced at her lightly, and then said to her, Andrew, Gulitam, and I both come from the Maka Plain. He took us out from there, and said he wanted to take us to see thousands of worlds. I we don't want your joining to slow down our progress. After saying that, he ignored Sia and caught up with Soldak in front. The two of them were walking and chatting and it seemed that only in front of Soldak could a gentle smile appear on Samira's face. The street is not very wide. There are some pedestrians on both sides of the street, and it can only accommodate two horses walking side by side. Sia followed, her eyes shining slightly. Her riding skills were not very good either. She had to hold the reins tightly with both hands to stabilize her body. At this time, the two-headed ogre holding two fried chickens came up from behind. The ogre magician Nauhua is ready to chat with Sia. Gulitam was currently concentrating on eating chicken. He bit down on the butt of the chicken. The bite was so big that a line of grease flowed from the corner of his mouth. The ogre magician Nauhuar handed the fried chicken in his hand to Sia. Thea shook her head and didn't even reach out to pick it up. She felt that this kind of animal with a pointed head and a long neck looked very much like the sea skewers on the sea. And the taste must not be very good. Don't listen to what she said. In fact, she is not bad-hearted at all. You will know later. Are you a water magician? Ogre Brain Flower asked Sia carelessly. Yeah. Sia nodded. Although she was about the same height as Gulitam when she transformed into the Janna Sea clan with human body and fish tail. The ogre still gave her a strong sense of oppression when he stood in front of her. The ogre magician was a bit familiar and immediately said. I happen to be a fire magician. We will have more exchanges in the future. Unfortunately, I still only know fireballs and ice shields. What that kid Victor said, I don't understand those magic theories at all. I think you are from the Janna Sea tribe, and I am from the Ogre tribe. So we should have something in common. Sia turned around and asked seriously. Mr. Ogre, do you want to learn water magic? I'm only good at this. Her voice was soft, but her tone seemed sincere. The Ogre magician immediately grinned, revealing a pair of sharp fangs, and said cheerfully, Call me Nohua. I am familiar with the fire element and the ice element. Speaking of water element and ice element, they should be about the same. Gulitam, who was eating fried chicken, almost spit out the fried chicken in his mouth. At this time, he quickly pulled his good brother's ears with his hands, wiped the chicken fat on his mouth, and yelled, I, I say brother, your magic needs to be awakened to gain it. Nelwar also argued loudly. Of course I know that even though this is the case, you can't stop an ogre who is willing to make progress from studying. 
Okay. I mean, you don't always harass Miss Sia. Gulitum whispered in Nahuar's ear. Don't you think? The ogre magician's eyes widened. And he looked at his good brother's face of sudden realization and said, If you put it like that, I understand. I don't know what Gulitum said. But the ogre brothers fell behind and began to eat the rose chicken intently. I thought Wilkes was big. It turns out that Beta City is bigger and more prosperous than Wilkes City. The ogre magician said to Gulitum. Serdak led a group of people through the streets and alleys to the hotel where they stayed when they first came to Benes City with the guard battalion. Every time he goes to a city, he likes to live in the same place. Most of the tenants in this circle hotel are from the Tabii area. Serdak still chose to live in the aristocratic area to the north of the circle building. The corridors here face the south, and you could sit in the corridors and bask in the sun. The hotel waiter knew Serdak, and he diligently led Serdak and his party to the door of the room. Serdak paid a tip of one silver coin and asked the waiter to take good care of their horses. Standing on the terrace, I habitually looked towards North Street. There were still so few pedestrians on this street. There was a row of magic caravans parked on the street. The townhouse across the street. Mrs. Dorothy and her lover. The house has been restored to its original appearance. And the broken windows have been repaired and the curtains have been covered. The young swordsman, who liked to stay at home and read newspapers, and practice swordplay on the wicker chair on the balcony every day was no longer there. This house probably didn't have a new owner yet. And the iron box at the door was already stuffed with newspapers. Thea didn't think there was anything good to see outside the terrace. She even hated looking around. The world was full of rooftops. And the red rubble was piled up like scales. She was half looking forward to being exposed to magic and getting comfortable in the bathtub for a while. Samira stood in the corner of the terrace. Looking at a group of wild pigeons in the sky. They seemed to make a buzzing sound while flying. Gulitum set up a tent in the inner courtyard of the hotel. These rooms were a bit small for him and were far less comfortable than living in a tent. He sat on the mattress made of thick fur, took out the fried chicken he bought from his cloth pocket, and continued to eat his lunch. While there was still some time in the afternoon, Serdak decided to go to the free market to visit the butcher shop owner Xander. Thea wanted to take a bath in the hotel and decided to stay in the hotel. Gulitum was going to eat up the fried chicken he bought in one go. And he didn't want to go shopping with Soldak for the time being. Samira had no idea of going out for a walk. So only Serdak led the horse out of the hotel alone. Walked through the lively street market. And came to the free market next to the magic district in Benes City. Warcraft materials and magic herbs. And also sells a variety of fresh Warcraft ingredients. Sandy was originally a butcher shop owner here who specialized in fresh meat from low-level monsters. Serdak originally planned to let him expand his business and open a larger store in this free market. We haven't seen each other for more than half a year, and Xander is still hiding in his shabby little wooden house. However, because he has sufficient supply and funds, Xander actually annexed all the stalls next to him. His butcher shop stall is in the market. It occupies an entire stall. The varieties range from various monster meats to chilled sea fish. If it weren't for the plaque on Xander's stall that read, Xander's butcher shop, Serdak would probably have to go around this free market. Sander no longer sells meat himself recently. He has hired several butchers. When Soldak came to the door, he was dismantling the thighs full of tender meat of those ghost-striped soldier ants in the wooden house behind. He would when these chilled thighs are taken out of the magic ceiling box. The hard sh. L on the surface is first broken. And the tender meat inside is cut into thin slices weighing nearly a pound and placed on a stall covered with crushed ice. There are also some fresh-looking sea fish on these broken ice. It is winter now. And the magic airship flies from Igne City in Pales Tina Province to Bena City in Bena Province in just 10 days. A butcher selling meat in a shop brought Serdak to Sander. Sander, whose waist had grown twice as thick, stood up and said excitedly to Serdak, Lord Serdak, why are you back? Soldak said, I happened to pass by Bena City. So I came over to take a look. It seems that the butchers hired by Sander have all heard of Serdak's name. When they heard Sander shouting like this, everyone looked at Serdak. With his face glowing red and a lot of gold ornaments hanging on his body, Sander invited Serdak to his usual resting place. When passing by a long row of meat tables in the backstage, Soldak looked down at the red-colored ghost-striped red ants, which were dismembered bit by bit by the butchers. Only the white, tender and translucent parts of their tender meat remained and cut into thumb-thick strips. Xander pointed to the butcher shop in front of him and boasted to Soldak. Look at my new butcher shop. I also hired a few butchers to sell meat for me. Now I just take them in the background to process the ingredients and sort out the accounts every day. 
Business has been very good in the past few months. You sell these ghosts marked red ant meat. And you still need to do such meticulous processing? Serdek asked doubtfully. Of course. This is the only way to sell it, Sandy said proudly. Look, I sliced the meat into thin slices, sprinkled a little salt, and put the meat together with the chilled sea fish. This kind of meat is very tender. Some are like the crab meat sticks of the oversized Matsuba crab. And after eating them, they not only speed up the recovery of physical strength, but also increase strength. So they are very popular in the market. He took a piece of crystal clear meat and introduced it to Soldek. But the Benna people are very picky about food. Just like the largemouth catfish I sell here that is dug out of the mud in the wild swamps. People don't like to eat this kind of catfish meat. But as long as the name is changed to dragonfish meat, the price will be lower. You can double the price if you pay, which is what is done in fish markets now. As he said this, he took a red ant leg and whispered to Soldak with a smile. Hey, I renamed these red ant leg meat as giant mountain crab leg meat. I see that many warriors with a lot of money in their pockets will buy some from me. Everyone will improve their food in the days before promotion. Eat some fresh meat from monsters that is good for your body every day. After speaking, he showed his thick arms to Soldak and said firmly, This kind of red ant meat can enhance strength, and the effect is much better than other primary Warcraft ingredients. Serdak saw that the butchers who were responsible for peeling the meat removed a lot of scraps in order to make all the strips of meat uniform in shape, square and crystal clear. Soldak asked Sander, When the meat is cut like this, there will be a lot of leftovers. How to deal with these leftovers? I don't seem to see any such leftovers in the stalls, Sander said proudly. Of course, I'll chop it into minced meat and sell it. There are many restaurants in the city that want to make reservations with me. The price of the exquisite meat strips cut in this way is much higher than the ordinary price. The leftovers will be reduced a little from the ordinary price. So you can make more money by selling them separately. This kind of meat filling is fried into a patty. Top with a little seasonal vegetables. Cheese. Butter. Etc. And then sandwiched between two scones. It is very popular here recently. I also make some sausages for sale here. Sander introduced his business philosophy to Soldak. Serdak walked around Sander's butcher shop, patted Sander's shoulder before leaving, and said to him, I thought you couldn't handle such a large amount of fresh red ant meat. It seems like they are doing pretty well here. Good. The next batch of fresh red ant meat will be much better than your current batch. But this is also the last batch in winter. My knights have withdrawn from the dark worm valley and will not be able to supply it for some time. I will appropriately increase the supply of fresh salamander meat. Sander touched his hairy chest and shouted repeatedly, it would be better to have salamander meat for sale. Serdak left the free market here on horseback and went to visit the Brunei manager at the Goffaro family's leather business in another part of the magic district. As soon as I turned around from the street corner, I saw from a distance that the door of the leather store was full of carriages. A complete piece of ghost pattern soldier ant armor was hung on the plaque of the store. The hard armor swayed slightly in the wind. Walking into this business store filled with various batches of supplies. The employees in the business store immediately approached and asked eagerly, Guest, is there anything I can do for you? I'm looking for the Brunei manager. Soldak said standing at the door. A groom who was responsible for tethering horses took the reins from Serdak's hand. The employee looked inside the business and said to Serdak, Please wait a moment. After saying that, he turned around and walked quickly into the business store and found the Brunei manager among a group of people. Serdak stood at the door of the trading house watching the batches of hard armor go through two processes of softening and coloring, and then separated according to specifications and sizes. The complete and defective ones would also be separated, and the severely damaged ones would be put on the waiting list. In this area, almost all the space in the trading house is filled with hard armor. The people who come to the leather trading house to do business are all for traders from all over the country. They almost all buy this kind of hard armor leather in bundles. And the trading house is very lively. Lord Sardak. The Brunei manager got rid of the entanglement of the group of people and ran over from a distance. Chapter 9 45 Ways to Solve Problems The Brunei manager is much thinner than he was six months ago, but he has also become more energetic. He invited Soldak to the manager's office on the second floor of the commercial bank and personally poured a cup of tea in front of Soldak. Business here looks good, Soldak told the Brunei manager. The Brunei manager stood next to Soldak and introduced him. Now this kind of war horse armor made of hard armor has become a trend. Many lords hope to dress up their cavalry. So the business is also very good. Some buyers even want to buy directly from us. Of blank. 
The manager's room is not big, but it is neatly tidied. A little assistant in a leather skirt brought some free refreshments from outside. But he was particularly curious about Soldek. The Brunei manager kicked the sweet-looking young assistant out. And then he guessed and asked, Are you here in person to settle this month's final payment in advance? Recently, the bank's capital turnover has been on track. I'll go right away. Calculate the settlement payment. If you have problems with capital turnover, our firm can pay you a payment in advance. Soldek waved his hand and said, I was just passing through Benna City and stopped by to take a look. The manager of Brunei said to Soldak with admiration, I heard that your excellency first tried to equip war horses with hard leather armor so that those ancient Baolai horses could be equipped with heavy cavalry. Now the lords all over the city are after following your example and equipping the cavalry. The demand for these hard armor simply exceeds supply. A complete piece of hard armor leather now costs about three gold coins. And the price has stabilized. However, the orders of leather workers across the city have almost been scheduled until next year. The Brunei manager is very talkative and talks about the market situation in the leather market. Serdak listened carefully and asked carefully if he didn't understand something. But before he realized how much time had passed, the young assistant wearing a leather skirt in winter knocked on the door and said eagerly, Manager Brunei, Mr. Dickens over there got into a fight with our employees. The Brunei manager asked the assistant in surprise, What's going on? We don't have the kind of high-grade leather he needs. Can't we just ask him to leave politely? Earl Dickens wants to talk to you again, the assistant said hurriedly. The Brunei manager stood up from his seat and apologized to Serdak. Sir Soldak, please sit here first and I will take care of it. It's getting late. I should leave. I haven't seen Beatrice when I came back this time. Soldak also stood up and walked out with the Brunei manager. When the two of them were standing at the entrance of the second floor, they heard someone yelling loudly from downstairs. I didn't expect that such a large leather business could not even produce high-grade leather from level 3 monsters. The Goffro family is really in decline. The Brunei manager hurriedly walked down and saw the middle-aged nobleman standing in the lobby on the first floor with a gold Earl badge on his chest. He immediately walked up and said with a smile, Earl Dickens, our Goffro firm is currently our main business is this kind of hard armor. If you buy the hard armor of Red Ant, as for the high-grade hard armor, we still have some. Following the direction of the Brunei manager's finger, Soldak saw large chunks of super-thick ghost pattern male ant leather. This thing was originally shipped here just to see if there was any market. In fact, no one used it at all. This thing is so thick that even the most exquisite peeling techniques cannot separate it into layers. This kind of leather can also be considered as the leather of a third-level monster? The middle-aged noble had an angry look on his face. But he became even more angry after seeing the giant piece of hard armor. The Brunei manager quickly said kindly, Your Majesty, Earl Dickens, I'm very sorry. Our store currently only deals in this kind of hard leather. Count Dickens glared and said angrily, Then why are you still hanging the sign of a leather store? Why don't you just change it to Gopher Leather Store? Even if you call out Earl Gopher, I will still dare to say it. He was actually angry because in the middle of the conversation, the Brunei manager actually left him and others to a salesperson in a store and left on his own. Now I just want to use this topic to make some use of it. At least to get the manager who offended him to get out of this business firm. The manager from Brunei explained in a low voice. Our firm usually deals in leather from some level 2 monsters. At this time, many people had gathered around to join in the fun. Earl Dickens also saw Soldak walking down the stairs with the Brunei manager. But he didn't know Soldak and thought he was a small lord from some small city who came to Benna City to hunt for goods. Soldak also guessed that the Brunei manager might be entertaining him which made the count very dissatisfied. So he asked, My lord, what kind of high-grade leather do you want to buy? Earl Dickens raised his head and did not bother to talk to Soldak at all. A young magician who accompanied Earl Dickens immediately answered for him. Our lord, the Earl, would like to ask Master Xal to customize a set of second-turn magic pattern structure, as long as it is a third level or above magic beast leather. Serdak turned to the Brunei manager and said, Brunei manager, there is no more level 3 magic skin in your store. Don't you still have some high-grade leather of level 4 magic beast waiting to be processed? Just take that one out and give it to Lord Earl. Take a look. The Brunei manager was stunned for a moment and immediately understood what Soldak meant and quickly said that he would go to the warehouse upstairs to take out the high-grade leather from the store. After saying that, he and Serdak went upstairs again. Just at the entrance of the stairs on the second floor, Serdak stopped and pulled out a magic sealing box containing the ghost pattern and queen's magic skin from his magic belt bag. 
There were three pieces in one box. Under the expectant gaze of the Brunei manager, he opened the lid of the box and found a stack of leather inside. The Brunei manager has been engaged in the leather trade for so many years. And of course, he has seen countless high-grade leathers. He touched the leather with his fingers and felt the magic flowing slightly on the leather. He knew that this was a genuine piece of high-grade leather from a level 4 Warcraft. He looked at Serdak with gratitude and said, Thank you so much, Lord Serdak, for this time. I will definitely sell this level 4 monster leather for its due value. Well, don't forget to settle the accounts together at the end of the month. Serdak waved his hand nonchalantly and said, If it weren't for entertaining me, you wouldn't offend this person. With these three high-level magic skins, I believe you can take care of this. Then he walked downstairs again, with the Brunei manager holding the magic box. He didn't stop in the lobby on the first floor of the business, and walked out of the business directly on horseback. While Count Dickens was inspecting the texture of the leather, the Brunei manager walked to the door of the business and watched Soldek right away. He said to the assistant with infinite emotion, I think the most correct thing Count Goffero did in his life was to marry Lady Catherine. Chapter 946 Visiting the Marquis Mansion Dusk always comes early in winter, and the afterglow of the setting sun stretches the shadow of the city. Serdak was riding on horseback, leaving a long shadow on the street. Pedestrians walking up and down the street would occasionally glance at him, but no one paid much attention to him. Everyone was used to seeing young knights like him riding horses. The fence was built so high that even if he was riding on horseback, he couldn't see the scenery inside the yard. The walls of the courtyard are covered with ivy vines. These vines have dried up in winter. Only after spring will these vines sprout branches. There is still some residual snow piled on the street. But the weather is not that cold. Serdak was a little hungry. This area was a large aristocratic residential area. And there were few restaurants or food stalls around. He opened a linen bag hanging on the saddle. Which contained a few dry baked wheat cakes. He doesn't know when he started to feel that this kind of dry wheat cake must be paired with broth before it can be swallowed. Life is constantly changing. And so is the stomach. In the past, even chestnut and multigrain porridge was delicious. But now even white bread has to have its outer crust cut off and spread with butter and jam before it can be served to the table. He took off the water bag that was almost frozen into a lump of ice and took a sip of the cold water. He suddenly felt a lot more awake. Serdak originally planned to walk around the aristocratic district along the riverside to see the manors and castles here. But he didn't expect that the aristocratic district in Bena City was so big. After walking around for a while, it was almost evening. Under the golden setting sun, Soldak arrived at the gate of Marquis Luther's mansion. Before he could reach the gatehouse and announce his name to the guard guarding the gate, a magic caravan drove quickly from the street. Two black horses spurted out two clouds of white steam as they ran. The coachman was almost squatting on the ground, holding a soft long whip in his hand. There was a very eye-catching Luther family emblem on the carriage. Seeing the magic caravan approaching quickly, Serta pulled the reins of the horse and leaned toward the street. When the magic caravan passed by Serdak, the driver suddenly applied the handbrake, and the four wheels almost stopped rotating completely. Dazzling sparks erupted from the axle friction, and the two strong horses pulling the magic caravan also let out long roars. With a long neighing sound, the man almost stood up on the spot. Serdak was also startled by this sudden situation. He looked at the coachman in front of the magic caravan. The coachman was sitting on the driver's seat, taking off his hat and saluting him. The carriage door was suddenly pushed open from inside, and Beatrice jumped out of the carriage first, holding her fluffy skirt in both hands, and ran towards Soldak with excitement on her face. Serdak didn't expect that he happened to see Beatrice at this time. He quickly leaned over and hugged Beatrice's slender waist, who was rushing toward her with her skirt in hand. He lifted her up with one arm, get on the horse and sit her in front of the saddle. No words could express Beatrice's feelings. She tightly hooked Soldak's neck with her hands, and put her lips as hot as rose petals on his face. Date, why are you here? Didn't the letter say that you are still on the Northern Expedition? Beatrice asked. The Northern Expedition is over. This time I happen to pass by Benis City. Soldak hugged Beatrice and looked towards the car. Hathaway held the car door with both hands and stuck her head out to look at him with a smile. He pulled the reins and came to the car door, leaned over and kissed her smooth forehead. Hi. Honey. How are you doing lately? Soldak asked softly against Hathaway's ear. When you come, it feels like the sky has turned blue. Hathaway cupped her hands on her chest and replied in a daze. Soldak held Beatrice in his arms and rode beside the carriage of the magic caravan. 
He walked and chatted with Hathaway in the carriage and entered the Marquis Luther's mansion. The servants who met the Marquis mansion along the way stopped what they were doing and saluted him. It wasn't until the magic caravan arrived at the steps below the castle that Soldak quickly jumped off the horse with Beatrice in his arms. Walked to the carriage first and helped Hathaway open the carriage door. Hathaway held Soldak and Beatrice in her arms and walked up the steps of the castle. At this time, a row of servants quickly walked out of the castle and the door in the center of the castle was pushed open. What surprised Serdak was that Marquis Luther actually stood on the high platform of the hall with Lady Marion on his arm. Marquis Luther was in good spirits. He stared at Soldak with bright eyes and watched him walk off the stage. Then he walked down to meet Soldak, stood in front of Soldak, and reached out to pat him on the shoulder. Shoot, he said happily. I didn't expect that Chester would actually bring you back this time. I heard that you did a good job in Doden Town. Your Majesty the Marquis. Lady Marianne. Serdak made a knighthood. Lady Marion smiled gently and nodded slightly to Soldak. I'll go to the kitchen to arrange dinner, Mrs. Marion said to everyone, and then winked at Hathaway and Beatrice. Hathaway stared with big eyes, pretending not to understand what Mrs. Marion meant, and held Soldak's arm and refused to leave. Marquis Luther could only cough slightly and said to his daughter, Hathaway, take Soldak. I have something to say to him. Can I sit in? Hathaway still refused to leave and prayed to her father. Marquis Luther shook his head slightly. Lady Marianne came over personally and took away Hathaway, who refused to leave. Beatrice could only follow behind obediently. Marquis Luther waved to Soldak, turned around and walked out of the hall on the first floor, and walked into a corridor along the side door. Soldak quickly followed, passing through a long corridor. Several guards with halberds stood beside the doorways they passed along the way, arriving at a council hall in the castle. The walls were covered with various maps, and there were five sand tables in the center of the hall. Serdak immediately recognized that the sand table in the middle was a map of Bena province. He first I recognized the city of Bena, and then found the city of Aranza on the sand table. A sand table next to it is the occupied area of the Belen Plain, and the unknown areas around it are covered with black cloth. Marquis Luther stood in front of a sand table and said gently, Since Chester can bring you to Bena city, it means that your strength has allowed you to complete such a dangerous task. I just broke through the second rank half a month ago, Soldak said. Marquis Luther was a little surprised, as if he didn't expect Soldak to become a second-level warrior so quickly. He then said, Chester is quite well informed, Serdak said. He didn't know it at first. He rushed to Doden Town to borrow two of my men to join him in the mission. When I heard that he was going to enter the Ganbu Plain to carry out the mission, I thought, I have a lot of personal strength, and my level happened to be promoted. It's actually like this, but in principle, I am against your participation in this operation. Marquis Luther stood in front of the sand table and said to Soldak very solemnly, But whether to participate in this mission is up to you. Decide. What happened? Serdak asked curiously. Marquis Luther walked around the sand table with a strange terrain, and then said, This is the terrain of the Ganbu Plain. In this operation, you will enter the Ganbu Plain through the portal of the Teleportation Hall of Bena City. The magician who will take you into the Ganbu Plain is from the Astrologer's Guild, and is also our main combat faction. Intelligence agents who infiltrated McDonald. He stopped and changed the topic. However, we are not yet sure whether the temporary portal established by this intelligence agent on the opposite side is really safe. So this mission is very risky. Before Soldak could speak, Marquis Luther continued, and I think the magician from the Astrologer's Guild is probably a double agent. He will not only reveal the intelligence there to us, but also our intelligence to the other side. The House of Representatives is now divided into two factions. The main militant faction wants to seize the opportunity to take back this dimension. As one of them, I naturally cannot object. However, this operation can be said to be extremely risky. You must be fully prepared mentally, Serdak exclaimed. How can it still be like this? Marquis Luther nodded and stood in front of the sand table. Well, the purpose of this operation is to enter the Ganbu Plain to capture McDonnell. I also want to see if there is a chance to repair the destroyed portal. Chapter 947 Marquis Luther's Gift Serdak walked over and looked at the sand table with different shapes in front of him. It looks more like a floating piece of land, or a piece of tile. The mountains, rivers, and lakes in the upper part are all very clear, and the entire plain is a gentle slope of about 15 degrees. So almost all rivers flow in the same direction. And there seems to be snow in the highlands. 
the lower part looks like it was pulled out from somewhere. With mountains of rocks and some dark vines scattered everywhere. Serdek asked. Is this the Ganmu plane? That's right. Serdek added. Its shape is really unique. Marky Luther sighed. This plane is small. But it is a very rich plane. He stretched out his hand to touch the snowy peak at the highest point of the model and continued. Because it is so small. The total area is even less than one half of the Bina province. And it was also the first plane discovered and occupied by the McDonald family. The portal of the Ganbu plane was originally built in the south of the tower. Harris City. He pointed at the sand mold of this plane and explained it to Serdak in detail from bottom to top. This plane looks like a vertebral hillside and is divided into a sunny side and a shady side. The sun always shines on the sunny land where various plants grow. It has the largest plant in the Bina province. On the shady side of the plantation, there is an uninhabited land of death where there are space cracks everywhere and our immigrants have completed the development of all available land on the Ganbu surface. Serdek looked back at the Belen Plain. Although this Ganbu Plain was countless times smaller than the Belen Plain, the actual occupied area was much larger than the Belen Plain. Marquis Luther frowned, focusing on a lakeside city on the right side of the center of the model, and said to Soldek, Now the disadvantages are also here. The McDonnell family has been operating for more than a hundred years. That's basically their sphere of influence. Although we have quelled the rebellion in Tanan this time, the main force of the McDonnell family has all withdrawn to the Ganbu Plain. In fact, it is not easy for us to capture the Ganbu Plain, not to mention that the main portal is still cut off, although there is currently a temporary portal that can enter the Ganbu Plain. The transmission cost of this temporary portal is too high and cannot transport a large number of troops at all. We can only send some elite teams to sneak into the Ganbu Plain to assassinate Lord McDonnell or repair the portal as long as our cavalry can capture the square where the portal is located. Reinforcements from behind will continue to pass through the portal and occupy the city. Marquis Luther said angrily, Those people in the House of Representatives are a bunch of brainless pigs. They don't know how to send out their own troops. So naturally they don't worry about the casualties of the executors. Sernak asked curiously, My Lord Marquis, why did Lord Macdonald defect? Marquis Luther lowered his head, and thought for a while before sitting down on a chair next to the sand table. He sat there a little slumped, his eyes slightly absent-minded at a certain moment. He sat quietly for a while before saying, First of all, let's start with the man McDonnell. This man is the most thoughtful lord I have ever met. He himself is also very good and has high leadership skills. But he is a typical perfectionist and is very idealistic about everything. He wanted to try to change some rotten systems, but was firmly resisted by many conservatives. This this was probably the main reason why he decided to leave Benna City. The second is the plane war that has broken out one after another in recent years. The entire Benna province has been tied to the plane war chariot. And materials and manpower are continuously transported outwards. The Ganbu plane is the most comprehensive development in this plane. The intensity of exporting resources has been quite large in recent years. And the people on the Ganbu plane have a high voice for McDonnell. Currently, the Benna Legion is trapped in the Warsaw plane and unable to escape. This is definitely a good opportunity for them. Serdak did not expect that the relationship between the lords was so loose and that they would directly launch a rebellion without the constraints of the Bena Legion. How is the situation in Tanong? Soldak asked Marquis Luther. Marquis Luther waved his hand, indicating that the problem was not big, and said, Many of the recaptured towns in Tanong currently need to be rebuilt, but many infrastructures have not been damaged. So this area will soon recover from the war. Soldak stood in front of the sand table and hesitated for a while, and then said to Marquis Luther, I want to go to the Ganbu Plain. Since you insist on going to the Ganbu Plain, come with me. Marquis Luther lifted up a map hanging on the wall on the east wall of this room and opened it with a set of keys. The secret door on the wall actually contained another set of golden keys. He put the bunch of golden keys in his arms, led Soldak through the first floor cloister of the castle and walked around in a long circle before walking down to the castle basement. There was still a small group of guards here. When they saw Marquis Luther, they opened the large iron door of the basement. He walked into the basement, passed through one iron door after another, and finally came to the innermost metal door covered with magic patterns. This is a showroom. Marquis Luther said to Soldak, Anything that can be used as a showroom will basically store some valuable things. Sernak is quite clear about this in his heart. Marquis Luther inserted the golden key into the keyhole, but did not rush to turn the key. He turned the winch on the door hard and twisted the wheel on the metal door to a fixed position. 
At this time, there was a click from the metal key port. The inserted key actually came out halfway, and Marquis Luther turned the golden key three times. There was a clicking sound of the lock spring inside, and rays of magic light lit up from the metal door, and the faint blue lines were clearly displayed. Finally, the entire door was filled with a glow of magic. Marquis Luther gently pushed it to both sides with his hands. With the sound of the wheel axle rolling gently, the large iron door actually slid to both sides. A room appeared inside the big iron door. Seeing that the room was filled with a dazzling array of jewelry, Soldak was inevitably a little excited. Let's go in and have a look. Marquis Luther invited Soldak, passing through boxes of jewelry and magic crystals and piles of magic metal ingot storage areas. The two came to an area filled with shells. There were countless magic sealing boxes on the shelves, and almost all of them were sealed. Magic boxes are labeled in the lower right corner. Many of the labels have become yellow and brittle due to their age, and the writing on them is also a bit blurry. What is displayed here is the wealth left by the patriarchs of the Luther family. Here is also what I left behind. Take a look. This set of magic pattern structure was worn by me when I was young. At that time, I was a knight like you. I brought this set of second-level magic pattern structure back from the big battlefield. Later, I got a more suitable one. And this set has been stored here. Marquis Luther pointed to a dusty magic ceiling box in the corner and said to Soldak with a smile, It's yours now. Take it away. The dinner arranged by Lady Marianne herself was very sumptuous. After having dinner at the Marquis Luther's mansion, Soldak, Hathaway, and Beatrice spent half the night watching the stars in the attic of the observation deck on the top floor of the castle and then hurriedly left Luther before they went to bed. Marquis Palace? If Madame Marianne's maid hadn't been guarding the door, Soldak felt that he might have become the son-in-law of the Luther family in advance. Riding a horse at a galloping pace, Soldak rushed back to the Circle Hotel at midnight. Chapter 948 Eisenhard The cold wind was blowing, and there were almost no pedestrians on the street. Occasionally, a magic caravan sped past on the street. The night watchman wore thick fur coats, and strolled slowly through the streets, holding lanterns. Serdak rode back to the Circle Hotel. The waiter at the door of the hotel opened the door and led the Gubo Lai War horse to the courtyard. When he came to the steps of the inner courtyard, Serdak jumped off the horse and stuffed the reins into the attendant's hands, hand, and threw a silver coin into his arms. Thank you, my generous lord. I will prepare the best stables and fodder for your horse. The waiter quickly saluted and promised. It is not every day that there are such generous guests. Serdak waved his hand without looking back and stepped up the steps. The waiter who immediately ran up to lead the way with a lantern walked cautiously in front and asked in a low voice, Sir, do you need hot water? Do you need juice or alcoholic drinks? We can also provide simple late-night snacks here or prepare a bed-warming young girl for you. Shut your mouth. Soldak tossed another silver coin and the waiter happily accepted the tip without saying anything. It wasn't until Soldak was sent to the corridor on the third floor that he stopped at the stairs carefully took out the silver coin, rubbed it on the leather on his chest with excitement, and then put it back in his arms. Seeing Soldak riding a horse into the inner courtyard of the hotel, Samira left the window with a cup of hot fruit tea, jumped onto the bed as quickly as a nimble cheetah, got into the white quilt, and closed her eyes. Prepare your eyes for a comfortable sleep. In the marching tent set up in the hotel yard, Gulitam and Nauhor were still chatting, as if they were arguing about what to eat tomorrow morning. The waiter with a lantern who was guarding the hotel entrance still had some shadow of the two-headed ogre. When night fell, he took the initiative to run to the tent and asked the ogre, Do you need a girl to sleep with? Unexpectedly, this ogre actually asked, How young is it? Is the meat very tender? Is it really edible? The waiter was scared to death. Thea seemed to have just gotten out of the bath. And when she heard the sound of the door opening in the next room, she ran out and said H, low to Soldak. The mermaid lady just showed her shoulders with light scales and immediately retracted them after saying something. Serdak didn't pay attention. He returned to the room and first lit the wall lamp on the wall. I poured myself a glass of water and after drinking the water, I took out the magic sealing box from the magic belt bag and dropped it on the table with a clang. Now, Samira and Andrew already have a set of elementary magic patterns. Andrew's earth shield seems to be about to be scrapped. Samira has just obtained a set of demon snake fangs, which only have two heads. The ogre girl at him is not available yet. His body shape is too special. And there is no suitable one. I'm afraid it needs to be specially customized. As for the mermaid girl see a next door, she probably needs a set of mage robes. In the green empire, 
Although magic robes are expensive, they are not difficult to buy. Magicians are very rare, and every magician can make magic robes. Every time they go through a stage, they will change their magic robes. So magic robes are full of shelves in magic stores. Sit in your living room and turn up the lights. Serdak couldn't wait to open the old-looking magic ceiling box. Marquis Luther gave Serdak a second-level magic pattern construction suit. But this set looks very strange. The suit part is actually full of weapons and shields. And there is also a line of text left on it. Which seems to be this the name of the suit. The name is also a bit weird. It's actually called Eisenhard's Arsenal. Serdak took out this set of magic pattern structures one by one from the magic ceiling box. This set had very few parts. It only had a breastplate, a long sword, a shield and a helmet with a visor. This set of magic patterns is a bit old. It is covered with modeled sword marks. And no magic patterns can be seen on the surface of the armor. If Marquis Luther hadn't said it was a second level magic pattern structure, Soldak would hardly have seen anything special about it. Serdak was a little curious. This set of magic pattern structure actually did not have shoulder armor, arm guards, belt, trouser armor, greaves, boots and other armors. It seemed that the suit was a bit too simple. But the moment he picked up the broad sword, a simple aura hit his face. Serdak can feel the magical power contained in the magic pattern structure. This is a broad sword with a bronze blade that looks like it is made of magical copper. It was heavy, and the linen threads wrapped around the handle were coagulated with dried blood. The blade of the broadsword is almost as wide as an adult's hand, and the length of the blade is almost four feet. The front half of the blade is very smooth, and there is a shallow blood groove two fingers wide in the middle. The second half seems to be polished into jagged edges, with a row of fine magic runes engraved in the middle of the jagged teeth. Holding it in your hand, the wide blade has a good guiding effect and has a good feel that only a machete has. The armor made of magical red copper looks like a copper vest. And it does not come with shoulder pads and arm guards. It looks a bit ordinary. Even very crude. The traces of knife and axe cuts are also obvious on it. The magic pattern is reverse engraved into the inside of the armor. The armor design is a bit tight. Serdak has a northerner's body type. He wanted the vestile armor on the ship. But he couldn't wear salamander leather armor under it. The helmet was like an upside down iron bucket with three holes. When he put it on his head. Soldak realized that the comfort of this helmet was not bad. And the visual field windows for the eyes were also good. It is somewhat restricted. The original rotation angle of the head is 180 degrees. When wearing this helmet, it is immediately reduced to 120 degrees. He placed the bronze helmet gently on the wooden table. And Serdak always felt as if something was staring at him. Although the helmet is simple and unpretentious. It looks like a masterpiece by an art master. The mask has an indescribable charm inside it. There is a gothic shield lying at the bottom of the demon ceiling box. This style of shield is much larger than the iris shield. And it is not as square as the tower shield. It is a streamlined design with a wide top and a narrow arc at the bottom. With stripes around it. There are scales and exaggerated sharp horn-shaped horns on the edges on both sides. This shield is Soldak's favorite part. No matter the size or style. It is in line with Serdak's understanding of shields. As a paladin. He has never had a shield that he can use. Even a thick steel plate like the dwarf chain shield had been worn out several times by him. Although it has been replaced with a better magic shield commemorative shield. This square tower shield with runes is not suitable for riding horses. Serdak took off his salamander skin armor and put this second level magic pattern structure on his body. Since there are only four pieces. And the only things that need to be worn are the breastplate and helmet. The process of putting it on is very simple. The most important thing is the breastplate and helmet, which don't require much carrying capacity at all. Serdak put it on and found that the effect of the suit was triggered. The magic patterns on the breastplate and helmet lit up slightly, and a source of power was transmitted from the suit to the body. The feeling was simply indescribable. Like an instant, he became much stronger again. Since he successfully broke through the second turn, he has gained greater carrying capacity. The pressure from the keel at the throat has disappeared. And now there is no problem at all wearing two pieces of magic pattern structure. He tried to pick up the shield in the living room. As expected, his body felt a weight. But he was still able to accept it. He waved the shield twice without any sluggishness or hindrance at all. Holding the broadsword in his hand again, Soldak felt that he had reached the limit of what he could mentally endure in an instant. But it was still bearable. All the magic patterns on the four magic pattern structures light up. And they seem to be closely connected by invisible magic patterns and streams of magical power are injected into the body from the armor. 
It was a kind of magical power that could not be felt by the earth shield. It was a very strange feeling. Although it did not feel much stronger. It just felt that the body was very different from before. The shield seemed to be easily lifted up. Although the shield was much larger, it became easier to lift the shield. Such a change made Serdak wonder for a moment. When Serdak swung his broadsword, he could also feel the hissing sound of breaking through the air. The blade just passed over the table. The glass bottle on the table was cut open silently, and the contents inside were cut open. Water dripped all over the table. Unexpectedly, the sword was so sharp, and Serdak did not dare to stay in the living room. He walked towards the terrace. Suddenly, he had a very clear feeling that the steps he took seemed to be a bit longer than before. This change in span even made him a little uncomfortable. Is this the change brought about by the second level magic pattern construction? Serdak thought. The strength of being promoted to a second level powerhouse has been greatly improved. The body can even directly communicate with the surrounding sacred aura and has endless power of holy light in a short period of time. But this set of magic patterns can give Serdak an overall improvement in physical condition. The pace is longer than before which means that Serdak's movement speed has been significantly improved at the same frequency. The magic pattern structure has very good defense and magic resistance. And the shield block also has significant changes. These changes make Soldak very satisfied. This set of magic patterns is very good. Samira stood barefoot on the railing of the terrace next door. The cold wind in the winter night blew her fine hair away. Her magic pattern structure is a set of demon snake fangs brought back from the imperial capital by Merchant Malakam. This is almost the top-level primary magic pattern structure that can be found in the auction house. As for the second-level magic pattern structure, almost no one will sell it whether in the auction house or on the market. It is a complete set with a sword and shield. Soldak stood on the terrace and waved the broadsword in his hand. The stone wall on the terrace flashed with sparks, and a few shallow marks were left on it. Samira came up and saw a line of small words at the bottom of the shield, and said in surprise, Does it actually have a name? It's such a good magic pattern construct. Serdak felt that it was pretty good. I don't know how much better it was than the Earth Shield. So he said, It is said that this set of magic patterns was obtained by Marquis Luther from the Great Battlefield. Then after we finish this mission, let's go to the big battlefield to try our luck. Samira said. Serdak lifted his visor, patted his forehead and said, Originally, I planned to clean up the Anya Swamp. How long will it take to clean up the Anya Swamp? As long as this area is opened up and those adventure groups and mercenary groups can gain a foothold, there will be people who come to take risks and experience. Samira is not worried about the swamp at all. A powerful monster lurks. Serdak nodded and said, Let's complete this mission first. Maybe we can find armor suitable for Gulitem to wear on the battlefield. Sia sat on the wooden bed with her quilt in her arms. Looking through the window, she could just see Samira and Soldak chatting on the terrace. She leaned her head against the wall and looked at the deep night sky. Chapter 949 Bena City Military Headquarters The Bena City Military Headquarters is located diagonally opposite the main entrance square of Duke Newman's palace. This is also convenient for Duke Newman, the supreme commander of the Bena army, to handle military affairs in peacetime. A group of pigeons landed on the central square. Soldak, Samira, Sia and Gulitem passed quickly through the square. The pigeons only flew a few meters away, and flopped back to the square. The two-headed ogre asked Soldak curiously, Do the people here usually not like roasted pigeons? Under the steps of the military entrance stand two five-meter-high statues of swordsmen. Both statues are swordsmen holding large swords with both hands. Their eyes are flying towards the highest roof of Duke Newman's palace in the distance. Banner! Maybe there are so many because no one eats them. Samira wore a hood on her head, covering her face tightly. Thea also imitated Samira's dress. The group of people arrived at the gate of the military headquarters and were stopped by the guards at the door. This is not the military headquarters of Wilk City, and Soldak has no ability to freely enter and exit here. Serdak and others were waiting outside the gate of the military headquarters. Some people went inside to communicate. During this morning, there were many people standing at the gate of the military headquarters. Many nobles and lords also wanted to enjoy the cold wind outside. But no one complained. Samira and Sia showed off their female figures and covered their faces with hoods and black gauze, which was quite eye-catching. In the military camp, there are almost no women among ordinary soldiers. Only some outstanding female warriors appear in some personal guard squads or independent combat groups. However, these female warriors are basically physically stronger than ordinary people. Relatively speaking, 
Samuel A's figure is extremely well-proportioned and slim. Misty is even dressed as a magician, but she doesn't have the awesome magician badge on her chest. In this way, her identity becomes even more curious. When Great Swordsman Chester reached the gate of the military headquarters, he saw the Eisenhard magic pattern structure worn by Serdak. His mouth immediately grew into an O shape, and he stared at Serdak in disbelief. Duck sighed. Your Majesty the Marquis is so willing to give you this set of magic patterns. Many people gathered at the door. Swordsman Chester put his arm around Serdak's shoulders, stepped forward and muttered to the guard at the door for a while, and then took out a sign before leading Serdak and others into the military headquarters. Soldak followed the great swordsman Chester into the lobby on the first floor of the military headquarters, only to find that it was packed with people and even more chaotic than the free market. I can't help it. The war situation in various places has been a bit complicated recently. Great swordsman Chester introduced. Normally, this place is not so chaotic. Serdak and his party followed the great swordsman Chester through the chaotic hall on the first floor. After climbing to the second floor, there were obviously a lot less people here. However, the corridor here is very long, and there are gates far apart. Groups of officers walked into these gates in small groups. Serdak passed by at that time. I took a look inside and found that these were conference halls. Serdak asked the Great Swordsman Chester, You know this arsenal of Eisenhard's weapons? Great Swordsman Chester curled his lips and said with a smile, Of course, my memory is still fresh. This was my biggest gain when I followed Marquis Luther into the big battlefield for the first time. Every trace on this set of magic patterns is related to Marquis Luther. Later, he no longer needed this set. I have constructed the magic pattern, but I have never been willing to take it out and hide it in my home. Soldak thought of Marquis Luther's earnest gaze last night, and finally felt how profound his father-in-law's grace was. Can such a powerful magic pattern structure really be obtained on the battlefield? Serdak asked curiously. The great swordsman Chester smiled freely. What is there to doubt? Haven't you worn it all? It's just not as easy as you think. Danger and opportunity always coexist. Serdak quickly said. I also want to prepare for entering the big battlefield. What? Are you so anxious to see the demons in the passage to H, L? Great Swordsman Chester stopped on the walking platform and turned to ask him. The buildings inside the entire military headquarters look solemn and solemn. And all the corridors and columns are very tall. Even if a two-headed ogre walks in the corridor, it will feel very spacious. Serdak forced a smile and said, I heard that it is also a place to temper yourself. Many second-level experts seek self-breakthrough there. Great Swordsman Chester's smile disappeared, and he asked with a serious face, Then have you heard how many strong men can come out of the big battlefield alive? Serdak said with some guilt, Someone needs to go there to fight. You're right. Seeing that Soldak was still so persistent, Great Swordsman Chester put his arm around his shoulders, moved to a conference room, and whispered, Don't think about these things for now. We need to think about it now. How can I return from the Ganbu plane alive? This conference hall is not very big. There is only a huge round table made of dark blue indigo wood. There are some celebrity oil paintings hanging on the surrounding walls. There is a huge crystal chandelier in the middle of the ceiling. With dots of lights. To make the conference room look very bright. There is a magic crystal placed in the hollow in the middle of the round table. There are already many people sitting around the round table. Almost all those who can sit around the round table are wearing a complete set of magic pattern structures. And the powerful aura exuding from their bodies shows that they are almost all second level powerhouses. These people were also divided into several fighting teams. One of them, a swordsman who looked very strong, carried two two-handed swords behind his back. He was sitting carelessly on a chair near the door. He saw the great swordsman Chester hugging him from outside. Serdak walked in, pointed at Serdak and asked, Chester, who is this? This Count Soldak is currently in the Independent Cavalry Battalion of the Luther Army. Swordsman Chester introduced Soldak. This is the Great Swordsman Quintus, who belongs to the Colin Army. So you are the night boy with the Holy Light Technique. I have heard your name. You performed very well in the Maka Plane. If Marquis Luther hadn't acted so quickly, maybe you would have had a chance to join the Colin Army. The tall swordsman Quintus extended his hand enthusiastically. Serdak didn't expect that when he was sitting in this conference hall, Someone would appear randomly, and he was a great swordsman. He quickly said a few words modestly, then followed the great swordsman Chester obediently and sat in the corner. Great swordsman Chester and great swordsman Quintus seemed to be very familiar with each other. The two chatted together, and someone familiar joined in. Chester, 
I heard that you went to Belan to garrison and take over the mess caused by Langdon's army. The great swordsman Chester also laughed carefully and said, By Lin's side is actually not bad. The northern occupied area is not as bad as rumored. But you? Quintus. I heard that you went to Luigi Plain. How is it going? Great swordsman Quintus also said casually, It's okay. Thank you Lady Lut for letting me drink in front of the Nakma people. Do you know our mission this time? Someone asked again. The speaker subconsciously lowered his voice. I heard he was going to the Ganbu Plain. At this time, the door of the conference hall was suddenly pushed open, and three senior officers walked in from the door. The leader was an old noble man with gray hair. It could be seen from the badge on his uniform that this was also a senior officer. The name is Marquis, commander of the Legion, and it is also the badge of commander. Marquis Luther also followed the noble old man. His eyes passed over the bodies of the great swordsman Chester and Soldak, and he nodded indiscernibly. After the three senior military officers entered the conference hall, everyone immediately stood up from their chairs. The aristocratic old man walked to his seat and stood up. He glanced around the room before nodding slightly and said, Very good. We can still see so many old faces here. And we can also see many new faces. Sit down. With a hurrah, everyone sat down around the round table. And the door to the conference room was closed. The aristocratic old man said in a loud voice, I won't say any more nonsense. This time I have summoned elite warriors from three legions. You are the commanders of each legion. You are summoned here to organize an assault team. You will sneak into the Ganbu Plain through the temporary portal today. Chapter 950 The Mission of the Assault Team The conference hall became very quiet, and everyone was listening carefully to the arrangements of the noble old man. Serdak was sitting on a chair against the wall behind the great swordsman of Chester. The old nobleman looked full of aura. Marquis Luther and a nobleman with two dark beards sat on his left and right. Both sides. The great swordsman Chester leaned back, and Soldak saw that he seemed to have something to say. So he immediately leaned forward. Chester introduced to Soldak in a very low voice. The one sitting in the middle is Marquis Johnson. He is not only the commander of Johnson's army, he is also the commander of the Talapagan War Zone of the Bene City Military Headquarters. Supreme Commander. And the other is the Marquis Norton. After listening to Chester's introduction, that one of the three people was the Marquis Norton. Soldak immediately thought of the young and handsome Baron Cole Norton he had met in Handanar County in the Warsaw Plain. At that time, Hathaway together with Darcy Christie. They also had a romantic relationship with Baron Cole Norton at the Bena Advanced Swordsman Academy. However, on the battlefield, Cole Norton's performance disappointed both Hathaway and Darcy. I don't know how Baron Cole Norton is doing now. Great Swordsman Chester didn't know these past events of Soldak seeing that he was slightly distracted after seeing Marquis Norton. He said to him, The Norton Legion and our Luther Legion are not the same people. If you meet them on the battlefield, you should be careful even if they are not hostile. They are all a bunch of untrustworthy guys. Soldak knew that when Hathaway and Cole Norton wanted to date at the Advanced Swordsman Academy, they encountered great resistance from the family. He did not expect that the root of the problem was actually here. As for Johnson's Legion, we must also keep a proper distance. This is a legion whose mission is to rescue all suffering people. This belief is not worthy of praise, because once you have such a noble belief, someone will inevitably die. The most powerful legion in the Bena province is the Bena Legion under Duke Newman. There is no doubt about this. But the legion with the most monuments on the cemetery is the Johnson Legion. Duck, you are a paladin. You are good at saving your companions on the battlefield. But you must be careful not to become a too good person. Once compassion overflows on the battlefield, it means that you are not far from death. Oh, uh, got it. The two of them whispered, and Serdak looked at the noble old man, not expecting that he would actually lead such an army. Marquis Johnson had already begun to assign tasks in front of the conference table. The assault team that sneaked into the Ganbu Plain, this time is composed of second-level soldiers temporarily transferred from the three legions. I know you people don't like each other, and no one will obey the other. There were a few dry laughs around the round table. Marquis Johnson said with a serious face. So the three assault teams will operate separately in this operation. I just hope you don't forget that you are allies on the United Front after all. The main purpose of this operation is to capture McDonnell, which will be the first priority of this operation. Although the location of the temporary portal is very secretive. Once there is action here, it is very likely that a certain assault team will bring the pursuers near the temporary portal. Out of concern that the temporary portal will be destroyed and the other two assault teams will not be able to return safely. 
The operation in the Ganbu Plain is only for 48 hours. The time for the three teams to return to Bena City cannot be advanced. Otherwise, the pursuit will be lost. Lead the soldiers to the vicinity of the temporary teleportation gate. But you cannot delay. Otherwise, once the teleportation gate is destroyed, you will be stranded in the Ganbu Plain. The Luther Legion and the Norton Legion Assault Team are responsible for capturing Lord MacDonald. The Norton Legion Assault Team is ambushing the Makuso City Hall. The Luther Legion Assault Team enters the MacDonald Manor. The Johnson Legion Assault Team will see if there is any chance. Seize the portal to the Ganbu Plain. The Luther Legion Assault Team and the Norton Legion Assault Team completed their mission and returned to Bena City through the temporary portal. The Johnson Legion Assault Team seizes the portal. If you have the chance, capture the portal. If you don't have the chance, check the specific damage of the portal. When the time comes, Mallory Magician from the Astrologer's Guild will follow you. If, if you can repair the portal, you can return to the south of the tower through the portal, where there will be troops waiting in front of the portal. If you don't have a chance, evacuate quickly. But you must wait until they take action before taking action, so as not to affect the capture of Lord MacDonald. Here are the regional maps of the Ganbu Plain and the urban map of Makusuo. You want the chief officers to take them with you. Only then did Soldak understand the main tasks of all parties in this operation. The Luther Legion, headed by the Great Swordsman Chester and the Great Swordsman Quintus, led a group of second-level warriors and were responsible for attacking Earl MacDonald in the city, outside the manor to prevent MacDonald from hiding in the manor. Johnson's Legion, led by Grand Knight Trollop and Sabrina Great Swordsman, were responsible for seizing the portal in the city center square. Only then did Sardak realize that there was an acquaintance of his at the venue. He had just followed the Great Swordsman Chester into the conference hall. As soon as he entered the door, he greeted the Great Swordsman Quintus and did not notice the inside of the conference hall. Now when the mission was being assigned, I discovered that the leader of Johnson's Legion was actually Lord Trollope. He hadn't seen Trollope Knight for about three years, but he didn't expect that he would break through the second level and become the combat commander of this operation. Another Sabrina Great Swordsman, Soldak, also had a chance encounter. She was the instructor who led the team from the Beta Advanced Swordsman Academy to the Warsaw Plain to participate in graduation training. The Norton Legion's Archmage Merlin and the Bayan Knight led the assault team responsible for infiltrating the Makuso City Hall. After assigning the tasks, Marquis Johnson, Marquis Luther and Marquis Norton left the conference hall first. This meeting did not last long, and everyone was in a hurry to prepare, and then set off. When he walked out of the conference hall, Lord Trollope came over, patted Serdak affectionately on the shoulder, smiled and said to him, I saw your name on the action list this morning, and I thought who is that guy with the same name? I didn't expect it to be you. He punched Serdak in the chest affectionately and said, You guy, did you actually break through the second rank in such a short time? Serdak saluted to Grand Knight Trollope, and then said, I was promoted to Knight Trollope half a month ago. Long time no see. How do you know each other? Swordsman Chester standing aside asked in surprise. Knight Trollope smiled cheerfully and said, Of course, we are already friends in the Warsaw Plain. The great Swordsman Chester saw that Soldak had no rebuttal, and quickly put his arm around his shoulders, pulled him away from the front of the Knight Trollope, and said with a cautious face, Dak, please don't talk to him. This kind of person becomes a friend. This kind of person is a fanatical lunatic, who can even stab his friends because of his beliefs. Sabrina, the great swordsman standing next to Lord Trollope, immediately scolded softly, Chester, don't say this in front of the newcomers. Towards this female swordsman, great swordsman Chester behaved like a gentleman. He quickly raised his hand and said, Okay, duck, let's go. Although we participated in the infiltration mission together, when our respective legions have different divisions of labor, we should not there will be some intersection. I wish you all the best. Serdak was speechless. The great swordsman Chester is really as bad-tempered as ever. And he is never sloppy in his behavior. Cool item. Samira and Sia were all waiting outside the conference hall. Also waiting outside were many second-level powerhouses. However, the two-headed ogre stood in the crowd. And his tall body seemed a bit eye-catching. Since he was standing with Samira and Sia, the two ladies had their faces covered with black veils pretending not to be approached by strangers. So no one took the initiative to strike up a conversation at this time. Everyone was guessing which legion these three people were from. As the chief officers walked out of the conference room, everyone cheered and gathered around them. 
Only then did the second-level swordsmen of the Luther Legion realize that these unfamiliar faces were all newcomers brought by the great swordsmen of Chester. Not to mention the two-headed ogre. The most bizarre thing for everyone is that there is actually a water magician and a second-level archer among them. The strongest part of the Luther Legion is that there is a constructed swordsman regiment under the command of Marquis Luther. They are a group of pure swordsmen who form the swordsman regiment. The ones who will perform this mission are all the second-level warriors in the swordsman regiment. Bye. Each of these second-level swordsmen are wearing exquisite magic pattern structures. Here, the expensive magic pattern structures that are out of reach for ordinary people seem to have suddenly become ordinary armor. Without the magic pattern structure, those who pretend become aliens, just like the two-headed ogre Gulidum. Standing in the crowd is a little awkward. Chester, where did you find these guys? Someone saw the great swordsman Chester and the great swordsman Quintus walking out of the conference hall side by side and immediately gathered around him, and said kindly to him, Obviously Great Swordsman Chester is very popular among the Constructed Swordsman group. Someone else came up and asked, Chester, I heard that you went to the Belen Plain, and I heard that the girls there are all fair-skinned and beautiful. Chester said to everyone seriously, I'll introduce it to you. Immediately, he introduced Serdak, Gulidum, Samira, and Sia to everyone. Then he saw so many people gathered in the corridor, somewhat obstructing traffic. So he said to everyone, There are many people here. Let's go to the courtyard. Great swordsman Quintus had the highest prestige among these people and ordered. Everyone will check the weapons and equipment later. We are going to the teleportation hall. All the second level swordsmen began to check the weapons and equipment they carried. Sardak asked curiously, Teleport hall? Great swordsman Chester explained, Well, the teleportation hall is a teleportation circle developed by the Astrologers Guild. It is distributed in the major cities of the Green Empire. This kind of teleportation gate can not only teleport between cities, but can also be connected with temporary teleportation gates. Now each main city the most convenient way to travel between them is to go through this kind of teleportation gate. But the cost of a single teleportation is a bit affecting your life. You need about one-third of a magic pattern structure at a time, which is not something ordinary people can afford. A group of swordsmen gathered together and walked down to the second floor of the military headquarters. Serdak asked in a low voice, Does one teleport cost at least 50 magic crystals? Swordsman Chester nodded and admitted, Yes, if the transmission fee were not too expensive. I am afraid that the airport terminals in various places would be abandoned. Great Swordsman Quintus also interjected at this time, It is most comfortable to take a magic airship now. It is only a week or two. And it is like a vacation on the airship. What Soldak was thinking about at the moment was that the House of Representatives and the military department had really spent a lot of money to capture Lord MacDonald. This time, the three legions gathered a total of nearly 40 second-level experts, prepared to enter the dry cloth plain, in the courtyard behind the military headquarters. A group of second-level warriors from the Luther Legion gathered together. In fact, there are 11 second-level swordsmen under Marquis Luther, among whom Quintus and Chester are the deputy commanders of the garrison. The other nine second-level great swordsmen are from the Constructed Swordsman Corps. Their lowest position is the squadron leader of the Constructed Swordsman Corps, including Serdak, Samira, Gulitum, Shia. This assault team has a total of 15 people, and the assault teams of the other two legions are 10-person teams. For this transmission fee alone, the Bina Provincial House of Representatives will have to spend 2,000 magic crystals. Everyone gathered in a pavilion. The great swordsman Quintus spread a map of Makuso City in the Ganbu Plain on the table, and introduced the specific situation there to everyone. The great swordsman Quintus has a beard, a big man, and his whole body is full of muscles. Just listen to what he said. There are seven second-level warriors in Lord MacDonald's army. In the Battle of Terrapagan, two second-level warriors died in the Battle of Gukin River. Now they are following Mike. Lord Tang now will definitely not have more than five second-level experts entering the Ganbu Plain. He smiled faintly, and said very confidently, even if we meet the opponent's second-level warriors, they can't stop us. Our mission is just to bring Lord MacDonald back. Don't have any other ideas. But you have been fighting in Taran for so long, and you have a deep understanding of Donald's regiment. You should know that their ordinary regiments are also very powerful. We can't be reluctant to fight in the manner. Once MacDonald's bodyguards surround us, coupled with some ordnance, it is estimated that even we will have a hard time resisting. Of course, this is just the apparent military power. I heard that Lord MacDonald has close ties with many bandit groups and rebels. In addition, 
there should be some members of the Black Magic Hermitage here. So everyone must be careful during this operation. Be careful. He turned his eyes slightly, fell on Suldak, and said, This Count Surdak is the only paladin among us. So you have to remember your responsibilities and team position. You must stand behind you at all times. We also count on you to help when you are injured. Once you are injured first, it will be embarrassing to lie with other injured companions. Suldak opened his mouth and simply didn't know what to say. Did he join the medical team with just one sentence? Chapter 951 The Quarrel in the Teleportation Hall Great Swordsman Quintus frowned and asked Great Swordsman Chester. Chester, why did you bring a magician to this mission? Don't you know that the quota limit for this operation is very strict? Swordsman Chester chuckled and said softly to the crowd. She can walk on the waves. This magic can help us escape from the battlefield as soon as possible. Everyone looked at Sia, who was covered with a black gauze scarf, with surprise on their faces. And Sia was so frightened that she quickly hid behind Soldak. When Great Swordsman Quintus heard what Great Swordsman Chester said, he immediately had no doubts. He waved his hand casually and said, Okay, okay, Soldak, you brought her here, and the responsibility of protecting her rests with you. But when his eyes fell on Ghoul Item, his expression immediately became very relaxed. And he even said with an admiring expression, The other Mr. Ogre, the two-headed ogre is still dominated by Gilidim. He popped up his chest and said politely to Quintus Great Swordsman, Just call me Cool Item. The ogre's voice was somewhat loud, making the surrounding area quiet. The half-elf archer who had been standing silently behind Serdek now said lightly, Tamira! The Great Swordsman Quintus said, Cool Item, you follow the assault team. Samira, you go with the scout team. The half-elf archer nodded without any objection. The entrance to the teleportation hall in Bena City was surrounded by military guards and the outermost perimeter was filled with knights from the guard camp. The entire teleportation hall is inaccessible after 9 o'clock in the morning. Fortunately, there are very few people who can afford the teleportation fee, and there are basically no people in the teleportation hall. The three assault teams were divided into three columns and stood in the teleportation hall. This building is very ornately built. The floor is paved with frosted marble, and the columns of the courtyard and porch are also polished with smooth bluestone. There are three teleportation gates in the hall, one of which is connected to the Imperial Capital, and the other is a teleportation gate, connected to a Yinsi. The portal in the corner can be connected to a temporary portal. The space magicians of the Astrologers Guild have the space beacon of this portal in their hands, no matter where they are. As long as they calculate according to the correct space beacon, they can set up a temporary portal. Serdak felt that the high transmission price of the temporary teleportation array was probably caused by the industry monopoly of the Astrologers' Union. At least the plane transfer fee is not that expensive. The magician who built a temporary portal in the Ganbu plane will also follow everyone to the Ganbu plane this time. And he also has a task, which is to find an opportunity to repair the portal in the center of Makuso. The magician responsible for this teleportation is another one. He is wearing a black magic robe and has a poker face as he counts the number of teleporters dully. The assault teams of the other two legions had a prescribed number of people. When it came to the Luther Legion, the magician frowned at the end and asked with an unhappy face, Why do you have five more people in your team? The great swordsman Chester chuckled, put his hand on the magician's shoulder, and communicated, We have summoned a lot of second-level experts this time. Uh-huh. But if we have more people to carry out the task, the success rate will be lower, can be higher. The magician shook his shoulders, shook off the great swordsman Chester's hand, and then scolded in a low voice. Don't you know how many magic crystals the extra five people will bear? Swordsman Chester forced a smile and asked. What you mean by that is that there are too many of us and your magic crystals are wasted. The magician said very forcefully. The rules above are for a ten-person team. You have to lose five people before I can send you there. Great Swordsman Quintus squeezed past Great Swordsman Chester. Stood at the front. Lowered his head to look down at the thin magician. And asked. You mean that if we don't reduce the number of people, you are not going to put us down? Have you sent it over? There are too many people. And the temporary magic circle is overloaded. Before the teleportation magician finished speaking, the great swordsman Quintus turned around, waved his thick arms, and shouted to a group of second-level warriors behind him. Then let's go! You think we are willing to go to the Ganbu Plain? The second-level swordsman of the Luther Legion didn't say anything, and just followed the great swordsman Quintus towards the door of the teleportation hall. A noble officer in charge of maintaining the teleportation hall saw the great swordsman Quintus 
and the second-level swordsman walking out of the teleportation hall, and shouted loudly, Quintus, what are you doing? When we summon the second-level warriors of the Luther army to come to Benna City, no one said that they would limit the number of people to ten people. Right. The majestic Quintus great swordsman roared angrily. I just said yes. If we gather together the existing second-level warriors in the Legion, we can also have magicians accompanying the group. Now that we have gathered together the manpower, what is the point of losing five people? The aristocratic officer chuckled and said, The teleportation fee given by above is only that much. If the number of people exceeds the cost, why can't we reduce it? What is there to argue about? Go ahead. Go ahead. Call the second-level warriors from your legion to come over now. I saw quite a few people from your legion at the military headquarters today. Great swordsman Quintus said without giving in at all. The officer was choked by the great swordsman Quintus and didn't know what to say. Okay, what are you arguing about here? The crowd quickly parted ways, and Marquis Johnson walked into the teleportation hall from the outside with a dark face. He saw the second-level warriors of the Luther Legion standing at the door, and he felt a headache for a while. Marquis Luther himself had reservations about this capture operation of sneaking into the Ganbu plane, but he still agreed to participate in this capture operation in order to take the overall interests of the main war faction into consideration. Now the teleportation hall actually proposes to limit the number of teleportation places. It's really a pillow for dozing off. People can't find any reason to refuse this operation. Now there is. Let them pass. Marquis Johnson paused and gave instructions to the magician who activated the temporary teleportation array. The magician's face was as dark as ink. But he did not dare to refute Marquis Johnson's words. He just said in an extremely suppressed tone. This temporary teleportation array will be opened again in 48 hours. No waiting. After saying that, he stuffed the magic crystals into the gem grooves one by one, and a trace of magic elements poured into the portal. The originally mirror-like portal finally became rippled, rippling outwards in circles. After a while, a huge vortex formed. The assault team of Johnson's legion entered the portal first, and the magician who had returned from the Ganbu plane was sandwiched between them and passed through the portal together. Next came the assault team of the Norton Legion, followed by the assault team of the Luther Legion. Watching all the second-level warriors walk into the portal, the teleportation magician sullenly took out the magic crystal that had been almost drained of magic power from the gem groove and put it into his pocket. Chapter 952 Stink Serdak passed through the portal, and his vision suddenly went dark. He closed his eyes and opened them again to find that he had walked into a bedroom. The light in the room was a little dark, and the windows had thick curtains. A temporary portal was placed next to the floor-to-ceiling bronze mirror. Che was walking in front of him. The great swordsman ST pulled Serdak aside so as not to affect his companions passing through the portal behind him. The assault teams of the Norton Legion and the Jones Legion were the first to enter the portal. At this moment, they were already at the window of the room, opening the curtains a crack and cautiously checking the situation outside. Several second-level warriors began to inspect the entire room and quickly occupied the roof. Serdak discovered that it happened to be night here and looked outside through the window only to find that the night sky outside was actually dark red. And there were no shining stars. There were several bright yellow light bands in the night sky, mutually intertwined. Passing through it, it's like the dry cloth plane is a huge gift box. This single-story building was not big. So the 41 commandos seemed a bit crowded in the room. But they did not leave the single-story building. The magician who had not spoken during the whole journey laid a map on the coffee table in the living room. The leaders of the three assault teams gathered together, then pointed at the map and said to everyone, This is a single-story building on the outskirts of Makuso City. It is an affiliated satellite town outside the city. It is not far from the city. It only takes half an hour to walk to the south gate on horseback. There is a forest farm nearby. When we leave later, try not to disturb the residents here. After 48 hours, we must carefully return to this stronghold and return to Roland Continent through the temporary portal. Let me reintroduce this map to everyone. Lord MacDonald's manor outside the city is built on this mountain ridge. He usually lives in the manor. Only when he needs to handle official business. He will leave the manor in a magic caravan. Members of the Luther Legion's assault team. You can follow this road to the west. Reach this valley. And go upstream along the river to reach the castle outside the city. I have explored this road before. Usually there is almost no one around. So I guess it can cover your whereabouts very well. The two great swordsmen Quintus and Chester looked at each other and nodded in unison. 
This information is quite important to the Luther Legion assault team. At least it can save a lot of unnecessary trouble. After speaking, these magicians said to the two leaders of the Norton Legion assault team, Wait until daybreak. Members of the Norton Legion assault team, before you can enter the city through the south gate of Makusuo City, the city is now heavily guarded. Entering through the city gate is the safest way. One of the two leaders of the Norton family this time is an archmage. The magician paused for a moment, then pointed to a street on the map and continued. The city hall of Makuso is at the end of this road. It is a majestic circular building with white walls and red tiles, which is very easy to recognize. Archmage Merlin, Grand Knight Bashan, you need to pay attention to the fact that Makuso City Hall is only separated by a wall from the guard camp and the city defense security brigade. Therefore, once something goes wrong at the city hall, the speed at which the guard camp and security brigade will come to support will be very slow. Very fast. Don't fight them for too long. Although Lord MacDonald doesn't have many second-level warriors, I discovered a few days ago that there are many more magicians in Makusuo City than I expected. I suspect that if something happens here at the city hall, the magicians in Makuso City will also come to join the fight after hearing the news. Once the magicians mount their magic cauldrons and fly into the sky, it will not be easy to get rid of them. Archmage Merlin and Knight Bashan also looked solemn, saying that this operation would be resolved quickly. After saying this, the space magician said to the great Knight Trollope and the great swordsman Sabrina, We're going to stay and help clear away the traces here, and then we'll look for an opportunity to go to the central square portal. Everyone, Please note that it has been half a month since I left the Gonbu Plain. I don't know what kind of changes will happen here after disappearing for so many days. So everything still needs to rely on everyone's adaptability. Then I wish you all good luck with your next actions. After the magician said this, he and Night Trollope got together and began to discuss how to approach the portal in the central square. Sabrina Great Swordsman glanced at Soldak, who was standing in front of the ogre, and nodded kindly to him, obviously recognizing him. The Luther Legion's assault team was the first to leave the single-story building in order to avoid overly large targets. The assault team members left the single-story building in small groups and walked into the woods outside the town in batches. Great swordsman Quintus led some members over the courtyard wall and dispersed into the houses and streets. Soldak and the great swordsman Chester left from the other side. None of them rode horses this time in order to avoid being discovered by the rebels on the Gonbu Plain. Everyone tried to avoid contact with the people in the town. The two-headed ogre attracts attention no matter where he is. So he left first with Samira. Under the cover of darkness, a group of people entered the woods outside the town without any danger. The great swordsman of Chester and his party unexpectedly met a night watchman at the exit of the town. Fortunately, they were discovered early. Everyone hid behind the low bushes on the roadside and were not discovered by the night watchman. Soldak felt that the night watchman should be grateful. If he had twisted his neck to the left and right twice, he would have been ready to dig a hole to bury his body by now. He found that the vegetation in the Gonbu Plain was not much different from that in the Roland continent. But it seemed to be summer here now, and the surrounding vegetation was lush and green. According to the map, this place is almost 20 kilometers away from Lord MacDonald's Manor, and a rapid march would take two hours. If the assault team could cross Makuso City, they might be able to get closer. But now not only can't they pass through the city, they have to circle around the outside of Makuso City in order to avoid trouble. Serdak found that the cities he saw in these plains were all very large. It was probably because the central city of the plain had plain portals that so many people lived together here. The outermost city wall of the city is only three or four meters high. No one can even stand on the wall. There is a simple archery tower built with wooden frames every ten meters. Basically, there are no crossbows or catapults. Serdak felt that this kind of city wall could not stop a charge of heavy cavalry at all. As long as they rushed to the city and hung the hook on the top of the wall, a team of heavy cavalry could pull down this simple wall. The assault team did not dare to get too close to Makuso City. As the sky became brighter, several bright yellow ribbons in the night sky gradually disappeared into the night. The sky gradually became brighter, and the sky changed from dark red to light pink. At first, Soldak thought it was because the cloudy sky blocked the sun. When the light gradually became brighter, he realized that there was no sun in the sky at all. I can't figure out where the light is coming from. And I can't even find the shadow. All members of the assault team were wearing ordinary linen robes, taking advantage of the lack of pedestrians outside the city in the morning. They quickly found the river valley the magician mentioned according to the map guidance. The great swordsman Chester pointed to this river valley and said, As shown on the map, 
We go up this river valley, and we will soon see the manor. Without waiting for the instructions from the great swordsman at Chester, the three scouts in the assault team ran ahead and explored along the river valley. And Samira was one of them. Her body is light and agile, and she can easily jump forward from the trees beside the river valley. Like an agile jungle cheetah, the forest here is not dense. There are no horizontal branches, and there are not many bushes in the forest. There are some broken marks on the lower branches of many trees, which look like people are often cutting firewood in this forest. This valley is very deep, but the river inside is very thin, with gurgling streams winding down from above. After walking a few kilometers upstream along the river, I saw a signal from the scout in front of me, indicating that I had discovered the manor where Lord MacDonald lived. Serdak was a little confused about the thoughts of these lords. You can also get large tracts of land in the city, and it is actually not difficult to enclose the land and build a manor. Some noble lords particularly like to build their manors in remote mountains to enjoy the beautiful scenery of nature. The group of people approached the manor along the river valley. The nearby mountains were probably the land of Lord MacDonald, and no other residents were found. A group of houses are hidden in the green woods, and there are several tall towers behind the manor. The scout team found a mountain ridge opposite Lord MacDonald's manor. From here, they could overlook the manor hidden in the mountains. There was a group of guards guarding the gate of the manor. There were also some guards passing back and forth on the corridor under the manor's wall. Every gate in the manor is guarded by guards. The manor is really heavily guarded. A group of maids walk back along the stone steps from the side of the river valley, carrying baskets of clothes. It looked like they had just finished washing the clothes under the river valley. The manor in Serdak is clearly divided into two parts. There is a vestibule and a garden in the front. All the houses are connected by long corridors. There are long rows of stables built along the walls. There are many people living in the manor. Female dependents. But the living area of the female dependents seems to be very limited. And some maids can always be seen walking back and forth in the area where they can move. But the back part of the manor seemed a little weird. No one could be seen walking here. And no guard could be heard at the door. Everything seemed quiet. As if it were a completely different place from the front yard. World. There are only a few lonely towers in the yard. But the gardening is pretty good. Some plants are growing neatly and it's hard to tell what they are. They look a bit like cabbage. But Soldak doesn't think such vegetables would grow in Lord MacDonald's back garden. Having not seen Lord MacDonald's magic caravan, it is not certain whether he is hiding in the manor. Due to limited time, Great Swordsman Chester and Great Swordsman Quintus decided that the assault team could not just observe and wait here, but also find opportunities to sneak into the manor to explore the situation there. Just when everyone was wondering how to sneak into the manor, a four-wheeled carriage drove up along the mountain road in front of the manor. The driver seemed to be very familiar with this place. He could handle such a rugged mountain road. The carriage trotted along. There were some wooden boxes in the carriage. But they looked a little stained with blood. But the coachman looked in front of them indifferently. Great Swordsman Chester bumped into Great Swordsman Quintus's shoulder and signaled with his eyes to the four-wheeled carriage on the mountain road ahead. You mean to let our people borrow this truck to sneak in? Great Swordsman Quintus asked. Swordsman Chester nodded and said proactively, I'll go down there and see if there's any chance of hiding under the carriage and sneaking in. Chester, let professionals do this kind of infiltration. A second level ranger in the team smiled and said to the great swordsman Chester, I'd better go and find out. I'll go. Samira, standing behind Soldak, said proactively. The half-elf archer rarely spoke in the team, and her voice had a rustling texture. Even with just one sentence, it attracted everyone's attention. Her face was covered with a veil, and her face could not be seen. I will hide, she explained lightly, and took a step towards the dark place of the trees. Her body instantly became translucent, looming in the dark place. When she stopped moving, her body completely disappeared. Although everyone knew she was still standing there, and could still feel her, they couldn't see her. Great Swordsman Quintus glanced at Great Swordsman Chester, with a hint of joy in his eyes. Okay. Then it's up to you to investigate this manor. You only need to confirm whether Lord MacDonald is in the manor. Don't worry about anything else. Also, pay attention to safety. If you encounter danger, try to escape as much as possible. If you can't escape, you will be punished. We send signals. The great swordsman Chester warned Sammy earnestly, as if he was admonishing a newcomer. Ellis Mira didn't say anything, but nodded slightly. After the great swordsman Chester finished speaking, she passed by Suldek, turned and walked into the woods. Every time she jumped, she was like an elegant cheetah running in the woods. 
The figure is looming in the woods. Samira quickly ran down the mountain ridge and lay down in the grass on the mountain road, waiting for the four-wheel carriage to pass by on the road next to it. With a slight jump, his body turned into a gray shadow and hid under the carriage. Seeing Samira successfully boarding the four-wheel truck, a group of people on the top of the mountain breathed a sigh of relief. At this time, Gulitam, who was squatting aside, secretly pulled Soldak and whispered to him, Dak, do you smell a stink in the air here? Chapter 953 The Gate of Evil Ghosts The two first walked around the woods and found nothing suspicious. Serdak didn't smell the stench. So he asked Sia again. And Sia also said that he didn't smell any special smell. Then Soldak asked about the Great Sword of Chester. Great Swordsman Chester and Great Swordsman Quintus also said that they did not smell any strange smell. Nohar rubbed his nose with a weird look on his face. Gulitam smiled honestly and said, Maybe we have some minor problems with our noses. But it's not a big deal. At most, we can just plug our nostrils. The assault team squatted on the mountain ridge until noon. And then Samira walked out from the dark shadow of a big tree. She appeared without warning, startling everyone. Everyone admired Samira's hidden skills even more. Swordsman Chester saw Samira coming out of the shadows and quickly stepped forward and asked, How are you doing? Did you find anything? Samira reached out and took out the sketch portrait she carried with her, returned it to Great Swordsman Chester, and then said with great certainty, MacDonald was in the manor, and when I sneaked in, he was dining in the restaurant with his family. Seeing Samira returning safely from the manor, a group of second-level swordsmen gathered around. When they heard that McDonald was in the manor, everyone was in high spirits for a while. Serdak walked around Samira and found that there was nothing strange about her. So he asked, You didn't show any signs of weakness, did you? Samira rolled her eyes at him angrily and said in a low voice, No. The assault team was located on the mountain ridge opposite the manor. A stove had been set up in the forest and lunch was being prepared. Can you be sure that there are several World War II experts following him? Great swordsman Quintus pondered for a moment before asking. There are four warriors who are qualified to sit at the dining table with him. Samira replied. Great swordsman Quintus nodded and exhaled before saying. He seems to be very cautious. And several of his cronies are actually beside him. Boss, do we have to wait until night to act? A second level swordsman asked the great swordsman Quintus. Get ready. Take action before dinner. Great swordsman Quintus patted his forehead and said very decisively. Now let's study the retreat route and assign tasks later. The second level warriors we have come this time are strong enough. We can crush them. What we have to do now is to bring Lord MacDonald back to Benes City as beautifully as possible. Great swordsman Quintus is going to circle around the manor first and sneak in to find a suitable location in the manor. Samira took out a wooden stick and drew the internal road map of the manor on the sand in the forest. Swordsman Chester squatted aside and kept asking about the details of the internal road map of the manor. Samira recalled and explained. Later, Great Swordsman Chester asked the other second-level swordsmen to come over, and everyone became familiar with the internal layout of the manor. Samira spoke very patiently, finally answered the repeated questions from the Great Swordsman Chester, including various details inside the manor. Samira also answered every detail. Then she walked up to Soldak. There seemed to be something strange in her eyes. Serdak looked at her curiously. Boss, I found something in the manor. As Samira spoke, she pulled Soldak to an uninhabited corner of the forest. What's so mysterious? Serdak asked her curiously, holding the big tree trunk with one hand. Samira almost pressed her lips to Serdak's ear, and the warm breath she exhaled was lightly scented with orange. There is a demon in that manor, Samira said. Soldak's hand shook in fright, and he quickly asked seriously, Are you sure? Samira nodded with great certainty and whispered to Soldak. I saw a H. L dog in a courtyard corridor behind the manor. I didn't think much about it at the time. So I followed it to the backyard. Son, it's the courtyard with three towers over there. A magic circle was once used to maintain the barrier in the courtyard. And some nightmare vines and night charms were planted in it. I originally wanted to take a look and leave. I don't know what I was thinking at the time. Maybe it was curiosity. So I sneaked into a magic tower. After entering, I climbed up the stairs to the top platform. In the magic tower, I saw a devil's door inside. Serdak asked, Oh, are there H. L. dogs crawling out of that devil's gate all the time? Serdak shook his head with a strange expression and whispered to Serdak, It's not like that. In fact, there was no H. L. dog crawling out of the devil's gate. 
because the door of the devil's gate was still stuck at that time. A demon with half of its body exposed. Unable to come in. Unable to retreat. I even saw the long devil's horn stuck on the door frame. Huh? Serdak exclaimed in surprise. Samira asked Soldak in a low voice. Then what should we do? Soldak thought for a while, but didn't come up with any good ideas. At this time, the great swordsman Chester came over and asked Soldak casually, What are you muttering about here? Serdak approached the great swordsman of Chester and whispered. Samira said she found the demon in the flaming H, L in the manor. Great swordsman Chester was stunned for a moment, then turned to stare at Soldak. Are you serious? Serdak nodded repeatedly and said, You can be sure that there is a door of evil spirits on the top of the tall tower in the middle. The great swordsman Chester immediately said to Soldak, I will discuss it with Quintus. The two great swordsmen stood together to discuss for a long time, and there seemed to be some disputes in the middle. However, at the end, it seemed that the great swordsman Chester argued hard, and the argument gained the upper hand. Then the great swordsman Chester ran back calmly and said in a very low voice, For the time being, we will proceed with the original plan to capture Lord Macdonald. Cleaning up those demons is unplanned. We must maintain with enough combat power. We must ensure that we can return to Bena City safely. After the great swordsman Chester and Soldak said this, they immediately called together all the members of the assault team. The great swordsman Quintus had a gloomy face and whispered to everyone, Because the situation has changed this time. We must complete this operation quickly. Now I will assign combat tasks. Okay. Get ready for action. After saying that, he clapped his hands gently to cheer everyone up. The second level warriors in the assault team were also veterans who had experienced hundreds of battles. They immediately began to act according to the tasks assigned by the great swordsman Quintus. The team quickly dispersed into the mountain forest and approached the manor in the mountains opposite. In the blink of an eye, Gulitum followed the first assault team and rushed directly towards the iron gate of the manor. Chapter 954 The Battle in the Manor Ogres can be regarded as the most outstanding infantry soldiers in the Roland continent. Adult ogre warriors are about one meter taller than barbarians. Their reputation in the Roland continent is as famous as the wolf riders of the orc tribe. However, the relationship between the ogres and humans is not very good. The biggest problem is that they sometimes regard humans as food. For this reason alone, ogres can never be friends with humans. But Gulitum is a unique ogre. In addition to not liking to eat people, he also likes to reason with people. Like all ogres, he likes food and is also good at learning. There is almost no wild smell in him that makes people panic. While running, he held a huge wooden stick as big as a small tree in one hand and a burning fireball in the other hand. The rough armor pieces were connected together with chains and hanging on the outside of these armor pieces. With a thick layer of ice armor, one step can cover seven or eight meters. Even the great swordsman Quintus, who was charging forward side by side with him, would have to spend some effort to keep up with him. Those two elephant legs were simply thick and long. Gulitum and the great swordsman Quintus rushed along the mountain road directly to the gate of the manor. The great swordsman Quintus was holding two extremely long giant swords. The shadow of an ancient Viking god of war appeared behind him. He rose into the air more than 30 meters away from the big iron gate and raised the giant sword above his head. The shadow of the Viking god of war solidified instantly and let out a majestic roar in front of him. The sound wave almost covered all the soldiers who stormed the gate of the manor, and each warrior's body was stimulated by this loud roar, and his blood boiled. The two-headed ogre Gulitum also roared at this time, and the next second the entire earth became solid and thick. Such is the power of the battle cry. The great swordsman Quintus fell from the sky, and with a row of dense crisp sounds, he split the large iron door into three pieces. The six guards at the door saw Quintus and Gulitum suddenly appearing in front of them. They had no time to respond, and they broke through the large iron gate of the manor. The guards rushed out of the concierge with weapons in hand. When they saw the indomitable Quintus swordsman and the two-headed ogre, they did not dare to step forward and hurriedly sounded the alarm bell at the door. Dang, 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 dang. The sound spread far away from the gate of the manor, and the patrol guards around the manor gathered towards the gate. Seeing the two figures running out of the gate of the manor castle quickly, the six guards finally regained their courage and chased after the great swordsman Quintus. The five second level swordsmen following the great swordsman Quintus drew their swords almost at the same time. The sword light flashed in front of the guard like a swordsman. Before they could even block it, the sword light had already cut through the metal armor. Several guards had several wounds as deep as the bones. 
blood spurted out from the wounds, and the armor became extremely heavy on their bodies. Amidst a suffocating sense of oppression, the guard's eyes showed the kind of panic before death. The six guards fell in a pool of blood. Their hands and feet were still twitching, and their bodies were already starting to get cold. Nearly a hundred guards rushed out from the manor. They held up heavy shields and blocked Quintus and Gulitum. When the great swordsman Quintus took a step forward, they took a step back with their giant shields. Several of the guards were wearing very conspicuous magic pattern structures. They rushed out of the crowd with long swords in hand, preparing to force the great swordsman Quintus out of the manor. Every time Quintus' great swordsman took a step forward, the surrounding ground trembled. The heavy footsteps, the cold and bloodthirsty eyes, and the oppressive feeling brought by the momentum made the guards on the opposite side breathless. Several constructed swordsmen didn't want to retreat any further. If they retreated any further, they would lose all courage to fight. At this moment, the guards behind suddenly gave way to both sides, and two constructed swordsmen came up from behind with solemn expressions. They were exquisite magic pattern structures, and their aura was similar to that of ordinary constructed swordsmen. There was a big difference. Gulitum could smell a different smell from them. The two swordsmen had an unnatural expression on their faces when they saw Quintus. Quintus, I didn't expect you to come here in person, one of the swordsmen said. The great swordsman Quintus took a big step, and without even saying a word, he swung his sword directly towards the swordsman. The two second-level swordsmen placed their long swords on Quintus's swords and then blocked the offensive of the great swordsman Quintus. The ogres and other swordsmen also came to kill, and one of the constructed swordsmen quickly shouted, Top shield. All the guards standing in the front row raised their shields in unison at the same time. Archers at the ready. The constructed swordsmen continued to shout. The sound of bowstrings being pulled came out, from several commanding heights in the manor. A group of archers poked their heads out. They all held longbows in their hands, and all the bowstrings were drawn. Great swordsman Quintus. I know your bravery. But this is Gonbu. You can leave before it's too late. The constructed swordsman's voice first dropped and then rose. And he backed away from the great swordsman Quintus. He ordered to a group of subordinates. Come on! A row of shield-wielding guards surrounded the great swordsman Quintus and the ogre. Arrows seemed to be falling from the top of their heads. And the surrounding guards also swung their swords at the second-level swordsman. The seven-member team of Quintus' great swordsmen continued to charge forward along the front of the manor amid the rain of arrows. Facing these ordinary warriors, the second-level warriors have an overwhelming advantage. Especially the weapons in his hands were all excellent magic weapons. When the swords collided, the ordinary weapons were cut into pieces. The splashing blood was so bright and dazzling on such a sunless afternoon. There were many people pouring out of the manor. They seemed to think that there were only seven people on the Quintus' great swordsman's side and they could completely swamp them with casual human sea tactics. Arrows flew from all directions, and the swordsmen did not even need to deliberately block them. The magic pattern structures on their bodies blocked these arrows with a faint halo. The great swordsman Quintus opened the tower shield in front of him and chased behind the second-level swordsman on the opposite side. The weapons in their hands collided, and countless sparks burst out. The two second-level swordsmen on the other side were no match for Quintus and Gulitum. Every time their weapons collided, they had to take a step or two back. In this kind of strength competition, the two-headed ogre was never afraid of anyone. Great swordsman Quintus is also a swordsman who focuses on strength. With his arms rounded, he chases the second-level swordsman opposite him in the crowd, from the gate of the manor all the way to the front yard. The corpses of the manor guards were all along the way. Serdak followed the second squad of Chester great swordsmen. Under the leadership of Samira, the second team walked around from the side door of the manor to Lord Macdonald's residence. Several swordsmen jumped up the high wall nimbly. When the great swordsman of Chester climbed over the high wall, his body showed excellent balance. Serdak seemed a bit clumsy in this aspect. He even had to take a run-up and stepped on the wall with two feet as a point of support to continue upward. Then he hooked one hand on the edge of the wall and grabbed it with both hands. He stayed on the edge of the wall and lifted his body up with his own strength. Then he hung it on the wall again, stretched out his hand, and pulled Sia up in the corner. Sia seems to have adapted to these two legs recently. Not only is she full of energy when running and jumping, but she has also mastered the unique rhythm of running, making her running and jumping appear extremely nimble. But it would be a bit difficult for her to climb over the wall. The members of the team were all level 2 experts. When everyone saw that Serdak had successfully brought Sia in, they all jumped into the yard. This is the east side of the manor. There is a row of stables built near the wall. 
Samira walked along the stables and through the side door of the corridor, leading everyone into a garden-like courtyard. The swordsman suddenly broke in, causing the female relatives in the courtyard to run away in fear. Samira ran at the front and grabbed a woman who looked like a housekeeper. Without saying anything, she nailed her hand to the pillar. Red blood seeped out from the palm of her hand, accompanied by the housekeeper's heart-rending howl. Shut up! Where is McDonald? Samira asked quickly. The housekeeper didn't have the courage to refuse at this time. She glanced towards the left side of the garden corridor. Samira left her where she was, like a flexible raccoon cat. She scurried up to the roof and looked in that direction. In a straight corridor, a group of guards were protecting Lord McDonnell and quickly retreated towards the backyard. Samira lay on the roof and pointed in that direction. Swordsman Chester immediately waved his hand and led everyone to catch up to the backyard. Chapter 955 Battle in the Manor 2 Samira stood on the ridge of the long corridor. She took out a feather arrow and put it on the sky's strike bow and instantly opened the sharp bow. Electric elements condensed in her palm and wind elements continued to pour into the arrow. The moment the arrow left the string, it was like a bolt of lightning flashing through the air. In the crackling sound, the arrow light passed through a distance of more than a hundred meters, and the arrow penetrated the neck of a manor guard who was running hard. The sharp arrow tip emerged from the other side of the neck, hidden in the arrow. The powerful electric element in it triggered a thunder in the sky. The guard's whole body exploded in the arc of electricity right in front of the gate of the manor's backyard. Lord MacDonald was protected behind him by two of his close men. One of his men helped him block the overflowing arcs of electricity, while the other man pulled him into the backyard. The moment the backyard gate was opened by those people, agile and flexible figures rushed out from the gate. They turned out to be H. L. dogs one after another. Some fat H. L. dogs actually had two heads on their heads. The eyes of these vicious H. L. dogs are blood red, and the corners of their mouths are flowing with flaming saliva. Each one is as big as a calf, and their skin is covered with hot lava. If Serdak had never been to the Maka Plain and experienced the siege of the H. L. dogs, he might have been scared when he saw these vicious dogs. But he and Samira both had the experience of half month siege in Wazamala City. How could they be afraid when they saw the H. L. dogs coming out of the back door? Great swordsman Chester and his companions had also experienced that. Times of battle. Samira stood on the roof, and the shadow of a great elf in leather armor actually appeared behind her. The great elf assumed the same posture as her giving her the power of precision and rapid fire. Arrow shot from her if you shoot it from your hand. It will be a double shot. Although the first arrow did not condense thunder, each arrow contained arcs and wind power, accurately nailing the H, L dogs to the stone floor. The great swordsman Chester dragged a shadow and rushed into the crowd first. The ancient long sword in his hand mysteriously protruded from his cuffs. At the moment when a manor guard raised his shield to greet him, the tip of the sword was like it was a snake letter that clicked on his forehead and the guard fell back to the ground in response. It's Chester! Come back quickly! Someone among the manor guards knew the great swordsman Chester and shouted in horror. A second-level swordsman came over from the opposite side, holding a cross saber in his hand. The saber was completely black and had a certain curvature. When he held it in his hand, a trace of darkness continued to condense, and the sword light spilled down. The black magic ball sprayed out from the tip of the long sword and shot towards the great swordsman Chester. The sword in the hand of the great swordsman Chester accurately struck the black ball. The ball exploded into a ball of black flames, but was blocked by the body-protecting chi of the great swordsman Chester. The second-level swordsman grinned, revealing a cruel smile, and the black saber in his hand was about to stab him again. Several second-level swordsmen around the great swordsman Chester all activated their respective shures. Their strength suddenly increased a lot, and the long swords in their hands all threw out streaks of sword light. Immediately. The second-level swordsman, with the black saber in his hand, was forced back, leaving him no room to parry. Serdak followed behind, protecting Thea who looked frightened, before he even had time to form the Holy Seal. The guards on the other side have been completely killed by the second-level experts here. The remaining two second-level swordsmen are also injured, and the magic pattern structure has also been cut open several times by the sword energy, and they are dragging it around in embarrassment. Lord MacDonald slipped into the backyard. Countless H. L. dogs sprang out from rooftops, courtyards, tree walls, and pools. But for the second level powerhouses, these calf sized H. L. dogs were almost no threat and could only temporarily slow everyone down. Seeing that these second level swordsmen like to split the heads of H. 
L dogs with precision and easily take away the magic core in the skull. Serdek chased after them, wanting to tell them that the best way to do this is to chop off the heads of H, L dogs. Best deal. A group of black robed magicians rushed out from the backyard to protect the fleeing Lord MacDonald. These black robed magicians all held staffs in their hands, and black flame balls shot out from their hands. Several second level swordsmen were forced to stop. Only then did Serdak have the opportunity to stand up. He single handedly holding an exquisite Gerda shield in his hand, with the rune words of ancient oath condensed on his chest. A shadow of a shield appeared in front of him, blocking the three black flame balls flying from the front. Thea simply hid behind Serdak at this moment, with a light blue magic pattern formation emerging under her feet. As bubbles continued to surge around her, countless waves of waves rose up from the formation, forming a surging wave in an instant. The huge wave lifted up several swordsmen and Serdak at the same time and chased Lord MacDonald. The second-level swordsmen who originally didn't think highly of Shia started shouting, Woo woo, one after another. They were pushed away by the wave and suddenly approached the group of black robe magicians. For this group of magicians, the warriors they least want to face, apart from sharpshooters, are agile swordsmen. Once the swordsman gets close, he will be entangled to death. In this battle, in addition to the second turn swordsman, they also encountered Samira, who could shoot double arrows. At this time, the magic crystal in the gem groove of the sky strike bow in Samira's hand shattered again, and an arrow containing powerful lightning power was shot out. The arrow flying in the air seemed to be countless electric snakes entwined together. A black-robed magician was shot. Even if the magician raised a magic shield at the moment of being hit by the arrow, that magic shield was instantly defeated by countless moving arcs. A bolt of lightning fell from the sky, instantly chopping the black-robed magician into pieces. A second-level great swordsman turned his head and glanced at Samira, who was standing on the roof, secretly glad that he was her teammate. These second-level swordsmen were very skilled and broke into the backyard gate and entangled several black-robed magicians. However, some vicious H, L dogs emerged from the black-robed magicians, and the magicians had pale yellow and transparent eggs on their bodies. Shield. They no longer throw black flame balls outward in their hands. After the black flame spread to the whole body, the magicians condensed shadow whips in their hands. These whips were like spiritual snakes, wrapping around themselves. Turn to the second swordsman. Another H, L dog pounced on them. And a fierce battle broke out. All the second level swordsmen released their power. And almost all the long swords in their hands were making the most effective and concise movements. Striving to deal with these H, L dogs and black mages as quickly as possible. At this time, Serdak followed everyone into the backyard and found that just as Samira said, the flower beds in the yard were covered with some H, L vegetation and those black cabbage-like things had big mouths on them. It looks a bit scary. There were actually servants in the garden carrying bloody wooden buckets, scooping out some severed limbs and stumps with wooden spoons from the stinky buckets, and watering them on the flowers of these H, L plants. Several servants were also frightened by the sudden battle. The bloody spoon in his hand fell to the ground. Some people even accidentally had their arms bitten off by these H, Lish plants. Samira, who was on the roof of the corridor, had already chased after him guarding behind Serdek. At this time, great swordsman Chester chased Lord MacDonald and put the sword in his hand on Lord MacDonald's neck. The two swordsmen following behind him forced the two second-level swordsmen beside Lord MacDonald. Retreat. Serdek rushed over with a shield. And all the black-robed magicians rode their magic harpoons back to the magic tower in the backyard. There were still some H. L dogs that kept coming out of the yard. At this time, the spears of the three magic towers in the yard began to light up and bunches of magic kept gathering together. The great swordsman Chester used the hilt of his sword to kill MacDonald. The lord was knocked unconscious, carried on his shoulders, and shouted to the second-level swordsman beside him. The magic tower defense device is activated. Let's go! After saying that, he ran outside first. The other second-level swordsman followed behind the great swordsman Chester. Thea! Another magic, Serdak shouted to the Janna mermaid beside him. Sia once again condensed the magic pattern formation. And two seconds later, a huge wave surged out from under everyone's feet, carrying everyone towards the backyard wall. The magic power condensed in those magic towers was enough. It was as if a magician was operating at the top of the tower. A thick black light representing death chased everyone. Where the light hit, a black flame burned on the ground. The stone floor was also burned to create a deep groove. Among the servants who were carrying wooden buckets to water the magic plants in the flower beds. Some were unlucky, 
and were cut in half by the black light. Before the ray could catch up, Serdak and Samira managed to climb over the courtyard wall. The great swordsman of Chester blew the whistle for retreat. Chapter 956 Confession in the Forest Swordsman Chester carried Lord Macdonald and led everyone towards the front yard of the manor where Swordsman Quintus was. Hundreds of manor guards gathered from all directions, and the archers who fell behind fired a shower of arrows. However, only some officers among these guards were first-level construct knights. When facing the second-level assault team, they were strong. There is no way to hold them back. A group of guards almost all ran wildly behind the assault team. Those in front could not stop them, and those behind them could not catch up. Several second-level warriors surrounded the great swordsman of Chester, protecting the great swordsman of Chester as he rushed forward. The black-robed magicians who were forced back into the magic tower began to retreat when they saw the assault team grabbing Lord Macdonald and ran out of the magic tower one after another. This time they knew the strength of the assault team, and they were much more cautious when they chased them out. Each black magician was riding a magic harpoon, and they were throwing black flame balls at the great swordsman Chester in the air. They were a little afraid of Samira and did not dare to get too close. These black flame balls frequently detonated in midair, more like fireworks to see off the assault team. However, these black magicians did not give up rescuing Lord Macdonald. They frequently used magic to slow down the assault team. Hundreds of manor guards were chasing after him from all sides like crazy. More than a dozen black magicians were floating in midair on magic harpoons. The three leading black magicians recited long spells. And the magic pattern array that appeared under their feet seemed particularly huge. Then, Serdak felt that the entire earth was shaking continuously. Cracks suddenly appeared on the stone road in front. And some hot magma spewed out from the cracks in the ground. Great swordsman Chester avoided the gushing lava very nimbly. And the second level swordsmen around him also quickly dispersed. Serdak had to take care of Sia, who was not running too fast, and seemed a little embarrassed. The gothic shield played a big role. Samira stared at the light red eyes, quickly jumped onto the roof of a corridor again, and shot an arrow at the magician who released the hellfire. The black magician was already prepared and raised his hand to hold up a magic shield. The arrow hit the magic shield and shattered it in an instant. The arrow hit the black magician's chest with the remaining force. I don't know what the material of his magic robe is. Black magic the master retreated a few meters in the air, riding on the magic handle to regain his balance. Serdak saw that the manor guards had surrounded him, and he was worried that Samira would be trapped in a tight siege, so he hurriedly waved to her to run away. Samira turned her head and glanced at the black magicians in the sky, then quickly jumped off the roof and chased after Soldak. The great swordsman Quintus came over with the first team, and the two teams of second-level swordsmen met at the fountain in the front yard of the manor with Quintus and Gulitum clearing the way in front. The manor guards blocking the front had no enemy at all. A group of people fought their way out from the main entrance of the manor. The two giant swords of Quintus' great swordsmen were stained with blood, and the blood dyed his hands and arms red. However, he could still maintain his sanity at this time. After leaving the manor with the assault team, he quickly got in in the mountains and forests. Avoid the black magicians chasing in the sky. A series of horns sounded in the manor, and signal flares shot into the sky, apparently summoning the nearby garrison. However, the assault team did not walk along the main road. After getting into the dense forest, they specifically found some places with lush trees. When the sky gradually darkened, the black magicians, who had been holding on behind had to return the same way. Samira climbed to the top of the tree several times and found that there were no black magicians in the sky, and the manor guards were also far away from the group of people. The assault team relaxed a little. Serdak followed a group of people over a mountain ridge and stopped in a forest clearing on the north slope of the mountain ridge. The canopies of the trees here were almost continuous, completely blocking the starry sky. Great Swordsman Chester and Great Swordsman Quintus stopped in unison. The two second-level rangers and the assault team immediately began to investigate the surrounding situation. Samira also nodded to Soldak and jumped to check out the surroundings from the tree canopy. Rest where you are for a while. Set up a tent. And after dinner, we will set off again. After the great swordsman Chester finished speaking, he placed Lord Macdonald on his shoulders next to a big tree and squatted next to him to check his condition. Lord Macdonald closed his eyes tightly and was still unconscious. In addition to his face looking a little pale, there was a trace of blood flowing from the corner of his mouth. It seemed that the journey was bumpy. Although he was in a coma, he still suffered a lot. The other second rank swordsman began to build a simple tent in a hurry. Of course, this tent was not used for resting. 
but to cover the fire when lighting fires and boiling water. Zerdak sat down with Sia beside him. The mermaid lady took off the water bag from her waist, pulled out the cork of the water bag, and poured a stream of water over her head. The clear water quickly wetted her long hair, and she recovered a little from her slightly sluggish state. Then she sat next to the big tree nearby, her big sea blue eyes flashing with a different kind of emotion. Light. After this operation is over, I will buy you an airship ticket at the Benes City Airport Terminal. Don't worry about any trouble on the way. I will have someone take you back to the sea safely. Soldak sat down next to him, whispered. Miss Mermaid's eyes fell on the dark mountains in the distance, and bright golden light bands lit up in the dark red night sky, against the backdrop of these bands of light. The stars are eclipsed. She twisted her wet long hair, and her robe clung to her body wetly, outlining her youthful curves. The night wind took away the last bit of heat, and the surroundings were filled with the sound of cicadas chirping. Sia took a deep breath, folded her legs with her hands, and sat on the root of the tree. She seemed a little excited and whispered to Soldek. Actually, this kind of mission is quite exciting, except for the inconvenience when moving. The rest is pretty good. I quite like this kind of adventurous life. Oh? Uh? Soldak was a little surprised. Thea turned to look at Serdak and said in a smaller voice, If you feel that I am not holding back when fighting, I can consider staying. Forget it. Do you know where I live? In the deserted land of Halanza City. There is water shortage all year round. Serdak laughed and refused. I thought to myself, no matter what, you can't cause trouble for yourself. Seeing Soldak's refusal, Sia said nothing. The ogre panted and sat down against a big tree trunk. When he heard Soldak talking about the desolate land, he began to complain to Sia that in the desolate land, apart from sea buckthorn grass and thirsty grass, there were only some limestone iguanas hiding in cracks in the ground. Soft volcanic ash everywhere. Serdak was not idle at this time. There was only one second-level swordsman in the team who was slightly injured. So he ran over to help with treatment. Thea blinked, looked down at the fine scale marks appearing on her arms and pouted. My body hadn't touched much water all day, and it felt like a dry, crack tingling sensation. Let Sia not want to move. Over there, two swordsmen set up a tent, lit a bonfire, and began to boil water in the iron pot they set up. The scones and marching rashes were placed next to them, waiting for the water to boil. After the water boiled, they poured the dry food into it, and boiled it into a pot. Gooey, the great swordsman Chester, and the great swordsman Quintus were guarding Lord MacDonald. The two exchanged the information found in the manor in a low voice. The great swordsman Quintus's face became more and more solemn. And finally the two they all fell silent, waiting for Lord MacDonald to wake up. Although Lord MacDonald was captured, the atmosphere in the assault team was still a bit dull. This was mainly due to the fact that the two captains in the team had obvious differences about the next step of the assault team. But they could not convince each other. It made the air in the forest glade seem to freeze. Swordsman Chester's current idea is to bring Lord MacDonald back to Benes City as soon as possible. He wants to join up with other assault teams and return to Benes City first to discuss other matters. Tomorrow we will return to Benes City. Lord MacDonald will be sent to Benes City. This is very important. Now there are many local lords in the Benes province who are ready to take action. With Lord MacDonald as a role model, it is estimated that many lords are praying for such freedom. Only by escorting him to the tribunal of the House of Representatives can the restlessness in the hearts of other lords be suppressed. Great Swordsman Chester said to Great Swordsman Quintus. Then he added, This is also our first task to gather so many second-level swordsmen and sneak into the Ganmu Plain. Great Swordsman Quintus shook his head and said, I'm not saying that Lord MacDonald's mission is not important. I just want to use the remaining time to fight back to the magic tower behind the manor. He stared into the eyes of the Great Swordsman Chester and said with great seriousness. Someone told me that it is a land of demons. You know what this means. If we don't do anything to deal with it, it is very likely to become a land of demons. And once they successfully open the transmission channel to H, L, the consequences will be that's unimaginable. Once connected to the forces of the abyss, a brand new dimensional war will break out, and this land will become a battlefield. Then, the great swordsman Quintus lowered his voice, and said to the great swordsman Chester, some people saw a blood pool behind the tower, and a group of servants were watering the demonic plants with flesh and blood. Others said that there is a demonic gate in the magic tower. Isn't this worth turning back and dealing with it? I'm not saying it's not worth it. I just hope the time can be postponed a little bit. 
I think the Black Magic Hermitage has played a big trick this time. In the name of Lord MacDonald. They have firmly controlled the Gonbu Plain. I don't know the aristocratic society of the Gonbu Plain. How rotten it is. But it's clearly worth investigating further now. Great Swordsman Chester's ears twitched slightly. Turned to look at Lord MacDonald. And said to Great Swordsman Quintus. You can ask him some things when he wakes up. Great Swordsman Quintus was not so good-tempered when facing Lord MacDonald. He leaned over and reached out to grab Lord MacDonald by his collar. And lifted him up. Lord MacDonald closed his eyes tightly and remained silent. His violent breathing could no longer be concealed. Especially when the Great Swordsman Quintus pinched his neck. Lord MacDonald began to cough violently. Quintus the Great Swordsman threw him back under the tree. This Count Serdak, Great Swordsman Quintus shouted Serdak's name. Serdak quickly stood out from the crowd walked up quickly, and said, Great Swordsman Quintus, you called me? Help our Lord heal. Great Swordsman Quintus pointed at Lord MacDonald and said, Soldak saw that Lord MacDonald had no injuries, but he still followed the instructions of the Great Swordsman Quintus and cast a holy light spell on Lord MacDonald. The holy light fell on Lord MacDonald to make him feel better. Before Lord MacDonald could take a breath, he felt a big hand on his knee. The Great Swordsman Quintus pointed it as a knife and slashed Lord MacDonald on the tibia without even saying H, low. The two lower leg bones broke in response, making a clear cracking sound in the night. Lord MacDonald let out a scream, but another swordsman covered his mouth in advance, and he could only let out a miserable whimper. This Count Serdak, please help our Lord heal. The most important thing is not to let him die in my hands, Great Swordsman Quintus said, and reached out to hold the knee of Lord MacDonald's other leg. Lord MacDonald sent out a signal to beg for mercy. Great Swordsman Quintus frowned slightly, spat to the side, and then mocked. Why doesn't a lord have such a little patience? Tell me, how did you collude with the Black Magic Hermitage King? Don't make up lies. You may not know that I have no patience at all. If I find you lying, I will kill your bones. Knocking them off one by one will ensure that you won't die. The Great Swordsman Quintus said fiercely, with the scars on his face and the muscles on his body. He really looked ferocious. The swordsman released Lord MacDonald's mouth, and Lord MacDonald let out a low moan that could not be suppressed. Serdak straightened his broken leg and used the holy light spell again to speed up the healing of his wounds. Okay, just make sure he doesn't die. Great swordsman Quintus put his arm around Soldak's shoulders and said to him affectionately, Lord MacDonald recovered a little at this time and lay on his back on the forest floor. Great swordsman Quintus squatted beside him, reached out and patted his pale cheek, urging, speak quickly. Don't challenge me. Patience. I don't know what you're going to say. Lord MacDonald gritted his teeth, wiped the blood from the corner of his mouth, and said weakly, Chapter 957 The Night Watchman in the Town. The manor of Lord MacDonald was in chaos. The guards of the manor kept running back to the manor like a group of headless flies, and then entered the mountains from the manor to search for the whereabouts of the Lord. Two cavalry battalions of 500 men and an infantry battalion of 1,500 men arrived outside the manor when it was just dark and began to search the forest. The black magicians also flew in the night sky on magic harpoons. They kept firing low-light flares into the sky to provide as much illumination to the ground troops as possible. But the assault team had already taken Lord MacDonald along the river path and bypassed the mountain forest, approaching the small town from whence they came. The Great Swordsman Chester and the Great Swordsman Quintus argued. In the end, Quintus decided to respect Chester's opinion. After all, his plan was more secure. Moreover, Lord MacDonald was more difficult to deal with than expected. Both his legs and arms were cut off by the Great Swordsman Quintus. And even the chain bones were cut off. However, Lord MacDonald had a few useful messages. None of it was revealed. Great Swordsman Quintus felt that he needed someone specializing in torture from the Benna City Intelligence Office to interrogate Lord MacDonald, who might be able to get some useful information. So after dinner, the assault team only rested for a short hour, then immediately dismantled the temporary tent and left the forest area overnight. After hearing the news from Makuso City, 2,500 soldiers from the 9th Battalion and Infantry Battalion came to conduct a carpet search when they were searching in the mountains. The assault team had already walked out of the mountains and divided into four groups to disperse into the suburbs. In a small town, it's okay for Serdak to take Samira and Sia, but the target of the two-headed ogre is too eye-catching. Therefore, the four of them could not stay in the hotel as an adventure group, so they had to find a house in the town that seemed to be relatively secluded. 
It is a coincidence that there is only one night watchman who lives alone in this house. When Serdak and Gulitam entered the yard, the night watchman had already put on his coat, holding a lantern in his hand, and was about to open the door and go to the street to start his night work. When he saw clearly that there was a two-headed ogre standing in front of him, he was so frightened that he rushed over. Of course, Soldak would not let him be unconscious for too long. When the night watchman woke up from the coma, he suddenly had a runny nose. Tears and all. The living room seemed very small. Soldak knocked a tea set on the wooden table to the ground and smashed it to pieces. Then a dagger and a gold coin were placed on the table in front of the owner of the house. And he was asked to do a seemingly simple multiple choice question. The owner of this room hardly hesitated. He picked up the gold coin very wisely, stuffed the gold coin into his mouth, bit it hard, and then quickly put the gold coin into the pocket next to his crotch. Are you the rebels from the forest farm downstream? The night watchman guessed. Serdak sat across from him noncommittally, staring at the night watchman. The night watchman gritted his teeth, rolled up a blanket and a leather mattress, got into the storage room, and covered the entrance to the storage room again. According to the agreement made with Serdak, Serdak's team will leave here tomorrow morning, and the night watch will be free, although he is likely to lose his job as the town's night watchman. With this gold coin, he can probably live comfortably for more than half a year without having to work during this period. Although the house is smaller, all facilities are quite complete. When Soldak decided to stay here for one night, Sia had already gotten into the simple bathroom and started to replenish herself with water. Samira took the initiative to walk up to the roof. There was no attic in this house. So she lay half on the rubble. Fortunately, it happened to be summer in the dry cloth plain. As long as a leather mattress was spread under her, it was quite comfortable for the night to lie on the roof. Of, Gulitam was sitting on the carpet in the living room. He needed a good meal to replenish his strength. Serdak looked at the dilapidated house. There was almost nothing in the house except a sofa, a fireplace, and a blackened iron pot. However, Serdak was not short of supplies. He dug out some scones and two boxes of canned luncheon meat from his magic backpack, took out his iron pot, boiled a pot of water in the fireplace, and cooked a meal for the ogre. Night snack. We only need to wait here until dawn and then meet up with the great swordsman Chester and the others. And then we can leave the Gombu Plain. Serdak took a bite of the wheat cake and said to the ogre enthusiastically, What about the devil's gate and the magic tower over at the manor? The ogre asked seriously, It is estimated that we will have to wait until we return to Benna City and the House of Representatives will make a resolution. Soldak said. At night, Serdak was lying on the sofa in the living room. Gulitam was lying on the carpet and snoring loudly. He hardly slept. When he closed his eyes, he could think of those black cabbages with their claws and claws. Every one of them appeared in his mind. The cabbage was covered in blood, and the plate's mouth kept opening and closing. Breakfast is the leftover pancake porridge mixed with luncheon meat from last night. Then I opened the underground storage room and saw the night watchman lying on a wolfskin mattress, still sleeping soundly, probably feeling the light from the storage room. The night watchman opened his eyes dimly, got up from the floor in the storage room, squinted at Serdak at the door of the storage room, and asked Serdak again. Road, are you the rebels from the forest farm? Serdak thought for a while, smiled and said to the night watchman, So be it. Then wait. I can't accept this gold coin. I heard that your funds are very tight. Unfortunately, I don't have much money, and I am very afraid of death. I can't help you, and I don't want to join you. The night watchman sat at the door of the storage room and talked a lot. Finally. He wanted to return the gold coin to Serdak, which surprised Serdak. Are you also opposed to Lord MacDonald's rule? Soldak asked. What's the use of objecting? They have already dismantled the portal and completely disconnected from the Bena province. The night watchman sighed and then said, In order to support this battle, everyone has taken everything of value. Out. Serdak didn't want to talk to the night watchman about this. So he stood at the door of the storage room and said, After we leave, You'd better stay at home until night before going out. He took two steps forward, then turned back. The night watchman looked at Soldak nervously. Serdak took out another gold coin from his pocket, threw it to the ragged night watchman, and said, I broke your tea set last night, and this is my compensation for you. After saying that, he led over, Samira and Sia out of this remote courtyard. Keep an eye on him. If he runs out to report the news, shoot him to death. Serdak whispered to Samira beside him. Chapter 958 The Devil Stuck in the Door Lord MacDonald Manor 
The corpses in the yard have been cleaned up by the guards. But before the large iron gate at the entrance of the yard can be repaired, all the manor guards have been escorted to the Makusuo City Military Headquarters. There was no way to wash away the blood stains on the stone pavement, so we could only temporarily lay a layer of sand on top. The 5th and 7th Cavalry Battalions of the McDonnell Regiment are now responsible for the defense of McDonnell Manor, the person in charge of the internal and external affairs of the family, and the manor has also been replaced by Viscount Markham Donnell, the fourth son of Lord McDonnell. This young Viscount holds half of the military power of the Donnell family, after Lord McDonnell was kidnapped. Although Markham was not the first heir to the Donnell family, he had more say than anyone else. A group of Lord McDonnell's wives were restless. Everyone was waiting in the inner courtyard in panic. They had even packed away their gold and silver jewelry. The maids were sent to the front yard of the manor to inquire about the situation. They all seemed to want to leave. Who would have thought that this manor would fall apart so quickly after Lord MacDonald was hijacked? The front yard and the backyard of the manor are like two completely different worlds that do not interfere with each other. On weekdays, the servants in the manor regard the area as a restricted area. Someone once accidentally walked into the backyard and never came out again. Later I heard that he was bitten to death by a group of vicious dogs, and his body could not be brought back. During yesterday's battle, so many hideous-looking vicious dogs rushed out of the backyard, and no one dared to approach the backyard. In fact, everyone in the manor knew that Lord MacDonald kept a group of magicians in his backyard. These people basically never went out. They locked themselves in the tower all day long to do research. Lord MacDonald only occasionally went to the backyard when he encountered something difficult to decide. Then he will do some incredible things. For example, an additional war tax was levied on the people of the Ganbu Plain, which caused many bankrupts to appear in the originally prosperous Ganbu Plain. For example, the independence of the Terra Pagan region was declared to the Bina province. And then the largest civil war in the Bina province in recent decades broke out. The southern part of the Terra Pagan instantly turned into a battlefield and countless farmland and orchards were involved in this war, was completely destroyed. Another example is to declare to everyone that homeless poor people and vagrants are guilty. Send security teams to arrest them everywhere, and imprison them in a concentration camp. That concentration camp is so weird that no one can leave once they enter it. Come out. Some people say that the big man living in the backyard is the real master of the Gonbu Plain. Grover. Lukash looked a little anxious. He was walking around in the magic tower wearing a Missouri magic robe. The old face is covered with wrinkles of time. He was holding a magic wand in his hand. And his figure was a little hunched. He looked uneasily at a devil's door in the center of the platform on the top of the magic tower. This two-meter-high devil's gate stands alone in the room. The entire portal is like a huge flat-mouthed wine bottle. The raised part on it is a devil statue. The dark color has no aesthetic appeal. In the middle of the devil's gate, where the mirror should have been, a demon with two antlers protruded from it. This demon was stuck in the teleportation door, with tiredness and irritability written all over its face. He has two black and white eyes, which are following the magician Lakash around. The wooden floor in the room is covered with dozens of metal plates with magic runes. The magic pattern array formed on the metal plates is constantly gathering magic power from all around. This magic power is continuously fed to the devil's gate, allowing it to continue to maintain. Go down. Grover. Lukash is the regional director of the Terra Pagan region of the Bina province of the Black Magic Monastery. And it was his decision to declare the independence of the Ganbu Plain. Perhaps because he was tired. His pace became slower and slower. The demon stuck in the devil's gate blinked and said angrily, Lukash, your body has been trembling nonstop. Are you scared? Lukash turned around and looked at the demon stuck in the demon's gate. He was not very afraid of it. It is now stuck in the devil's gate. With its head, right shoulder, and right arm exposed from the devil's gate, looking a little embarrassed. But now it can't go back and can only be stuck on the devil's gate. I have been thinking about the solution these days. Magician Lakash's voice was a little low. He had summoned this demonic gate and it had been maintained for almost more than a month. Unfortunately, the demon's condition was getting worse and worse. The magic pool is almost exhausted. Yesterday, he saw a team composed of second-level swordsmen and he became even more worried. He said to the devil stuck in the devil's door, I said they will come over. That McDonald is not reliable at all. Even if they destroy the portal, they will still be able to come over. Now this time, all the people coming here are the second level powerhouses. They must have discovered us. And then the magicians from the law enforcement team will chase them. And we must get out of here. 
The demon rolled his eyes filled with deathly aura and asked magician look as coldly. I asked you to send people to follow them. How did you do this? It was so dark. And there was a very powerful archer in their team. Our people didn't dare to get too close. Magician Lucas defended his magicians when he remembered the battle yesterday. The devil said with disdain. Does that mean we've lost track of them? Magician Lakesh nodded and said. That dense forest is really difficult to track. And none of your age, L dogs have been able to come back. He casually asked again. What do you think will happen if I lift this devil's door now? The demon's voice was as cold as ice. The space rift will cut my body in half. I suggest you give up this idea. The wrinkles on Magician Lakash's face were squeezed together, and he said, But we can't just sit here and waste our time. The demon asked anxiously, Lucas, hasn't your power improved? Magician Lucas raised his eyebrows, spread his hands and said, But you also saw that this demon gate has not changed at all. The demon rolled his eyes and said, Maybe they just came to capture Lord MacDonald and didn't notice us. How can you be so naive to think that you are still a demon? Magician Lakash got closer and then continued, I think the reason why you are stuck in the portal is actually because of these two things on your head. The horn is too long. If you cut it off. He was too close. Don't have such dangerous thoughts. The demon roared loudly. He stretched out his dry and strong hands and grabbed the magician's collar. He was about to continue to be angry. But he felt his stomach making a violent noise. And he stopped. Well, I'm so hungry. Go and find me some food. I found that since I started eating people. My strength has become stronger and stronger. Go and find me some more. Didn't a lot of people die yesterday? The devil let go of Magician Lakash in his hand. Lucas stood on the floor and readjusted his collar shakily. He is not too worried that the devil will kill him. He is the founder of this devil's gate. If he dies, this devil's gate will also dissipate. And the demon stuck in the devil's gate will disappear. He felt that even if the demon was cut in half by the space rift, it did not mean that it would die thinking of the disgusting pool of blood in the garden. He waved to the wall, called an assistant, and slowly walked down the spiral staircase down the tower, seeing the figure of Magician Lucas disappear completely on the stairs. The resentment and hatred in the demon's eyes were completely released. The long purple tongue licked his forehead, and it said in demonic language with a ferocious face, Actually, I've always been curious about what a magician smells like. Magician Lukash, who walked down the spiral staircase, of course did not hear what the devil said. He and his assistant planned to go to the blood pool to get a bucket of human blood back. The corpses in the blood pool are almost all wanderers and civilians from the dry cloth plain. After they are slaughtered like cattle and sheep, they will be soaked in this blood pool. There are various magic circles around the blood pool, and the magic assistant is also a young black magician who has been released. He asked with a hint of expectation in his eyes. President, do we want to leave here? Of course. Lucas said decisively. When he left the tower, the hesitation disappeared from his eyes. He said to his assistant, when he feeds him later, pour this bottle of magic forbidden potion into it. As long as he can successfully get the two devil horns, let's leave here. After saying that, he took out a small medicine bottle from his magic pocket, handed it to his assistant, and then said, the research on black magic will also be suspended for a while. We destroyed the portal. These second-level powers in the Bina province, the attackers can still come in. But no large numbers of troops have followed. So it seems like they may have opened a temporary portal. We need to avoid those second-level experts in the military. Magician Lakash said. The assistant agreed. Okay, President. In a town near Makuso City, three assault teams successfully converged. The assault team of the Norton Legion rushed to nothing at the city hall. They did not cause a large-scale chaos. It was just that when the Bayan Knight left Makuso City with the second level warriors, he was killed by a group of city defense troops. It was discovered that during the battle, they killed a senior officer of the other party. The Johnson Legion assault team sneaked into the Civic Center Square as planned, only to discover that the portal there was not sealed or the magic nexus was taken away, but that the entire portal had been artificially knocked down. To rebuild this portal, what is currently needed is not space magicians, but a group of bricklayers who can understand the drawings. They need to rebuild the masonry structure of the portal. Obviously, such a mission would be impossible unless the city of Makuso was completely captured. Lord MacDonald, whose hands and feet were all broken, was lying on the dining table with bandages on all his limbs. After receiving treatment from the Holy Light of Soldak, his mental state was pretty good. At least he didn't look like he was dying. 
He just saw this many second-level swordsmen gathered in this private house. And they realized that it was impossible for their cronies to save themselves from these second-level swordsmen. Lord Bajan of the Norton Legion approached Lord Macdonald, looked at some Lord Macdonald seriously, turned around and said to his companions behind him, Don't underestimate Earl Macdonald. He and I both served in the constructed knights of the Benna Legion. He was close to the peak of the first rank at that time. But unfortunately, he never broke through to the second rank. Serdak did not expect that Lord Macdonald was once a construct knight. Chester and Quintus looked at each other. They were not familiar with Lord Macdonald before. And they only had a one-time acquaintance. Swordsman Chester asked with some concern. During the arrest, Lord Macdonald did not resist at all. Could it be that he was a substitute? Yes, this is him. Knight Bajan said firmly after carefully identifying the scars on his face. Hearing what Knight Bajan said, everyone felt relaxed. Later, the great swordsman Chester told the story about the discovery of demons in Lord Macdonald's manor. The second-level experts from the other two assault teams looked at Lord Macdonald in surprise. Great swordsman Quintus glanced at Knight Trollope. Sure enough, the jealous knight squeezed forward and came to Lord Macdonald, stared into his eyes and asked, Do you have a group of black magicians in your manor? Probably because he felt that he could not escape no matter what. Lord Macdonald's momentum also weakened. Lord Macdonald said, These black magicians are just doing academic research on demons. I don't know anything else. Knight Trollope closed his eyes, suppressed the anger in his heart, took out the map of Makuso City again, and asked the great swordsman Quintus, Where is that manor? Since we discovered it, it's gone. There's no reason to let them go. They're here anyway. Great swordsman Quintus obviously hopes to gain the support of Great Knight Trollope. Hearing his question, he immediately pointed it out on the map. This is it. If you want to destroy their stronghold, you must count me in. Several second-turn knights from Johnson's Legion assault team expressed their intention to join this temporary operation. Even Sabrina's great swordsman was no exception. At this time, the space magician who was following the assault team of Johnson's Legion said, I will open the temporary portal first and send people to send Lord Macdonald back. Anyone who wants to stay can do it until the black man is destroyed. The stronghold of the magic monastery. I will reopen the temporary teleportation array and take everyone back to Benna City. When the magician said this, the second-level swordsmen of the Luther Legion also expressed their intention to stay and help. Only the second-level warriors of the Norton Legion assault team decided to return to Benna City with Lord Macdonald under the pressure of the Bayan Knight. They were not prepared to participate in the annihilation of the Black Magic Hermitage stronghold. However, Archmage Merlin cannot escape. All magicians are obliged to cleanse the demons. Chapter 959 Escape All members of the assault team of Johnson's Legion chose to stay as did the nine second-turn swordsmen of Luther's legion led by great swordsman Quintus. Swordsman Chester originally wanted to stay in the Ganbu Plain and work with everyone to clear out the stronghold of the Black Magic Monastery. But someone always needed to escort Lord Macdonald back to Benna City to report to the Luther Legion assault team. Merit. Lord Macdonald cannot be handed over to the Norton Legion and let them gain this merit in vain. Therefore, it was appropriate for the great swordsman Chester to return to Benna City with Lord Macdonald in custody. The two-headed ogre asked Serdak in a low voice. Boss, do we want to stay? Soldak thought for a moment, nodded slightly to Great Swordsman Chester, and then said sincerely to Great Swordsman Quintus. Great Swordsman Quintus, we also want to stay and join this operation. Soldak, welcome to join. Great Swordsman Quintus patted Serdak's shoulder heavily and said. The other second-level swordsmen of the Luther Legion stretched out their fists towards Serdak. Serdak also stretched out his fist and bumped their fists respectively. Serdak was of course very respectful of this etiquette. Only by touching them in this way can the newcomers in the army be officially accepted by the veterans. In fact, Soldak felt that Chester Great Swordsman's decision was more prudent. The task of wiping out the Black Magic Monastery originally fell within the scope of the Magic Guild Law Enforcement Group's responsibilities. The military only needs to notify the Magic Union and ask the Magic Union Law Enforcement Team to send magicians which is more in the interests of the Luther Legion. Knight Trollope also came over, put his arm around Soldak's shoulders, and said excitedly, Just in time to show me what you have learned in the past few years. I heard that you actually obtained the title of Marquis Luther. Appreciation. Miss Hathaway is now my fiancé. Soldak explained in a low voice. Knight Trollope said with a bit of laughter, I thought you would be embarrassed by this matter, but it seems that you are not affected by it at all. What's there to be embarrassed about? Serdak chuckled and responded in a low voice. The magician drew the curtains in the bedroom tightly. 
and set up a sound insulation barrier in the room, and then set up a temporary teleportation circle in the bedroom. Every time this kind of temporary magic circle is deployed, it must be at least in the magic pattern. More than a hundred magic crystals must be placed on each node of the magic circle to make the temporary teleportation magic circle work. Every time a person is teleported, a large amount of magic crystals are consumed. However, the temporary magic teleportation array set up this time was very successful. The members of the Norton Legion Assault Team were the first to enter the temporary teleportation array, followed by the Chester Great Swordsman, who slowly walked in carrying Lord MacDonnell, who had broken arms and legs. Before leaving, Great Swordsman Chester specifically said to Soldek, Be careful. I'll wait for you to come. Soldek nodded. This time the two teams merged together, with a total of 25 second-level powerhouses and three mages. The lineup was much stronger than when Lord MacDonnell was captured. The Great Swordsman Chester disappeared into the portal, and the Space Magician began to dismantle the temporary teleportation circle. The assault team did not make any pre-war combat arrangements, and decisively abandoned the house in the town. They walked from the yard to the street in twos and threes, then dispersed into the town, and finally ran to the woods outside the town to regroup. Together, this time heading towards Lord MacDonald's estate. Going to Lord MacDonald's manor this time was not as easy as before. The main reason is that after Lord MacDonald was kidnapped, almost 3,000 people entered the mountains, and everyone was searching for Lord MacDonald's whereabouts. Such an intensive search operation also made it difficult for the remaining second turn team to approach the manor. But then, the great swordsman Quintus and the great knight Trollope led the assault team into the mountain forest quickly. Even if their whereabouts were exposed, they had to quickly approach Lord MacDonald's manor. They jumped flexibly in the jungle and run very fast. Magician Lakash sat on the top of the magic tower and watched with his own eyes as the demon drank the blood mixed with the forbidden magic potion. He sat on a chair and slowly waited for the magic forbidden potion to take effect. The demon in the devil's gate first licked the pot with his tongue, but did not taste any special taste. He held up the blood basin with his arm and drank all the blood in the wooden basin. Before Magician Lakash could speak, the demon suddenly pulled out an arm from the devil's gate and like lightning, grabbed Magical Lakash's head with its big hands with sharp nails. With a little force on his hand, the sharp black nails were deeply embedded in the skull of the magician Lakash. The devil opened his mouth, stretched out his long fleshy tongue, and penetrated directly into the left eye of magician Lakash. Lucas trembled and threw out a fireball, and he was pushed away from the devil's clutches by the air wave after the explosion of the fireball. The devil wanted to stretch his hand forward a little further, but found that his arm could not be stretched out. It stared in surprise at Lucas, who covered one eye and groaned, and roared angrily. What did you add to the blood? Magician Lakash was seriously injured, with blood flowing from his mouth, nostrils, ears and eyes. With the help of his assistant, he stepped back a little. Hearing the devil ask this, he coughed up blood and said, What can there be that is just pure blood? Without the magic power of Magician Lakash to maintain, the magic pattern array under the devil's gate gradually became dim and the entire Devil's Gate became quite unstable. Just as the Devil struggled to crawl out of the Devil's Gate, the moment before, the Devil's Gate disappeared, disappeared together with the Devil's Gate, and the rear half of the Devil's body. The demon looked at the half of his body that was left behind after being slashed across the shoulder with a broadsword. His face was ferocious, and he crawled toward Lakash dragging a long trail of blood. His wounds healed very quickly. The magic assistant, who helped Magician Lucas back tore open a scroll this time. The scroll turned into three fireballs, which hit the demon in succession. The demon rolled back again and again, and his body became extremely burnt at this moment. The magic assistant desperately tried to drag Lakash to a safe place, but unfortunately on the steps, Magician Lucas was already furious. At this time, the magic assistant heard the sound of fighting coming from the plane. Before he could react, the door under the magic tower had been kicked open. Several second-level swordsmen rushed into the magic tower. There were even continuous sounds from below. Screams. Magician Lakash asked his magic assistant to lie half of his body on the stairs and poked his head out from the stairs to look down. I saw several second-level swordsmen rushing in from below, rushing up along the spiral staircase. He smiled with difficulty and said angrily to the magic assistant beside him, Run quickly or it will be too late. Window magic handle. The magic assistant quickly put down Magician Lucas and ran quickly to the window on the top floor of the magic tower. At this time, the demon with only half of its body opened its huge mouth, and a black shadow shot out from inside 
and penetrated into the body of the magic assistant. The magic assistant only felt a sharp pain in his heart. He couldn't control his balance properly and tilted outwards and fell out of the window. Then he touched the handle of his magic harpoon in a panic, adjusted his posture in midair as he fell, and used the magic power activates the floating device on the magic handle. And the magic handle flies into the sky like an arrow from the string. Chapter 960 Fierce Battle in the Manor Probably the black magicians in Lord MacDonald's manor did not expect that the assault team would come back so soon to launch a raid. When performing surprise assassination missions, second-level swordsmen may be slightly less powerful than assassins. But in this kind of team assault battle, the Bena swordsmen have a huge advantage. It can be said that they are invincible anywhere in the Green Empire. The great swordsman Quintus went directly to the backyard of the manor this time. The 28 members were divided into five groups and attacked the five magic towers in the backyard of the manor. This time, Serdak, as the captain of the assault team, led Gulitum, Samira, Thea and a second turn swordsman from the Luther Legion to rush into the second magic tower on the west side of the backyard. The two-headed ogre Gulitum used the most direct way to break the door. He started running when he was still a hundred meters away from the magic tower. When he was still 30 meters away from the magic tower, the ogre was actually tall. Jumping up, the whole person turned into a white light. Like a cannonball, hitting the door of the magic tower directly. The armor piece on his shoulder shattered the moment it came into contact with the door of the magic tower. Then the door of the magic tower dented inwards and broke into several pieces with a roar. Several black magicians on the first floor of the magic tower were about to run upstairs because Lord Lucas shouted from the top of the tower. But at this moment, a two-headed ogre more than three meters high broke through the door. Entering, these black magicians were so frightened that they quickly hid behind the test bench. They held the staff in one hand and took out the magic scroll from their arms with the other hand. They chanted magic spells. And the magic scroll shattered into protective magic shields. Samira and Serdak then broke in. Samira stepped into the magic tower and shot three feather arrows. One of the feather arrows just hit the eyebrow of a black magician who did not have a magic shield. The other two the feather arrow hit the magic shield. And the magic shield was strongly distorted. The black magicians hiding behind the test bench also quickly counterattacked. They did not even chant a spell. But directly tore open the magic scrolls in their hands. Under their feet. Complex magic arrays lit up. With streaks of black flames. And the fireball flew toward the door. Gulitum and Serdak rushed side by side. Serdak held the Gerda shield. And stood a little closer. When he opened the ninth seal. He immediately chose the ancient oath. A light shield. Covered on the Gerda shield. The Gerda shield itself is also blessed by the effects of the holy shield and the blessing shield. The ogre Gulitum only had a layer of ice armor on his body. So Serdak tried his best to rush to the front. Several black flames and fireballs exploded in front of Soldak. And Gerda's shield suddenly burst into colorful brilliance. The big stick in the ogre's hand had already hit the cast iron test bench. And the cast iron test bench exploded with a roar. The section was cut into two parts and the tracking magic experimental items piled on it were scattered all over the floor. The glassware made a crisp sound of breaking. Some magic potions were mixed together, and pungent smoke came out. Serdak did not stop downstairs. The second turn swordsman and Gulitum, who followed behind him, had firmly suppressed the black magicians, and he rushed up the spiral staircase. Samira followed Serdak, with a feather arrow on the sky strike bow in her hand. What Serdak didn't expect was that when he climbed to the top of the tower, he found a weak magician at the top of the tower stairs. His body was still warm. But a magician appeared in the orbit of his left eye. There was a bloody hole the size of an egg. And blood was gurgling out of it. It was impossible to save such a serious injury. At the top of the tower is a circular room of almost tens of square meters. The walls are surrounded by bookshelves with some books and magic materials placed on them. In the center of the circular room, a black devil's door is slowly dissipating and the huge magic pattern array emerging from the ground is also slowly losing its magical luster. Next to the devil's door, a man with a head on his head with devil's horns. The devil with an extremely ferocious face fell in purple blood. It still had a weak breath, but it was cut diagonally from the right shoulder to the left rib by some sharp weapon at both ends, and a large amount of purple blood flowed out of his body. Although this demon only has half of its body, it can still be seen that it is extremely tall and strong with some natural magic marks on its body. From the severed body wound, some damaged organs flowed out along with purple blood. It seemed to be crawling on the ground for a few steps, dragging a long trail of blood on the floor. And even the intestines and stomach were bleeding all over the floor. 
when Serdak saw it. Its eyes had completely lost color, as if it had no soul. On the platform of the tower, a young magician hurriedly pushed open the window. Unfortunately, he failed to maintain his balance and lost his footing and fell out of the tower. When Soldak ran to the window, he saw that the young magician actually pulled out a magic magic handle during the fall. The young magician relied on his body's flexibility to turn over and mount the magic magic handle and drill directly towards him. Night sky. Samira nimbly got out of the window, grabbed the ease with one hand, turned over and stepped on the top of the magic tower, aimed at the young magician who had already penetrated into the night sky, and shot an arrow hastily. The young magician was hit by an arrow in the shoulder. The magic pot shook violently, but did not fall. It flew towards the valley in the distance to the north. At the same time, black magicians rushed out of other magic towers riding magic harpoons. In this kind of fierce battle in the tower, there is no way that magicians can be the opponents of this group of second-level swordsmen, especially with the suppression of power across levels, leaving these black magicians with no room to fight back. The magicians flying into the air began to hold magic scrolls and launch a counterattack against the second-level swordsmen who chased them. Amidst the explosion of fireballs, several magic towers were ignited one after another. Samira stood on the top of the tower and shot down six black magicians riding magic harpoons one after another. Only then did these black magicians realize that it was not safe for them to ride on magic harpoons in the air. And they all raised their height in the air. But in this way, when the fireballs in their hands are thrown down, they will also have little power. Archmage Merlin mounted the magic harpoon and caught up in the sky. The space magician from the assault team also rushed forward. The magic harpoon flew very fast. And the magician flying in front had absolute dominance. Explosive flames exploded in the dusk like brilliant fireworks at night. Losing the support of the second-level swordsman, Archmage Merlin and the space magician were blown away by the black magicians and returned to the manor. Hearing the sound of fierce fighting, the guards in the front yard of the manor began to gather in the backyard. But they did not rush in. Nearly a thousand lords' private troops surrounded the backyard. Serdak quickly cut off the demon's head. It is said that the devil's horns can be used to make very sophisticated wands. And the head is also a high-level sacrifice. There are a lot of books in the tower, as well as some magic materials. Of course, you can take as much of these things as you can. The second level swordsman began to clean up the H, L dogs in the yard. The two-headed ogre had a habit of cutting off the head immediately every time he killed a H, L hound. There were many H, L dogs in the yard, and there were no in a short time. The H, L dog's head was wrapped twice around his waist. Thousands of Lord Macdonald's private troops are currently searching in the mountains, and forests seeing the flames of fierce fighting breaking out on the manor side. The army quickly gathered towards the manor side. There was even the sound of rolling wheels in the distance. And some shield carts and ballistae were parked outside the manor. All the commanding heights around the manor were filled with archers. And there were always sharp arrows shot in from outside the wall. He is a second level powerhouse. Samira stared at the arrow path and whispered to Serdak. Serdak quickly asked Thea to hide behind him as much as possible and not to show up. When the assault team attacked the magic tower, some second-level swordsmen were injured by magic. The signs of burning, freezing, and corrosion were obvious. Everyone rushed out of the magic tower, gathered together, and prepared to break out and leave. At this time, I heard dozens of anchor-like iron hooks hung on the east wall, followed by the sound of neat chants. The wall began to shake rhythmically, and as the shaking became larger and larger, it finally collapsed amidst the sound of chants. A group of infantry stood in a row outside the courtyard wall with tower shields. They were standing sideways. A row of long archers wearing leather armor stepped up from behind and then filled the long bows in their hands. A gleaming feather arrow was aimed at the assault team in the yard. There is a neat row of spear throwers behind the long archers. And archers are also standing on the commanding heights all around. And this group of people didn't intend to make any declaration of war. After setting up the formation, the commander holding a saber in his hand waved the saber and shouted, Fire arrows! A row of arrows shot straight towards everyone. The knight Serdak and Trollop raised their shields to block the front. The other swordsmen also inspired the fighting spirit in their bodies and waved their long swords to deflect the arrows. A blue glow lit up under Sia's feet again, and the magic pattern array emerged. As Sia's singing-like spell was recited, a huge wave surged out from under her feet again. The raging waves rushed towards the archers and a row of arrows got into the waves, and they suddenly lost their accuracy. But there was no way to resist the javelin thrown down from the sky. A bunch of javelins fell down, 
and were cut off by a group of second-level swordsmen. Although this kind of action is a bit cool, it puts a heavy burden on the physical strength of the second-turn swordsmen. We withdraw. Great swordsman Quintus shouted. All the second-level swordsmen followed the great swordsman Quintus closely and ran toward the other side of the courtyard wall. But before everyone could escape to the wall, the wall collapsed under violent shaking. The moment it collapsed, a row of arrows shot in from outside the courtyard wall. When the arrow flies in the air, it makes a sharp sound of swish, swish, swish. Serdak and Trollop, the great knights, quickly raised their shields and pushed them forward. The shield in Serdak's hand frequently erupted with holy light. Rush over. The great swordsman Quintus did not change his retreat route. A ball of white sword energy burst out from his body and rushed towards the collapsed courtyard wall. The archers had quickly retreated behind the shield warriors. One by one, the spearmen lifted spears more than four meters long from the top of the shield to prevent the swordsman from approaching. The great swordsman Quintus' whole body lit up with white light, and he swung his two swords and hit them. He immediately split three tower shields, and his two swords were like meat grinders, cutting off the six or seven infantry soldiers in front of him. Gulitum followed Serdak and Knight Trollop, and followed the great swordsman Quintus as he rushed up. The three of them immediately expanded the opening opened by the great swordsman Quintus. And the second turn great swordsman behind them followed up against the rain of arrows. The heavy armored infantry kept retreating with tower shields in hand, always adjusting the shield wall. When someone fell, someone immediately blocked him with a shield. The infantry in the military formation formed a huge pocket, tightly wrapping the assault team in it. This encirclement was almost filled with the life of the heavy armored infantry. The spearmen kept following the gaps and thrusting the spears in their hands through the gaps in the shields. The second level swordsmen faced a large number of troops. Although their personal abilities were outstanding and they were all wearing magic pattern structures, some people would inevitably be injured. The bodies of shield warriors lay at the feet of the swordsmen. Some shield warriors fell and did not die immediately. Even if they were dying, they would stab the daggers in their hands into the swordsmen's ankles. The distance from the manor to the forest was only a hundred meters. But within this distance, the second level swordsman almost stepped on the corpses of the opponent's heavy armored infantry soldiers and left. Entering the woods, the heavy armored infantry behind them quickly moved to both sides. A creaking sound sounded, and a crossbow was pushed out from the backyard. Although Serdak didn't look back, he seemed to hear the sound of the crossbow winch twisting, and the bow string made a loud cracking sound. The second level swordsmen present are all veterans with rich combat experience. When everyone hears this sound, they naturally know what the opponent is pushing out. Of course, they can run as far as they want at this time. Especially here, there are lush woods everywhere. As long as you run far enough, there will be enough trees to block these bed crossbows. Everyone didn't even wait for the great swordsman Quintus to give the order, and rushed into the woods at a faster speed. At this time, the black magicians who had fled into the air finally had some breathing space. They saw Lord MacDonald's private army in the sky rushing over to support them and they immediately gathered in the night sky on magic harpoons. They threw the fireballs in their hands at these second-turn swordsmen. Although the fireball could not cause damage to these second-level swordsmen, it lit up the battlefield in the evening, guiding the archers behind to throw arrows. The fireball even ignited the surrounding woods, successfully hindering the retreat of the second-level swordsmen. The irritated Samira quickly jumped onto the crown of a big tree, as a magic crystal in the gem groove of her bow arm shattered. A crossbow arrow flashing with countless electric snakes crossed the blurry night sky, shooting a black magician lying in midair. A bolt of thunder fell from the sky and immediately hit the black magician. His body was torn apart by the thunder, and the magic potion fell from the sky together with it. There was silence. All the black magicians in the sky once again rode on magic harpoons to increase their flying height. 